I'm a 25-year-old male, and this terrifying experience occurred just last year when I decided to take a solo vacation. Luckily, one of my friends owned a cabin near the area I planned to visit, which turned out to be a lifesaver in terms of saving money. The cabin was a place I'd heard my friends speak about often and had seen numerous photos of. It was described as the coziest and most relaxing place in the world, precisely what I yearned for during my vacation. However, little did I know that this getaway would turn into a nightmare. The cabin was nestled in an isolated area, approximately 40 minutes away from the nearest town. The remoteness added to its charm though much of that time was consumed navigating a slow drive down a dirt road. Upon my arrival, I couldn't help but stand outside for what must have been an hour, gazing off into the distance, savoring the serene beauty of nature and the overwhelming quietness. Once the daylight started to fade, I decided to prepare an early dinner and indulged in some time on my phone. As the evening approached, I made up my mind to make the most of the remaining daylight with a short walk. There were several small trails adjacent to the cabin, which had caught my attention earlier. I texted my friend to double check if these were indeed trails and if they were safe to explore. He assured me that there was nothing to worry about, and mentioned that the closest one behind the cabin led straight through the woods. This sounded perfect to me, so I laced up my walking boots and embarked on the trail. It wasn't the smoothest path but it was far from challenging, and I felt confident I couldn't get lost. My primary concern was straying off the trail, so I walked for about half an hour, immersing myself in the natural surroundings and letting my mind wander. Then, something unsettling happened. I heard a noise that made me stop dead in my tracks. It was the sound of a man's voice, loud and harsh, but it seemed to be coming from a distance. I scanned the woods around me, trying to pinpoint the source of the voice, but I couldn't see anyone. The voice spoke again, this time from somewhere to the right of the trail, but still concealed from my view. It sounded as though the man was speaking angrily, possibly shouting at someone, though I couldn't understand the language. A sense of unease washed over me. I didn't know if there were any other cabins or houses nearby so I couldn't determine if it was normal for someone to be in this area. What made it strange was that they weren't on the trail. I listened for a few more minutes, hearing the man's voice repeatedly, yet no one ever responded audibly, at least not loudly enough for me to discern. Eventually, my curiosity got the better of me, and I cautiously moved closer to where the voice was coming from, trying to remain hidden. I didn't want to reveal my presence, I just wanted to ensure that nothing was seriously amiss. Carefully, I kept an eye on the trail as I ventured deeper into the woods, but as I drew closer to the source of the voice, all the talking and yelling abruptly ceased. A chilling feeling began to creep over me, I sensed something was terribly wrong, and being alone in the woods was now the last place I wanted to be. The sun was gradually sinking below the horizon casting eerie shadows through the trees, and it was my cue to abandon my quest and return to the safety of the cabin. I quickened my pace, my footsteps echoing through the quiet woods. Suddenly, I heard the unmistakable crunch of leaves behind me. I snapped my head around, but the dancing shadows created by the fading light made it challenging to see clearly. Someone was running, and it seemed like they were closing in on me from somewhere out in the woods not too far away. Panic surged through me and I immediately turned and sprinted the rest of the way back to the cabin. Once inside, I locked all the doors and windows. I peered out of the back window and to my horror, saw a man in a thick hoodie approaching the cabin. He held something in his hand and it was clear that his intentions were far from benign. In a desperate moment, I grabbed my keys and bolted for my car, parked at the front of the cabin. I raced away without seeing anyone pursuing me. When I finally spoke with my friend about the incident, he reiterated that no one should have been in that area. The identity of the man and the reason for his presence in the woods remained a mystery, but one thing was certain. If I had stayed in that cabin, I might have never been seen again. I was out camping in a familiar forest in Colorado 
a place I'd visited countless times over the years. My home was a couple of hours away, but I always found solace in this wilderness, coming out every couple of months when the weather was nice. This particular trip started like any other. I had my camp set up and had already spent two full days here, focusing on mundane tasks like getting my tent situated and going fishing in the nearby river. On the third day, I decided to embark on a hike just north of my campsite. There were no designated trails in this area, but I was confident in my knowledge of the landmarks nearby and had all the necessary equipment to ensure I didn't get lost. So I began my hike, simply enjoying the serenity of the forest. The sun was high in the sky, casting dappled shadows through the trees, and the only sound was the soft rustling of leaves underfoot. As I walked further up the mountain, I noticed something unsettling, a column of smoke rising from behind me. It appeared to be originating from a point quite near my campsite. My heart quickened, and I hurriedly adjusted my course to get a better view. Straining my eyes, I could make out the ominous plume of smoke, but it was clear that whatever was burning was either at my camp or close by, concealed within the dense thicket of trees. Worry gnawed at me as I hastened back, my thoughts racing with the possibilities. Had I left a fire smoldering? But no, I distinctly remembered extinguishing it before my hike. The closer I got, about a quarter mile from the source of the smoke, the more apparent it became that it wasn't directly from my campsite. My relief was tempered by the mystery. Something was burning nearby, yet the forest surrounding my camp remained untouched. Upon my return, I found everything at my campsite undisturbed and no signs of fire or distress. Puzzled, I reasoned that it must have been someone else's campfire. It was an odd coincidence for someone to be in this exact location, considering there were no established trails leading here. A tinge of unease crept over me at the thought of encountering strangers in the wilderness, so I decided to stay put and put the strange incident out of my mind, hoping it was just a passing occurrence. I continued with my day, engaged in various camp chores and leisurely activities, trying to shake off the disquiet that had settled within me. Time passed, perhaps an hour or so, and I casually glanced around my surroundings. That's when it happened. My body stiffened, and my heart leaped into my throat. There, standing amidst the trees, was a man. He appeared out of nowhere, his presence utterly unexpected. I couldn't fathom how long he'd been there, watching me. I hesitated, then raised my arm in a nervous wave, hoping for a friendly acknowledgement. But the man didn't wave back. He was too far away for me to discern if he was watching me, but he was undoubtedly facing in the direction of my campsite. My initial fear subsided slightly, and I returned to my activities, albeit with an uneasy eye occasionally cast in his direction. He remained rooted in that same spot, a solitary figure in the woods, for almost fifteen minutes. The silence around us grew oppressive as I pondered his intent. Then, as suddenly as he had appeared, he vanished. It sent a shiver down my spine, leaving me with an unsettling feeling that something was terribly amiss. His inexplicable presence gnawed at my thoughts. I waited for a few more hours, vigilant and wary, scanning the surroundings for any further signs of the stranger. But the forest remained eerily quiet devoid of any disturbances. As the sun began its descent beyond the horizon, I decided to retreat to the safety of my tent, hoping the night would bring clarity to the bizarre events of the day. Sitting outside my tent, I lit a fire, its warm glow providing me with a semblance of comfort. I lost track of time, absorbed in my thoughts, and the fire's flickering light. An hour or so must have passed when I noticed another flickering light to my left. It wasn't the light of my campfire. It was from another source, a campfire situated deep within the forest. Oddly, it wasn't in the direction from which I'd seen the smoke earlier in the day. Instead, it was closer to where I had observed the mysterious man. My unease returned, and I peered closely at the distant campfire. Strangely, it appeared abandoned, with no sign of anyone tending to it. I scanned the surrounding darkness, my senses on high alert. That's when I saw it. A face, partially hidden behind a bush, just ten or fifteen feet away. 
Panic surged through me, my heart pounding with fear as I stared back at the figure. It was as if the figure didn't believe I could see them, but our eyes locked in a tense standoff. I swallowed hard, my body trembling, and I couldn't tear my gaze away from that face. The figure remained utterly still, crouched behind the cover of the underbrush. I took a few cautious steps back, placing the campfire between us. My eyes remained fixed on the enigmatic figure, my mind racing, trying to decipher their intentions. For an excruciatingly long half hour, we locked eyes, neither of us moving a muscle. My heart pounded loudly in my ears, the tension in the air palpable. Then, without warning, the figure slowly began to retreat, gradually fading into the dark recesses of the forest. They remained crouched and moved silently, disappearing further and further into the trees, until they were entirely concealed by the shadows. I remained rooted to the spot, my wide-open eyes darting around in all directions, my ears straining for any sound. The night dragged on, the eerie silence enveloping me. Finally, as the first rays of dawn began to pierce the forest, I decided that I had to leave. Something about the situation felt increasingly dangerous, and I had no intention of discovering the true nature of the stranger's intentions. With haste, I packed up my belongings and headed back to my car, my footsteps echoing loudly in the stillness of the forest. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something sinister. Whatever was happening out there, it was far too suspicious, and my gut told me that staying any longer would only invite perilous encounters. My friend Ryan and I lived in a cozy small town just outside of Seattle. Over the past few years, we had both become passionate about camping and hiking, but there was something uniquely captivating about setting up camp in the wilderness, immersing ourselves in the wild, and living among the creatures of the forest. It was a connection with nature that resonated deeply within us. The fateful incident occurred in the fall of 2019. We had meticulously planned a typical camping trip not too far from our hometown. However, due to the erratic nature of our work schedules, it took some intricate maneuvering to find the perfect window of opportunity. In the days leading up to the trip, my manager reluctantly pushed back my requested days off by one day, throwing our plans into disarray. I informed Ryan of this unfortunate twist of fate, but he was unfazed. In his easygoing manner, he assured me that he would hike out to the campsite and spend the first night alone. He insisted he'd enjoy the solitude, and who was I to stand in the way of his adventure? He messaged me as soon as he reached the campsite and set everything up, reporting that all was well. The following morning, I packed my gear and drove out to meet him. Our chosen campsite was not a popular one, mainly because there were plenty of other options nearby. Nevertheless, it had a well-maintained trail leading to a cleared-out area designated for campers. It was far from a random spot in the forest. As I ventured deeper into the woods, I tried texting Ryan to confirm our rendezvous, but soon lost cell service. It wasn't too alarming at first, as signal drops were common in these remote areas. However, as I continued, I realized that I hadn't received any messages from him. I attributed it to potential service issues, or a glitch with my phone, given the myriad reasons messages might go undelivered. Upon arriving at the campsite, I immediately sensed something was amiss. Ryan, I called out, searching the tent and its surroundings, but he was nowhere in sight. Initially, I wasn't overly concerned. There were numerous places he could have ventured off to, a nearby river for fishing or a couple of trails with stunning vistas. He could have been anywhere. Setting my backpack down, I proceeded to set up my own tent. Then I ignited a fire to warm up some canned food I had brought along. It was only noon, and if Ryan had gone hiking, he wouldn't return until later in the afternoon. As the clock approached five, my anxiety grew. I strained my eyes, trying to discern any discernible shoe prints that would hint at his whereabouts. But the forest floor was littered with prints that led in every direction. Still devoid of phone service, I was faced with limited options to locate Ryan. My only logical choice was to stay put and hope he'd return. However, 
As the sun dipped below the horizon, the thought of him hiking back in the dark was unsettling. I added more wood to the fire and sat down, torn between hope and dread. Hours passed and my fear escalated. Did he get injured? Was he lost? Or was he simply enjoying an extended hike? My mind raced with countless possibilities. And then, just as the night was settling in, a flicker of light caught my eye a few trees ahead. The light moved erratically, as if someone were walking with it, and it appeared to be near one of the trails. Relief surged through me, convinced that it was Ryan. The light drew closer, growing brighter, and I could hear faint footsteps in the distance. Ryan, I called out again, my voice trembling. The footsteps abruptly ceased, and the light extinguished. Silence enveloped the forest. I repeated his name, but there was no response, no movement. A knot tightened in my stomach, and dread clawed at me. I stared into the darkness for what felt like an eternity, straining my senses. An hour passed, during which I heard nothing but the ambient sounds of the forest. There was no sign of the person who had carried the light, and a creeping unease took hold of me. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was out there, watching me. At that point, I couldn't stay any longer. A primal instinct urged me to leave and seek help. Hastily, I packed my belongings, all the while keeping a wary eye on my surroundings. I didn't believe I was being followed, as I made my way back without further incident. However, it wasn't until the following day that the police were able to assist me. Returning to the campsite, we found everything exactly as I had left it. The tents, the fire pit, the gear, all untouched. But Ryan was still missing. The authorities tracked his last known movements, showing that he had strayed off one of the trails, accompanied by another set of shoe prints. Unfortunately, Ryan's trail went cold, and the search yielded no results. The prevailing belief was that he had been taken by the same person I had encountered that eerie night in the forest. It's a haunting thought, wondering if things might have turned out differently if I had been there with him on that first day, or if I too would have vanished into the wilderness. It was early September, and I decided to take my camper out for a midweek camping trip. The woods right outside my house had plenty of dirt paths, big enough to fit my truck with the camper attached, so I found myself staying there for a few nights a few times a month. My favorite spot was down a small trail that led to a secluded lake. This lake was vast, but the spot I always chose was far too random for most people to venture into. On that particular morning, I detached the camper from my truck and prepared my bag for a hike. Although there weren't any marked trails, Walking along the lake always seemed like a safe bet to avoid getting lost. Only a few minutes' walk from my camper, I stumbled upon something incredibly strange. It was a trailer, wedged between a couple of trees, looking rugged and old, almost as if it had been sitting out here for years. But I had been down this way before, and it definitely wasn't here last time. Someone must have moved it here recently. I hesitated, keeping my distance trying to discern if there was any sign of someone living there. Honestly, one look at it gave me a feeling that it was purposefully hidden, perhaps to cover something up. From what I could see, it showed no signs of recent habitation, fueling my suspicions further. Why would someone go through the effort of moving a beat-up trailer through the woods into such a secluded area? My gut told me to leave, but there was something about it that pulled me in. Against my better judgment, I approached the trailer and knocked on its door. No one answered, and there was no movement from inside. I knocked once more, still met with silence, so I left and walked back to my camper. The trailer haunted my thoughts for several hours as I sat outside, tending to my campfire. However, as the sun set and the stars filled the sky, I managed to enjoy my night. Sitting on a small chair, gazing up at the peaceful night, I was startled by the unmistakable sound of footsteps crunching leaves behind me in the woods. I turned and saw a light moving steadily between the trees, as whoever it was approached the lake. It was incredibly strange to see someone out here. 
I kept my eyes on them, but suddenly, the light went out. I strained to see through the darkness, searching for any movement, but there was nothing. Then, faint footsteps started again, coming in my direction, and they were trying to be as quiet as possible. I stood up, my heart pounding, and called out, Hey, what do you want? The footsteps stopped, and it felt like they were just a few yards away from me. I waited anxiously for a response or any sign of movement, but there was nothing for what felt like an eternity. Finally, the footsteps began retreating, fading into the woods. I put two and two together and realized that the mysterious person was heading in the direction of the abandoned trailer. After the bizarre encounter and my unease about the trailer, I had no intention of staying the night. I hastily packed up, reattached my camper to the truck, and turned on my brights as I carefully drove down the path. It took a while, but I finally made it out of there. Once I reached a safe distance, I decided to call the police to report the strange behavior of the mysterious man and the odd trailer. The following morning, I guided two officers to the location of the trailer, but to my shock, it was gone. What was even more bewildering was that there were clear trails on the ground, showing that the trailer had been dragged all the way up to the lake, where the marks faded into the water's edge. Whatever that trailer had hidden now sat at the bottom of the lake, completely inaccessible. No evidence ever surfaced to warrant the retrieval of the trailer, leaving the mystery unsolved. It's terrifying to think about what that man could have done to me had he caught me by the trailer he was hiding. Unfortunately, I will always be haunted by the enigma of what lay behind that door. I went on a camping trip with my buddy from college, who I'll call Evan to protect our privacy. We'd been friends for a little less than a year, and both enjoyed the forest and going for hikes, but we hadn't ever stayed overnight in nature before. This adventure took place during spring break at our school, and we had been planning it for a while. We carefully chose a trail we were familiar with, and even had a basic idea of the area where we would set up camp. On the day of our journey, we headed out without thinking twice. We were thrilled to see that nobody else was on the trail. In fact, we had chosen this specific trail because it was never a busy attraction. The trail led us about six miles into the forest before we arrived at the general area where we wanted to set up camp. After pitching our tents, we prepared a small meal just before the sun was about to disappear below the horizon. Evan and I collected some large stones and sticks to make a fire with and got it going just as it got dark. Irresponsibly, we had brought a pack of beers and started drinking while talking and just hanging out by the fire. We had some good conversations and had fun, but a couple of hours in, we were ready to call it a night. We put out the fire and then got into our tents to go to bed. I actually fell asleep really easily because of the calming sounds of nature, but throughout the night, I kept waking up. It wasn't due to any specific noises, but I would just jerk awake for some reason. I assumed it was just me being unfamiliar with being out in the forest at night, but it still gave me an uneasy feeling. Then, on maybe my fourth or fifth time waking up, I heard Evan's tent unzipping. I thought he was probably going out to use the bathroom or something, but he only took a few steps until I heard him open up his backpack and start searching around. Another thirty or so seconds went by with no other noises. It was like he was just standing right outside of his tent. My curiosity got the better of me, and I sat up and eventually unzipped my tent and looked out. As soon as the sound of my zipper began, I heard Evan's footsteps rush away from the front of my tent. By the time I stuck my head out, Evan was ducked down and quickly shoved something back into his backpack, then turned and looked at me with a concerned face. Is everything okay? I asked feeling a chill crawl up my spine. He looked at me for a moment, then nodded his head. Something about this immediately felt off. I climbed out of my tent and stood up, asking what he was doing out here. He responded by saying he was having trouble sleeping and just came out for some fresh air. But while he was talking, I looked down at his backpack. Sticking out of the top was the back end of a handgun. I felt my face turn white as I looked back at Evan and tried my best to hide my reaction, but he already knew what I saw. 
We stared at each other for a strange few seconds before he turned and went back inside his tent without saying another word. I'd never seen him act like that before, and his face gave away that he was guilty of something. It was already strange that he never told me he was bringing a gun, but the way he was acting just made it even more unsettling. I stayed up for the rest of the night, sitting on the ground outside the tents and waiting for the sun to come up. When it did, I packed everything up and left. After that day, Evan never contacted me, which I guess proves that something was going on that night. I don't know for sure what would have happened or why it would have happened, but I know that I was lucky to get out of there before finding out. The memory of that eerie night in the wilderness still haunts me, and I can't help but wonder what secrets Evan was hiding in the darkness of the forest. I've always felt drawn to the wilderness, like it was calling out to me, whispering secrets I longed to understand. So when I decided to go camping alone in a forest an hour from my house, it felt like I was finally answering that call. It was just for one night, a brief escape from the noise and chaos of everyday life. I wasn't an experienced camper, but I figured how hard could it be. It was just one night after all. The night before the trip I could barely sleep. I was too excited, imagining myself surrounded by trees in silence, with nothing but the sky above and the earth below. In my room, surrounded by the familiar and mundane, the adventure ahead seemed like a dream waiting to become reality. I packed my backpack with the essentials, a tent, a sleeping bag, some food, and a flashlight. I didn't bother with a map. I planned to stay on the trail, and it was only for a day. The morning sun was just peeking over the horizon when I set out. The drive was peaceful, a soothing prelude to the adventure. I rolled down the windows, letting the cool morning air fill the car, carrying with it the promise of the day ahead. The road wound through the countryside, each turn revealing a landscape more beautiful than the last. My heart raced with excitement and a touch of nervousness. When I arrived at the forest, the first rays of sunlight were filtering through the trees, casting a golden glow on the path ahead. But my heart sank a little when I saw several cars parked beside the trail. I didn't want to share this experience with strangers. I wanted solitude, to be alone with my thoughts and the sounds of nature. So I kept driving, searching for a less popular spot. A little way down the road, I found another trail. It was narrow, just a dirt path winding its way into the heart of the forest. There were no cars, no signs of people. It was perfect. I parked my car a little distance away and walked back to the trailhead, my backpack feeling heavier with each step. The trail welcomed me like an old friend, its path shaded by towering trees. The air was fresh, filled with the scent of pine and earth. I started down the path, my footsteps the only sound in the quiet morning. The forest seemed to embrace me, its canopy a protective cover. I walked for hours, lost in the beauty around me. The terrain was mostly flat, making the walk easy, but I was so mesmerized by the forest that I hardly noticed. There were only trees and bushes as far as I could see, an endless sea of green. But as I ventured deeper, the trail began to fade. It became harder to tell where the path was. I should have been worried, but I wasn't. I was too captivated by the wilderness, too confident in my ability to find my way back. It was an oversight I would soon regret. Little did I know my adventure was about to take a turn, leading me to a discovery that would transform my tranquil escape into a night of unspeakable terror. After what felt like hours of walking, I realized the chirping of birds and rustling leaves were the only companions on my journey. The trail, which had started out so clear and defined, now seemed like a faint memory. I remember thinking, this is what real adventure feels like, as I trudged along the increasingly vague path. The trees seemed to grow closer together, their branches intertwining above, casting intricate shadows on the ground. Every step I took seemed to lead me deeper into an uncharted world. It was exhilarating and, admittedly, a bit frightening. The thrill of exploration was mingling with a creeping sense of isolation. 
I checked my phone for the time and realized it had been a couple of hours since I left my car. I stopped for a moment, taking in the sheer beauty and tranquility of the forest. The sunlight filtering through the leaves painted the ground with a mosaic of light and shadow. I couldn't help but feel small amidst the towering trees, each one seeming to hold centuries of secrets. As I continued, the path became more and more elusive. The once obvious trail now seemed like a puzzle, with me trying to piece together its fragments. The ground was uneven, covered with fallen leaves and branches. I had to watch my step carefully to avoid tripping over hidden roots. At that moment it hit me. I might be getting lost. The initial confidence I had felt was slowly being replaced by a gnawing uncertainty. I should have brought a map, or at least marked my way, I thought. I decided it was best to turn back, hoping to find the more defined portion of the path. But just five minutes into my return journey, something caught my eye. Something so unexpected that it stopped me in my tracks. There, amidst the dense foliage, stood a cabin. It was odd, almost out of place. The wood was weathered, and the structure leaned slightly to one side, as if carrying the weight of untold stories. My first thought was confusion. I hadn't noticed it on my way in. How could I have missed something so significant? Then, a wave of unease washed over me. The cabin had an eerie aura, like it was hiding something sinister within its walls. Curiosity overcame my apprehension, and I approached the cabin slowly. There was no door, just an open doorway that seemed to beckon me. Peering inside, I saw it was a mess, filled with what looked like years of accumulated garbage. Old cans, torn pieces of cloth, and unidentifiable debris littered the floor. The longer I stood there, Looking into the shadowy interior of the cabin, the more the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Something about this place felt wrong, deeply unsettling. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was not alone, that eyes were watching me from the shadows. I took a step back, ready to leave this creepy place behind, when a loud thump echoed from inside the cabin. My heart leaped to my throat. Whirling around, I saw a figure emerge from behind a wall within the cabin. It was a man, middle-aged, with clothes so torn and dirty they seemed to blend into the environment. His face was weather-beaten, and his eyes. His eyes held an emotionless stare that sent shivers down my spine. I stammered a nervous, sorry, my voice barely a whisper, and quickly turned to leave. As I walked away, I couldn't help but glance back. The man was still there, watching me with that same eerie, unblinking gaze. A cold knot of fear settled in my stomach as I hurried back to the trail, the image of the man's haunting stare imprinted in my mind. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a night that would test my courage and haunt my memories for a long time to come. I rushed away from the cabin, my heart pounding in my chest. The image of the man's emotionless stare was etched in my mind, and it fueled my steps. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see him following me, but all I saw were the dense trees and the shadows they cast. My earlier excitement about this solo adventure had completely evaporated, replaced by a gnawing sense of fear. The forest, which had seemed so inviting earlier, now felt like a labyrinth, with every tree looking eerily similar. I realized I had underestimated the wilderness. The trail was hardly visible and I started to doubt whether I was on the right path back to my car. I should have marked my trail, I thought, regretting not bringing any kind of navigation aid. As I stumbled through the underbrush, my mind raced with thoughts about the man in the cabin. Who was he? What was he doing out here, in such a dilapidated place? And most importantly, why did he look at me the way he did? I tried to convince myself that he was just a hermit, living off the grid, but the chill in his gaze suggested something more sinister. I quickened my pace, but the forest seemed to stretch on endlessly. The sun was starting to set, casting long shadows that played tricks on my eyes. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig made me jump. I felt vulnerable, exposed. I was no longer a visitor in this forest. 
I was an intruder in a world that didn't welcome me. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I recognized a part of the trail. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. The sun had dipped below the horizon, and the forest was quickly being enveloped in darkness. I knew I wouldn't be able to make it back to my car before nightfall. Despite my fear and the unsettling encounter, I had no choice but to camp out for the night. I found a relatively clear spot and set up my tent with shaky hands. Every noise made me tense, and I kept glancing around, half expecting to see the man from the cabin lurking in the shadows. Once my tent was up, I crawled inside, not bothering to light a fire or eat. I just wanted to close my eyes and wish away this nightmare. But sleep didn't come easy. My mind replayed the day's events over and over. The isolation I had sought now felt like a trap. I listened to the sounds of the forest, each creak and whisper amplifying my fear. It felt like the forest was alive, watching me, waiting. Then in the dead of night I heard it, a faint rustling outside my tent. My heart stopped. I lay there, holding my breath, listening. The rustling grew louder, closer. I remembered the man's face, his empty eyes. Panic gripped me, and I felt an overwhelming urge to run, but I was frozen, paralyzed by fear. In that moment, lying in my tent, alone in the darkness of the forest, I realized how vulnerable I was. This wasn't just a camping trip anymore. It was a fight for my sanity, maybe even my life. And as the night stretched on, I knew that this was just the beginning of the longest, most terrifying night of my life. There I was, lying in my tent, every sound of the forest magnified in the deafening silence. My heart pounded against my chest, each beat echoing my fear. The rustling outside had stopped, but the dread it instilled lingered. I couldn't shake off the image of the man's cold, emotionless stare. The darkness of the night seemed to press against the thin fabric of the tent, suffocating, ominous. I tried to calm myself, telling myself it was just the wind, just an animal, anything but him. But deep down, I knew the forest had a different story to tell tonight. The once peaceful and inviting woods now felt like a menacing labyrinth, with dangers lurking in every shadow. Every minute felt like an hour as I lay there, waiting for the first hint of dawn. But sleep was a distant dream, chased away by the fear gripping my heart. I had planned to make a fire, cook some food, maybe even enjoy the solitude. But now, all I wanted was to see the sun rise, to escape this nightmare. Then suddenly, a new sound shattered the silence. A soft, deliberate movement just outside the tent. My breath hitched, it was not the random noise of nature, it was something or someone. I remembered the man from the cabin and my blood turned to ice. I lay there, paralyzed, as the sound grew closer. My mind raced with panic. What if he was out there watching, waiting? The thought sent chills down my spine. I should have left when I had the chance. I should have listened to my instincts. The noise stopped, and for a moment everything was silent. Then without warning, the flap of my tent was gently pushed aside. I wanted to scream, to run, but fear held me in its vice-like grip. In the dim light, I saw it, a shadow-covered face peering in, the same haunting eyes from earlier that day. Our gazes locked, and for a moment time stood still. I saw the man's face, so close I could almost feel his breath. Then, as if sensing my terror, he recoiled and disappeared into the night. I heard his hurried footsteps fading into the forest, leaving me alone with my pounding heart. I didn't wait a second longer. With trembling hands I grabbed my bag and hastily dismantled the tent. My only thought was to get away, to put as much distance between me and the cabin, the man, this cursed forest. I stumbled through the darkness, guided only by the faint moonlight and my desperate need to escape. Every sound made me jump every shadow a potential threat, but I kept moving, driven by an instinctive urge to survive. The forest that had once seemed like a sanctuary now felt like a prison. The trees, once majestic and comforting, now stood like silent sentinels, witnessing my plight but offering no solace. 
I had come here seeking adventure, a connection with nature, but I found something else, a primal fear, a confrontation with the unknown. As the first light of dawn began to break through the darkness, I finally saw the outline of the trail leading back to my car. I had made it through the night, but the terror of what happened would stay with me forever. I knew one thing for certain. I would never look at the wilderness the same way again. Dawn was breaking as I finally saw the familiar path leading back to my car. The night had been a blur of fear and adrenaline, each moment etched in my memory like a bad dream. The forest, with its dense trees and unseen dangers, was behind me now. But the fear lingered, a constant reminder of what I had experienced. As I walked, the events of the night replayed in my mind. The man's face, the way he had looked at me through the tent, it was all I could think about. Who was he? What did he want? Questions swirled in my head, unanswered and unsettling. I felt a mix of relief and unease. I was safe, but the mystery of that night would probably never be solved. Reaching my car felt like a huge relief. I threw my backpack into the back seat and didn't waste a moment before driving away from the forest. The sun was fully up now, casting a warm glow over the landscape, but the beauty of the morning light couldn't erase the darkness of the night before. The drive home was a blur. My mind was still in the forest, reliving the terror of the man's face appearing at my tent. I knew I had been lucky to escape, but the feeling of being watched, hunted even, clung to me like a second skin. Once home, I found myself unable to talk about what had happened. I wanted to forget, to push the memories away, but they lingered, haunting my thoughts. I kept wondering about the man in the cabin, his reasons for being there, and what might have happened if I hadn't woken up when I did. Sleep didn't come easy in the nights that followed. I would close my eyes and find myself back in the forest, the man's face looming in the darkness. The safety and comfort of my own bed couldn't shield me from the memories. I realized that this experience had changed me, had shown me a side of the world, and myself, that I couldn't unsee. I had gone into the forest seeking an adventure, a connection with nature, a bit of solitude. Instead I found fear and danger, a brush with something unexplainable and terrifying. The wilderness, which I had always seen as a place of peace and beauty, now held a sense of menace in my mind. The encounter in the forest made me reconsider my desire for solitude. I realized the value of being around others, of not taking safety for granted. My perspective on life and the world around me had shifted. No longer did I yearn for the isolation of the wilderness. Instead, I found comfort in the familiar, in the presence of people. I never went back to that forest, nor did I attempt another solo camping trip. The experience had left a deep imprint on me, a reminder of the unpredictability of nature and the unknown. I learned that some adventures come with risks, and some mysteries are better left unsolved. From then on, I approached life with a new caution, a respect for the unknown. The forest and its secrets would remain just that, a chapter in my life that was closed but never forgotten. Back in high school, my house was special, not because of its size or color, but because of the vast, sprawling backyard that seemed to stretch endlessly into a thick, inviting forest. This forest was the backdrop of my childhood adventures. It was a place of mystery and excitement, a natural playground where my friends and I spent countless hours. As kids, we would race through those woods, our laughter echoing among the trees. We played hide-and-seek, built forts, and imagined ourselves as explorers charting unknown territories. There was always this small sense of danger lurking in the shadowy corners of the woods, but it only added to the thrill. We felt like kings of our own wild domain, fearless and free. But as we grew older, the forest lost its allure. High school brought new interests and distractions. Video games, sports, and homework replaced our woodland escapades. The forest became nothing more than a scenic view from my bedroom window, its mysteries and adventures forgotten. 
That changed one lazy afternoon during junior year. I was sprawled on the couch, aimlessly flipping through channels, when Tyler, my best friend since kindergarten, came over. Tyler was the kind of guy who always had crazy ideas, and that day was no different. Dude, remember how we used to play in the woods? He asked, a nostalgic glint in his eye. Yeah, feels like ages ago, I replied, not sure where he was going with this. We should go back, like tonight. Wouldn't it be wild to camp out there? Tyler's suggestion caught me off guard. Camping? We had never done anything like that. The idea seemed reckless, maybe even a bit foolish. Yet, as I thought about it, excitement bubbled inside me. The forest had been our childhood adventure land, and the thought of revisiting it stirred something within me, a longing for the carefree days and the thrill of a little danger. Our plan evolved quickly from a simple walk in the woods to an overnight camping trip. Tyler mentioned that his parents had an old tent we could use. So, with a sense of adventure rekindled, we walked down to his house to retrieve it. I should mention here that neither Tyler nor I had any real camping experience. Our preparation was laughably inadequate. We packed a bag with snacks, water bottles, and a portable phone charger, our idea of essential camping gear. It didn't occur to us to bring things like a proper flashlight or a map. As the sun began to set, we set off into the woods. Our footsteps crunched on the dry leaves, and the familiar, earthy scent of the forest filled my lungs. For a moment, it felt like stepping back in time. The excitement was palpable between us. We were embarking on a new adventure, a throwback to our childhood but with the independence of our teenage years. However, our nostalgia was soon challenged by reality. The flashlight Tyler brought was pathetic, a dim, flickering light that barely cut through the darkness. It was enough to prevent us from tripping over roots, but not much else. The initial stretch of our journey was filled with banter and laughter, reminiscing about our childhood antics. But as night enveloped the woods, our conversation dwindled. The darkness seemed to swallow the sounds around us, replacing them with an eerie silence. I remember feeling a chill that had nothing to do with the night air. It was the thrill of danger, the kind we used to crave as kids, but now it felt real, tangible, and slightly unnerving. After about 30 minutes of walking, the dense trees gave way to an open section of grass. It was as good a place as any to set up camp. Tyler, ever the optimist, declared it perfect. As he fumbled with the tent under the weak beam of the flashlight, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of regret. What had started as a fun, impulsive idea was quickly turning into an uncertain, perhaps even foolish, endeavor. But there was no turning back now. We were here, in the heart of the woods we once ruled as fearless kids. Only now, the darkness seemed deeper, the silence more ominous. And as we struggled with the tent, every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig, felt like a warning. Little did we know, our night was about to take an even more unsettling turn. The darkness of the forest was a stark contrast to the fading twilight, as Tyler and I ventured deeper into the woods. Our laughs and jokes from earlier had quieted down, replaced by a tense anticipation. The weak beam of the flashlight did little to cut through the night, casting eerie shadows that danced just beyond our sight. Every sound seemed magnified, every rustle in the underbrush a cause for alarm. As we trudged along, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. The forest, once a familiar playground, now felt foreign and intimidating. I remembered the tales we used to tell each other as kids, stories of mysterious creatures and lost travelers. Back then, they were just stories. Now, in the heart of this dark, silent forest, they felt unnervingly real. We should have brought a better flashlight, Tyler muttered, breaking the silence. His voice, usually so full of confidence, had a hint of unease. I nodded, gripping the strap of my backpack tighter. We were both beginning to realize that our adventure might have been a bit too impulsive. Finally, after what felt like hours but was probably only about 30 minutes, we found a spot that seemed suitable for camping. It was a small clearing, surrounded by trees that stood like silent sentinels in the dark. 
The grass was soft underfoot, a small comfort in the otherwise daunting environment. Setting up the tent was another challenge. The instructions made it sound easy, but in the darkness, with only a feeble flashlight and our limited experience, it felt like a Herculean task. We fumbled with the poles and fabric, our movements clumsy and uncoordinated. Every few minutes we paused, spooked by a sudden noise or a rustling in the bushes. I swear, if a bear comes out of nowhere, I'm blaming you for this, I joked nervously, trying to lighten the mood. Tyler chuckled, but the laughter was short-lived. We both knew that the possibility of encountering wildlife was real, and the thought wasn't comforting. After what seemed like an eternity, we finally managed to get the tent standing. It was lopsided and the fabric sagged in places, but it was shelter, shelter from the unknown, from the darkness that seemed to press in on us from all sides. Exhausted, we crawled inside, zipping the entrance shut. The tent felt like a sanctuary, albeit a flimsy one. We sat in silence, listening to the sounds of the forest. There were moments when everything was eerily still, and then suddenly, the night would come alive with the chirping of crickets or the distant hoot of an owl. It was in one of those silent moments that we heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps. They were slow, deliberate, unmistakably human. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could see Tyler's eyes widen in the dim light. Did you hear that? He whispered. I nodded, unable to find my voice. We listened, holding our breaths, as the footsteps seemed to circle our campsite. They weren't hurried or aggressive, but their steady measured pace was somehow more frightening. Who would be walking in the forest at this hour? The footsteps faded, then stopped altogether. The silence that followed was suffocating. We sat there, frozen, not daring to move or speak. The reality of our situation was suddenly very clear. We were alone, unprepared, and vulnerable in the vast, dark woods. That night, the forest no longer felt like our old playground. It had transformed into a place of uncertainty and fear, where every shadow held a threat and every sound a warning. As we sat there in our lopsided tent, the thrill of adventure was replaced by a growing sense of dread, and I couldn't help but wonder if coming here had been a terrible mistake. The darkness outside our tent seemed to press against the fabric, a tangible reminder of our vulnerability. Inside, Tyler and I sat in silence, the only sound our shallow breaths, and the occasional rustle of nylon as we shifted. The flashlight, now placed between us, cast a weak, flickering light its beam feeble against the overwhelming blackness of the night. Every little noise seemed amplified in the silence of the forest. The wind whispered through the trees, a sound that was once comforting, but now felt like a warning. I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone. My imagination, fueled by the stories we used to tell each other as kids, conjured images of shadowy figures lurking just beyond our sight. The earlier encounter with the footsteps had left us on edge. They were too deliberate, too human to be any forest animal. I tried to convince myself that it could have been a deer or some other harmless creature, but the steady bipedal rhythm of the steps echoed in my mind, refusing to be dismissed. Tyler broke the silence. You think someone's out there? His voice was a mere whisper, laced with a fear I felt echoing in my own chest. I don't know, I admitted, but it's weird, right? Why would anyone be out here this late? We pondered the possibilities, maybe another group of campers, a forest ranger, or something more sinister. The unknown was more frightening than any definitive answer. As the night wore on, the tension in the tent was palpable. We spoke in hushed tones, our conversation revolving around what we should do. Leaving seemed like the obvious choice, but the thought of venturing out into the dark, unknown forest was daunting. So we stayed, trapped by our own fear. The forest seemed to come alive at times, and then fall eerily silent. In one of those moments of quiet, the footsteps returned. They were distant at first, but gradually grew closer. My heart raced, and I could see Tyler's face, pale in the dim light, his eyes wide with fear. This time the footsteps didn't circle around us. They stopped abruptly, somewhere nearby. 
The silence that followed was oppressive. I strained my ears, trying to pick up any sound, but there was nothing. It was as if whoever, or whatever, was out there had vanished into thin air. We sat there, paralyzed, not daring to move or make a sound. Minutes ticked by, each one stretching out endlessly. The tension was unbearable. I wanted to scream, to run, to do anything but sit there in that suffocating silence. Eventually, Tyler reached for the flashlight. We should check, he said, his voice barely audible. I nodded, my mouth dry. The thought of unzipping the tent and looking out into the darkness was terrifying, but the not knowing was worse. With a trembling hand, Tyler unzipped the tent. The cool night air rushed in, carrying with it the earthy smell of the forest. We peered out, the flashlight's beam cutting through the darkness, but there was nothing, just trees and shadows and the night. We zipped the tent back up, the sense of unease still clinging to us. Neither of us spoke. We just sat there, listening to the sounds of the night, each one a reminder of our isolation and vulnerability. That night, every creak of a branch, every rustle of leaves, felt like a threat. We were intruders in a world that didn't want us, surrounded by an unseen presence that watched and waited. The adventure we had sought was nowhere to be found, replaced instead by a primal fear that clung to us, as tangible and suffocating as the darkness itself. The night in the forest grew deeper, colder, and more unnerving with each passing hour. Tyler and I, huddled in our poorly constructed tent, were a bundle of raw nerves. The sense of being watched, of an unseen presence lurking just beyond the frail shelter of our tent, was overwhelming. We couldn't shake the feeling that something or someone was out there in the darkness. After what seemed like an eternity of sitting in silence, punctuated by the occasional distant rustle or snap, Tyler whispered, We can't just stay in here all night. I knew he was right, but the idea of stepping out into the unknown was terrifying. However, the thought of remaining in our vulnerable state, trapped inside the tent, was equally daunting. With a deep breath, we made the decision to face whatever was out there. Unzipping the tent, we stepped into the chilling night, the cool air brushed against my skin, raising goosebumps. The forest was a vast expanse of darkness, the trees like silent sentinels watching over us. Our weak flashlight seemed even more inadequate out in the open, barely piercing the dense blackness. We sat close to each other, our backs to the tent, trying to cover as much area with our limited light as possible. Our conversation was minimal, our senses heightened to every sound and movement around us. We tried to convince each other that it was probably just an animal or our imagination running wild, but the fear, once rooted, was hard to shake off. Then, it happened. The same sound we had heard before, the unmistakable sound of footsteps, began in the distance. This time, they were getting closer. Each step seemed deliberate, measured. My heart raced and I could feel Tyler's tension mirroring my own. As the footsteps approached, the night seemed to grow even quieter, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. The sound stopped abruptly, leaving a deafening silence in its wake. We strained our eyes into the darkness, the flashlight's beam trembling in Tyler's hand. The silence stretched on, and then, just as suddenly, the footsteps resumed. But they weren't retreating. They were coming directly towards us. Panic surged through me. My mind raced with thoughts of who or what could be approaching us in the middle of the night. In the middle of the woods. Tyler shone the flashlight in the direction of the sound, but it was futile. The light fell short of penetrating the thick darkness. The footsteps continued, slow and steady, until they were alarmingly close. We could hear the faint sound of breathing, just beyond the reach of our light. Frozen in fear, we sat there, staring into the void, waiting for something to emerge from the shadows. But nothing did. The breathing stopped, and there was a moment where the tension peaked. A moment where I felt that anything could happen. Then, the footsteps began to recede. The sound grew fainter and fainter until it disappeared altogether, leaving us alone in the silence once again. We didn't speak. We didn't need to. The decision was unspoken, but mutual. 
We had to leave. We hastily dismantled the tent, our movements frantic and uncoordinated. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, propelling me forward as we grabbed our things and fled through the woods. The journey back was a blur, a panicked, desperate escape from an unseen terror. We stumbled and tripped over roots and branches, our only thought to put as much distance as possible between us and the forest. The forest, once a place of adventure and wonder, had turned into a nightmare. As we emerged onto a neighboring street, far from where we had intended to exit, the reality of our situation set in. We had been scared, threatened by something we couldn't even see. The night's events were a harsh lesson in recklessness and fear, one that would stay with us for a long time. Exhausted, shaken, and drenched in a cold sweat, Tyler and I finally emerged from the forest, finding ourselves on a neighboring street. The surreal feeling of being back in the familiar, yet somehow alien surroundings of our neighborhood contrasted sharply with the wild, oppressive darkness we had just fled. Our hearts still pounded in our chests, our breaths coming in ragged gasps as we tried to process what had just happened. We walked in silence towards my house, the streetlights casting long, eerie shadows that made us flinch. Every sound, every movement around us was a potential threat. Our minds were still trapped in the forest, in the terror of the unknown. Reaching my house felt like crossing into a sanctuary. The familiar walls, the soft glow of the lights, it all seemed incredibly comforting after the night we had endured. We went straight to my room, not wanting to wake my parents and have to explain our disheveled, panicked state. Once inside, we sat on the floor, our backs against my bed. The safety of my room did little to ease the knot of fear that had settled in our stomachs. We talked in hushed tones about what had happened, each of us trying to make sense of it. Who do you think it was? Tyler asked, his voice still carrying a tremor of fear. I don't know, I replied. But it was someone, right? It couldn't have been. I mean, it wasn't something else. We debated the possibilities, from a prankster to a homeless person, or perhaps a hunter. But none of the theories seemed to fit. The deliberate way the footsteps had approached us, then stopped just out of sight. And the eerie way they had retreated, it was all too strange, too frightening. The night dragged on, and neither of us could sleep. Every little noise made us jump, a reminder of the unseen presence in the woods. The adventure we had sought turned out to be a nightmare, one that neither of us had been prepared for. As dawn broke, the first rays of sunlight filtering through my window, the events of the night began to feel like a distant bad dream. But the fear, the feeling of being watched, it lingered. We're never doing that again, Tyler said as we watched the sunrise. It was a statement, not a question, and I nodded in agreement. The experience changed something in both of us. The forest, once a place of wonder and adventure, was now a source of fear. We had sought a thrill, a taste of danger, but we found more than we bargained for. In the days that followed, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. I avoided the backyard, the sight of the forest line bringing back memories of that night. I wondered about the unseen stranger, about what could have happened if they had decided to step into the light. The mystery of who or what was in the woods that night remained unsolved, a haunting question that lingered in the back of my mind. I learned a valuable lesson about recklessness and the real dangers that lurk in the shadows of adventure. As for the woods, they remained untouched, a silent brooding presence at the edge of my backyard, a reminder of the night when our search for adventure turned into a chilling encounter with the unknown. Four years ago, I found myself in a peculiar living arrangement. I was staying in my friend's house while attending a nearby university. The household consisted of my friend, his sister, and their parents. Everything seemed normal at the beginning, but little did I know that this story would take a chilling turn. Around two weeks into my stay, my friend's sister invited her boyfriend to move in with us. Initially, he appeared to be a friendly and sociable guy, always sharing fascinating stories and engaging in lively conversations. 
We'd often gather around the dining table for drinks or unwind in the garden while puffing on cigarettes. Life seemed pleasant. However, as time passed, the cracks in his seemingly normal veneer began to show. He started ranting about government conspiracies, portraying himself as a perpetual victim. He was deeply engrossed in the bizarre concept of Sigma male and was obsessed with martial arts. But what was most alarming was his explosive temper. This guy also had a menacing dog, which he inexplicably kept locked in a cage. When he wasn't around, the dog's violent tendencies became evident. One day, it attacked his girlfriend, and the poor creature had to be euthanized. That's when the guilt-tripping and incessant rants against her began. Around two months later, he hatched an audacious plan to live in a shipping container. This wasn't one of those chic, trendy shipping container homes. It was a rented container in a storage yard on the outskirts of town. He relentlessly intimidated and threatened the staff there, which eventually led to the police being called. Of course, he believed this was yet another conspiracy against him. His abuse towards his girlfriend escalated to horrifying levels, prompting her family to intervene and get her out of that nightmarish situation. Throughout this ordeal, I had to pretend to be on his side, just to ensure her safety. When they finally broke up, he blamed me, accusing me of poisoning her against him and conspiring to make her mine. She eventually found a new partner, and they seemed happy together. After that ordeal, we all blocked the Psycho X on every form of communication possible. However, he continued to harass them relentlessly, until, eventually, he seemed to vanish from our lives. Fast forward to last year. I began receiving messages on social media from various accounts, some friendly and some hostile. It was only after some digging that I discovered who was behind these messages. I blocked each account as I encountered them. One of these profiles, though, was pretending to be someone I knew from university. We began chatting about life, reminiscing about old times, and eventually I was invited to a house party. The invitation came with the promise of a free house and a gathering of friends. Excited, I booked time off from work and made travel plans, all while maintaining my conversations with this friend. As the date of the party approached, I mentioned it to my friend's sister, who also expressed interest in attending. However, when I shared the address of the supposed party location, she suddenly panicked. The address was a property belonging to the crazy ex-boyfriend's father, which was scheduled for sale. I decided to wait until the day of the party and called the police, claiming a suspected break-in at that address. What they found sent shivers down my spine. There were five people inside the house, including the sinister ex. Parked out front was a butcher van, equipped with food storage facilities, and a collection of knives, hammers, and rope. Let's just say, I'm eternally grateful that I didn't attend that party. It was a nightmarish rendezvous I never want to experience. In 2019, I lived in the Humble Park neighborhood of Chicago with my partner and our loyal German Shepherd. At the time, I was 34 years old and we occupied a fourth-floor walk-up unit in a typical low-budget Chicago rental in a neighborhood undergoing change. Our building played a crucial role in the events that unfolded. It had a total of 15 units, with mine and the three below sharing a front entrance. The other units had a separate entrance. What connected all 15 apartments were the back porches and stairs that led to a walkway ending at a rear gate, which opened into an alley. The front stairwell had windows on each landing, allowing you to see the back door of my apartment when standing at the front door. Living in our building meant having good relations with our neighbors, especially those directly below us who shared our front door. This bond would ultimately become our lifeline. However, my life was marred by a dark history. In my teens and twenties, I had been hurt and stalked by my ex making me live in constant fear that he might resurface in my life. A little less than a month before my partner's upcoming tour, I received a creepy Facebook message from my old stalker, sent from yet another new account. About a week later, my car was broken into. Though the thief only took a bag of dog treats, 
leaving behind some cash in the glove box. My heightened anxiety led me to set up cameras and purchase door braces for both my front and back doors before my partner left for his tour. I became entirely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor German shepherd also suffered from stress-induced diarrhea, which meant frequent trips down four flights of stairs during the night. During these late-night dog outings, I often felt a prickly, crawling sensation as if I were being watched. But in the midst of my fear and paranoia, distinguishing between genuine threats and my own imagination became increasingly difficult. I also noticed that some of my neighbors weren't closing the front door properly, leaving the lock unengaged. I brought this up with my downstairs neighbor one day, explaining my concerns about the stalker. He was supportive and promised to mention it to the other neighbors, and I did notice a positive change. Then came that fateful Sunday morning when my partner returned from his tour. Around 8.30 a.m., our first floor neighbor's apartment was burglarized. He was a metalhead who collected instruments and sold drugs, and he lived alone. Apparently, he had left his door unlocked while he went out for breakfast, and the intruder helped themselves to his food, a coat, and a pair of boots, leaving behind a filthy coat in exchange. Strangely, they took his college diploma, but left $500 and all his expensive musical instruments and equipment. They also left behind the drugs, but took a set of keys, including a master key to the front door and the back gate. My neighbors quickly informed each other about the break-in, especially considering my stalker history. The metalhead neighbor came up to let me know about the incident, and my partner had just returned when he knocked at the front door. We stood on the stairs, chatting for about 15 to 20 minutes, when we suddenly heard the front door open and close below us. Initially, we didn't think much of it, but then we saw a man climbing the back porch steps toward my apartment. He had to pass all 14 other accessible units to reach mine, and it was evident that he wasn't going to any other apartment. He wasn't my stalker, but his image is seared into my memory. The stranger wore flashy black and white high-top sneakers, not the ones stolen from downstairs. His oversized black coat hung loosely from his shoulders. Our eyes locked through the window, and he froze on the porch stairs. Slowly, he pulled out a cell phone and made a call while turning halfway up the steps. Then, he began descending with artificial nonchalance before sprinting as soon as he reached the porch below mine. My neighbor immediately dialed 911, and my partner and I rushed through the apartment to the back porch. We spotted a sedan and a windowless van speeding out of a sketchy building two doors down. Unfortunately, we didn't get their license plate numbers, and the police later explained that they couldn't intervene as no crime had been committed. The police condescendingly reasoned that there was nothing concrete to justify stopping the vehicles. My neighbor made the call and had the police report, while my partner and I were merely considered witnesses. But what haunted me the most was the tool my neighbor found when he went downstairs. A two by four piece of wood cut to about two feet in length with about six inches turned into a handle, resembling a paddle. It puzzled me for a while until I realized it was likely a ram used to force open doors and jam locks. Examining my door, it seemed like it had been repaired, as if someone had broken in before. It became apparent that they had intended to use that one master key to place their ram and catch me at the back door, while someone else would break in through the front. Luckily, we caught them before they could execute their plan, and I believe they had been closely watching my movements, waiting for an opportunity. It was sheer luck that my partner had arrived home just 30 minutes before this terrifying ordeal unfolded. In hindsight, we could have been seriously injured or worse had they managed to trap us inside. No further incidents occurred, but my landlord refused to change the locks. Nevertheless, he agreed to let us out of our lease, and I decided to leave Chicago behind, moving to a new place equipped with cameras floodlights, and vigilant neighbors. Now, I've also added a younger dog trained in bite work to my life, ensuring that I'm better prepared to protect myself and my home. It's been about 12 years since that chilling incident, but the memory still lingers vividly in my mind. I should mention that this story is recounted from my perspective, 
and while I've tried to get my mother's perspective on it, her recollection of the events isn't as clear as mine. For context, we lived in a mid-sized city in the southern United States, where the main pastime was going to the mall. Sure, we had movie theaters and a couple of bowling alleys, but besides that, there wasn't much else to do in the city. My mother worked at a department store located within the mall, and since I had nothing better to do, I would regularly accompany her to work. It gave me a reason to get out of the house, and if I wanted to, I was allowed to walk around the mall or grab a snack in the food court. However, I was quite shy and preferred to stay cooped up in the break room, losing myself in video games on my trusty Nintendo DS. My mother's co-workers were generally very kind to me. They often popped into the break room to say hello or check on me during their downtime. If I was lucky enough to go with my mom on weekends, I could usually convince her to pick up my friend. Well, we were actually dating. But since we were both girls, I didn't want that to become public knowledge. Going to the mall meant I was free from doing chores at home, and it was a cheap way to sneak in a secret date every now and then. My girlfriend, however, never really liked staying in the break room with me. She always wanted to walk around the mall. Now, I should note that she really enjoyed taking walks, so it wasn't unusual for her to want to do so at the mall as well. I, on the other hand, wasn't as fond of walking, so I tried to avoid it whenever I could. I could usually convince her to browse a nearby store or grab something from the food court instead of walking. However, I quickly noticed that she wasn't trying to get me to walk. She just didn't want me in the break room. My girlfriend was more perceptive than I was, and I assumed she just didn't like the ambiance of the break room for some reason. After a while, my frustration got the better of me, and I finally asked her directly what was bothering her about the break room. I thought she might mention the cramped space or the erratic lighting, both of which bothered me too. However, her response was far more unsettling. She said she heard things in the ceiling, as if someone was walking around up there, I recalled from my conversations with my mother that there was indeed a space in the ceiling, but it was meant for maintenance purposes. It contained wiring and insulation, but technically, someone could access it. I tried to reassure my girlfriend that it was probably just an employee up there fixing something, but her discomfort remained. Later that day, I mentioned what my girlfriend had told me to my mother. She looked distressed and informed me that no one had been up there fixing anything that day. Still, she wanted me to see something. She led me to the receiving room of the department store, a room filled with boxes and assorted items the store was preparing to put up for sale. The layout of the room was an L-shape, with one part used for receiving merchandise and the other part serving as an entry point to the ceiling. To clarify, to access the ceiling, the store would need to call the mall's maintenance team since they didn't have a ladder or equipment on hand for such tasks due to safety concerns. In this particular area, there was only a hatch leading into the ceiling. What I saw next sent shivers down my spine, claw marks that appeared to lead up the wall towards the hatch. I can still remember the way those marks looked, brown gashes gouged into the concrete wall of the receiving room. My initial thought was that it might be some sort of prank, but my mother assured me that it wasn't. These strange markings had appeared several times over the course of a few months. Each time the store would call in mall security and the maintenance team to clean the wall and investigate the ceiling. However, nothing ever came of their searches, and they eventually gave up dealing with the enigmatic marks. Mall security's only explanation was that it was likely a homeless individual who had somehow made their way into the ceiling, displaying an uncanny ability to hide during the searches. The revelation left me deeply unsettled. I stopped staying at the mall with my mom after that, and when my girlfriend wanted to meet, we found alternative places to go during the day. Sometimes she'd come over to my house to watch TV or do other activities, but I couldn't bring myself to return to that break room. Nothing had happened up until that point, but I simply didn't want to take the risk. So, to whoever or whatever was walking around in the ceiling at my mom's workplace, I sincerely hope our paths never cross again. The mystery of those claw marks still haunts me to this day, a chilling reminder of the unsettling events that transpired in that mid-sized southern city mall.
I've spent my whole life in the mountains of Northeast Pennsylvania, immersing myself in the wilds, hunting, fishing, and camping. I've encountered almost all the wildlife this state has to offer, but I've always believed there are many mysterious things out there, lurking beyond our understanding. It was late summer in 2016 when this eerie incident took place, a memory that still sends shivers down my spine. My ex-wife, who shall remain nameless, had grown up in the streets of Trenton, New Jersey, and had never experienced the joys of camping. My family decided to introduce her to our rural lifestyle with a weekend camping trip in my parents' backyard. To be clear, it wasn't exactly roughing it since we'd be staying in a pop-up camper just 25 yards from my parents' cottage. Most of the weekend was delightful, filled with fishing, hiking, swimming, and campfires with toasted marshmallows. It was just the four of us, my family, my ex-wife, and our two lab mixes, Cosmo and Max. We had already spent two nights in that cozy camper, and this was supposed to be the last night. My father, a salt-of-the-earth kind of guy, had warned us about an incoming rainstorm, but we chuckled it off, excited at the prospect of sleeping through a thunderstorm. The idea of the rain drumming on the camper's roof sounded pleasant. We said our good nights, tucked the dogs in, and prepared for sleep. My ex-wife and I briefly reminisced about the wonderful weekend before drifting into slumber. We had spent the day swimming and were utterly exhausted. Sometime around midnight, I awoke, but it was hard to pinpoint the exact time. The camper rocked gently, and distant thunder rumbled ominously. I closed my eyes, attempting to go back to sleep, but I was abruptly yanked from slumber by a deafening crack of thunder. It rattled the camper, shaking it violently. My wife and I both bolted upright, and the dog started barking frantically as rain pounded down on us like bullets. We began discussing our next steps, assuming my parents were coming to wake us and advise us to seek shelter in the house. We're on our way, my ex-wife yelled out over the cacophony. The dogs, especially Cosmo, who weighed a solid 125 pounds in his prime, had already cowered under the table, joining the skittish Max. Suddenly, something struck the camper door with an incredible force, rocking the little pop-up. We both screamed as the camper tilted to one side, as though something was trying to pull it down. A loud bang came from the roof, suggesting that something had landed on it. It was pitch black outside, which struck me as odd because the yard light sensors should have activated it. The dogs were barking ferociously as my wife began sobbing uncontrollably. In the darkness, I whispered to my wife, I'll send the dogs out first, then you follow. Run to the house for Dad, and don't stop for anything. She continued to cry, but I could barely see her nod in agreement. I flung the camper door open and yelled, Cosmo, Max, go. They obeyed without hesitation, bolting into the night. I stepped out, unarmed, but then I remembered the hatchet my father used for the campfire. It lay just a few feet away, and I grabbed it as my wife ran towards the house, screaming. Finally, the motion-sensing lights illuminated the yard, revealing the downpour and the surrounding area. I looked around in horror, but there was nothing there. Just rain and wind. My father had been roused from his sleep and had rushed to the back porch in his underwear. But whatever had attacked the camper and leaped onto the roof had mysteriously vanished. The camper itself was surrounded by a small patch of trees, and there were no low-hanging branches. I would have heard or seen something drop from a tree, but there was nothing. Shaken, I went inside to tell my dad and mom what had happened. My dad, a firm non-believer in the supernatural or paranormal, dismissed my fears, suggesting it was probably just large raccoons. He admonished me for getting so worked up over what he assumed were tree rodents. However, he promised to investigate in the morning. Needless to say, None of us got any sleep that night. As the first light of dawn broke, we ventured outside. I recounted my story, trying to convey the sheer terror we had experienced. I demonstrated how the camper remained solid as I jumped up and down on it, with no sway whatsoever. It couldn't have been the wind. I even tried to rock it myself, 
and I'm a sturdy six foot one, weighing 230 pounds, but still, it remained rock solid. The most chilling discovery was when my dad fetched a ladder to inspect the roof. Above the door, we found four long fingerprints etched into the algae-covered surface. Dad, I said, pointing at the prints, look at these. Those fingers are at least seven inches long. He just shook his head and returned to the safety of the house. Now I know it wasn't the wind, and it certainly wasn't a raccoon. To this day, I have no idea what paid us that mysterious visit on that summer night. But I'm grateful whatever it was didn't stick around to reveal its true nature. Five years ago, in the dense Ozark forests of Missouri, I embarked on a hunting expedition during the rifle season of 2018. I was a 20-year-old, just on the brink of turning 21, and my father had decided to join me as a birthday present. It was a rare occasion for us to spend quality time together because he was always occupied with work. I had eagerly prepared for the trip the week before, and on that fateful morning, I was filled with anticipation. However, my excitement was abruptly shattered by a phone call from my mother. She informed me that my dad had fallen sick and wouldn't be able to make it to our hunting trip. I was devastated by the news, but after some contemplation I decided to go ahead with the hunt. After all, I had invested so much time and effort into preparing for it, and it seemed like a waste to back out now. I readied myself, grabbed my trusty rifle, and hopped into my pickup truck. The sky was pitch black when I arrived at my designated hunting stand. It was crucial for hunters like me to reach their stands before dawn to avoid startling any deer that might be lurking nearby. As I settled into my stand, the world around me was shrouded in darkness. The crisp, cold air nipped at my skin, and I could hear the distant sounds of the forest coming to life. In an attempt to pass the time, I decided to close my eyes briefly. But in the world of hunting, every sense must remain alert. It was during this momentary lapse that I heard something that sent a chill down my spine. Footsteps. They were slow and deliberate, and more alarmingly, they sounded distinctly bipedal. My heart quickened as I strained to listen. The footsteps were heavy, unnatural, and wholly unsettling. Having spent my entire life in the Ozarks, I considered myself a seasoned woodsman. I had grown up in these forests, often accompanying my parents on outdoor adventures. Yet, what I was hearing now was far from ordinary. This was no animal or fellow hunter. This was something altogether eerie and unnatural. Suddenly, my father's voice pierced through the darkness, calling out to me, Daughter, I've come to hunt with you. Where are you? The voice was wrong in so many ways. My father was known for his jovial and carefree nature. He wouldn't simply call out like that especially since he knew the exact location of our deer stand, a spot we had never changed due to its consistent success. What unsettled me most was the emotionless monotone quality of his voice. It sounded robotic, almost as if it were a recording. My heart pounded in my chest as I sat there, eyes wide open, scanning the inky blackness of the forest. A dreadful feeling gnawed at me as I began to entertain a haunting possibility. I had heard stories, chilling tales of wendigos, skinwalkers, and other supernatural entities that could mimic the voices of loved ones. Panic clawed at my insides as I realized the perilous situation I might be in. I remained motionless, trying to control my breathing, while my eyes darted nervously through the dark. Every rustle of leaves and every snap of a twig sent shivers down my spine. I was trapped in my stand, helpless and my trusty rifle suddenly felt like a frail defense. Then, I gasped softly, my breath catching in my throat. A shadowy figure emerged from the blackness. Its form was indistinct, but I could make out unnaturally long arms that brushed against the forest floor with each heavy step. It moved with a strange, almost mechanical gait, repeating the same eerie refrain. Daughter, I've come to hunt with you. Can you tell me where you are? I remained in my tree stand, frozen in terror, until the first faint hints of dawn began to break the darkness. It felt like an eternity before I dared to climb down from my perch. Even then, 
Every step I took through the forest felt like an eternity. I had an overpowering sense of being watched, of unseen eyes tracking my every move. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves intensified my anxiety. Finally, I reached my pickup truck. My heart still raced as I fumbled for my keys and started the engine. I glanced into the rearview mirror and what I saw seared into my memory. A tall, pale figure leaned out from behind a tree, observing me with a malevolent gaze. It emitted an angry, otherworldly scream that chilled me to the bone. Instinctively, I let go of the steering wheel, covering my ears, before regaining control and swerving to avoid colliding with a tree. My heart hammered in my chest as I drove home as fast as I could. When I arrived, I recounted the harrowing events in my mind, trying to make sense of what had happened. This experience didn't diminish my love for the woods, but it did open my eyes to the fact that there are mysterious and malevolent forces lurking within the familiar wilderness. Thankfully, my dad recovered from his illness, and we returned to hunting together the following year. I've kept this story to myself for years, as my parents had always dismissed such cryptic topics with laughter. Now, as I share this tale, it feels like a heavy burden lifted from my shoulders. Regardless of how well one thinks they know their hunting grounds, there are entities in the wild that can challenge even the most seasoned outdoorsman's perception of the world they thought they knew. Nestled in the uncharted depths of Tennessee's rugged mountains, my home is a realm of secrets unknown to many. Vast hills, imposing cliffs, and seemingly endless hollows stretch far beyond state borders, concealing a rich tapestry of history unbeknownst to most outsiders. The story I'm about to share delves into one such concealed narrative. In this remote expanse, there exists a section of forest-blanketed mountains known to the locals as Hoboken Mountain. Yet, to the natives entrenched in the region, they refer to it as the forest that takes. This place is shrouded in mystique, echoing a tale that transcends mere names and taps into a hidden history, veiled beneath the shadows of ancient hills and cliffs that seem to stretch into eternity. Long ago, colonists ventured deeper into unexplored territories, their aspirations fixated on the coveted expanse now currently known as Hoboken Mountain. Extensive surveys of the region unveiled a panorama of allure, a wealth of animals, abundant resources, and fertile grounds promising bountiful harvests. This mountainous haven not only satisfied their immediate needs, but strategically positioned became a linchpin for further settlements. The colonists, driven by dreams of prosperity, saw in Hoboken Mountain not merely a plot of land, but a key to unlocking the untold potential of their burgeoning community. During this era, the indigenous people and the newly arrived colonists existed in a state of mutual coexistence. However, as news spread of the colonists' intentions to settle in the foothills of Hoboken Mountain, a shift in the delicate cohabitation occurred. The native inhabitants, rather than adopting a hostile stance, chose a path of caution and concern, sensing an impending disturbance. They earnestly warned the newcomers to steer clear of that particular terrain their voices carrying wisdom rooted in fear and superstition for the darkness that lingered in Hoboken Mountain. Unfazed by warnings and superstitions, the resolute colonists, driven by prospects, forged ahead with their settlement construction. Occasional skirmishes with native groups and sabotage motivated by fear of the ominous consequences of trespassing on the cursed ground failed to impede their progress. Undeterred, the settlers successfully constructed their settlement, laying the foundation for the founding of a town. Numerous tales shroud the generations during which this settlement endured, none of them positive, and all lacking any corroborating evidence. The lore weaves a dense narrative of misfortune, otherworldly affliction, and mysterious disappearances. Depending on the storyteller, the consensus emerges that the settlement was ultimately abandoned, surrendered to the relentless embrace of the encroaching forest. Presently, locals caution against venturing near those woods. While not everyone heeds the warning, any seasoned hunter understands the unspoken wisdom. Avoid those woods, and if you go, do so in a group. The unwritten rule for Hoboken Mountain is clear. 
Never defy the rule of two. Always ensure you're in a pair or more, never fewer. In the summer of 1998, I foolishly defied the cardinal rule. While the Amazon is dubbed the Green Inferno, those acquainted with the Tennessee mountains in summer would argue it's the true Green Inferno. An expansive realm of mountains and trees. Once inside, the sky vanishes, and orientation fades. Raised in these woods, I'd hunted them for years, familiar with the Hoboken mountain range. However, that summer marked my first solo expedition, originally planned with three fellow hunters, unforeseen circumstances left me alone. Ignoring better judgment and swayed by misplaced confidence, I ventured into the woods alone. Driving my truck down the dirt road leading to the Hoboken Forest entry, I left it at the road's end, commencing my trek. Standing at the precipice where dirt met tree line, the forest seemed to hold its breath in anticipation as I crossed the threshold into the woods embarking on the track to a familiar hunting spot, a location of past success that required a two-hour hike. Initially, the forest teemed with life, birds, bugs, squirrels, the vibrant symphony of nature. However, as I delved deeper, an unsettling unease settled in. Despite knowing the terrain well, I felt an unnatural disconnect with my surroundings. The cliché sensation of being watched manifested profoundly on this hike, with about 30 minutes remaining, I decided to pause, settling on a rock for a sip of coffee from my thermos. I glanced down and discovered several drops of blood on a leaf. Realization struck as I recognized the source, a cut on my arm. The scene took an eerie turn as a flock of butterflies gracefully descended, landing on the leaf and engaging in a bizarre struggle over probing the blood droplets with their proboscis. Lost in a surreal trance, I gazed at the bizarre butterflies. A sudden snap jolted me, but as I turned there was nothing. When I looked back, both the butterflies and the blood droplets had vanished. Shrugging off the ominous feeling, I pressed on with my hike. Reaching the spot where we had set up a deer stand years earlier, I found myself overlooking a picturesque clearing cut through by a stream flowing down from the mountain. The scene was enchanting a perfect spot to patiently await a deer. Within an hour, a massive buck emerged into the clearing. Slowly raising my rifle and peering through the scope, I had him in my crosshairs when he abruptly jerked his head towards the tree line. Something had spooked him, and he bolted before I could take the shot. Swinging my scope towards the disturbance, I observed movement in the bushes, a pinkish blur that gradually revealed itself. What emerged was beyond horror, my heart and lungs seemed to halt in fear. In the clearing stood a naked, dirt-covered duplicate of myself, staring directly up at me with a malevolent, gaping smile of rotted, blackened teeth. Lowering my gun, I aimed to scrutinize the naked figure of myself with my own eyes, without the distance of the scope potentially distorting my observation. However, in the brief span it took for me to lower the scope and my eyes to adjust, it simply vanished. Disturbed and disoriented, I sat frozen. The forest, once filled with the lively chorus of nature, now felt oppressive and eerily silent. The unsettling encounter left me grappling with my own sanity. I cautiously descended into the clearing with my rifle in hand, where the bizarre apparition had stood. The air seemed charged with an otherworldly energy, every hair on my body stood on end, a primal fear enveloping me. I felt hunted akin to the buck. Suddenly, a human-like guttural roar echoed from beyond the tree line. Without hesitation, I turned and sprinted. The dense forest, once familiar, now felt like an ominous labyrinth closing in on me. As I covered the two-hour hike in nearly half the time, gasping for breath, I emerged from the trees onto the dirt road. My hands planted on my truck's hood, as if seeking refuge in a twisted game of tag. In my peripheral vision, a massive black form shifted behind a tree in the direction I'd exited the woods. Glancing back, I saw a single hand, grotesquely human in form, clung to the bark before vanishing behind the tree. I hastily climbed into my truck, leaving a trail of dust in my wake. Putting Hoboken Mountain in my rearview mirror, the encounter was unlike anything I've ever faced before or since that day. 
while I struggle to fully comprehend or accept what happened, I'll share this insight. The world harbors ancient mysteries, even still in modern times. And in those aged corners, relics of a long-forgotten world may stir and come to life. Beware of old places with old tales, for those stories may linger on, very much alive. I'm a mid-twenties female, and tonight I found myself at the local grocery store at around 5 p.m. The winter evening was already starting to cast long shadows, and the darkness was creeping in faster than I'd anticipated. I was leisurely strolling through one of the store's narrow aisles, trying to decide between various product options. As I perused the shelves, a sense of unease began to settle in the pit of my stomach. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a man who appeared to be in his late twenties or early thirties. He had light features, glasses perched on his nose, and a scruffy beard. He had casually sidled up right next to me, and at first I dismissed it as mere coincidence. People often shared the same shopping aisles after all. However, what struck me as peculiar was the fact that he wasn't moving or reaching for any items on the shelves. He was just standing there uncomfortably close. I decided to steal a quick glance in his direction, and to my surprise, our eyes locked. It was as if he had been watching me all along, and my heart skipped a beat. For a moment, I entertained the thought that he might speak to me, but when he remained silent, I felt an inexplicable chill run down my spine. Without wasting another second, I hastily turned and walked away from the strange man. My mind raced with questions and anxiety, trying to dismiss the encounter as mere awkwardness on his part. Perhaps he didn't know how to initiate a conversation with a woman. That was the narrative I told myself. However, my relief was short-lived. Barely thirty seconds later, as I had moved on to another aisle, I caught a glimpse of him out of the corner of my eye. He was once again approaching, his eyes fixated on me. Panic surged through my veins as I realized that this couldn't be mere coincidence. I increased my pace, feeling his unwavering gaze follow me. I decided to head straight to the self-checkout area, hoping to escape his unsettling presence. As I scanned my items, I couldn't help but glance over my shoulder repeatedly, fearing that he might be lurking nearby. As I finally made my way towards the store's exit, my guard was somewhat lowered. I convinced myself that I had overreacted and that the man was probably gone. But just before I reached the automatic doors, an overwhelming sense of dread washed over me. Instinctively, I turned around one last time. There he was, right behind me, mere inches away. What struck me as even more unsettling was that he had nothing in his hands, no groceries, nothing to suggest a reason for being there. I came to a sudden halt locking eyes with him once again. He didn't break his gaze either, and my heart pounded in my chest. Then, in a bizarre twist, he lowered his head, pretending to be engrossed in his phone, and walked past me, out the door. It was at this moment that I felt sheer terror. He had never intended to buy anything. His sole focus had been on me. Fear overtook me completely. My head spun as I thought about what could have motivated his actions. Was he just socially awkward? Or did he have more sinister intentions? Maybe he saw me as an easy target for a robbery. I could see my car not too far away, having parked near the exit, thank goodness. I immediately dialed my fiancé and, without thinking, sprinted towards my car. I jumped inside, locked the doors, and scanned the parking lot for any sign of the strange man. He was still there, aimlessly wandering among the parked cars. With my fiancé on the phone, I started to feel a bit safer. I watched the man for a few more seconds, making sure he wasn't getting any closer, before finally leaving the scene. I couldn't fathom his motives, and that was perhaps the most unnerving part of it all. Each time I had noticed him, he had been blatantly staring at me, far from being discreet. This lack of subtlety puzzled me. It didn't align with what I'd expect from a dangerous predator. Furthermore, the fact that he hadn't purchased anything in the store added to the confusion. As I drove away, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong about that encounter. It was a chilling and unsettling experience, and even now, I find it difficult to rationalize what happened that evening. I used to work night shifts in the desolate heart of Arizona, far from civilization, at an old pueblo that had been transformed into a hotel. It was, without a doubt, one of the easiest jobs I'd ever had, but it came with the heavy drawback of a grueling hour and a half commute each way. Initially, I loathed the drive. It sliced a significant chunk out of my precious free time, leaving me to contemplate the idea of relocating to AO or seeking employment closer to Yuma. But then, on a fateful night during what I think was my third or maybe fourth shift, everything changed. I spotted a random taco truck parked outside the Copper Sands RV park. It had been there before, silently beckoning to passers-by, but I had always resisted the temptation to stop. After all, I had over a hundred miles ahead of me, and making a pit stop seemed impractical. Yet, that night, my stomach growled with such ferocity that I feared I might start speeding just to get home sooner. So, as the truck came into view on my left, I swerved off the road and pulled into the RV park's entrance. Stepping out of my car, I approached the taco truck. Its owner seemed to be either a resident of the RV park or someone who diligently drove out here every night to conduct his business. The first thing that struck me was the savory aroma wafting from the truck. It was impossible to resist. I didn't just grab the tacos to go. Instead, I stayed by the truck, reveling in the flavorful bites. After devouring my meal, I engaged in conversation with the truck's owner over a soda and a cigarette. He even offered those handy lemon-scented hand wipes for free, preventing me from greasing up my steering wheel on the way home. Over the next few months, I made this pit stop around 40 or 50 times. It became a regular part of my nightly routine, and yet, I never bothered to ask the taco guy's name. It didn't seem necessary at the time, and he didn't inquire about mine either. We were just two people sharing a fleeting interaction in the darkness of the night. However, in hindsight, I regret not asking, as it would become a crucial detail in the eerie events that unfolded. One evening, as I rolled up to the usual spot outside Copper Sands, the taco truck was conspicuously absent. I parked my car, stepped out, and approached the truck, hoping to enjoy my usual meal. Everything appeared normal at first, not unusual for the times when the taco guy was briefly occupied elsewhere, but then, the ominous silence settled in. There was no one on the highway, and it seemed as though the entire RV park was asleep, shrouded in an eerie calmness. While I scanned the surroundings, waiting for the taco guy to reappear, a peculiar scent reached my nostrils. Something burning. I stretched up on my tiptoes, straining to peer over the grill's counter, and there it was, a thin wisp of smoke rising from the grill's surface. I called out, my voice trembling, Hey, I think there's something burning over here. Yet, silence persisted, broken only by the unsettling sizzle emanating from the grill above me. With cautious steps, I made my way around the truck to its narrow entrance door. I climbed the retractable stairs and gripped the door handle, pushing it open. My eyes were met with an empty cash register, its drawer upturned on the counter, loose change scattered around it. The word robbery immediately came to mind, but the lack of signs of a violent struggle baffled me. Perhaps the taco guy had been forced to empty the cash drawer himself. My anxiety grew as I advanced toward the grill, which was still alight. I had to ascend a few more steps to reach the cooking area, and when I finally gazed upon the grill's surface, my world crumbled. There, scorched onto the grill, was a perfect jet-black outline of a person's hand. I recoiled, gasping, my heart pounding in my chest. I muttered aloud, Oh my God. Without looking again at the macabre imprint, I reached down and turned off the flame beneath the grill. Descending the stairs, I hastily closed the door and walked back to my car, trembling with fear and uncertainty. I dialed 911, trying to explain the situation to the dispatcher. A robbery had occurred, 
and someone had been severely hurt. That much I knew. But where had they gone? Why hadn't the police arrived with sirens blaring? Despite my anxiety, I decided to wait, hoping that the taco guy might return, bandaged but alive. I waited for what felt like an eternity, 30, maybe 40 minutes, but no one showed up. Eventually I drove home, my mind in a whirlwind of confusion and guilt. I replayed the events over and over, wondering what had transpired and why the authorities hadn't come to our aid. And as the days passed, I couldn't shake the thought that I should have asked for the taco guy's name. I tried googling various phrases like taco truck owner burned by robber, hoping for any lead, but the results only yielded unrelated violent incidents. I remain haunted by the night I discovered that horrifying handprint on the grill, desperately hoping that the taco guy somehow managed to recover from the ordeal. My name's Will, and I'm from a place called Handsworth in Birmingham, UK. Yes, the same city as Peaky Blinders. I'm a big fan of the show, and since Christmas is coming up, it reminded me of a story my dad told me a few years ago. It's a story of two parts, in a way. The first part is us finding out what happened in the first place, which was a big drama but not as interesting as the event itself. So I'll dive in, and I think you'll see what I mean. Back in 1984, my mom and dad were still brand new parents, and I wasn't even out of nappies yet. So my mom mostly stayed at home to look after me. Mom couldn't work, and dad was still on crap money, so he ended up getting a part-time job as a DJ. You wouldn't think to look at him, but my dad has a sick taste in music. Her family has a Jamaican background, and his parents are first generation, so he loves everything from rock steady and roots to dub and dance hall. I've got a lot of happy memories of being a kid, going through his record collection and pretending it was me that was the selector. Anyways, he gets offered this gig playing a party over in West Brom, which is only a couple of miles down the road. So he accepts, drives over, does the gig, and then starts driving back. It's about one in the morning, and he's just gone past the roundabout on Kenrick Way when he sees a flashing blue light behind him. He looks up in his rear view, and sees a copper on a police bike behind him, white helmet, high-vis jacket, all that stuff. So he pulls over to the side of the road, turns his car off, and waits for the copper to come up to his window and tell him why he's been stopped. My dad's sitting there, looking into his right-hand wing mirror, watching as the copper parks up behind him, gets off his bike, and then starts walking towards his window. But the closer the copper gets to my dad's window, the more my dad starts thinking that something isn't quite right. For starters, motorbike cops like that mostly stuck to motorways so they could respond to big car crashes faster. Then secondly, cops are supposed to have something on the front and the back of their uniforms that make it clear that they're policemen. But instead of a little patch over his heart saying police, there was nothing there. It looked like the kind of jacket a builder might wear or something. Then. On this guy's feet, he didn't have boots on. He had all white trainers. By the time he clocked all that about the bloke, my dad's thinking, hang on, this isn't right at all. But then, right as that thought pops into his head, he sees this copper who's not a cop at all reaching into his pocket and pulls out what looked an awful lot like a gun. My dad said that he did the only thing that came to mind. He reached for his keys, started his engine, and while sinking as far down into his seat as he could, he put his foot down. As he's taking off, he says the front seats just exploded in a shower of glass as his front and driver's side windows got taken out by the guy's bullets. He only sits up again when he's almost at the turnoff to Birmingham Road. It's only when he turns right off of Kenrick and has to turn his steering wheel all the way and back again that he can just feel there's something wrong with his shoulder. He makes it all the way to the Hawthorns before he has to pull over because by that point, he's noticed how badly he's bleeding from the bullet that's gone through his shoulder. He's terrified that he's going to bleed to death or something. He ended up getting out of his car, flagging down the next one that passed him, and getting a lift to A&E at Sandwell Hospital, which is where he found out just how lucky he'd been. If the bullet had hit him a few inches further down, it could have done fatal damage to his heart. 
or he'd probably have bled to death before he could even get out of his car to flag another one down. Obviously, because he needed surgery, the hospital kept him for a few nights, and the police asked him questions from his hospital bed. The first visit was all questions. The second one included telling him that his car, which he'd basically just abandoned near the Hawthorns, had been found. Someone had found it and set it on fire. Because of that, the coppers who came to ask him questions started asking things like, Are you involved in organized crime? And, Is there anyone you've angered recently enough for them to want to hurt you? To each of these quite accusing questions, his answer was no, every time. Something you've got to know about my dad for this to all make sense is that apart from his taste in music, he's basically a massive nerd. He was interested in computers growing up, got an IT job, and kept himself squeaky clean. When he was a teenager, he was never involved in any kind of gangs or drug dealing or anything like that. Which, to be fair, Hansworth has got quite a bad reputation for. The only thing he could think of which could have possibly rubbed anyone up the wrong way was having to turn down a song request at the party he'd been playing that night. Dad said a fella had come up to him, asked for some proper aggro dub track, and when my dad told him that he didn't have it, the bloke started giving him this death stare before he finally walked off. Dad continued without any further confrontation, but he said he caught the bloke staring at him across the hall a few times, just staring and kissing his teeth and all this other hard man stuff. Dad finishes his set, packs up his gear, and the bloke had plenty of opportunities to come up and have a go, but he didn't. Then the next thing dad's getting pulled over by a fake cop and gets shot in the shoulder. My dad said that he only really put it together then, and that was only because the police seemed very interested in the details of what dad believed was nothing more than a minor confrontation. Dad gave them a description of the bloke. He'd been a Jamaican guy, about 5'10", with a blue and white striped shirt, white jeans, and lots of gold chains. Dad also said that he was still in the dance hall when he packed up and left, and he looked legless drunk too. So there was no way that he was hopping on a motorcycle and following him. What were the chances of him having a fake motorbike cop outfit just stashed nearby in case of an emergency? But like I said, the penny started to drop as he described the guy from the dance hall. A few days later, one of the coppers all but confirmed his worst fears. Basically, the police thought that the bloke that he'd had that little confrontation with in the dance hall was a Yardie. Lots of people know about Yardies because of Grand Theft Auto. Nico's made Jacob as a Yardie, and he does some missions for them. Aside from that, I suppose they're famous for the same way the Yakuza and Triad are famous. They're not as famous as the Italian or Russian mafias, not by any stretch, but I suppose crime families get a reputation all over the world for a reason. Anyway, back in the early 80s, lots of Jamaicans started coming over to the UK. There had been a trickle since the 1950s, which is when my grandparents came over. But the late 70s and early 80s saw loads more unemployed Jamaicans coming over to the UK to make better lives for themselves. The trouble was, not all of them were honest, hard-working people just looking to get along. The Yardies got their name because they tended to hang around what were basically council estates, or what they called in Jamaica, government yards. If you were a known criminal, you couldn't get a job, so instead, you hung around the yards with the other Yardies who were always up to no good. Gang life in Jamaica is brutal, and there's hardly any money to go around. So when the Yardies heard that they could get over to the UK on forged documents, or jump a ship once it arrived in Bristol or London, they came over, and hundreds were looking to make their fortune, and make it they did. London and Bristol got saturated fairly quickly, so the Yardies that arrived later ended up moving north to the likes of Nottingham and Manchester, but especially Birmingham, with it being the second biggest city in the UK. And they brought all their Yardie badman brutality with them. Ask anyone around here, and they'll tell you badman is fairly recent slang. But ask my granddad and my dad, and they'll tell you the whole badman ting had been around forever. Jamaican culture is very macho as it is, and the Yardies took the whole culture and ran with it until the whole point of being a bad man. Yardie was being the coldest, cruelest. 
I've heard stories of Yardies shooting people dead just for giving them a funny look. So, it made sense that the one my dad ran into would want to have him shot for being disrespectful. And to a Yardie, anything that wasn't perfectly to their liking could be seen as disrespectful. One of the policemen my dad dealt with basically told him that they thought his shooting was connected to a handful of others that happened around Hansworth and West Brom, and that any help my dad might be able to give him would potentially bring them a step closer to solving quite a few other unsolved shootings. Dad told them everything he could, more than once too, but weeks turned into months, and we never heard from the police again. As far as my dad knows, they never caught the who shot him, and for a while, he was worried they'd come back for him. Police advised him not to go around West Brom for a while, but without his car, he wasn't going anywhere that wasn't on a bus route anytime soon. Time went on, and after a while, Dad stopped looking over his shoulder, and his wounds healed. He still can't lift his left arm above his head, but other than that, he's perfectly mobile. Crazily enough, this whole story came out one Christmas when my mom, who was completely smashed, let slip that my dad knew what it was like to be shot. My granddad and I had been watching some terrible old war film, laughing about how awful the acting was whenever someone got shot. Granddad says something like, they can't act because they don't know how it feels, and Nana goes, your dad does. Basically all hell broke loose after that, and it ended with our dad telling us that story you just heard. It got a bit emotional toward the end because we inevitably got to the part where it hit us how lucky we were to even still have him around. And in my sister's case, how she wouldn't have even been born yet if the shooter's aim had been a bit better. Now I won't lie, the thought still gets me sometimes. Thinking someone could be so petty as to want to end another man's life just over a freaking dub track. The single scariest thing that's ever happened to me occurred on a routine drive home from work back in 2010. I used to work in a kind of speakeasy down in Shreveport, sort of a hipster place that specialized in Prohibition era drinks. It was a pretty cool job, but the scheduling sucked. And sometimes we didn't get out of there until 3, and occasionally as late as 3.30 in the morning. On this particular night, we finished around 3 and I found myself driving down West Shreveport with nothing but the streetlights to guide my way. Out of nowhere, I suddenly spotted someone lying right in the middle of the street. From what I could tell, it was a guy splayed out like a starfish on the blacktop. I instinctively slowed down and swerved to avoid hitting him. As I peered out of my driver's side window to get a better look, I couldn't see any blood or obvious injuries, but the guy's eyes were wide open in a really creepy way. That made me think that he was in some real trouble. Or worse, maybe he was dead. Realizing I should probably do something, I reached for my door handle. I swear I was halfway out of my car before this inexplicable feeling overcame me. I can't quite put it into words, but it was like I got a tap on my shoulder, and something in my head urged me to look behind me. When I did, my blood turned to ice. For those familiar with Shreveport, you'll know what I'm talking about. As I gazed in the direction of Joella Street, near the strip mall near the office depot, there was a row of trees on the left-hand side where Forest Park and Wildwoods, or whatever it's called, were located. Pure instinct led me to spot two guys, their faces covered, creeping through the trees in my direction. Realization hit me like a freight train. I was about to get carjacked. Panic set in, and I jumped back into my car, slamming the door shut. But as soon as I did, the guy I had initially thought was either dead or unconscious. The same one I had contemplated offering help to. Suddenly sprang up from the ground and lunged for my door handle before I could speed off. My heart pounded like a jackhammer the entire rest of the ride home. I was maybe a mile away before I could muster the courage to slow down. They weren't going to catch me, not if I drove like I had been. If I hadn't snapped back to reality, I might have gotten a ticket or worse, been involved in a horrific car accident. It may seem unrelated, but I always look back and think about how I could have escaped one dangerous situation only to meet another fate in a blind panic, thinking they might be following me in another car or something. That gut feeling I had when I stepped out of the car haunts me. 
If I had been a little more tired or slower in sensing the danger, I might not be here today to recount this chilling tale. I don't think they had a gun or anything. Or if they did, they didn't fire any shots as I drove away. But a knife, or even the possibility of them running me over while trying to escape, raced through my mind. I could have ended up on the street, just like that guy had been when I rolled up, but with me, it might not have been so easy to get up again. In the 90s, when I was growing up, we didn't have all the distractions that kids have today. Our generation had to make up our own things to do, and more often than not, that meant going outside, going hunting, or inventing games. Our parents encouraged us to be outdoors, and living in a small town, there was no shortage of outdoor activities to indulge in. But one activity that almost everyone in our town partook in was riding some type of ATV or dirt bike. For me, this became one of my most cherished pastimes. I was just seven years old when fate intervened. A man on the highway was selling a YZ80, and for me, it was like discovering buried treasure. All I could think about was sitting on that dirt bike and riding it all day around my neighborhood. But my dad had reservations. He believed I was too young to handle such an incredible machine. It took weeks of relentless pestering, but my unyielding determination ultimately convinced him to buy it for me. I couldn't contain my excitement. However, the truth was, I had no idea how to ride a dirt bike at the time. The first time I got on that machine, I popped the clutch, executed an unintentional wheelie, and flipped the bike. This incident did nothing to inspire confidence in my father, but with time, I honed my skills and became proficient at riding this machine. Thankfully, I had access to an open field where I could perfect my skills. As my friends learned about my dirt bike, they started taking me to various trails around our town, and it gradually became one of our favorite pastimes. We would do this almost every single day after school, and it's a childhood memory I still hold dear. Among the places we explored, there was one particular spot called Emmons. I never knew the person behind the name or why it was called that, but what mattered was an old abandoned house situated deep within the woods. This mysterious house had been there for as long as anyone could remember, and it was surrounded by a network of thrilling trails, featuring hills, creeks, and wide open stretches where you could really push your machine to its limits. Most of the time there were two or three of us riding together, but occasionally I would venture out on my own. I had embarked on solo rides several times before, but one day would etch itself indelibly into my memory. On that day, I couldn't go riding right after school. I had some homework that needed my attention, and I couldn't ride until it was done. It was already six in the evening when I finally set out. Thankfully, it was summer, and darkness wouldn't fall until around 8.30. My dirt bike didn't have any lights, so I knew my ride couldn't be too long. Nevertheless, Emmons was only about five minutes from my house. The moment I hopped onto my machine, a smile crept across my face. I adored that dirt bike. It was my pride and joy. After fueling it up and giving it a once-over, I put it in neutral, kicked the bike to life, and felt the exhilaration course through me. A few days earlier, I had broken my clutch cable, so I had to give the bike a push, jump on, and throw it into gear. It was a maneuver I had perfected, and I was quite adept at it. My dad had ordered the replacement cable, but it hadn't arrived yet. I set off into the trails with enthusiasm, tearing through the paths for about an hour, not encountering a soul. It seemed like everyone had other plans that day. Deep within the woods, there lay an open field, about four or five acres in size, enclosed by a rusty, mostly intact fence. The quietness in the air struck me as odd, considering the noise my dirt bike generated but I dismissed it, attributing it to my own noisy presence. Feeling the call of nature, I decided to stop on the trail and relieve myself. My racing bike lacked a kickstand, so I leaned it against a fence post. As I was in the midst of my business, I noticed the eerie silence around me, an unusual contrast to the revving engine moments earlier, but I brushed it off, assuming it was my imagination. Then, about 50 or 60 yards away, I heard rustling, 
I glanced in that direction but saw nothing initially, so I chalked it up to a squirrel, common in these woods. However, as I finished up, an inexplicable sense of anxiety washed over me, and the atmosphere grew heavy, as if unseen eyes were fixed upon me. I scanned my surroundings but saw nothing. My bike was just a few feet away, and I began walking towards it. With each step, I distinctly heard another step behind me. The realization sent shivers down my spine. I was certain someone was following me. At this point fear gripped me, and I was uncertain about what to do next. My only thought was to run to my bike, jump on it, and make a quick getaway. It had to be a seamless maneuver since my bike lacked a clutch, and I had to kickstart it, push it, and throw it into gear all at once. Gathering all the courage I could muster, I sprinted towards my bike. In one fluid motion, I leaped onto it, kick-started it, and shoved it into gear. The footsteps continued behind me, relentlessly echoing my every move. I knew whatever was back there was only a few yards away. As I sped away, a sudden breeze grazed my back, as if something had taken a swipe at me and narrowly missed. My heart raced, and I could feel my pulse pounding in my temples. Though I never saw anything, the sense of urgency to escape those woods was overpowering. Finally, I reached the road, stopped my bike, and tried to collect myself. It took several minutes, but as I did, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air. It started softly, but crescendoed into a deafening roar, reverberating through my chest. Without hesitation, I revved my engine and raced home as fast as I could. It was a long time before I mustered the courage to return to those woods. And when I did, it was always with friends by my side. That day, that dreadful encounter in the woods, remained etched in my memory. A haunting reminder of the unknown lurking in the depths of the forest. It was around November of last year when I had just moved to Washington State. Being new to the area, I found myself drawn to the woods, so when a few friends of mine, who were avid forest enthusiasts, decided to take me out to a secluded spot, I thought, why not? I need some time away from work. I managed to get the weekend off, packed my bag, cleaned my rifle, and headed over to my friend's house. We ended up about 25 or 30 miles away from the Canadian border, deep within a forest that seemed to stretch endlessly. I was enthralled by the wilderness, as my home state didn't have anything quite like this. There were six of us in total, along with two dogs, a Labrador and a Rottweiler. Each person was armed with either a hunting rifle or a shotgun, and they all had a handgun, except for me. We parked our cars on a tiny dirt road, likely used by game wardens or border patrol, and hiked about four miles into the woods. By this time, dusk was setting in, and we decided to build a fire right away so we could set up our tents. Two of the group and one of the dogs went out to gather firewood while the rest of us started setting up the tent, a massive six to eight person one. November in this region could be quite chilly, but we managed to set up the tent in about 15 minutes. The trio that went to gather wood still hadn't returned, so we decided to start a fire with some branches we found around the campsite. As we were getting the fire going, we began to hear crashing noises coming from the woods, as if someone was sprinting towards us. The two guys who had gone to gather wood came rushing back, their eyes wide with fear. The Labrador was with them, but the Rottweiler was nowhere to be seen. They began to explain that they had seen one of our friends out in the woods acting strangely. They tried to approach him, but every time they got close he would move away. At one point he simply vanished and then reappeared not ten feet behind them. They mentioned a terrible stench of rotten meat and spoiled milk that seemed to surround them during the encounter. They tried asking him what was wrong, but he didn't respond. Suddenly, he bolted into the woods, and the dog chased after him, barking frantically. Soon, both the man and the dog disappeared from sight. The terrible smell persisted, accompanied by eerie giggling sounds. We were all disturbed by this bizarre story, but we initially thought it might be some elaborate prank. However, our concern grew when we realized that the missing dog hadn't returned either. 
We began to worry about the situation, but decided to stay put. By this point the sun was dipping below the horizon, so we built up the fire and brought out some Coleman lanterns. We huddled together, eating MREs, with our firearms close at hand. About 15 minutes after darkness fell, the remaining dog, the Rottweiler, suddenly perked up and started growling aggressively. The stench returned, and the guys were not exaggerating about how terrible it was. The forest began to groan and creak, and we could hear branches and leaves snapping around the perimeter of our campsite. The atmosphere was tense, and the sense of dread intensified. The dog's barking grew more frenzied, so one of the guys, Sean, stood up and fired three rounds of buckshot randomly into the woods. A horrifying, otherworldly screech echoed from the darkness and rapidly moved away from us, taking the foul odor with it. We waited for about an hour, on high alert, and then decided to try and get some sleep. Two people would keep watch at all times. I was on the first watch with another guy named Victor. The Labrador was still nearby, and we kept a close eye on the surroundings. The first two hours passed without incident. As we woke up Sean and Jim for their watch, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that something was very wrong. It wasn't long before I woke up to that nauseating smell once again, and Sean was shouting loudly. Victor and I hurried outside to see what had happened. Sean was scanning the edge of the woods with a spotlight, desperately calling out Jim's name. I asked what had occurred, and they explained that they had been sitting there when they heard one of our friends calling to them from the woods. The dog had growled and rushed toward the sound, and Jim followed after the dog, disappearing into the woods. Sean had been yelling for him when he heard Jim begin to speak, but he was abruptly cut off. Fear gripped us all, and we couldn't leave Jim out there, so we decided to venture into the woods to find him. By this time, the foul stench had returned, making most of us feel queasy. We pushed on because we were determined to locate our missing friend. We found some of Jim's tracks but lost the trail when they suddenly stopped, leaving no other footprints leading back in the direction he had come from. The situation grew even more unsettling. Suddenly, one of the guys at the back of our group stopped and made a strange noise before yelling in anger. We all rushed over to see Jim standing about 20 feet away. However, he was standing unnaturally, and something about him felt profoundly wrong. We approached him cautiously, asking if he was okay and if he needed help. He just stood there with a blank expression, slowly nodding yes. It was clear that something was terribly amiss. Laughs and jokes circulated among the group, except for Jim, who remained eerily silent. It was hard to believe that he had only been out in the woods for less than a day, considering his strange behavior. Back at the camp, we tried to lay him down, but he adamantly refused, choosing to remain outside by the fire. A few of us went to sleep, while Sean, Victor, and I stayed up to keep an eye on Jim. As we observed him, we noticed bizarre, jerky muscle spasms and movements that sent shivers down our spines. It seemed like there was something seriously wrong with him. Jim remained mostly silent and slow to respond to us, except when it came to food. We offered him an MRE, but he only ate the meat from it. Afterward, he got up and began to move awkwardly, suggesting that we join him in the woods to gather firewood. Despite the darkness, the ample firewood we had collected earlier and the presence of a large campfire, his request didn't seem all that strange at the time. He gave a peculiar shrug before walking off strangely into the woods. We were on guard but didn't attempt to stop him. A few minutes later Sean got up and went into the tent for something, leaving me outside with Victor. That's when the dreadful smell hit me like a sledgehammer, making me gag. Simultaneously, I started hearing strange gibbering and giggling, a chorus of madness that sent chills down my spine. I had never felt so terrified in my life, and it was clear that Victor felt the same way. Sean came out in time to hear the disturbing sounds clearly. He rushed back inside the tent to wake everyone up. He froze at the tent flap, his face draining of color as he muttered curses under his breath. His alarmed reaction stirred the rest of the group, and we all awoke in a panic. I couldn't understand why he was cursing, but it certainly had the desired effect of waking everyone up. 
As we counted heads to ensure everyone was present, Sean's face grew even paler. He stammered, Where's Jim? It was then that we realized something was horribly amiss. The gibbering grew louder, and a cacophony of nonsensical sounds seemed to echo through the woods. Jim's voice called out to us from the darkness, pleading for help, but his words were off-key and interspersed with unsettling giggles. We decided to stoke the fire, turning it into a blazing inferno, and turned all the lanterns to their brightest setting. We clutched our weapons, ready to defend ourselves. We stayed huddled around the fire until the first light of dawn began to break through the trees. As soon as there was enough visibility, we extinguished the fire, packed our belongings, and made a hasty retreat towards our vehicles. The ominous giggling and nauseating smell returned as we hastily left the campsite. Upon reaching our cars, we were met with a horrifying sight. Scratches covered the vehicles, most of the windows were smashed, and the seats were shredded beyond recognition. We needed the cars to run, so we hastily tossed the keys into the ignition. We breathed a collective sigh of relief as the engines roared to life. Without a second thought, we piled into the vehicles and sped away, leaving behind the nightmare in the woods. For months, we avoided discussing the eerie events that had transpired, and most of us couldn't bring ourselves to admit that it had happened. One of the guys later confided in us that he had seen Jim standing at the edge of the woods, staring at us as we departed, a twisted grin on his face. I believed him, and that experience left me with an unshakable belief that I had encountered something sinister, a skinwalker. It's a memory that will haunt me for the rest of my life, and I'll never venture into the woods so far from civilization with just a handful of friends again. In the summer of 2015, I found myself on a mission to hunt coyotes for their prized fur. Armed with my basic AR-15 rifle that I had acquired inexpensively, I admired how it slung comfortably over my shoulder. I attached a sling point to the barrel, securing it messenger bag style around my neck, and hopped onto my dirt bike. The cabin on the mountain awaited, a remote sanctuary where my journey would begin. As I approached the cabin and parked my dirt bike, I sensed an eerie presence lingering in the air. I had been baiting the woods with squirrel and rabbit guts to attract predators, but to my surprise, all the bait had vanished. An unsettling feeling gnawed at me. The neighbor who lived just down the road had also departed in his car, leaving me alone. Deciding to investigate the woods, I couldn't shake the sensation that I was not alone. Every step I took seemed to be echoed by another, as if unseen eyes were watching my every move. I glimpsed a shadowy figure in the distance, its silhouette resembling a stick figure. I waved hesitantly, and it slipped behind a tree. Dismissing it as a trick of my imagination, I retreated to the safety of the cabin. Inside the cabin, I opted to sit down and indulge in some drinks while I contemplated my next move. The distant yelps of coyotes filled the air, signaling their presence. I readied my rifle, preparing to confront a few of these cunning creatures. Sitting on the porch with the lights turned off, I waited patiently, but nothing crossed my path. The yelping gradually evolved into distant cries for help. My attention shifted to the neighbor's house, which stood in complete darkness. It suddenly struck me that he had left, but the cries for help persisted. Fear gripped me as I realized that he might have encountered trouble, perhaps a leg injury in the woods, surrounded by coyotes. Determined to help, I ventured into the woods, following the dirt bike trail. The cries grew louder, leading me deeper into the forest. Without warning, I encountered a U-shaped dip in the trail, and instead of hitting the brakes, I coasted down it. As I descended, I heard an anguished cry for help right in front of me. Panic surged through me, and I desperately tried to steer away. In the chaos, my dirt bike flipped, and my memory grew hazy as I briefly lost consciousness. Regaining awareness, I found myself trapped beneath the overturned dirt bike. Panic set in as I realized that my left leg was pinned beneath the heavy machine. My attempts to free myself were futile, as though the dirt bike had suddenly gained a hundred pounds. The sling around my neck reminded me of my rifle, and I dragged it within reach, even though my arm was bleeding. 
As I assessed the condition of my rifle, I noticed damage to the handguard and a cracked stock, but it still seemed functional. With 30 rounds at my disposal, I had to endure the night or hope that someone would find me. I sat in the eerie silence of the forest, my fear intensifying with every passing moment. Suddenly, a shuffling sound nearby shattered the silence. The atmosphere grew thick with tension as I strained to locate the source. The cries for help resurfaced, drawing nearer. Uncertain whether to respond or remain silent, I listened to the approaching shuffling. It was getting closer, and something loomed over the dirt bike. I averted my gaze, unable to look directly at the unknown presence. But before I could react, it grabbed my face, rendering me helpless. My mind raced, searching for the trigger of my rifle, but it was a futile endeavor. Slowly, it moved my head to face it, and what I saw chilled me to the bone. The figure was grotesque, resembling a crack-addled golem with a mutilated face, sunken cheeks, and hollow eyes. Its breath was a noxious stench that filled my nostrils, searing into my memory. Panic surged as I felt the flash hider of my AR-15 bump against something, jolting me back to reality. I screamed with all my might, and it screamed back. I pulled the trigger repeatedly, the deafening gunshots ringing in my ears. It seized my hair and began bashing my head against the ground, all while the rifle's deafening report continued. Finally, it wrested the gun from my grasp and pummeled me with it, all the while howling in torment. My vision blurred, and I felt the brink of unconsciousness approaching. Just when I thought it was over, I heard a sound louder than the creature's screams. In a moment of sheer terror, I watched as its head seemingly exploded. My gun lay a mere ten feet away, and a brilliant light drew nearer. My world faded into darkness as I heard someone scream my name, urging me to hold on. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in a hospital bed, my head stitched up. Inquiring with my neighbor about that fateful night, I received an unexpected response. He simply claimed it was a bear, a common sight in those parts. Yet deep down, I remained unconvinced that a bear had been responsible for the harrowing ordeal I had endured. A couple of nights ago, something chilling happened to me at Stall Soft Park, a location I frequent for some late night solitude. Let me provide some context first. This park is situated within my city, covering approximately a square mile in total area mostly dominated by dense forest. There's a playground on the northern end, adjacent to the street, and the park is situated on an elevated hill, with the forest sloping down to a central valley. The playground is bordered by woods on two sides, and the swing set where I was perched sits about ten feet from the fence separating the playground from the forest. I often visit this park between nine at night and midnight to relish the serenity of being the only person in the area. It's not that I dislike kids or crowded places, but I find solace in the quiet of the night. On the particular night in question, I estimate it was around 11 p.m. when I first heard shuffling noises coming from behind the fence. This was not unusual, and initially, I paid little attention to it. Approximately five minutes later, the shuffling sound returned, but this time it had an eerie, almost human-like quality. My first thought was the possibility of a mountain lion, even though I'd never encountered one in this park before. Mountain lion warnings were posted in the area, but they generally don't pose a threat to humans unless provoked. Still, I remained vigilant. My next thought was that it might be a creeper, and I mentally prepared to jump off the swing and make a dash for my car. While mulling over my options, I strained my eyes to peer at the fence. That night, the moon wasn't providing much light, but its faint glow allowed me to see movements, especially of something as large as a human or animal. As I contemplated my next move, I heard a sound that can only be described as a low, moaning growl, which persisted for about five seconds. What puzzled me was that the source of this eerie vocalization seemed to be right at the fence, just ten feet away from where I sat. What should have been my cue to leave turned into a moment of stunned paralysis, 
and I continued swinging for another thirty seconds or so. Then, things took an even stranger turn. As I swung back and forth I caught sight of a flashlight in the distance, near the point where the playground met the street, roughly sixty to seventy feet from me. Obstacles like play structures obscured my view, but I assumed it could be a police officer, considering the park was technically closed due to the ongoing pandemic. However, I'd swung at parks after hours in the past, and the police had never bothered me. The person with the flashlight gradually approached, moving at an angle toward me. Imagine the area as a clock, with me at six, and he started at twelve, moving towards seven. To my right, about ten feet from the swing set, and in the opposite direction of the fence, there was a twenty by twenty metal overhang with a fishnet patterned table for picnics. I hopped off the swing and crouched behind it, which in the darkness of night provided surprisingly effective concealment. I watched as the person drew closer. Though the visibility was incredibly poor, I could make out that he was dressed in a manner reminiscent of a character from the TV show Supernatural. Baggy pants, a vest, and the familiar duckbill hat that Lid sold. He seemed to have objects strapped to his arms and legs, but I couldn't discern any more details. In his hand he held a flashlight aimed at the ground, and on the other hand, there was some kind of stick or baton. The whole situation was bizarre, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I might be in danger. It struck me that if this person saw me swinging alone at midnight, he might consider me an easy target. With that thought, I decided that if he came any closer, I would make a run for the far fence leading into the forest. I knew the woods like the back of my hand having frequented them since I was a child. Even in complete darkness, I could navigate them well enough to hide if necessary. I crouched behind the table and watched as the person briefly stopped, then continued walking towards the entrance of the forest. This marked the end of our eerie encounter. I waited in silence for a few minutes before attempting to see if I could still spot him, but he had disappeared into the depths of the forest. Reflecting on the events of that night, I couldn't be certain if the strange noise I had initially heard and the flashlight-wielding individual were connected. I knew what mountain lions sounded like, and the only other wildlife in the park were deer, squirrels, and insects. The idea of a skinwalker or something supernatural crossed my mind, but it was all speculation. There was no distinctive smell, and although the person dressed oddly, I didn't get an overwhelmingly sinister vibe from him. Furthermore, I doubted the park's size was sufficient to house a creature of such lore. As I pondered these bizarre events, I couldn't help but wonder if this mysterious figure was hunting something else entirely, and I was merely an unsuspecting observer in the shadows. The possibility lingered in my mind, leaving me with more questions than answers. Had I encountered a skinwalker or someone on a quest to confront one? I couldn't say for certain but that night at Stall Soft Park had left me with an eerie and unshakable sense of unease. I'm 22 years old, a college senior hailing from the quiet corners of Connecticut. My semi-rural residence lies about 20 minutes away from the closest supermarket and fast food joint. I study in Washington, D.C., but not in the upscale neighborhoods you might have heard about. I'm nestled in a part of town where substance abuse issues are prevalent, and the police presence is more reassuring than troublesome. Let me clarify one thing. I'm not some muscle-bound freak. I stand at 6'1 and weigh 240 pounds, mostly muscle. Sure, I could drop a few pounds, but who doesn't have their vices? I enjoy the occasional smoke, drink, and indulgent meals. It's all part of the college experience. As the diligent student I am, I've chosen a real major, accounting. I even scored an internship at a mid-sized PR firm, crunching numbers and raking in a respectable $20 per hour. College isn't cheap, so I also moonlight as a pizza delivery guy after the office closes. The pizza place where I work isn't exactly gourmet, and its delivery radius is absurdly large, around 20 minutes from my home and just 5 minutes from the beach. My house lies north of the pizzeria, and we deliver even farther north, which takes an additional 50 minutes.
Currently, I'm typing this tale at work, stealing moments between scrutinizing the fine print on our client contracts to ensure we charge them every last penny. Believe me, they'll do everything to shortchange us. Anyway, the farther north you venture from the pizza place, the more rural and isolated the landscape becomes. On this particular night, I found myself working until closing time, around 9.45 p.m. I was in the back, dutifully folding pizza boxes, when the counter girl approached me with a delivery slip in hand. She mentioned that the customer who placed the order had sounded strange on the phone, as if speaking through a fan or cupping their hands around their mouth. They were also making gurgling noises. My Washington, D.C. experiences immediately conjured images of substance users, given our neighborhood's reputation. However, it was more likely to be someone who had overindulged in benzos around here. I took a look at the delivery address, and I admit, I was a little annoyed. It was practically in the middle of nowhere, and the last thing I wanted was a long drive. Moreover, the order was bizarre. The customer had requested a large pizza loaded with anchovies, ground beef, ham, sausage, pepperoni, and various other toppings, totaling a whopping $15 in extras. I went back to the counter girl to confirm, and she admitted that she wasn't entirely sure, as she had some difficulty understanding the caller. Given her age, around 16, I cut her some slack, thinking she might have been daydreaming during the call. No harm in double checking, so I decided to give the customer a call back. I dialed the number, but it rang and rang, reaching 5, 10, 20, 30 times without an answer. I hung up and tried again, only to hear, The number you have dialed does not have a voicemail box that has been set up yet. Goodbye. My manager, not wanting to waste any more time, decided to make the pizza as ordered, and we would figure it out from there. Reluctantly, I took on the delivery. As I drove to the customer's location, I put on some dubstep music and revved up my turbo subi. For those unfamiliar with rural areas, you should know that a winter drive through the woods can be quite eerie. It's an environment where absolute silence reigns, broken only by the occasional rustle of something larger than a cat moving through the underbrush. So there I was, speeding toward the address in this chilling silence. After what felt like an eternity, I reached the location. There were a few houses on the street, each sitting on about five acres, so they were quite spread out. I was searching for number 1134, but I passed 1130, drove through a long stretch of empty road, and then found 1144. Frustrated and puzzled, I realized I must have missed it. I called the customer's number again, and this time, I heard a strange buzzing or humming sound coming from somewhere outside my car's stereo. It grew louder and louder, until I couldn't stand it any longer, fearing for my speakers. At that point, my car windows were fogging up from the tension in the air. I pulled over between two of the houses and rolled down the windows, only to be hit by an overwhelming odor of decaying trash, reminiscent of driving through Newark, New Jersey. It was so foul that I couldn't bear it. I shifted my car into gear and started driving toward the next house, intending to knock and ask if they had made a mistake with the order over the phone. That would have been a reasonable explanation for these bizarre circumstances. As I approached the end of the driveway, I noticed a pole with a light on top of it. The plan was to pull into this house's driveway, clarify the order, and hopefully put an end to this unsettling situation. I was about 100 feet away when I spotted someone stepping out of the darkness and into the light at the bottom of the driveway. My initial reaction was relief, thinking it must be the customer. However, the man standing under the light didn't fit the typical mold of a customer in need of a pizza delivery. He was eerily calm, wearing a massive, ill-fitting black coat that made him appear even larger than his towering stature, though he was probably five inches shorter than me. I couldn't see his face properly at first, but I grabbed the pizza and got out of the car, preparing some change in case he paid in cash. Hey sir, sorry about the wait and all the phone calls. The delivery's pretty far, I began, but there was no response. It was then that I realized I should be watching him more closely. The red flags were stacking up, including the repulsive stench that hung in the air. It didn't make sense. It wasn't trash day. 
I moved the pizza to the far side of the car roof to distance myself from it and squinted at the ticket, trying to decipher the order. Still no response from the man. At last, I gathered the courage to study him more closely. The guy was enormous, had no shoes on, wore ripped jeans with stains covering every inch, and his face... His eyes seemed sunken in, and I couldn't even discern the pupils. They were like bottomless black craters. I started feeling increasingly uneasy. Between the noxious smell, his odd head movements, and those unsettling eyes, my anxiety was mounting. He was still motionless, not responding to my presence, so I stood there frozen, my gaze locked on him. His head was bobbing from side to side, but it wasn't fluid or natural. It was more like a car door that stops halfway and requires another push to close properly. This strange head movement continued for about ten seconds, intensifying my unease. I was getting increasingly uncomfortable when, in the midst of this bizarre encounter, I noticed that the man was smiling. It was a chilling, unnatural smile that sent shivers down my spine. I hadn't paid much attention to his mouth before, but now I couldn't look away. He continued to smile with that eerie grin, and as I stared, I heard him speak. Uh, can you please come get this? Also, I think you might have dropped your phone or something when you were hiding a body or whatever in the woods. I stammered nervously. I was still clinging to the hope that this man had taken too many pills, and was simply having a strange interaction. To my astonishment, his mouth opened, and his head stopped its erratic movements. He uttered a word that sent a chill down my spine. What? His voice was strained, fragmented and disjointed, almost as though he was trying to say something else but couldn't. I was stunned and baffled by his response. What? I repeated, my voice shaky. It was his, he replied, and the words sounded disjointed and unnatural, as though he were struggling to communicate. My heart raced as my mind went into overdrive, trying to make sense of the situation. His... What? I managed to utter, my anxiety mounting. The man, still not moving from his spot, repeated, The phone was his. Phone's not his anymore. I was trembling now, feeling a sense of impending danger. The words he spoke made no sense, and his demeanor was increasingly unsettling. In one jerky motion, he propelled himself closer to my car, and I could hear his voice change, as if it was coming from a different source entirely. Go away. Stop following me. I will call the police, he said, still not moving his mouth, and his voice took on a completely different tone, one I had never heard before. Fear gripped me like a vice, and I finally found my voice. I'm going to call the cops, man. If you don't just get out of here, I shouted, panic overtaking me. That creepy smile widened on his face, but he didn't move his mouth. Instead, I heard him speak again this time in a voice that sent shivers down my spine. Away. Stop. Police. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to escape this bizarre and terrifying encounter. Without further hesitation, I shoved the pizza toward him and made a hasty retreat to my car. I didn't even bother closing the door properly. I just needed to get away from this stranger. My heart was pounding, and I sped down the road, leaving everything behind. The pizza the car door slightly ajar, and my fear-stricken thoughts. I drove about 80 miles per hour for a quarter of a mile, then abruptly executed a U-turn. I didn't want to get any more lost in this unfamiliar area with that eerie man still lurking around. I quickly returned to the spot where I had left him, only to find that he had vanished into thin air. As I finally reached the end of the road, preparing to merge onto the main road, I instinctively glanced right to check for oncoming traffic. What I saw froze my blood. The man's face was just inches away from mine, mere inches from my car window, his eyes boring into mine. I turned left as fast as I could, my heart racing, leaving him behind. Back at the pizza place, I was shaking uncontrollably. I did something I never did while working. I lit up a cigarette, desperately trying to calm my nerves. When I walked through the front door, the counter girl informed me that the man from the open space house had called back. She said he claimed I had forgotten some food, but he had only ordered a pizza, hadn't he? I was on the verge of tears as I glanced at my phone, which had been thrown around the car during my frantic escape. 
There were 14 missed calls from the same number. I listened to the voicemails, but all of them were empty except for the last one. In that final voicemail, all I could hear was ragged breathing and those same low grunting sounds that the man had made earlier. I couldn't hold back my tears any longer. I sat there for 10 minutes, attempting to regain my composure. Then I remembered the change the man had left on the roof of my car. I mustered up the courage to step outside and shine a flashlight on my car's roof. It was covered in a thick, viscous, foul-smelling substance that resembled copper. I gagged and heaved, and as I inspected further, I found the quarters he had left surrounded by the same repulsive goop. They were stuck to it along with what appeared to be a small chunk of soft tissue. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Panic surged through me, and I rushed back into the pizza place. My nerves were shattered as I asked the counter girl to call the man's number again. She made several attempts, but the phone consistently went straight to voicemail. The next morning, I handed the mysterious number over to my uncle, a police captain in a nearby town. He informed me that it was a burner phone, paid for in cash, making it nearly impossible to trace. The phone was now turned off. Ever since that night, I've been sleeping with the lights on, haunted by the eerie encounter in the woods and the unsettling stranger who seemed to defy explanation. My name's Ellie. Last year, my friends James, Peter, and I decided to go camping in the woods near my house. We live in a small town called Supply, North Carolina. The first day went by like any other camping trip. We arrived at the pond, unpacked our gear, set up our camo, and lit a fire to kick things off. The second day is when things started to take a strange turn. After waking up and enjoying a joint, we decided to go fishing by heading about half a mile through the woods to reach the nearby river. As we walked there, James pointed out some peculiar footprints on the trail. Now, I consider myself a hunter, and the deer around these parts aren't much larger than a Great Dane. But these tracks were different. They were bipedal, which was downright weird. Curiosity got the best of us, so I knelt down to examine those tracks more closely. They were almost as big as my hand, and I had never seen deer tracks that massive. We continued down the trail, discussing the unusual tracks as we made our way to the river. Once we reached our usual fishing spot and cast our lines, everything seemed normal for about an hour. We managed to catch five decent-sized red drum, and with excitement, we packed up to head back to camp. However, our excitement quickly turned to dread when we heard a blood-curdling scream that seemed to go on for an agonizing 15 seconds. It was distant, so I brushed it off, suggesting it was probably just a panther or something, since there had been mountain lion sightings in the area. Returning to our campsite, we noticed that the same peculiar tracks we had seen earlier now surrounded our tents. Three enormous claw marks adorned the outside of one of our tents. I began to suspect that someone might be playing a prank on us, as some of our friends knew we were camping here. We decided to stoke the fire and make breakfast, trying not to let unease creep in. The rest of the day passed relatively peacefully. We took leisurely walks, went swimming, smoked a few more joints, and engaged in casual conversations, all while savoring the final days of summer. When night fell, we retreated to our tents. I woke up to the sound of that same horrific scream from before, but this time, it was much closer. Fear gripped me as I grabbed my Mossberg 500 shotgun and cautiously emerged from my tent. James and Peter were already outside their tents, wide-eyed and terrified. I asked if they heard it, and James affirmed that they did, explaining that it had been too unsettling to ignore. I threw some logs onto the fire, and we huddled together, straining our ears to pick up any unusual sounds. Then, as if the forest itself had fallen silent, the sounds of birds, bugs, and rustling leaves ceased. Heavy footsteps started to encircle our camp, and we exchanged nervous glances but couldn't spot anything in the darkness. Moments later, a massive figure stepped into the light cast by our campfire. It was so enormous that it defied any logical explanation. 
Even I, standing at 6'3", felt dwarfed by it. Initially, we thought it might be a person, but it was simply too big and appeared almost solid white. Its body resembled that of a man, but instead of a human head, it wore a grotesque deer skull. As this enigmatic creature drew nearer, I could no longer contain my fear and fired three slug rounds into its chest. The creature halted, seemingly unfazed, and locked its hollow eye sockets onto me. In a moment of desperation, I urged James to retrieve the car keys from my tent. The creature shifted its attention to Peter, and I fired a fourth round into its stomach. It responded by fixing its eerie gaze upon me and bizarrely seemed to smile. Panicked, we sprinted for the car, keeping our eyes on the creature as I aimed my gun. Once we had all clambered into the vehicle, James revved the engine and sped down the narrow, winding dirt trail. We must have been going at least 60 miles per hour when Peter suddenly screamed. In the same instant, the SUV was jolted to the side. I peered out the rear window and saw that the creature was still in pursuit, effortlessly keeping pace with us. James did something almost superhuman to coax even more speed out of the car. When we finally reached the main road, we knew we were safe. We kept driving, not stopping until we were far away from that horrifying campsite. Since that night, we have not ventured out camping again, and I'm not sure if we ever will. Until now, we hadn't shared our encounter with anyone, but I've been listening to your channel for the past three years. I thought maybe someone else had experienced something similar in this area. My father told me a story once, and I'll never forget it for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But honestly, that isn't the reason you hear stories on TV, or sometimes overhear something in a public place. People talk about ghosts and aliens, and you think to yourself, that isn't real. They're making it up or they're mistaken or they're crazy. Something like that. You just can't believe it until something happens. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way that you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you, or maybe you hear the same story again and again happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a bit bigger than you thought. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down that it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet that I started to believe. I started to hear other stories just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He's never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it, he called it a skinwalker. After an old Navajo tale his grandfather told him, but I'll tell you the story the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night, killing coyotes for 50 bucks a skin. We lived on a dairy farm in Ohio, and sometimes we'd kill a calf. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes while we were out, we'd come upon a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind, and it could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home walking because we didn't have a car or a four-wheeler back then. We'd cut through the woods, and that's when we came upon it. Blood everywhere, splattered on the trees, in the grass, in the creek, everywhere. At first we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They scavenge and then start hunting deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs. But this wasn't like that. When a pack of dogs, wolves, or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off one that's weak, sick, old, or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner someplace it can't get out of, and then they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha, and that deer will never see that alpha. They might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat is gone, and then it will drop dead. It's quick. It's clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den, and wolves neither because they'd get too much of a fight. There were three, I think three bodies just torn apart. You'd see a head here, a leg there, 
a torso over there. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses, and we thought it's something that we've got to take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him, and I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone with nothing but a twenty-two and a pocket knife. I was only thirteen at the time, so a twenty-two rifle was about the only gun I could reliably use. Dad had the shotgun, and he wasn't going in there without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally we began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't hard either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I'd never seen my dad scared before that night. We started hearing noises. I've been in a lot of woods in my life. I've been all over the world, and I ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Deer, foxes, rabbits, raccoons, and birds just scared. Now keep in mind, this is maybe twelve or one. Except for the fox and some birds, nothing was supposed to be awake. But they weren't just awake, they were moving. I saw flocks of birds that night fly straight into trees just trying to get out of there. We came upon a pack of coyotes, nearly shot a couple, thinking that it was what we were looking for. But then we saw that they were running towards us. They ran right past us, didn't even notice. And then some deer did the same. And then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes even a couple of wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other, and the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together that maybe whatever we were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see, and it wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go toward trouble, to fight. And knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally get into an open valley. It was normally a soy field, but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks. Then a lot of the animals fleeing the forest had paved over the land, but where the deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step, like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds. But that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing around 40 pounds nearly tore my damn throat out once, and all that means is that it's quick and it's hard to hit. So we follow the tracks, and it doesn't take long for us to find where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on the top of the hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado, and nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was just some sick kid riding a high. But we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards, and we hear this noise, a screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One, a high-pitched screech, and another, a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear the sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Now Dad looks at me, kneels down, and whispers, I've got to stay behind him, because we're about to corner it. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. But we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, probably rabid. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting until it doesn't move anymore, and then slit its throat. If it gets to Dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off of him. So he walks up, and I'm right behind him, just a tad to his side so I can see what it is. I wish to this day that I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tearing off its flesh and throwing what it doesn't nibble at its side. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, human-looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey, hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So, we see that, and my dad hesitates. 
He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat to try to get it to turn around. I swear to God all the noise just ceased. I ain't never heard true silence before that, and not after it. But for two seconds, nothing. Nothing made any noise, which made it all the louder when it turned around, made this shrill cry, and jumped on Dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed it. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. But it was on him, tearing parts of him off. I started shooting it with a 22 point blank, but it barely bled the thing. I got off five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the gun butt. It wasn't budging. It didn't even register that I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin, and then it moved up. It tore off his throat, his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. Then it started digging in and ripping off the bottom half of his jaw, the little bones in that tube in your neck, and then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened, but somehow my dad's knife ends up in the thing's shoulder, and my dad ends up on my back. I'm running, and by God, I'm running faster than I'd ever run before or after, and I know it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we'd been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just... I'm not looking back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up, and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance, and he looks at me, and I'll never forget what he said. What's that on your back? He asked me. And just as he said it, he saw one of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad, most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly, we hear it screeching, and he grabs me. My dad gets thrown in the ground, and I'm fighting him, crying because I think we can still save him somehow. But my dad had been gone before I even picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside, and they're locking doors and getting guns ready. The landlord looks at me, asking what happened, but I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it all together to understand that there was something dangerous out there. All the lights in the house are on, and someone calls the cops. They'll be there in 15 minutes. We look outside and we see it walk in front of the fire. I don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. And suddenly, something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it ain't the thing. It's my landlord's dog. Just the body, though, not his head or legs. We start pushing things in front of the door and windows when we hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open, and we hear metal and glass just getting ripped apart. We put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet, not silent like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol, and no sooner did I pull the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again, except now it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out because it was inside with us. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs, and we got to it just as that thing did. It opened it just a bit, and four or five men just slammed into it. It got its hands through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that, put the barrel right up to its wrist, and pulled the trigger, cutting its hand clean off. That only made it angry, though. It started pushing on the door, clawing. We were on one side pushing as best as we could, and it was on the other doing the same. That wood just wasn't going to hold, so someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing, and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of them just unloaded on the top of that door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police showed up. I was still glued to that door, what was left of it, and the sun was up before they got me off it. They put me in a hospital for a while, and a lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long, 
long time. When we got back home, I got a job from the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about that thing. But I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal, probably a wolf, or maybe a bear, that had migrated north, or so they claimed. My curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't help but ask my father how they could conclude that so confidently, especially when they had the severed hand as evidence. He looked at me, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and disbelief, as if reliving the horrors of that day. He stammered as he spoke, his voice barely a whisper. That hand never made it back to the station, he confessed, his words hanging heavily in the night air. My heart raced as I leaned in, eager for more of the chilling tale. The cop who had it in his car, he continued, he wrecked and drove into a tree. He died on impact, and the hand was never found. The gravity of his words sank in, and I couldn't help but wonder about the sinister forces at play. A sense of unease crept over me as I probed further, seeking answers to the unexplainable. I asked him how the authorities could disregard such a bizarre occurrence, but his response sent shivers down my spine. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand even existed at all, he whispered, said that it simply was the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I gulped, my mind racing to comprehend the unsettling details of this unsettling mystery. I never ended up talking to that landlord again, my father's grim words leaving an indelible mark on my psyche. Rumors of his disappearance while I was away at basic training swirled, with the police chalking it up to him owing money to dangerous people and simply running away. But I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't that simple. As I sat there, listening to my father's harrowing account, I made a silent vow to myself. I would never venture back into those woods, even if I had the whole goddamn U.S. Army at my back. The story he'd shared about the creature, whether it was the rake or a skinwalker, still left me unsure of what to believe. Years passed, and when my mother passed away, my father seemed to lose all sense of purpose. It was as if he felt he had nothing left to lose. He disappeared into those dreaded woods, and he never returned. The FBI was called in, and they put on a show for everyone involved, but I knew deep down that they weren't truly looking for him, and they never did find him. To this day, the mystery of those woods and the unexplained horrors that lurked within them continue to haunt my thoughts. My father's unsettling tale still echoes in my mind, leaving me with more questions than answers, and a lingering fear of what may be lurking in the darkness of those unforgiving woods. I was 22 years old, deep in the heart of the Ozarks in Arkansas, equipped with some new gear that I had been saving up for months. From my sturdy boots to a tactical vest and even a military spec gas mask, it felt like Christmas morning to be out here, eager to field test my personal prototypes. My trusty nugget handgun was holstered at my side, a weapon that wouldn't do much against big bears but would certainly ruin the day of any snake, stray dog, or cougar that crossed my path. I had a couple of loaded clipazines ready to go, along with some rolled up targets stashed in my pouches. Additionally, I was well prepared for anything the wilderness might throw at me, with a compass, topographical map, thermal blanket, extra underwear, MREs, a canteen, and a camelback hydration system. I was basically armed and ready for the inevitable invasion of any kind. I was having a blast, navigating the dense woods, testing the limits of my gas mask's field of view, and evaluating the reliability of the clipazines. I wandered alongside a peaceful creek bed, deciding it was the perfect time to practice some guerrilla tactics. The late summer early fall season ensured that there was no risk of getting my gear wet in the non-existent stream. Although I was starting to feel the moisture build up inside my gas mask due to my own sweat. After a quick safety check, I began a series of screen slides, uphill hustles, and full-on survivalist maneuvers. However, 
I quickly realized that the combination of my heavy gear and the sweltering weather made me winded. Panting and sweaty, I found myself standing in that dry creek bed, contemplating my position on the topographical map to set a course for home. Amidst my efforts to reorient myself, I caught an unusual smell. At first, I attributed it to my own perspiration, but the odor soon transformed into something far more sinister. It was a putrid, overwhelming scent. A complex blend of rot, animal musk, garbage, garlic, and something like skunk and onion sludge. It was so noxious that it nearly made me gag. Instinctively, I reached into my pouch and took an Adderall for extra focus, then drew my nugget, ensuring it was in working order. I was determined to be prepared, but I prayed I wouldn't have to use it. The smell persisted, growing stronger, and I knew whatever was emitting it was getting closer. With a deep breath, I decided to pull my gas mask from around my neck and over my face. It provided some relief, but the mask wasn't entirely airtight around the joints, allowing traces of the stench to seep in. I proceeded cautiously and silently along the creek bed, heading towards the area where the slope was shallowest. As I crept forward, I strained my ears, listening for any snapping twigs or animal sounds from above. There was definitely something shuffling around, and it sounded larger than anything my nugget could handle. It emitted a constant snuffling grunt, accompanied by sloppy uncoordinated movements through the underbrush. My mind immediately jumped to my father's stories about big bears. My dad, an Ozarks resident for 58 years, had shared tales of these bears, claiming they weren't just black bears but also brown bears, the result of a mysterious hybridization. The offspring were larger and meaner, thanks to something called hybrid vigor. He had even shown me photographs to prove his point, revealing a massive black and brown creature rummaging through a clothesline, emphasizing the size and height difference from the clothesline in the background. Back to my story, I was contemplating hiding when I finally caught sight of the source of the stench. It was not a bear, though it had bear-like features. It resembled a bizarre fusion of a grizzly bear, a sloth, and something entirely otherworldly. Its elongated snout resembled a stubby trunk, and its body was bulky, covered in dirty, matted fur. I was mesmerized by the sight, studying the creature for what felt like an eternity. Astonishingly, it hadn't noticed me yet. My overactive imagination tried to label it as some sort of creature from science fiction, like a solidor, but it was far from any classification I could muster. My fascination was broken by a sudden interruption, a fart. Yes, a simple bodily noise in the midst of this bizarre encounter. The creature halted its movements, my breath caught in my throat, and my heart raced. The only sounds in the woods were the echoing fart and the sound of my heart pounding against my chest as the creature shifted its attention towards me. The creature sniffed the air, emitting a low growl that had my entire digestive system preparing for a siege. I fired my nugget, not at the creature, but into the ground beside it. There was a puff of dirt and hair, but no blood. It seemed that the creature's unkempt fur served as natural body armor. Undeterred, the creature reared up on its hind legs and growled menacingly. I knew I had to act fast, so I worked the bolt and fired again, this time aiming at its bizarre face. The shot hit home with a sickening sound, but to my surprise the creature seemed unfazed, save for a trickle of blood. It roared and lurched towards me. In sheer panic, I yelled and fired a third shot in a random direction, desperate to scare it off. Amazingly, it worked. The creature dropped to all fours, its strange noises still echoing in my ears, and I managed to shuffle away from it. I stood there, trembling, as the sky transitioned from blue to orange, realizing that my father's stories about big bears had been partially correct. When I eventually made it home and recounted the encounter to my dad, he refused to believe me entirely. He locked the doors and retreated upstairs for the rest of my visit, only communicating through a few cold drinks. Oddly enough, I wasn't frightened during the encounter. My curiosity had outweighed my fear, and the Adderall probably played a role in keeping my panic at bay. 
It was the day I met a creature unlike anything I'd ever imagined and lived to tell the tale. I don't really have an explanation for what happened. I have ideas, but here's the story. I'm a freshly graduated high school student on my way to college. During my senior year, I had a job working for my grandfather as a farm manager. He would give me instructions on what to do on the farm without him being there, most commonly feeding the cows. It was early November, and at this time, baseball practice started after school and would last from 3.25 to 5.30. By that time, the sun was almost down when I arrived at work and started getting ready. One day, I had gotten dressed, filled up the buckets, and fed the first farm, when I realized that I didn't have a key to the other farm. Frustrated, I was forced to pick up two buckets at a time and walk them from the fence to the feed trough, a good 40-yard walk. While walking, I was trying to keep myself upbeat and just started to whistle, no real pattern or tune, just something that I came up with. When I came back and put the last buckets in the bed of the truck, I heard something from my neighboring property. It was whistling, strange whistling. I thought, as no one lives anywhere near that property, and it sounded very close. I rationalized it was a mockingbird or something, and just kind of went on with my life. The next couple of days, I didn't whistle, but the whistling continued. Slowly, over those few days, it got clearer and clearer until it sounded like regular whistling. Eventually, it got louder. When I first heard it, it was very faint. Almost missed it over the crunching of me walking to my truck. In the last few days, I kind of became accustomed to the whistling and kind of expected it. When one day, it didn't come, I was a little disappointed. This time I had brought the key and walked up to the gate and started fiddling with my keys when I dropped them into the grass. I said, damn it, when I dropped them. I squatted down and started to search for them when I heard a very faint sound coming from the other property, a low groan or glee, and it was getting louder. At this point, I wasn't scared but more curious as to what was going on over there. I left my truck parked across from the property and walked a few feet down the road, hopping the fence of the property where I heard the sounds. The land in there goes straight uphill and is heavily wooded all throughout. The further you go up, the more dense it gets. Looking back now, I made a few big mistakes that could have gotten me hurt. As I walked up the hill, I would occasionally hear the gurgle. It was far up the hill, still as faint as it was before. As I walked, a bad smell started to hit my nose, a weird mixture of garbage and wet dog or something. I heard something as I was about to crest the hill. Damn it! A very dry, low, and quite distorted damn it came from a couple of yards in front of me. It sounded like a 60-year-old smoker saying damn it very slowly, as if they didn't know English or something. I automatically thought someone was on our property. Somewhat angry and paranoid now, I started to move slower. I didn't want this guy to hear me before I could see them. I kept going and stopped and listened when I heard another sound. Damn it, damn, damn it. This guy was now slowly saying damn it. Normally, not long and drawn out in that eerie way, as if he didn't know English. I sat down on this log, kind of listening, trying to figure out what I should do about this person. He kept saying it over and over, and I noticed his tone was getting higher, his inflection was changing. It hit me. This guy was perfectly mimicking me. My tone, inflection, literally everything. He even mimicked my frustration when I said it. Angry and kind of scared now, I got up and started to crest the hill. I flicked on my flashlight on my phone. Hey, this is private property, I began, but I was cut off in my sentence as I came over the hill. The light barely illuminated this naked figure squatting just a couple of yards in front of me. His eyes were illuminated by the faint glow of my flashlight. I automatically felt that something was wrong. This wasn't a regular person. His neck was longer than normal and when I came up the hill, he winched his neck and snapped his head to look at me without moving his eyes. They were too big, and his head was large and slender. He was squatted in a ballerina-type squat. I looked at his body. He was very skinny, his
his ribs showing through his skin. There was a short silence, and like a robot, the man turned in the leaves and slowly stood with his hands next to his side. I was debating if it was even a person. It was far too tall to be a person. Damn it, it said in my voice. I turned and sprinted down the hill. It didn't feel like I was running, but more that my legs were just going through the motions. I didn't look back before I got to the fence, and when I hopped it, I got in my truck and sped away. Sadly, I still work at that farm, but I've never told anyone the story, not even my grandfather. I've only heard the whistling a few more times since then. I'm not really a believer in the paranormal, and I really tried to find an explanation for weird stuff. I believe that this may have just been some weird squatter, but I really don't know. Sitting on the western side of the Missouri River is Omaha, Nebraska, a sprawling metropolis that has been the largest city in Nebraska for nearly 170 years. It has seen its share of historical events and boasted a rich tapestry of ethnic neighborhoods where waves of immigrants found a home among their own kind. South Omaha, a district famous for its meatpacking plants, welcomed Eastern Europeans, including Poles, Czechs, Germans, Lithuanians, Slavic Croatians, and more. But as time passed, many of the slaughterhouses closed, forever altering the landscape. Growing up in Omaha, I often heard tales of South Omaha's past, and the old buildings that remained as silent monuments to those days fascinated me. I longed to explore these relics of history, from old slaughterhouses to factories and even breweries that once made Omaha famous. However, one particular building had captured my imagination, the massive five-story slaughterhouse nestled close to the train tracks that sliced through South Omaha. Constructed of brick and steel, it stood as a testament to the city's industrial history. News of its impending demolition filled me with sadness, but it also spurred my curiosity. While I'd always been intrigued by urban exploration, I'd been too nervous to trespass in the past. But with the slaughterhouse slated for destruction, I made a decision. I had to see it before it became just another parking lot. One fantastic fall evening, I parked my truck at a distance from the building. Armed with a heavy LED mag light and dressed inconspicuously in light hiking gear, I approached the massive structure. The slaughterhouse lay near the train tracks, surrounded by other buildings with the same red and white brick facade. Tall grasses and empty lots bordered the site enclosed by a chain-link fence that encompassed the entire complex. I was prepared for this moment and parked my truck discreetly on a side street near a garage. As I neared the fence, a strange sensation crept over me. Nervousness and fear, a cocktail of emotions that refused to dissipate. Nevertheless, I pressed on, and as I stepped over the fence, the unease intensified. I reached a door on the side of the building, its logo and name long faded, the glass coated in dirt and grime. I tried the handle, but it wouldn't budge. With some force, I managed to pry it open, breaking the lock in the process. I shrugged it off, knowing the building was destined for demolition. Inside, I switched on my flashlight, revealing a vast pitch-black room filled with decaying machinery used for meat processing. Dust and cobwebs clung to everything, and control stations, desks, and more lay untouched for years. Undeterred, I navigated through the machinery until I reached a pair of double doors leading to another room. As I pushed the doors open slightly, a sudden chill descended upon me. It was an unnatural cold, given that the outside temperature was a mild 65 degrees Fahrenheit. My skin prickled, and a sense of foreboding washed over me. There was no wind, but it felt like winter had encroached upon this room. I steeled myself and ventured forward, entering what I presumed to be the killing floor. It featured a main pathway for cattle and conveyor belts to transport them to the next processing station. Yet, the smell that assailed my senses was unlike anything I had ever encountered in this part of town. It was a foul odor of death, decay, and disease, a scent from the depths of nightmares. The hairs on my neck stood on end and I recalled stories of such putrid stenches being associated with wendigos and skinwalkers. 
I tried to convince myself that it was merely a decaying animal, but the unease lingered. My journey through the next room was tense, and then a sound like no other shattered the silence, an otherworldly bellow that reverberated with an eerie, almost human-like cry. I scanned the room, searching for the source of the wailing, but found nothing. Panic began to set in as I moved to the next room, my nerves stretched to the limit. There my flashlight revealed a gruesome sight, large plastic bins filled with bloody cow bones. How could they still be here after nearly four decades of abandonment? I took a step back, realizing that the floor was also coated in fresh blood. My heart pounded, and I was about to make my escape when I saw it, a faint red light emanating from a nearby doorway. Two crimson eyes appeared in the darkness, and I leaned closer to discern their source. Then another deafening bellow, closer this time, accompanied by the sound of hooves on tile, sent me sprinting through the door to the other side of the room. Once through the door, I raced down a hallway lined with shiny tiles, hoping to find an exit. The footsteps of the unseen pursuer echoed behind me, but the gear they wore seemed to slow them down, allowing me to gain some distance. At last, I reached the end of the hallway and pushed through a doorway with rubber flaps, like those in a butcher shop. I turned to the right, but froze in my tracks. A dim red light bulb illuminated a workstation where multiple men in long white smocks, helmets, goggles, and rubber boots were cleaning a cow carcass. One sprayed it down, another cut it apart, and the third moved bones into a bin. It was an impossible sight. Meat packing in this abandoned place? It couldn't be. As I inched further into the room, I heard them speaking, an unfamiliar language, Eastern European, perhaps Polish. My heart raced as memories of my grandparents speaking Polish flashed before me. I needed to get past them to escape, so I carefully maneuvered around the men. I don't know how, but they heard me. All three stopped what they were doing and turned to face me, their bespeckled faces illuminated by the dim red light. I felt like a trespasser in a forbidden world as one of them shouted something in Polish and began moving toward me. The others followed suit, their intent clear. Panic seized me, and I dashed for the other door, sprinting down the hallway once more. I could hear their footsteps closing in behind me, but their cumbersome gear seemed to hinder their pursuit. I finally found an exterior door and burst through it, emerging on the opposite side of the slaughterhouse. Gasping for breath, I surveyed my surroundings, my newfound freedom allowing me to regain some composure. I glanced back at the menacing building and froze. Through an open truck dock, I saw the three men again, their faces unchanged, but now with glowing red eyes. Fear surged through me as I sprinted to my truck up the road. Another bone-chilling bellow echoed in the distance, and my ears throbbed with the sound. How could this be happening? I sped away from the nightmare, my mind racing with questions. What did those men want with me? What had I stumbled upon in that place? I had no answers, only a chilling encounter that would haunt me forever. After extensive research and countless hours of reading about the supernatural, I couldn't help but wonder if I had encountered some kind of malevolent entity, perhaps a skinwalker. The truth remained shrouded in mystery, and I vowed never to venture into abandoned buildings, especially those with a dark and eerie past. The layout of the cabin we were staying in outside was quite unique. It had a deck that wrapped around the house in a C-shape, creating a cozy, welcoming atmosphere. The main entrance faced south, providing a stunning view of the surrounding landscape, while the second entrance faced west, overlooking a peaceful meadow. The stairs leading down from the west side, where the meadow stretched out, consisted of 15 steps, each roughly 10 feet high. As you approach the cabin from the south, you couldn't help but notice the big panel glass windows that adorned the west side. These windows connected two smaller windows, allowing ample natural light to filter into the cabin. A screen door stood directly underneath this arrangement. It was a year after my mom and her boyfriend had gone on a cruise, leaving me in the care of his parents, Mary and Ben, with Kenny, his brother, also joining us for the cabin trip. Despite my lingering unease from a previous encounter, I decided to push my apprehensions to the back of my mind. 
In a previous story, I had shared my initial encounter with what I believed might have been a skinwalker, and that experience made me wary of returning to the cabin's treehouse. However, with no one else to accompany me, my youthful curiosity led me to wander around the property. One day, as I stood near the front of the cabin, gazing toward the treehouse, the memory of my past encounter sent a shiver down my spine. An inexplicable feeling of being watched washed over me. I couldn't shake it off. I stared at the treehouse, fearing the worst, and then, to my horror, it suddenly collapsed to one side. I couldn't stay outside any longer, so I sprinted back indoors. The rest of the day passed somewhat normally. I watched a movie, ate dinner, did the dishes, and even caught a college football game on TV. Exhausted, I eventually fell asleep on the couch, but was rudely awakened sometime around midnight by a fierce storm. Lightning flashed and thunder roared outside, startling me from my slumber. I rubbed my eyes and with a sense of trepidation made my way up the stairs to my bedroom. The bed I lay on was situated right at the edge of the open area upstairs, and I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Something was definitely peering in at me, and I could feel it deep in my bones. I turned my gaze toward the panel glass windows as another lightning strike illuminated the night. There, pressed against the glass, I saw a massive, grotesque creature. My body went cold, and I instantly recognized it as the same creature that had watched me earlier in the evening. It seemed to know I was there. Panicking, I bolted from my bed and fled into the kitchen. I huddled behind the bar-like table against the countertop, my heart pounding with terror. The tapping on the window grew more frequent, and I couldn't bear to look. I closed my eyes, curling up into a fetal position on the floor. Above me, the kitchen sink had a small window, and when I eventually opened my eyes, the creature was there, staring back at me. Its face was horrifyingly human-like, with pitch-black eyes, damp hair from the rain, a flat nose, and a mouth reminiscent of a gorilla. I couldn't tear my gaze away, frozen in terror, with tears streaming down my face. I finally managed to shift my head so that I couldn't see it anymore. At that moment, I heard the creature walk over to the door and start rattling it, desperately trying to gain entry. Just when I thought I was beyond hope, Kenny walked out of a room, heading towards the bathroom. He turned around and found me on the kitchen floor, trembling like a frightened animal. He asked, What are you doing? But I couldn't even form a coherent response. Fear had taken complete control of me. Soon Mary joined us, probably awakened by the commotion. Together they managed to calm me down, and they let me sleep in their third bedroom that night. The next day, we hastily packed our things and left the cabin behind. When my parents returned from their vacation, Mary and Ben shared the unsettling events of that night with them. My mom asked me about everything that had transpired, from the moment I first felt uneasy to the terrifying encounter by the window. I couldn't shake the memory of that creature, and I knew I could never return to those mountains without feeling an overwhelming sense of dread. As I contemplated what I had seen, I couldn't help but wonder, was it some sort of Sasquatch, a Wendigo, or perhaps even a Skinwalker? I may never know for sure, but the haunting memories of that night in the cabin would stay with me, forever etched in my mind. I still get chills down my spine when I reminisce about that harrowing summer night three years ago. I was just an innocent 11-year-old, full of youthful excitement, attending a summer camp with my classmates. At first, the camp was an absolute delight. We frolicked in the sun and relished the camaraderie. Little did we know that our tranquil world was about to be shattered. It was a moonlit night when it all began and our cozy shelter in the woods echoed with the sinister symphony of footsteps. The eerie sound pierced my slumber, jolting me awake. Fear gripped my heart, paralyzing me. I lay there, petrified, straining to discern the source of the ominous noise. Each step reverberated through the shelter, etching dread into my very soul. Time seemed to stretch endlessly until the footsteps finally faded into the obscurity of the night. Only then did I gather the courage to venture a glimpse outside. 
my heart pounded as I peered through the flimsy veil of darkness. There, right before our shelter, stood a shadowy figure. My skin prickled with goosebumps, and an icy shiver traversed my spine. Panicked, I roused my slumbering friends from their dreams. Desperate to prove I wasn't hallucinating, I gestured wildly towards the figure outside. But when their sleepy eyes blinked open and they turned to look, the figure had vanished, leaving behind an unsettling void. The following day brought with it the bright distraction of daytime activities, and the nocturnal scare was temporarily shelved in the recesses of our minds. Engaged in a thrilling excursion with a group of rangers, my friends and I ventured into the dense wilderness. Our enthusiasm was palpable as we anticipated close encounters with wildlife and breathtaking sights. However, what we encountered was far from the anticipated adventure. Amidst the whispering leaves and dappled sunlight, a solitary man materialized on our path. He beckoned us to approach, his intentions shrouded in mystery. Skepticism coursed through my veins, but one of my companions argued it would be impolite to ignore him, suggesting he might need our assistance. I, on the other hand, sensed danger, and my instincts screamed at me to retreat. I began to backtrack towards the reassuring presence of the rangers, planning to share our unnerving encounter. But time betrayed me. As my friends debated whether to heed the stranger's call, he decided for us. With an unsettling grin stretching across his face, the man approached us and uttered chilling words. Hey boys, I want to have some fun. My response was immediate, a resolute, no thanks, we have to go back to the rangers. Miraculously, he acquiesced and allowed us to leave, sparing us from whatever malevolent scheme he had in mind. That night, the relentless sound of footsteps returned, determined to torment us once more. This time, I was ready. I roused my friends before cautiously peering outside, determined to unveil the identity of our nocturnal visitor. And there he stood, the same ominous man from the afternoon encounter. My heart pounded like a drum as I locked eyes with him, his features illuminated by the faint moonlight. How did he know where we were staying? Panic gripped us as my friend hurled a vile threat, a promise of violence to protect us. In response, the man brandished a massive, gleaming knife, glinting malevolently in the night. It was our only saving grace, for the sight of the weapon sent him fleeing into the obscurity once more. The following day, we wasted no time reporting the horrifying encounter to the rangers, hoping for their intervention. But the man vanished into the ether, never to be heard from again. The unsettling encounter remained etched in my memory, a haunting enigma that would forever haunt my thoughts, leaving me with the lingering question of what that sinister stranger truly wanted with a group of innocent children. The morning sun peeked over the horizon, casting a warm golden glow over our small suburban home. I stood by the window, coffee in hand, watching the neighborhood wake up, Today was the day, the day we'd been planning for months, our family camping trip to the secluded woods up north. I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and apprehension. Joyce was bustling around in the kitchen, her movements efficient and full of purpose. Tyler, our adventurous 12-year-old, was already outside, double-checking our camping gear with the seriousness of a seasoned explorer. Amy, the youngest at nine, was buzzing with energy her laughter filling the house as she chased our old dog, Buster, around the living room. As a family, we needed this. Work had been relentless for Joyce and me, and the kids were growing up fast, caught in their own whirlwinds of school and friends. This trip was our chance to disconnect from the world and reconnect with each other. Packing the camper was like a well-rehearsed dance. We all knew our roles. Joyce's meticulous planning ensured we had everything from spare batteries to her famous homemade granola bars. Tyler, ever the helper, was in charge of the camping gear, while Amy took it upon herself to make sure Buster had his favorite chew toys. I supervised, making sure everything was secured and ready for the four-hour drive. The drive was peaceful. Open roads, clear skies, and a playlist of classic rock set the tone. 
Joyce and I talked about everything and nothing while the kids played games in the back seat. Every now and then, I'd catch a glimpse of Amy's face pressed against the window, her eyes wide with wonder at the passing scenery. We arrived at the campground in the mid-afternoon. It was as beautiful as we remembered, a pristine lake reflecting the clear blue sky, surrounded by dense woods that promised adventure. We found our campsite, a cozy spot near the lake, and got to work setting up. Tyler and Amy were a blur of excitement, helping us set up the camper and then immediately setting off on their bikes to explore the nearby trails. Joyce and I worked together in comfortable silence, our routine seamless after years of camping together. Once everything was in place, I took charge of the grill, cooking up a batch of burgers that had everyone's mouth watering. The familiar smell of grilled meat and the sound of sizzling fat were comforting. We gathered around the picnic table, enjoying our meal under the shade of tall pine trees. As the sun began to set, we lit a campfire. The crackling flames and the soft glow against the darkening sky created a magical atmosphere. We roasted marshmallows, shared stories, and laughed together. It was these moments, simple and unadorned, that I cherished the most. The night grew darker, and the woods around us came alive with the sounds of nature. The hoot of an owl, the rustle of leaves in the breeze. It was peaceful, yet there was an undercurrent of something wild, something untamed, just beyond the reach of our campfire light. As the kids started to yawn, worn out from the day's adventures, we tucked them into bed in the camper. Joyce and I lingered by the fire, talking softly, enjoying the quiet. Eventually, we too decided to call it a night. As I lay in bed, listening to the gentle breathing of my family, I felt a profound sense of contentment. Out here, away from the noise and rush of everyday life, I felt grounded. Little did I know, our tranquil retreat was about to take a turn into the unknown, into a night that would test us in ways we never imagined. The chirping of birds outside our camper ushered in a new day, full of promise and the allure of the unknown. After a quick breakfast of scrambled eggs and toast, we set out to explore the dense woods that surrounded the campground. There's something about being in nature, the way it strips away the complexities of life, leaving you with a raw sense of existence. That's what I wanted for my family, a touch of raw, unfiltered life. Tyler led the way with the confidence of a young boy who believed he was invincible, his sister trailing behind, her eyes wide with curiosity. Joyce walked beside me, her hand occasionally brushing mine, a silent communication of shared love and contentment. We followed a well-worn trail that meandered through the forest. The canopy of leaves above us danced in the light breeze, creating a mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor. Every now and then, Amy would stop to pick wildflowers, her collection growing with every step. About an hour into our hike, we stumbled upon something unexpected, an old cabin, hidden away in the thicker part of the woods. It stood there, a relic of a bygone era, its walls weathered and beaten by time, the roof partially caved in. I felt a chill run down my spine as I approached it. There was something unsettling about this forgotten structure, a sense of stories untold, of secrets kept hidden by the silent trees that stood guard around it. Tyler was already heading towards it, his curiosity peaked but I called him back. Let's not get too close, Ty, I cautioned. It doesn't look safe. Amy seemed disappointed, her adventurous spirit dampened by my warning. Joyce squeezed my hand, a silent nod of agreement with my decision. We decided to take a break, sitting on a fallen log near the cabin. As we snacked on granola bars and apples, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that we were being watched. The woods, once a source of serenity, now felt like they held a lurking presence. We continued our hike, but the cabin stayed with me, like a shadow at the back of my mind. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see something or someone following us. Joyce noticed my unease. Everything okay? she asked. Yeah, just can't shake the feeling about that cabin, I replied, trying to sound more casual than I felt. We made our way back to the campsite the laughter and chatter from the kids easing some of the tension that had built up inside me. But as the sun began its descent, 
casting long shadows across the campground. A sense of foreboding settled over me. The forest, with its darkening depths, seemed to whisper secrets in a language only it understood. That night, as we sat around the campfire, the flames casting a warm glow against the encroaching darkness, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. It was as if the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something to break the silence of the night. And then it came. A scream, distant yet distinct, slicing through the calm of the night like a knife. In that moment, our peaceful retreat transformed into something else entirely, something primal and unsettling. As the echoes of that scream faded into the night, I knew our adventure had just taken an unexpected turn. The night had fallen like a thick curtain over the campground, wrapping everything in a shroud of darkness only pierced by our campfire's glow. We sat around the fire, the kids roasting marshmallows, their faces illuminated by the flickering light, laughter and stories filling the air. It was a picture-perfect moment, one of those you wish you could freeze in time. But as the night deepened, the forest around us seemed to grow denser, more ominous. There was a stillness in the air, the kind that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself it was just the wild playing tricks on my city-tuned senses. Joyce and I stayed up a little longer after tucking the kids into the camper. We sat by the dying fire, sipping on our beers, talking in hushed tones. There's something about being out in the wilderness that brings out deeper conversations, ones that get lost in the everyday hustle. Then, cutting through the night, came a sound that sent a jolt of fear straight to my core. A scream, distant yet unmistakably human, a sound of pure terror that echoed through the silent woods. Joyce's hand gripped mine, her eyes wide with alarm. The kids, awakened by the noise, peeked out of the camper, their faces etched with fear. What was that, Dad? Tyler's voice trembled slightly, trying to sound braver than he felt. I'm not sure, buddy. Probably just an animal, I said, trying to sound reassuring. But the look in Joyce's eyes told me she wasn't buying it. We decided to retreat to the safety of our camper, locking the door behind us. The thin walls felt like the only barrier between us and the unknown terrors lurking in the dark. Lying in bed, every creak and rustle of the wind sent my imagination into overdrive. I could tell Joyce was awake too, her steady breathing a little too forced. The night seemed endless, every sound amplified in the deafening silence that followed the scream. I lay there, my mind racing, trying to piece together what could have made such a sound. A lost camper, an animal in distress, or something more sinister. As the first light of dawn crept through the curtains, we all emerged from the camper, tired and uneasy. The peacefulness of the previous day was gone, replaced by a sense of vulnerability, of not being alone. Over breakfast, Joyce and I debated whether to pack up and leave, but the kids, still clinging to the excitement of camping, convinced us to stay one more day. We can't let one weird noise ruin our trip, Tyler argued, his voice a mix of bravado and the desire to not let his fear show. Reluctantly, Joyce and I agreed, deciding to stick close to the camper for the day. But as we went about our activities, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The woods seemed to have eyes, and the tranquility we had once felt was now replaced by a lingering sense of dread. As the day wore on, the unease grew. The once inviting forest now felt like a maze of shadows and unknown dangers. And as night approached again, so did the realization that we were in a place where the line between the known and the unknown was as thin as the tent walls that separated us from the dark. The morning after the scream was a pale imitation of the day before. The sun rose all right, but its light seemed filtered, as if the very brightness was wary of touching our campsite. Joyce was quiet as she made breakfast, her movements mechanical. The kids tried to play near the camper, but their laughter was forced, their glances towards the woods frequent and nervous. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig, sent a surge of adrenaline through me. The forest had transformed from a place of wonder 
to a realm of unseen eyes and hidden threats. The departure of our neighboring campers did nothing to ease our minds. Their empty sight stood as a silent testament to the terror of the night before. We spent the day close to the camper, activities subdued. The kids drew in their sketchbooks, the images darker, more jagged than usual. Joyce read a book but often looked up, scanning the tree line. I busied myself with minor repairs on the camper, though my mind was elsewhere, straining to hear any sound out of the ordinary. As the day wore on, the sky began to darken, clouds rolling in like an ominous premonition. By the time we cooked dinner, thunder rumbled in the distance. We ate mostly in silence, the storm's approach mirroring our growing apprehension. The first drops of rain fell as we cleared the table. We hurried inside the camper, the wind beginning to howl like a beast awakened. Lightning flashed, each bolt illuminating the forest in stark, surreal detail. The thunder was no longer a distant threat but right upon us, shaking the camper with its fury. In the cacophony of the storm, a new sound emerged, a low, guttural moaning that seemed to rise from the very earth beneath us. It was a sound of anguish and rage, unlike anything I'd ever heard. The kids huddled close to Joyce, their eyes wide with fear. What is that, Dad? Amy's voice was a whisper, barely audible over the storm. I don't know, sweetheart, I replied, trying to mask my own fear. The moaning grew louder, accompanied now by the sounds of something large moving through the underbrush, the snapping of branches, the rustle of leaves, as if a massive creature was making its way towards our campsite. Joyce and I exchanged a look, a silent agreement that we needed to protect our children at all costs. I grabbed a flashlight and a camping knife, feeble weapons, but all I had. The sound stopped abruptly, leaving only the storm's rage. We sat there, not daring to breathe, each of us lost in our own fears of what lurked outside. Then, a blinding light flooded through the windows, followed by the piercing sound of a bullhorn. Come out with your hands up. We stumbled outside, blinded by the light, to find two police officers, guns drawn, scanning the tree line. There's a dangerous animal on the loose, one of them shouted over the roar of the storm. We need to get you out of here. We didn't need to be told twice. Packing in haste, we threw our belongings into the camper. The storm raged around us, but it was nothing compared to the fear of what might be hiding in those woods. As we drove away, escorted by the police, the relief was palpable. But the questions remained. What was out there? What had stalked us through the trees? And would we ever feel safe in the wilderness again? The drive away from the campground was surreal. The rain still poured down, relentless, as if trying to cleanse the forest of its secrets. In the rearview mirror, the woods receded into the darkness, taking with them the terror of the last two days. Joyce sat beside me, her eyes fixed on the winding road ahead. The kids were in the back, huddled together under a blanket, Buster curled up at their feet. The only sound was the rain drumming against the camper and the occasional muted sob from Amy. As we put miles between us and the campground, the tension slowly began to unravel. Tyler, who had tried to play the brave older brother, finally let his guard down and fell asleep. Joyce reached over and squeezed my hand. A silent thank you for getting us out of there. I kept replaying the events in my mind, trying to make sense of it all. The scream in the night, the feeling of being watched, the animal noises during the storm, and then the police, their urgent warnings, their tense expressions. It was like a scene from a nightmare, except it was all too real. We stopped at a diner on the way home, the bright lights and the bustle of people a stark contrast to the isolation we had just experienced. The kids ate quietly, their usual energy subdued. Joyce and I exchanged small talk with the waitress, but our smiles were forced, our thoughts elsewhere. The rest of the drive home was quiet. We were all lost in our own thoughts, processing the events in our own way. When we finally pulled into our driveway, it was like returning from another world. Our home, with its familiar comforts, felt like a sanctuary. Unpacking was a silent affair. Each item we took out of the camper was a reminder of our ordeal. The camping gear, once symbols of adventure and escape, now felt tainted. 
We decided, then and there, to put it all away, maybe for good. That night, as we settled into our own beds, the safety of our home enveloped us. But the shadows of the forest lingered in the corners of our minds. The kids slept in our room, needing the reassurance of our presence. Joyce and I lay awake for a long time, talking in whispers about what had happened. We should have left after the first night, Joyce said, her voice tinged with guilt. We couldn't have known, I replied, though I shared her regret. The next morning over breakfast we made a pact to never return to those woods. The kids surprisingly agreed. The adventure they had once craved had turned into a lesson about the unpredictability of nature and the fragility of our place in it. In the weeks that followed we tried to return to our normal routine, but the experience stayed with us. Sometimes, in the quiet of the night, I would wake up to the sound of a distant scream, only to realize it was just the wind. We never did find out what the police were tracking in those woods. Part of me wanted to know, to put a name to our fear. But another part was content to let it remain a mystery, a shadow in the forest best left undiscovered. As for our next vacation, Joyce's suggestion of the beach sounded perfect. The open sky, the endless sea, a far cry from the claustrophobic embrace of the woods. We needed a place to heal, to rebuild our sense of adventure in a world that suddenly seemed a lot bigger and a lot more unpredictable. The sun had barely crested over the jagged outline of Black Mesa when I loaded the last of my gear into the caravan. The Arizona sky, a canvas of fiery oranges and soft pinks, stretched above the barren landscape. I couldn't shake off a nagging sense of foreboding, a feeling that this trip would be different from the others. As a regular on these supply caravans, I had grown accustomed to the vast, open spaces of the desert the way the earth stretched endlessly under the blazing sun. But today, the land seemed to whisper secrets in the wind, secrets I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. I glanced at the Peabody coal mining operations in the distance, an ever-present reminder of the complex relationship between the land and its resources. We were here to assist the communities affected by the mining, to bring supplies and a semblance of comfort. Yet, amidst the sprawling machinery and dust, I often wondered if we were really making a difference. My thoughts were interrupted by Buck, our caravan leader, a man as rugged as the terrain we traversed. Amanda, you set? He called out, his voice carrying over the hum of engines and the chatter of my fellow volunteers. Yeah, all good, I replied, forcing a smile. I admired Buck's unwavering optimism, even if I couldn't always share it. As we set off, the convoy of trucks kicked up a haze of dust, swallowing the path behind us. I sat in the passenger seat of the lead vehicle, my gaze fixed on the unyielding horizon. The caravan members, a mix of seasoned volunteers and wide-eyed newcomers, chatted excitedly, their enthusiasm unaffected by the early hour. I tried to join in the conversation, to lose myself in the mundane details of logistics and supply counts but my mind kept drifting back to the conversation I had with an alumnus just a few days before about his eerie experience in these very lands. He spoke of shadows that moved with intent and whispers in the wind that sounded almost human. I had laughed it off then, a defense against the chill that ran down my spine. As the caravan snaked its way through the undulating landscape, I noticed the subtle changes in the terrain. The dry arroyos, which lay dormant under the sun, were like scars on the earth, reminders of the fleeting wrath of rain. I knew these natural pathways could turn into raging torrents with little warning, much like the secrets that seemed to lurk just beneath the surface of this land. The caravan came to a stop at our first checkpoint, a routine pause to ensure everything was in order. I stepped out of the truck, stretching my legs and taking in the vast expanse of wilderness that surrounded us. The beauty of the place was undeniable, yet it felt like an untamed beast, beautiful but dangerous. I looked up at the sky, now a brilliant blue, and took a deep breath. This was more than just a supply run. It was a journey into the heart of a land rich with stories and mysteries, a land that held its secrets close. And as we moved deeper into the heart of Black Mesa, 
I couldn't help but feel that we were not just visitors here. We were part of a story yet to unfold, a story that would test our resolve and perhaps reveal truths we weren't ready to face. The heat of the midday sun was relentless, a scorching presence that seemed intent on draining every ounce of moisture from my body. I pulled my hat lower over my eyes, trying to shield myself from the harsh glare as I watched a lamb, its coat as white as the cumulus clouds dotting the sky, dart playfully away from the enclosure. It was a harmless escape, a brief moment of freedom for the animal, but for me, it was the beginning of an unforeseen ordeal. I set off after the lamb, my boots kicking up small clouds of dust with each step. The land around Black Mesa was deceptive. What appeared flat and navigable from a distance was a labyrinth of dips and rises, arroyos, and hidden crevices up close. I kept my eyes on the lamb, which seemed to hop effortlessly over the rugged terrain, blissfully unaware of my growing concern. As I ventured farther from the camp, the familiar landmarks began to blur into one another. The vastness of the landscape engulfed me, and a creeping sense of disorientation settled in. The lamb, now a distant speck, vanished over a rise, and I hastened my pace, determined not to lose sight of it. I reached the crest of a small hill, panting from the effort. Below me, the land stretched out in all directions, a tapestry of earth and sky, with no sign of the lamb or the path back to the caravan. A surge of panic gripped me. I was lost, utterly lost in a sea of dust and sun-scorched rocks. I tried to retrace my steps, but the land seemed to shift and change with each turn. My breaths became shallow, my chest tight. The asthma that I had kept at bay for so long chose that moment to rear its ugly head. I fumbled for my inhaler, my fingers trembling, but it was not there. In my haste to chase the lamb, I had left it behind. The world began to spin, a dizzying, disorienting sensation that overwhelmed my senses. I struggled to draw breath, each inhalation a battle against the tightening grip in my chest. My vision blurred, the edges of my consciousness fraying as panic and hyperventilation took hold. And then, darkness. When I came to, the world was a different place. The sun had surrendered to the moon and the land was bathed in its pale, silvery light. I sat up, disoriented, my head throbbing with a dull ache. The temperature had dropped, the night air cool against my skin, a stark contrast to the day's heat. I listened, hoping to hear the familiar sounds of the caravan in the distance, but there was only silence. A chilling, oppressive silence that seemed to weigh down on me. Then, the snap of a twig, sharp and clear in the stillness of the night. I turned, my heart pounding in my chest, and in the dim moonlight, I saw it. A dark shape, huddled behind a tree, watching me. For a moment, I thought it was a person, perhaps one of the caravan members come to find me, but as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I realized it was something else, something not quite human. It was then that fear, raw and primal, took hold of me, a fear that seemed to seep into my very bones. I was no longer just lost in the wilderness. I was lost in a world that was no longer familiar, a world where shadows hid secrets, and the night whispered of things best left unseen. The night was eerily quiet as I stared at the shadowy figure behind the tree. My mind raced with questions, yet my voice was paralyzed in my throat. The figure seemed to be observing me, its presence both curious and menacing. In that moonlit moment, the landscape of Black Mesa transformed from a familiar terrain into a realm of unknown threats. Compelled by a mix of fear and curiosity, I called out hesitantly, Hello, is someone there? My voice sounded alien in the stillness, and the figure remained motionless, a dark sentinel against the pale bark of the tree. I took a tentative step forward, my heart pounding against my ribs. I'm with the Colorado caravan, I continued, my voice quivering. I think I'm lost. There was a pause, a breathless stretched moment where the world seemed to hold its breath. Then, the figure slowly emerged from behind the tree. To my bewildered relief, it appeared to be Charlie, a fellow caravan member. 
relief washed over me in an overwhelming wave. Charlie? I called out, my voice tinged with disbelief and hope. The figure motioned for me to follow, and I hesitated only for a moment before complying. My mind was foggy, my judgment clouded by the relief of seeing a familiar face. We walked in silence, the figure leading me through the arroyo's winding paths. The moon cast long, haunting shadows across the landscape, turning every rock and bush into a potential threat. My senses were heightened, every snap of a twig or rustle of the wind sending jolts of fear through me. After what felt like an eternity, another figure materialized from the shadows ahead of us. My heart skipped a beat. This new presence was unexpected, and a sharp bolt of pain, like the onset of a severe migraine, struck me. I stopped dead in my tracks, my head throbbing with an intensity that bordered on unbearable. I squinted through the pain, and as my eyes adjusted, I saw more figures emerging, forming a semicircle around us. Panic surged within me. These were not humans. Their forms were distorted, more akin to large coyotes standing on their hind legs, with an unsettling human-like posture. My breath caught in my throat as I stared into their eyes, ten glowing orbs reflecting the moon's dim light. I was frozen in place, a primal part of my brain screaming at me to run, to escape the nightmare unfolding before me. But I couldn't move. The figures remained still, their gaze fixed on me. The silence was oppressive, punctuated only by my ragged breathing and the pounding of my heart. Then, as if on some unspoken command, they slowly began to advance. Adrenaline kicked in, shattering my paralysis. I turned and ran, stumbling over the uneven ground, my only thought to put as much distance between myself and those unearthly creatures as possible. I heard another twig snap behind me, but I didn't dare look back. I was no longer just lost. I was being hunted. And in that terrifying realization, I knew that the legends and whispers of Black Mesa were more than just stories. They were a warning, one I had failed to heed. My lungs burned as I ran, each breath a ragged gasp in the cold night air. The sounds of pursuit seemed to echo from every direction, a cacophony of rustling and snapping that kept pace with my frantic heartbeat. The moonlit landscape of Black Mesa had become a nightmarish maze, with each turn and twist plunging me deeper into terror. I didn't dare look back, fearing that the sight of those coyote-like figures might paralyze me with fear. Their haunting eyes, glowing in the darkness, were etched into my memory, a chilling reminder that I was prey in a hunt I didn't understand. Suddenly, salvation appeared in the most unlikely form, the headlights of a vehicle cutting through the darkness. It was a Peabody mine worker, driving along a service road. Desperation lent me new energy, and I burst from the brush, waving my arms frantically. The truck screeched to a halt, and the driver, a rugged man with a face weathered by the Arizona sun, peered out at me with a mix of surprise and concern. What in the hell are you doing out here? He asked, his voice gruff with confusion. I didn't have the luxury of coherence. Please, I gasped. I need help. I'm lost, and something's chasing me. Without waiting for an invitation, I clambered into the passenger seat. The driver hesitated for only a moment before hitting the gas, the truck lurching forward. As we drove away, I risked a glance in the rearview mirror. In the fading glow of the brake lights, I saw them. Those haunting eyes, glowing ominously in the darkness. My heart pounded against my ribcage, a drumbeat of fear and relief. The driver, casting wary glances my way, asked no further questions. I could only imagine what I looked like, a wild-eyed, disheveled mess, babbling about being chased by creatures out of a nightmare. Eventually, the lights of the caravan's camp came into view, a beacon of safety in the unforgiving wilderness. The driver stopped at the edge of the camp, clearly reluctant to venture further into what he likely considered superstitious nonsense. I stumbled out of the truck, mumbling thanks and assurances that our caravan leader, Buck, would explain everything. My legs felt like jelly, my mind still reeling from the night's horrors. I ran towards the safety of the camp, but at the last moment, I veered off towards Johnny's family, Hogan. 
I knew it was a breach of cultural respect to seek refuge in a Navajo family's home uninvited, especially as a non-native. But terror had stripped away all social norms and protocols. Johnny's parents, an elderly couple who spoke only Dine, looked up in surprise as I burst into their Hogan. My attempts to explain were a jumble of broken sobs and disjointed words. Yet something in my panicked demeanor transcended the language barrier. Johnny's father's face paled as he pieced together my story. He quickly moved to the window, peering out into the night with a grave expression. Meanwhile, Johnny's mother went to the stove, her movements deliberate and purposeful. She collected a small pan of ashes, which she sprinkled onto a handful of bullets, loading them into a 357 revolver. Her voice, singing what I assumed to be a dine prayer, was both comforting and ominous. They allowed me to stay, a gesture of kindness that I would never forget. As I lay there, listening to the soft murmurs of their prayers, I knew that I had crossed into a world where ancient beliefs and modern nightmares collided. And for one long, restless night, I hovered on the edge of that world, praying for dawn. The first light of dawn crept through the small openings of the Hogan, casting a soft golden glow on the woven rugs and simple furnishings. I lay there, exhausted yet restless, the events of the night replaying in my mind like a haunting melody. Johnny's parents were already awake, moving quietly with a sense of purpose that spoke of deep-rooted traditions and an unspoken understanding of the night's terror. I sat up, my body aching from the tension and fear. The memory of those glowing eyes in the darkness was still vivid, a stark reminder of the inexplicable events I had encountered. Johnny's mother offered me a cup of tea, her eyes reflecting a mix of concern and wisdom. I accepted it with a nod, my throat too tight for words. Johnny arrived shortly after, his expression a mixture of worry and relief upon seeing me. His parents spoke to him in hushed dine, their gestures and tone conveying more than I could understand. He turned to me, his face serious. The medicine man is coming to see you, he said. He'll perform a blessing. It's important. I nodded, feeling a mixture of gratitude and apprehension. The idea of a blessing seemed both alien and necessary, a bridge between my understanding of the world and the mysteries I had just experienced. The medicine man arrived with the sun fully risen, casting long shadows across the desert landscape. He was an elderly man, his face lined with the stories and wisdom of years I could only imagine. He spoke no English, but his presence alone was a comfort. He began his ritual, burning sage and chanting in a rhythmic cadence that filled the Hogan with a sense of ancient power. As he prayed over me, I felt a gradual easing of the tension that had gripped me since the previous night. It was as if his words were weaving a protective shield around me, warding off the darkness that had threatened to consume me. After the ceremony, Johnny spoke quietly with his father, then turned to me. We're cutting the trip short, he said. The walkers won't bother us now that we're leaving, but it's better not to take chances. The term walkers sent a chill down my spine, a confirmation of the supernatural elements I had tried to dismiss. Johnny seemed to read my thoughts. It's rare for them to show themselves, he explained. You were unlucky, or maybe lucky, in a way. Not many people see them and walk away. His words were meant to reassure, but they left me with more questions than answers. The drive back to civilization was quiet, each of us lost in our thoughts. The vast landscape of Black Mesa stretched out around us, unchanged by the events that had unfolded. As we left the reservation, I looked back, half expecting to see those haunting eyes one last time, but there was only the open desert, indifferent and unyielding. I knew one thing for certain, my view of the world had changed. The boundaries between reality and legend, between the seen and the unseen, had blurred. And while I was safe for now, the mystery of what I had encountered would stay with me, a lingering shadow at the edge of my consciousness. I made a silent vow then, no more caravans for me, not after this. The wild, untamed beauty of Black Mesa was something I would admire from a distance, respecting its secrets and the ancient powers that dwelled within.
Several months ago, I found myself in a deeply unsettling situation. It was a typical evening, and I was making my way home after a long day's work in the bustling city. My house, nestled in the suburbs, lay a considerable distance from the city, necessitating an hour-long drive every night after my 10 p.m. shift. The journey, primarily through desolate roads once outside the urban sprawl, was usually uneventful, albeit time-consuming. On this particular night, I felt unusually weary, the kind of fatigue that doesn't stem from any specific cause but simply accumulates over a day. I was about half an hour from home, cruising along a solitary, single-lane highway, when my attention was jolted awake by an unexpected obstruction in the road. Under the dim glow of the streetlights, I could vaguely discern something blocking my path. I cautiously eased onto the brakes, the fog momentarily obscuring my view. As I inched closer, the fog lifted, revealing a massive tree sprawled across the entire road. Confusion set in. There had been no recent storms or strong winds, and the road had been clear when I left in the morning. Leaving my car running but in park, I stepped out to investigate. The surrounding area showed no signs of other fallen trees or damage. Approaching the tree, I realized it stretched from one forest edge to the other, leaving no room to pass. The oddity of the situation began to irk me, especially when I considered the nearest detour was a 15-minute drive back, adding an hour to my already long journey. Contemplating calling for help, I stood by the tree, lost in thought. That's when a light suddenly pierced through the branches from the other side. It wasn't an approaching vehicle. The car must have been there already, its lights only now flicking on. As I tried to peer through the foliage, the sound of a car door opening and closing reached me, followed by footsteps. Hello? I called out, attempting to alleviate the tension. A mumble came in response, but it seemed unrelated to my greeting. I assumed the other person was equally frustrated with the roadblock. Then the branches began to move, rustling as a figure clambered over the tree. I instinctively retreated towards my car. The figure, a man with a short beard and buzz cut, dressed in a thick jacket, landed on my side of the road. His approach was silent, his face expressionless. I hurried into my car, my instincts screaming danger. The man quickened his pace, reaching my window just as I closed the door. He stared blankly at me, knocking on the glass without a word. What do you need? I asked, my voice tinged with fear. He continued to knock, now more aggressively, his fists pounding against the window. In a panic, I threw the car into reverse, a dull thud sounding as the door latch presumably tore from his grasp. That sound confirmed my worst fears. I spun the car around and sped off, too focused to even glance in the rearview mirror. Once I reached the bypass, I stopped to report the incident. Predictably, the man and his car were gone when authorities arrived. I later learned that the tree had been deliberately cut down, an act that made the evening news due to its seemingly malicious intent. Whether the strange man was responsible remained a mystery. Since that night, I haven't experienced anything similar on that route. But every evening as I drive home, even on my most exhausted days, I find myself wide awake, alert, and watchful, haunted by the memory of that eerie encounter on the road. I was 29 years old when this harrowing incident unfolded. It was a chilly winter evening, and my husband and I had made plans to visit his parents' house outside the city, where we intended to stay for a few weeks. Given my husband's late work hours, we decided it would be better for me to set out with our five-year-old daughter earlier in the day, while he would follow a couple of hours later. As we hit the road at around 3 p.m., I couldn't help but feel a sense of confidence that we would reach our destination without any trouble. However, the winter nights came quickly, and by 4.30 p.m., it was already pitch black outside. We were still about an hour and a half away from my in-law's house, and while I didn't have a particular sense of foreboding, as a mother, I couldn't help but have concerns lurking in the back of my mind. We were driving down a desolate back road with no street lights and the feeling of utter isolation began to gnaw at me. Nevertheless, I tried to shake off my unease, 
reassuring myself that we'd soon arrive safely. After all, we had driven this route countless times without incident. Around 30 minutes from our destination, I noticed flashing lights in the distance. Two blinking yellow lights in the middle of the road, which I quickly identified as hazard lights on a car. A sense of dread washed over me as I realized that this car wasn't pulled over to the side, but was blocking the road entirely. I brought the car to a stop about 80 to 100 feet away from the stranded vehicle, trying to decide what to do. One thing I was certain of was that I couldn't risk stopping to help these strangers. Alone in my late twenties with my young daughter, it would have been reckless to put ourselves in harm's way. I made up my mind to call for help once we were safely away. I assumed any woman in my situation would prioritize her and her child's safety above all else. Sitting there, I must have spent what felt like an eternity contemplating my next move. With no cell service, I couldn't reach my husband or father-in-law. Ultimately, I decided to turn around and head back. But it wasn't that simple on a two-lane road. A three-point turn would take too long. Just as I hesitated, my rearview mirror caught sight of shadows rapidly approaching in the moonlight. They were about 30 feet behind my car, and as they drew nearer, I realized they were people, seemingly carrying something. I couldn't stay put any longer. My body reacted before my mind could catch up. I shifted the car into drive and floored the gas pedal. While it wasn't a high-performance vehicle, it responded enough to put distance between us and those approaching figures. As I passed by, more people emerged from the roadside, hurling objects in a desperate attempt to stop me. I sideswiped one of them, and my windshield was struck and cracked by a projectile. I screamed from the impact and my daughter, in turn, began to cry. I reassured her as best I could, but she was just five years old, and my words did little to console her. My sole focus remained on getting us away from those people. Before I knew it, we were pulling up to my in-law's street, which had a guarded entrance. I pressed the button to be allowed in, and the security personnel immediately recognized our distress when they answered. We were granted access, and my father-in-law met me at the driveway armed with a gun. I was in tears, and my daughter clung to her grandmother, equally distraught. Once inside, I recounted everything that had transpired. My father-in-law, fiercely protective of us, was visibly angered by the ordeal. He repeatedly inquired if they had followed us to this location, but I couldn't be certain as I hadn't been paying attention to the cars behind us. I was solely focused on reaching the safety of their house. My in-laws were known for their strict security measures, complete with numerous firearms and surveillance cameras both inside and outside their property. They examined the security footage and noticed a car passing by their front gate repeatedly as if it was circling the area. Realizing the gravity of the situation, we decided to contact the police. Unfortunately, they informed us that they couldn't assist because it wasn't considered an emergency and was beyond their city limits. My father-in-law made it explicitly clear that anyone entering their property would be dealt with if necessary, and the police acknowledged his rights before hanging up. He armed my mother-in-law and me and instructed us to wait inside the house while he went outside to inspect the property. We anxiously watched the security cameras, and as he approached the gate, the car returned. This time, it stopped right at the gate, and two individuals got out. They seemed oblivious to my father-in-law's approach and began pushing the gate. Since we couldn't hear their exchange, all we saw was my father-in-law firing a shot into the air, yelling at them. They hastily retreated to their car and sped away. My husband arrived an hour later, filled with apologies for having allowed me to drive alone. I reassured him that it wasn't his fault and that the outcome would have been the same if he had been with us. The most important thing was that we were safe. A few days later, we learned that there had been several carjackings in the area. Fortunately, no one had been seriously injured during these incidents. I shudder to think about what might have happened had I not spotted those individuals approaching us from behind. I remain grateful that we emerged from that nightmarish situation unharmed, and I've since made it a point never to drive at night without proper protection, whether it's my husband or a firearm.
I'll never forget that fateful night. My girlfriend Jessica and I were the adventurous type, always seeking to escape the confines of our home and immerse ourselves in the great outdoors. We had jobs that allowed us to set our own schedules, working for a larger company, but maintaining the freedom to choose when and where we worked. It was this freedom that led us to embark on a camping trip deep into the wilderness, away from the hustle and bustle of city life. As twilight cast long shadows over the rugged terrain, we decided to go camping for about a week. Our destination was a state park known for its untouched beauty and the fact that you could camp there for free without the need for permits or approval. We eagerly packed our bags, eager for the adventure that lay ahead. We drove along a dirt road for what seemed like hours, completely engulfed in the darkness of the night. It was then that I made a terrible mistake. I didn't turn on my high beams. I couldn't fathom why I hadn't thought of it earlier, and this oversight would haunt me for the rest of my life. To make matters worse, I was driving too fast for the treacherous terrain, and the combination of factors would lead us down a harrowing path. Suddenly, Jessica let out a blood-curdling scream, and in the faint moonlight we both saw it, a massive fallen tree blocking our path. With little time to react, I slammed on the brakes, desperately hoping we could stop before colliding with the obstacle. But luck was not on our side that night. The sickening crash into the tree sent me into unconsciousness for a few seconds. When I came to, my head was throbbing, and the ringing in my ears was deafening. But my immediate concern was Jessica. In the dim light, I could see that her eyes were closed, and she was unresponsive. Panic set in. My phone became my lifeline as I fumbled to turn on the flashlight, directing its beam toward her. What I saw was beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Blood, stark against her white shirt, stained her chest. It was then that I noticed the branch, about the circumference of a finger, protruding through her chest, a gruesome sight that defied comprehension. It was still attached to the tree, the cruel instrument of our tragedy. Fearful of causing further harm, I refrained from touching her. I reached for my phone to dial 911, but there was no signal in this remote location. Desperation took hold as I considered our limited options. The truck wouldn't start, making escape impossible. My pocket held a small knife, and it became the only glimmer of hope in the darkness. Climbing onto the hood of the truck, I attempted to cut the branch, but the small knife made little progress. Panic surged through me. Precious minutes passed, and Jessica remained unconscious. An agonizing hour ticked by, and I could do nothing but pray. A strange act for someone who had long abandoned faith. I clung to hope, praying for hours in what felt like an eternity. I dared to hope because, miraculously, Jessica was not actively bleeding during that hour. The branch had missed her heart, offering a slim chance of survival. I checked her pulse. It was weak, but it persisted. All I could do was wait for help that seemed impossibly distant. Then like an answer to my prayers or a stroke of luck, I saw headlights approaching from behind us. My heart raced as I leaped out of the truck, screaming and waving frantically. The driver pulled up behind us and rolled down his window, demanding to know what was wrong. I rushed to explain our dire situation, stammering through the details. It took a moment for him to grasp the gravity of the situation. He cursed under his breath and shone his flashlight on Jessica, confirming our worst fears. Without hesitation, the man retrieved a chainsaw from his truck, and I trembled at the thought of what lay ahead. He began sawing the branch about a foot in front of Jessica's chest, while I covered her with a blanket to protect her from the sawdust. The vibrations of the chainsaw, though unsettling, did not stir her. Finally, the branch was severed, and Jessica was free from her wooden prison. The man and I handled her with the utmost care, placing her gently in the back seat of his truck. I joined him in the passenger seat and he sped down the treacherous mountain road, heading toward help. Jessica remained unconscious throughout the journey. We arrived at an EMT station, a place I had not known existed in this remote wilderness. The medical personnel were surprised by our unexpected arrival. They quickly transferred her to an ambulance, and I climbed in with her. The nearest hospital wasn't too far away, thank goodness, but it lacked a trauma center. She needed to be airlifted to a larger city, an hour away by helicopter. 
The doctor's grim assessment revealed that she had a punctured lung, but her heart remained unscathed. If the branch had been an inch to the left, she would have perished within minutes. Jessica spent almost two weeks in a coma. When she finally awakened, her pain was excruciating, and she struggled to speak due to the trauma in her chest. She endured extensive surgeries to repair the damage. But the possibility of a lung transplant loomed in the future. I was grateful beyond measure that she had survived, and I remained in close contact with the man who had saved her life. Though Jessica still depended on oxygen and experienced breathing difficulties, we attended her monthly appointments, determined to help her on the long road to recovery. We understood that full recovery might be elusive, but we were prepared to face whatever lay ahead together. I asked Jessica to marry me while she was still in the hospital, and she said yes. Regardless of the challenges ahead, I looked forward to spending the rest of our lives together. That night will forever be etched in our memories, and while I struggle to forgive myself for the accident, I am grateful that it's a memory Jessica doesn't have to bear. It was a dark, moonless night, and the clock on my dashboard read 3 a.m. I was exhausted, driving home from a work meeting that had run late. This meeting was a once-a-year ordeal, and it had taken place a grueling eight hours away from my workplace. The long, desolate road stretched out before me, winding through the countryside. Driving through this part of the state was always a dreary experience, as outside the city it was mostly farmland with miles and miles of plain fields of crops. At least on these barren roads, I could space out and only had to focus on keeping my car on a straight path. As I continued on my journey, seemingly endless fields of crops blurred by in the darkness. Then, out of nowhere, I saw a massive gap in the crops to the right of the road. It was as if a part of the field had been torn away, revealing a car wedged deep into the crops. It looked like the vehicle had careened off the road and became hopelessly entangled. This sight was unexpected, and I couldn't quite understand how driving into a field of crops could be all that harmful. It certainly didn't seem serious enough for me to call for help, especially since there was still cell service out here. The car was also eerily silent, its engine off, which led me to believe that the driver had already been picked up or had walked away from the scene. I continued driving, putting the peculiar sight behind me, just a minute or two down the road, I noticed a set of headlights approaching in front of me. As I drew closer, it became apparent that the vehicle ahead was moving at an exceptionally slow pace. I had to swerve into the other lane to pass it. The speed limit on this highway was 80 miles per hour, but the car in front of me couldn't have been going more than 25 miles per hour. It was a dangerous pace for such a late hour. After I passed the sluggish vehicle, I expected it to speed up and disappear into the distance. Instead, to my astonishment, it merged into the oncoming traffic lane and pulled up alongside my car. I turned my gaze to the driver's side window and was met with a chilling sight. A man, appearing to be in his mid-forties with long, disheveled hair and an unkempt beard, was staring directly into my eyes. What was unsettling was that he didn't seem angry. Instead, he wore a faint, ominous smirk. Feeling my nerves fray, I shifted my focus back to the road, hoping that the bizarre encounter would end there. However, the car beside me abruptly sped up, swerving in front of me and slamming on its brakes. I had to react quickly to avoid a collision, and I too slammed on my brakes, skidding to a halt behind the strange car. It then maneuvered to block both lanes of the road, leaving me trapped. I sat there in shock, about fifteen feet behind the mysterious car unable to comprehend the severity of the situation. The man wasted no time, jumping out of his car and sprinting directly toward me. In one hand, he brandished a gun, and he now had a hood pulled over his head. Panic surged through me as I realized the danger I was in. With no time to spare, I floored the gas pedal, desperately trying to escape. My car lurched forward, but for a terrifying moment, it felt as though it wouldn't respond. Panic clawed at my throat and a wave of terror coursed through me as I imagined the horrors that could await me. Had the other car I'd seen earlier in the crops fallen victim to this menacing stranger as well? 
Suddenly, my wheels found traction, and I was able to swerve my car out of the field and onto the other side of the road. In the distance, a single gunshot echoed, a chilling reminder of the danger I had narrowly escaped. My heart pounded as I sped away from that horrifying encounter. I dialed 911, my voice trembling, and provided every detail of what had just transpired. I also mentioned the car I had seen earlier, wedged in the field of crops. Despite the police's efforts, the man who had tried to stop me on that desolate road was never found. They managed to locate the other car, but it was empty, with no signs of the driver. It was as if they had abruptly veered off the road, become trapped, and then vanished without a trace. The eerie similarity between their situation and what could have happened to me sent shivers down my spine. If I had become stuck in that field, the other person in that car might not have been the only one to disappear that fateful night. I really wasn't planning on telling this story, but it's been a few years, and I'm not as freaked out by what happened as I used to be, so why not? I was only 19 at the time. I had moved across the country the year before college and had never had any issues driving home for the different breaks that we had over the school year. It was winter break and my mom really wanted me to come home that year to celebrate the holidays with my family, since I hadn't the year before. I agreed, but I really didn't want to leave my car for weeks. There had been a lot of car break-ins in the city that I lived in, and leaving my car to be vandalized, broken into, or stolen just was not an option to me. I told my mom that I'd be driving home, and she wasn't too happy about it, but understood. She offered to have my dad fly out and drive with me, but I didn't want them to go through all that trouble, and I thought a few days on the road by myself would be a good thing. I'd been having issues in my personal life, and having the time to think about it without any distractions seemed like a good thing to me. I packed up a few bags that wouldn't last me the next few weeks, and said goodbye to my roommate, who was pretty bummed out about me leaving. I headed out the door. Looking back on it now, my car probably wasn't worth what I went through during that drive home. It was a 20-year-old Honda Civic that had the propensity to break down a lot, and by a lot, I mean at least once a month. I just didn't have the money to replace it. I hopped in the car and was on the highway within a few minutes. I got some coffee before heading out of the city so I could stay awake as long as possible. It was still around 8 in the morning, so I figured I'd drive for around 10 hours before hopefully finding a hotel and settling in for the night. I had no definite plans and was following the fastest route home, which probably wasn't the best decision. I know now that I should have taken the route that didn't involve long stretches of highway with nothing but fields for miles and miles. I stopped a few times for bathroom and snack breaks, and by around 7 p.m., I was done. I'd been driving for almost 11 hours and didn't want to be a hazard to myself or others on the road if I kept driving while being that exhausted. I found a relatively nice hotel and got a room for the night, planning to continue my drive the next morning. That day, I'd be driving through parts of the Midwest, and it wasn't necessarily something I was looking forward to. The last time I drove through it, it was a lot of just flat land and cornfields, both things I thought were boring to look at on a long road trip. It was winter, though, so there was no corn. The weather could have been better, but I had no issues the day before, so I hoped that it would stay that way. The day went by faster than the previous one, and the sun was down before I knew it. By 6 p.m., I was feeling pretty good to keep going, so I passed through the next city and drove on. Around 7, I started hearing a knocking sound, and I wanted to cry when I realized that it was coming from my engine and it started to snow. My car began to creep along the road until I pulled to the side of the road where it completely gave out. It was getting cold without the heater on, and I knew that I had to get help very soon. I checked Google Maps to see if I was close to another city, but the next town, albeit a very small one, was still almost an hour away. I tried calling my parents to tell them what happened, but my service was completely out. I decided to use the emergency calls only button on my phone to call for help, and thank God it worked. The only problem was the closest officer that could respond was at least an hour away in the town that I mentioned earlier. I told the dispatcher that obviously I'd wait, 
and she instructed me to lock the doors and try to hide myself inside the car enough to where it looked as though no one was inside. Apparently, right where my car decided to die on me also happened to be a very sketchy section of the highway that wasn't very safe for stranded drivers, especially young women. I'm not gonna lie. Having the dispatcher tell me that made me feel physically ill. I felt like I was going to have a heart attack with how fast my heart was racing. I put up a sun shield in the windshield area and thankfully had three extra ones in the car from when I went car camping. I decided to put those along the sides and back windshield as well so no one could see inside. From the outside it would look almost black. Around 30 minutes into me waiting, I started getting the feeling like somebody was watching me. Now, I tried convincing myself that it was just because of the situation that I was in, and that all the windows were covered anyway, so there was no way that that was possible. I wanted to shake it off, but the feeling just wouldn't go away, no matter how much I told myself that it was okay. There was something inside of me telling me the situation I was in was about to get very, very scary. I turned on the screen on my phone and faced it in the direction of the windows, not knowing what I was about to see would traumatize me for years to come. At first, I felt some ease seeing only the reflection of the sun shield. I turned my phone towards the passenger side windows, and in the small crack that wasn't covered, to my horror, a strip of window was visible. On the other side of the window was the face of a man pressed against the glass with a smile, staring directly at me. My first reaction was this blood-curdling scream. It was a sound that I didn't know that I even had the ability to make. It was like fear itself was manifesting in sound. It almost actually rang in my ears. The second the scream left my mouth, I watched as the man lifted his face from the glass and heard him begin to laugh, the most awful guttural laugh I'd ever heard. Immediately, I heard the car move as the man violently tried the door handle to get access into my car. I was screaming and crying as he hurled himself around the car, howling like it was some animal. Between his laughing, it felt like he was taunting me in a way. I called 911 again and was screaming that I needed help now. The woman who answered the second time wasn't as friendly as the first I'd spoken to only 30 minutes prior. She kept yelling at me to stop screaming, otherwise she wouldn't be able to help me. I was crying trying my best to calm down as the man just outside my car was putting me through this. She hung up on me, and I felt completely helpless. The only relief that I was feeling at the moment was the fact that he hadn't been able to break into my car. I called 911 again, hoping I'd get a dispatcher with more empathy, and thankfully, that was the case. A man answered and immediately took my distress into account and helped me calm down enough to get the information he needed. The officer had been sent almost 45 minutes before, and now was only around 10 minutes away. I was told that they'd have him get to me as quickly as possible given what I was going through. I was hopeful, but that hope was ripped away when I heard the sound of what was obviously a rock being thrown at my windshield. It shattered just enough to motivate the man to get on top of my hood and start stomping the windshield until it was broken enough for him to reach a hand inside. I screamed and climbed into the back seat. I was trying my best to get out of reach of this very insane and clearly dangerous person. They started tearing the windshield out of the way, and his face was even scarier than it was the first time I saw it. I was paralyzed with fear as I watched him begin to climb between the glass into the car. I had no choice but to get out of the car and hope the officer was close by. I opened the door and turned on my phone's flashlight. I faced it toward the hood and was so relieved to see that he had become stuck. He was trying to climb out but wasn't able to. I then saw the beautiful flashing red and blue lights in the distance and heard the sirens as he drove closer. I started frantically waving him down and he pulled up beside me. He was out of his car in seconds and another police car was pulling up behind him only a few minutes later. I was placed in one of the cop cars and watched as they actually drew their guns out demanding that the man climb out of the car. This crazy guy was screaming and thrashing his body around. One of the officers grabbed him by the ankles and pulled him out of the vehicle. The man tried biting him multiple times before being slammed to the ground and handcuffed. They put him in the back of the other car and told me more officers would be coming down to take pictures of the scene, 
and a tow truck would be on its way to tow my car. I was driven to the police station and gave my statement about everything that happened. I called my parents, who bought me a plane ticket home from the nearest airport, which the officers were nice enough to drive me to. I wish I could tell you the man who did that to me, and even give a reason as to why, but he didn't. He was so mentally deranged that they said he wasn't even fit to stand trial. Eventually, I guess he was taken to some state mental hospital where the last I heard, he's still there. I wish that there was some justice for the hell that he put me through, and maybe some people would say there was, but to me, it wasn't justice. He isn't being punished. The memory of what happened punishes me every day. It's gotten easier to deal with as time goes by, but it'll always be there to torture me any time I'm reminded of that man in the window. I was driving my truck back home from my girlfriend's apartment. It was a stormy night, with heavy rain and darkness enveloping the town. Despite the adverse weather conditions, I wasn't too concerned. After all, my house was only a ten-minute drive away, and I had to work early the next day. All my work clothes were at my place, so I had no choice but to brave the storm. The power had gone out, leaving the streets in complete darkness. The only source of illumination was my truck's headlights, casting an eerie glow on the rain-slicked road ahead. The relentless downpour pounded on my windshield, and my wipers struggled to keep up, making it feel like I was driving blind. Yet I knew these streets like the back of my hand. Muscle memory guided my turns and calculated distances as I navigated the familiar route. I turned onto the road that led to my house, but almost immediately, a sense of unease crept over me. Something wasn't right. It felt as though my truck was floating, and I sensed moisture creeping in around my feet. Inside the cab, the lights flickered ominously. I peered out, and through my headlights, I could see the water outside rising steadily. Panic began to set in as my truck was slowly consumed by the encroaching flood. The current tugged at my vehicle, dragging it further into the watery abyss. Frantically, I unbuckled my seatbelt and attempted to open the driver's side door, but it wouldn't yield. Water was now seeping in rapidly, reaching my knees. I remembered my father's advice about not panicking in life-threatening situations. Taking deep breaths, I reached for a waterproof flashlight in my glove box. With trembling hands I turned it on, scanning the dark interior for something to break the window. Unfortunately, I had recently cleaned out the truck and left my tools behind. All I had was my sweater, the small flashlight, and a pocket knife. Desperation compelled me to dial 911. However, I was greeted with a recorded message, informing me that all dispatchers were occupied with other calls due to the storm. The voice assured me that they would respond as soon as possible. The dispatcher's indifference only fueled my fear. Time was slipping away as the water continued to rise. The water level had now reached my belly button, and I was rapidly losing hope. Squatting on my seat, I struggled to keep my head above water. It was clear that most of the water was seeping in from the driver's side door. I grabbed my sweater and tried to use it as a makeshift barrier, but it proved futile. Seven agonizing minutes later, a dispatcher finally answered. I relayed my dire situation, but they offered little comfort. They explained that many others were also trapped in flooding situations, and it would take at least 30 minutes for help to arrive. I pleaded for them to stay on the line, but they cited the overwhelming demand for dispatchers during the storm and advised me to call back if the situation worsened. I hung up, realizing that I couldn't afford to wait another seven minutes if things deteriorated further. Panic surged as the water reached my chest. My pleas to my parents went unanswered as I continued to record my voice messages, my shaky words filled with a mixture of desperation and resignation. Only ten minutes after my call to 911, the water had climbed to my neck, and I was convinced that my time was running out. With my cheek pressed against the roof, tears streamed down my face. No one was coming to my rescue, and despair gripped me. Suddenly, the sound of an approaching engine broke through my despair. I hadn't expected anyone to notice my stranded truck in the darkness, but I screamed and flashed my light to draw their attention. 
relief flooded over me as a boat pulled up alongside my truck. I directed my flashlight towards the person who jumped into the water next to my driver's side window. They had a window breaker and shattered it on their first attempt. Grabbing hold of my shirt, they pulled me out through the window. I gasped for air as they hoisted me onto the boat. Overwhelmed with gratitude, I thanked them profusely for saving my life as I took deep, shuddering breaths. An emergency blanket was wrapped around me, providing a much-needed sense of warmth and security. We continued to rescue others trapped in their vehicles before finally reaching an area where police and firefighters were waiting. I was transported to a hospital, but fortunately, I didn't have any serious medical issues. I felt immensely thankful to be alive. It was a harrowing experience, and I had come dangerously close to becoming a tragic statistic. The incident left me deeply disillusioned with my city's emergency services. On that fateful night, it was good Samaritans, not law enforcement, who had come to my aid. I hoped that no one else would ever find themselves in the same dire situation. But if they did, I prayed that someone would rescue them in time, just as I had been saved that night. In the months that followed, I battled nightmares of drowning. Even now, I felt a shiver of fear whenever I had to drive in a storm or venture out on deep water. I had attempted therapy a few times, but it hadn't provided the solace I needed, so I had eventually stopped. I longed for the day when I could finally move on from that traumatic night and banish its haunting memory from my life. I was grateful to be alive, but the scars ran deep, reminding me of the night I had come so close to losing everything. I had just completed a grueling 24-hour shift in construction and management. My workplace had no qualms about overworking us when deadlines loomed, and the promise of overtime pay often kept us going. As I drove home from the job site, the clock was nearing 3 in the morning and the road was empty, save for the occasional set of headlights in the distance. The exhaustion was taking its toll on me, and I knew I was being reckless by attempting to drive in such a state. Nevertheless, all I craved was my bed, and I pushed on. During the drive, my eyelids drooped dangerously several times, almost causing me to veer off the road. Just as my weariness seemed insurmountable, a chilling sight snapped me awake. There, on the side of the deserted road, sat a young girl, no older than seven or eight. I initially passed her by, but a nagging feeling in my gut prompted me to turn my car around and check if she needed help. I pulled up beside her, and her gaze met mine. Her eyes held a peculiar, unsettling intensity. I asked if she was okay or needed assistance, but she remained silent, her lips sealed tightly. My sense of unease grew stronger, and I reassured her that I meant her no harm, coaxing her to get into my car. She hesitated for a moment before finally complying. My plan was to take her to the nearest police station, hoping they could identify her and reunite her with her family. I made countless attempts to elicit information from her during the drive, but she remained mute, fixated on me with those unnerving eyes. The silence in the car was deafening as we continued down the dark, desolate road for another ten minutes. Then, unbelievably, it happened again. I spotted another child, this time a little boy, sitting on the side of the road. He too refused to speak, and without hesitation climbed into my car. I repeated my questions, but he responded with the same eerie silence, his gaze mirroring the girl's, locked on to me. Panic began to claw at the edges of my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had unwittingly stumbled into something sinister. Were these children kidnapped and abandoned here? Was it some horrifying trafficking situation, or had they simply become lost? The question swirled in my mind, unanswered. Another fifteen agonizing minutes passed, and my worst fears were realized when I saw a car seat on the side of the road. I pulled over and with trepidation got out of my car. To my horror, a little baby was nestled inside, its age unclear but seemingly healthy. Its innocent eyes met mine, and I knew I couldn't leave it there. I placed the car seat in the back of my car and dialed the police immediately, relief washing over me as I got a signal. They instructed me to go to the nearby hospital and they promised to meet me there. 
I arrived at the hospital shortly after the call and carried the car seat inside, beckoning the children to follow. The receptionist was the only person there, and I frantically explained the situation. To my bewilderment, her response was a puzzled and confused expression. I motioned for the children to stand beside her, imploring her to help, but she seemed oblivious to their presence. My frustration mounted as she repeatedly asked if I was okay, completely ignoring the children and the baby in the car seat. I couldn't fathom why she couldn't see them, or why she was so intent on my well-being when it was the children who needed assistance. As I was recounting the story to the receptionist, two police officers entered the hospital. I told them the same bewildering tale, but they too were unable to see the children standing right in front of them. I was utterly perplexed and growing desperate as they concluded that there were no children with me. Instead, they believed I was experiencing some form of mental episode. I protested, insisting that I had never had any mental health issues, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. I was admitted to the hospital under a 72-hour observation cycle due to my persistent hallucinations, as they deemed me a potential danger to myself and others. Their certainty was disconcerting, and I was convinced that they were the ones who were delusional. Over the next few days, I underwent numerous tests and evaluations to uncover the root of my bizarre experiences. Initially, they attributed it to severe sleep deprivation, a common cause of hallucinations. However, even after hours of sleep, the hallucinations persisted, raising suspicions of a deeper issue. I was scared and felt trapped in a nightmarish world. Desperate for answers, I called my mother, who came to the hospital and provided our family's medical history to the doctors. After the 72 hours elapsed, I decided to stay at the hospital, as I had no other explanation for what was happening to me. In the following weeks, the children continued to follow me everywhere. They watched me sleep, providing a strange comfort, but also serving as a constant reminder that something was profoundly wrong with me. The hallucinations, however, were no longer my sole concern. I began to experience speech difficulties and struggled to think clearly, further perplexing the doctors. This cognitive decline prompted further investigation, and during an MRI, one attentive doctor noticed a shadow. It turned out that I had a small but malignant frontal lobe tumor, compressing the optic nerve. Regrettably, its proximity to the optic nerve ruled out surgical removal. Nevertheless, the doctors remained hopeful that chemotherapy and radiation could combat the cancer cells, given that it had been detected at an early stage. I embarked on a course of chemotherapy and radiation, and as the weeks passed, the hallucinations diminished in frequency. Part of me began to miss their presence, as they had become strangely familiar companions. Most importantly, they had led me to the hospital, where my life-threatening condition was discovered early. I am still undergoing treatment, and while my official prognosis remains uncertain, I choose to hold on to hope. Without the eerie encounter on that fateful night, I might have never sought medical attention and my life could have taken a much darker turn. Hope is my constant companion now, a beacon guiding me through the uncertainty that lies ahead. I drive part-time for Uber Eats as a college student, and it's a great gig that I can work around my school schedule. This eerie incident occurred one night after my classes, probably around 11 p.m. I didn't have class until late in the afternoon the next day, so I decided to stay up late and complete as many food deliveries as I could. I received an unusual grocery order to pick up from a 7-Eleven and deliver to an address about 15 minutes away. The directions led me through a few neighborhoods, eventually taking me to the back roads that led into a densely wooded area. As I approached the end of a gravel road, I glanced at the address on the app which indicated that it was down this path. However, all I could see were safety cones and construction materials, with no streetlights to illuminate the way. With caution, I ventured down the path, switching on my brights and carefully maneuvering through the obstacles until I reached the last turn. This section was even more unsettling, resembling a path more than a road. 
I consulted the map again, and it was clear that the address was indeed at the end of this mysterious path. I raised my head, peering into the darkness ahead. As my eyes adjusted, I started to discern a structure at the end of the path. It looked somewhat like a house, but there was an undeniable eerie quality about it. My senses tingled with unease, and as I scanned my surroundings, I began to make out more houses in the vicinity. The limited light from my headlights prevented me from seeing them clearly, but it appeared to be a community of newly built houses under construction. Considering this, I reasoned that the house marked on my GPS might be one of the few completed ones. I turned and proceeded down the path, pulling into an empty cul-de-sac with a lone house. Up close, it was apparent that the house was not entirely finished, although the front appeared nearly done, complete with a door. Despite the bizarre situation, I reminded myself that my job was simply to deliver the groceries and not to concern myself with someone else's housing situation. I parked my car, retrieved the grocery bags, and approached the front door. All the lights were off, and an eerie silence enveloped the area, making me increasingly uneasy. Placing the bags on the doorstep, I knocked, but there was no response. As I turned to make my way back to the car, something caught my peripheral vision. In the shadows near the edge of the woods, I saw movement. My heart skipped a beat, and I froze for a moment, staring into the dark abyss. Whatever it was had ceased moving. Panic surged through me, urging me to hurry back to my car. I reached the vehicle, started the engine, and as my headlights pierced the darkness, I saw a man standing exactly where I had seen the movement in the woods. His eyes were locked onto me, his gaze intense and unsettling. Without taking my eyes off him, I started to back out, but my anxiety had me gripping the wheel too tightly. I barely noticed as my car jolted backward, first at the rear tires, then at the front. The entire vehicle rocked violently for a moment. My adrenaline surged, preventing me from getting a good look at what had caused the disturbance. I hit the gas harder, getting off the path and onto the gravel road. As I entered the normal neighborhood, it became evident that my car was shaking and bumping, and there was no doubt I had several flat tires. I managed to pull over somewhere I felt safer and immediately called the police. They conducted a search of the address and the Uber Eats account only to find that the address led to an unfinished, uninhabited property, and the account itself was a throwaway. The police did discover several large sharpened metal objects on the path, likely placed there after I had pulled in as an attempt to immobilize me. What the intentions of those individuals were, once they had me trapped out there in the woods, remains a mystery. Perhaps they aimed to rob me, or worse, but I was grateful I didn't have to find out. I was 17 years old and had just gotten my driver's license. Looking back, I admit I was the typical self-absorbed teenager, too impatient and reckless for my own good. It was a Friday night, and I was desperately trying to persuade my mom to let me take the car to meet up with my friends. She, on the other hand, was adamant about not letting me go, convinced that I was planning to go out drinking and drive under the influence. I kept reassuring her that I had no intention of doing anything like that, but she remained unwavering in her decision. In a fit of frustration, I uttered the words I would later come to regret, I hate you. Slamming the door to my room, I resolved to sneak out later that night, around 11 p.m. With my mom asleep in her bed and my dad out of town, I figured it would be easy to make my escape. Earlier in the night, I had already swiped the car keys. So as stealthily as I could, I crawled out of my window and onto the front lawn. My mom had forced me to install Life360 on my phone, a decision I now wish I had never agreed to. To avoid her tracking my location, I turned off the app, thinking I could fool her if she happened to notice I was gone. She was the type of mom who'd call the police if I didn't return when I was supposed to. I sent a quick text to my friends, asking where they were, and predictably, they had driven all the way to LA. Despite being over an hour away from their location, I made the foolish decision to go after them. The traffic on the freeway was unbearable, so I decided to take some side streets, 
hoping for a faster route. Living in Southern California meant one thing for sure. Traffic, everywhere, all the time. As I continued driving, I became increasingly lost. Refusing to turn on my phone for directions, I sought to reach a freeway, hoping it would lead me back home. Time slipped away, and the later it got, the more disoriented I felt. I had to admit to myself, I was scared, and all I really wanted was my mom. I meandered through side roads, alleys, and sketchy neighborhoods, not giving a thought to my own safety. Then I turned down a narrow road and was met with a shock, a truck blocking my path parked sideways as if deliberately. When I attempted to reverse, a man suddenly appeared, pointing a gun at my face and pounding on my window. Panic coursed through me, and I did as he instructed. He ordered me out of the car and shoved me to the ground. Another man rushed over and started kicking me relentlessly, each blow feeling like it might rupture my stomach. I begged them to stop, screaming for help. But a few others just stood by, watching the assault. Lying there, utterly helpless, all I wished for was my dad to miraculously appear and save me. I knew it was impossible, but the thought of seeing my parents again was the only glimmer of hope I had. The beating seemed endless, and I realized they believed I had passed out, though I hadn't. I lay motionless, my arms shielding my head and face. That was when one of them got the horrifying idea to stomp on my face. As soon as my arms moved, his foot came crashing down on my jaw. In that moment, the adrenaline coursing through my body dulled the pain, but I'd come to understand later just how excruciating it truly was. Eventually, the beating ceased. I guess they thought I was unconscious, but I wasn't. I was simply incapable of moving any part of my body. Flashes of light pierced through my closed eyelids, and I realized they were taking pictures of me as if they were proud of their vicious act. They laughed as they searched my pockets, making off with my keys, wallet, and phone before driving away in my car. All I could think about was how much I wished I had listened to my mom and stayed home. I lay there, the pain slowly setting in. My jaw throbbed the most. It felt broken. With great effort, I managed to open my eyes in the dim light, only to see red staining the asphalt around me. I tried to lift myself up, but the agony was too intense. Tears streamed down my face as the horrifying realization washed over me. There was a significant chance I might pass right there, alone on a desolate street. The last thing I had said to my mom was that I hated her, but I didn't. I just wanted to see her more than anything, to have her by my side, getting me the help I so desperately needed, reassuring me that everything would be okay. I must have lost consciousness because the next thing I remember is paramedics waking me up, asking for my name and what had happened. I was still sprawled out on the road as they prepared to load me onto a stretcher, with an ambulance nearby waiting to take me to the nearest hospital. I could barely speak, but I managed to utter my name before blacking out once again. It seemed like an eternity before I regained consciousness in the hospital, a week having passed since that fateful night. My jaw was wired shut, the result of the brutal stomp to my face. My mom was sitting beside my hospital bed, tears streaming down her face as I recounted the terrifying details of what I had endured. The police and doctors told me that it was likely part of some gang initiation, and that I was incredibly lucky to be alive. As they described my injuries, it became painfully clear how close I had come to losing my life that night. Multiple broken ribs, Internal bleeding from relentless kicks to my torso, a broken jaw, nose, and various other facial fractures. The list was harrowing. But the most horrifying revelation was that my Achilles tendons had been severed. To this day, nobody can explain why they did that, or why I hadn't felt it happen. I underwent surgery on both my ankles, and even now, I face the prospect of more surgeries and extensive physical therapy before I could even think about walking normally again. I remained in the hospital for months before being allowed to return home. I couldn't help but feel foolish for my reckless decision. What had happened to me was the worst case scenario of what could occur when a teenager takes their parents' car without permission. I'm not sharing this story to make you believe that disobedience leads to such horrors. 
it's far from common. Instead, I hope my experience serves as a reminder that sometimes our parents do know best. They possess life experience, wisdom, and unconditional love that we should never take for granted. I'm a single mother and I know a lot of people will roll their eyes when they read that, but it's important to the stories, so please don't judge too hard. The story I'm about to tell you took place when I was in my late 30s, and my two daughters were 13 and 15. I had just gotten out of an intense custody battle with their father, but thankfully, I was awarded full custody due to his drug addiction and rocky financial status. My girls and I were so excited to be moving to another state, away from all the drama the custody battle had caused. There was a lot of choosing sides and blame being thrown around, even by my daughters, so we decided that getting out of such a toxic environment by moving was the best idea for us. It was early June and the weather had started to warm up. We had just packed up the last boxes in our house and decided to leave a few days before the moving truck, as we wanted to get settled in the house before all our stuff arrived. Even if there would be no furniture for a few days, we were fine with that. We said goodbye to our old house, which was a very emotional thing for us to do, and we set off. We were taking the fast route, and according to Google, it was only supposed to take a couple of days to get to the new house. We had the idea that we'd stay in a hotel for one night along the way, and that was super exciting for us. My girls loved staying at hotels like most kids do, and I loved seeing them happy after hours of driving. It was late afternoon, and we were ready to get out of the car and find a room to stay in. I checked every hotel in the area, every app, and there was nothing available. Literally not one room was free in any of the surrounding cities for another three nights. I called around, and apparently there was a huge kids soccer tournament in town, one of the largest in the country. We decided to keep driving until we found something, but instead we were met with a stretch of road that had a lot of rest stops, but no hotels. We stopped at a gas station to get some gas, and noticed a few biker guys in the parking lot. As I waited at the pump, I noticed one of the men staring into the back seat of my car, clearly looking at my daughters, who were both asleep. I felt a chill run down my spine, and I instantly had this gut feeling to get them out of there. It just didn't seem like a great position to be in. A young mom alone with her teenage daughters. Not great. I didn't even wait for the gas to finish pumping. I took it out, closed the gas cap, got back in the car as inconspicuous as possible, and got back on the highway. I watched to see if they were following us, but they didn't, and I thought maybe I had just been a little paranoid, so I stopped thinking about it. The girls and I decided to stop at a rest stop. We felt like it was safe enough because of the time. When we pulled in, there were plenty of other vehicles and people around. I had my daughters cover the back windows with the blankets that we had brought with us, and we all fell asleep. At around 8 p.m., I had the intention of only sleeping for a few hours before heading off again, but I had failed to remember to set an alarm. Instead, I was woken up by the loud roar of a motorcycle pulling up beside the car. I don't know what it is about being a mom, but every sound I hear makes me wide awake in seconds when my daughters are around. I sat up and looked outside the window, and I was terrified to see the same men from the gas station only a few parking spots away. And they weren't alone, there were at least 25 to 30 of them now. I was fairly positive that they hadn't seen us, so I decided not to wake the girls. I didn't want to scare them. I started the car and turned on the headlights but no matter how much I tried to pull out of there unnoticed, it just wasn't going to happen. Something in the universe wanted those bikers to see my car and recognize it quickly. The second my headlights switched on, every head turned and looked directly at us. I was hoping the men from the gas station wouldn't realize that they had seen us earlier, but of course that wasn't the case. I heard one of them yell out to his buddies that they knew us and that there were a couple of hotties in the back seat. I was immediately terrified, but also rolling my eyes because who even says that, especially about two teenage girls who were obviously underage. But then again, 
They didn't seem like the kind of people who would care about that sort of thing. I honestly thought that if I just drove away, it would be like the last time where they wouldn't follow, but now they were quick to follow right behind. I woke up the girls, and I wish I could have been one of those moms who sugar-coated things to save their kids from being scared, but there was no way to do that with what was going on. I told them that we were being followed by some scary men, and they stayed down where no one could see them, keeping the blankets on the windows. They both started freaking out and crying, and I understood as I sped down the highway. These bikers got more aggressive. They began throwing things at my car and swerving as they tried to run us off the road. I was trying my best to stay calm on the outside so as not to scare the girls any more than they already were, but on the inside, I was having a full-blown panic attack. I knew my main priority had to be maintaining control of my car. It was clear that if something happened, and they were successful in running us off the road, nothing good would come of that. They started yelling at me to just pull over and that they only wanted to chat. I continued to stare forward outside the windshield and not even acknowledge them, and they didn't like that. They started calling me names, demanding I roll down my window. I did roll it down about an inch to try and plead with them to just stop and leave us alone, but there was no way they could hear me. We drove like that for at least five miles before entering the next city, and by that time, it was already two in the morning. Finally, I came to my senses and told my oldest daughter to just call the police. Through tears, she told them what was going on. I don't know what they told her, but she said that they were coming. Unfortunately, it just wasn't soon enough. I felt something hit the side of the car, and within seconds we were off the side of the road and headed for a tree. I slammed the brakes as hard as I could, and the car came to a very violent halt. We were all okay, but I started to wonder for how long, though. The bikers surrounded us and started pounding on the windows and pulling on the door handles while the car shook. The girls were screaming at the top of their lungs and begging me to make them go away, but there was really nothing I could do. I prayed to God that we would make it out of there, and thank God, he answered my prayers. We heard sirens in the distance and watched as the men all got back on their motorcycles, speeding away. We hugged each other and cried until the officers were standing at the doors of the car. They had to step out, and we explained everything. Now they tried to get in contact with the bikers around that area, but they weren't able to track them down specifically, at least not at that moment. To this day, I'm still terrified every time I see a group of motorcyclists. My girls are older now, with children of their own, and my biggest piece of advice to them is always carry protection. You just generally never know when you're going to find yourself in a situation as psychotic as that. I grew up in a quaint little town nestled in the heart of Canada, a couple of hours drive from Edmonton, Alberta. This charming place, situated along the river that lent its name to the town, was my childhood haven. For about four to five months each year, Athabasca transformed into a bona fide winter wonderland, becoming an integral part of my upbringing. Winter sports, building snowmen, and engaging in epic snowball fights with my childhood friend were cherished memories. Alberta was my home, and I never imagined straying too far from it. The farthest I thought I'd ever venture was down to Edmonton for work. However, fate had other plans for my family, leading us farther away from home than I could have ever imagined. My career path had taken me to Melbourne, Australia, where I met a girl, got married, and decided to build our family. Since my side of the family was more flexible with travel, they visited us in Melbourne once or twice a year. But for all those years, my children had only heard stories about their dad's homeland, and most importantly, they had never seen snow. My daughter Angie had turned five, and my little boy James was four when my wife and I decided it was time to introduce them to the beauty of a Canadian winter. So, we planned a trip back to Alberta for Christmas in 2018. Angie was particularly thrilled, while James seemed rather bewildered by the prospect. Upon landing in Edmonton, and embarking on the 84-mile journey to my parents' place, my kids were utterly captivated by the pristine, snow-covered landscape that enveloped us. 
showing them my beloved hometown was a magical experience, and they relished their time with their grandparents. However, the snow stole the show, as my children reveled in its splendor. In Australia, Christmas was celebrated much like in Canada, but the glaring difference was the weather. While Northern Hemisphere countries were immersed in deep winter, the Southern Hemisphere was sweltering in high summer. It was a bizarre feeling to witness festive advertisements featuring fake snow in 40 degrees Celsius heat. I often wondered if Australians would eagerly trade their scorching weather for a day of frost just to align with the Christmas spirit. For my kids, having a snowy backdrop for Christmas was as enchanting as a trip to Disneyland, and they cherished every moment of it. The kids couldn't get enough of the snow. They wanted to build snowmen, engage in snowball fights, and experience all the winter activities I had enjoyed as a child. Donning warm winter clothing was an exciting novelty for them. Angie once remarked that she felt like either an Eskimo or an astronaut, given how alien the experience was for them. Our adventure took an unexpected turn when my wife spotted an advertisement for a winter glamping experience at Jote Lodge. We eagerly booked an overnight stay in one of their family-sized yurts. Arriving on December 21st, we were all set to build an army of snowmen by noon. We frolicked in the snow for hours, but as twilight descended, my wife retired to the yurt to prepare dinner on the provided camping stove. The kids and I continued to play in the fading light, and after an intense snowball fight where my children unexpectedly teamed up against me, we all grew ravenous. We were just a short distance from the yurt, so I dashed back to check on my wife, who assured me dinner would be ready soon. I then returned to the spot where my kids had been playing, only to find Angie starting the base of yet another snowman. My heart pounded as I realized that James was nowhere to be seen. I initially assumed James couldn't have strayed too far, but panic surged through me when Angie looked up with concern and stammered, I don't know. She seemed to fear my anger, but my overwhelming emotion was frantic terror. I knew I had to find James, and I followed his little boot prints, frantically calling his name. The moments that followed were the most terrifying of my life exacerbated by the fact that Angie was witnessing my frantic search, feeling a sense of responsibility for her little brother's disappearance. I followed James's footprints through the snow until they led me to a sight that sent chills down my spine. An icy, cold stream lay before me. It didn't appear deep or wide, but it was the perfect size for a four-year-old to fall into and be swept away by the current. My heart raced as I scanned the water for any sign of James, screaming his name in desperation, hoping he would hear and come running. My daughter watched, petrified, as I ran up and down the stream's banks, searching for any trace of my son's body in the water. These moments were excruciating, the fear of losing my child consuming me. I scarcely paid attention to the opposite bank, deeming it impossible for James to have crossed without being swept away. But then, when I heard his voice, I spun around, only to see him standing on the other side of the stream. To my amazement, he didn't seem frightened or anxious. James wandered through the snow in his overcoat and boots, seemingly carefree. I rushed across the stream, scooping him up into my arms. I didn't scold him. Instead, relief washed over me, and I could see that he was scared too as tears welled up in his eyes upon seeing Angie, who was also crying. I carried him back to the yurt where my wife awaited, confused and angry. After recounting the ordeal to my wife, she expressed anger at me, then at our daughter, and then at me again. But primarily, we were all just relieved that we had found James safe and unharmed, avoiding a potential Amber Alert. Once we calmed down a bit, we had dinner put the kids to bed, and I couldn't help but ask James something that had been gnawing at me since it popped into my head just after dinner. I asked him, how did you get across that stream, buddy? We were all so relieved to have found James safe and sound, so that was the main thing on my mind. I never really thought about how he had gotten across until that moment. James's response sent a shiver down my spine, making my blood run cold. He said, the snowman carried me, of course, I knew a snowman couldn't have carried him across an icy stream, but someone had, 
and that thought made me feel sick to my stomach in the most delicate way possible. I gently told James it couldn't have been a snowman, and asked if it was maybe a person dressed in white clothes or with snow on their hair or shoulders. He shook his head and repeated, The snowman carried me. Before I could press further, he closed his eyes and drifted off to sleep, not more than five or ten minutes later. I couldn't imagine what he had gone through or why he didn't react more strongly to being taken by a stranger. The next morning, we were on our way back home, not even considering asking for a refund due to how shaken we were. Once we returned, I contacted the police to report what had happened. Within a day, they confirmed our worst fears. On the opposite side of the stream, alongside James's tiny footprints, were larger footprints that had undoubtedly been left by his potential abductor. James later told us that the person who carried him had worn a white hat or light-colored clothing. They had carried him through the woods for a brief moment before setting him down and walking away. James didn't recall any words exchanged or feeling scared during the encounter. It was bizarre for a child not to react when picked up by a complete stranger, but there was something deeply unsettling about the whole incident. The memory of that day continues to haunt me, leaving me with unanswered questions and a profound sense of unease. The thought of a stranger taking my son and then letting him go chills me to the bone, and I can't help but wonder what might have happened if they hadn't decided to release him. My name is Jim, and I live in Northeast Louisiana. A few weeks ago, my friends Dave, Ryan, Jess, and I embarked on an unforgettable trip to visit some of my family in Washington State. Dave and I were both 18 years old, while Ryan and Jess were a year older at 19. Our adventure began in late October when we packed up all our belongings and set out on a long road trip from the swamps of Louisiana to the scenic landscapes of Washington. Our visit to my uncle's house in Washington was enjoyable, filled with laughter and catching up with relatives we hadn't seen in years. As our time in Washington was coming to a close, Ryan suggested that we spend our last night camping in the nearby woods. Dave and Jess readily agreed to the idea, but I was a bit hesitant. A million different thoughts raced through my mind, but in the end, I decided to go along with it. We borrowed two tents from my uncle and ventured into the woods setting up our campsite not too far from his house. If we unzipped our tent doors, we could barely make out the faint glow of his porch light in the distance. We were in a remote area, with no neighbors for miles around. It felt isolated, but in a thrilling way. After spending the evening by the warm, crackling fire we had built, we all decided it was time to call it a night. Well, all except for Jess, who wanted to savor a little more peace and solitude beneath the starry sky. I figured, why not? I joined her, and we continued to chat for about twenty more minutes, basking in the serenity of the forest. Then, it happened. I saw something massive moving in the darkness, about twenty yards away from us. It was colossal, at least ten feet tall, or so it seemed in the dim light. Panic surged through me as a million thoughts raced through my mind. Jess and I exchanged nervous glances, and without a word, we retreated to one of the tents. We woke up Ryan, who was still half asleep, and in hushed tones he mumbled, What the hell's going on? He grabbed his hatchet and sat up, trying to make sense of our incoherent explanations. Go back to sleep, y'all, Ryan finally said, putting his hatchet down and curling back into his sleeping bag. Around twenty minutes later we heard it again. The ominous footsteps slow and deliberate, encircling our tent. Ryan was now fast asleep, oblivious to the eerie presence outside. I quietly reached for Ryan's hatchet and held it tightly in my hand. With my other hand, I covered Jess's mouth to keep her from screaming. We realized that we had left Dave alone in his tent with no means of defense. Jess bravely volunteered to step outside with the hatchet. As she cautiously ventured out, she immediately recoiled, her breath coming in heavy, terrified gasps. I urged her to explain what she had seen, but she could only stammer about something vast and solid black lurking in the shadows. I couldn't let her face this unknown menace alone. With hatchet in hand, I stepped out of the tent, and there it was, 
the colossal figure looming over our campsite, peering down at our tent. My heart raced, and I swung the hatchet blindly at its leg in sheer terror. A pained scream pierced the night as the enigmatic creature fled into the darkness. The scream jolted Dave and Ryan awake. They rushed to our side, demanding to know what had happened. Before we could respond, Ryan looked down at the deep, massive footprints left in the mud. Dave's eyes widened in astonishment. Is that a Bigfoot? He exclaimed. My cousin, alerted by our commotion, arrived at the scene with a pistol and a lantern in hand. What the hell was that? She shouted, her voice trembling. Ryan pointed at the enormous footprints. I ain't never coming without a gun again, he declared, his voice filled with determination. I couldn't shake off the fear that had taken hold of me that night. Sleep remained elusive until we returned to the familiar comforts of Louisiana. That was one creepy and unforgettable night, one that none of us would ever forget. I've been a long-time listener here, but today, I'm finally sharing my own story. One that's far from those cliché, creepy guy stared at me tales. This is the story of how my best friend from college, Tyler, and I almost met our demise in the woods. And let me assure you, it's not just about creepy staring. It's about survival, fear, and a scar to prove it. Back in college at CU Denver, Tyler and I developed a strange fascination with survivalism during our sophomore year. We lived off campus, working part-time jobs, and were within a stone's throw of Chief Mountain and Mount Blue Sky. Hiking became our go-to method for blowing off steam and staying fit. Our interest started during freshman year when we were still on campus, but after we moved into our apartment, we watched a movie one night that ignited our curiosity even further. The movie was called Alive, and it depicted the harrowing true story of a South American rugby team whose plane crash landed in the Andes Mountains. To survive the freezing conditions and injuries, they resorted to consuming the flesh of their deceased teammates. It was an intense film, and it captured our imaginations. We couldn't help but ask ourselves, what would we do in a similar situation? It became a debate on how hungry we'd have to be before resorting to cannibalism. A grim topic indeed. Obviously, we never wanted to put that to the test. Instead, we decided on the next best thing, heading into the mountains during peak snowfall and attempting to camp for a night or two to see if we could handle it. Now, before I continue, let me emphasize that what we did is not something I'd recommend. Wilderness camping is risky enough, but doing it during the dead of winter is downright foolhardy. But being the naive college students we were, we thought it was a brilliant idea. So, after planning over Christmas break, we set off on the first weekend back at school. We drove up to Echo Lake Park near Rogers Peak, parked our car, and ventured into the snowy forest in the direction of Mount Goliath. It took us a few miles, but we eventually found a sheltered spot among the pine trees where we cleared a space for our camp. I won't bore you with the gritty details of how miserable it was to camp in those conditions. Suffice it to say, it sucked. Everything stayed wet, making it a constant struggle to keep the fire going, and we barely got any sleep. The experience was so terrible that we decided to pack up and leave around 6.30 or 7 in the morning, using the first light to find our way back to the car and escape to the warmth of home. I used my trusty jet boil to make some coffee inside the tent, and after warming up and caffeinating ourselves, we started packing. Tyler finished a minute or two before me, then opened the tent flap and said he was going to take a quick pee. I nodded, still half asleep, and continued with my task. Moments later, Tyler returned, but didn't enter the tent. Instead, he squatted by the entrance and asked, Is your knife within arm's reach? I assumed he had spotted a bear. Sometimes they woke up from hibernation early, and when food was scarce, they posed a significant threat to campers. Curiously, I inquired about the issue, expecting to hear about a bear. However, Tyler's response left me bemused. There's a dude, he said. He was watching me take a leak. Relief washed over me as I processed the situation. So what if some early morning hiker had given Tyler a disapproving look while relieving himself in the snow? 
But then Tyler added a chilling detail. The guy had a gun. Now this didn't immediately send me into a panic, given that seeing armed individuals in Colorado's mountains wasn't entirely uncommon. But maybe I was too tired, too cold, or too eager to leave. But I failed to grasp the gravity of the situation. Tyler's explanation might have been inadequate, or perhaps my mind couldn't comprehend the danger lurking in those snowy woods. I sat there, bewildered, when in reality, we should have been running for our lives. Suddenly, Tyler turned his head, his eyes widening, and he screamed, Get out of the tent! I hadn't even finished packing, but his urgency spurred me into action. I scrambled out of the tent, my heart pounding. What I saw outside left me frozen in fear. It was a hunter, a lone figure with a ski mask or balaclava covering his face. He remained silent as we slowly backed away, trying to communicate that we didn't want any trouble and apologizing if we had trespassed. We babbled on, trying to defuse the situation, but the man remained mute. Then, to our horror, he raised his rifle, aiming it directly at us. Time seemed to slow as we waited for the inevitable shot. Bang. The first shot was deafening, echoing through the woods as we sprinted away from our campsite. It felt like an eternity between the first shot and the second. I vividly recall thinking, he's aiming, any second now, and I'm dead. Then another bang, and I felt something strike the back of my left thigh. My leg threatened to give way, but I pushed through the pain and ran alongside Tyler through the dense trees. I knew I had been hit. The bullet fragment had punched into my thigh, but thanks to the pine trees, it hadn't severed my femoral artery. Warm blood streamed down my leg as I sprinted, but the cold air made it feel strangely cold at the same time, a sensation I never wanted to experience again. In a blur, we made it down the mountain. Either the hunter couldn't get another shot at us, lost us, or decided to flee the area before we could find someone to call the police. To say I got off lucky would be an understatement. The pine trees had thwarted his aim, and the bullet had fragmented, slicing open the top of my thigh as I sprinted. The doctor later told me that if the bullet had hit the tree slightly differently, or if I had been running a bit slower, the fragment could have severed my femoral artery, and I would have bled out within minutes. As for the man who had taken shots at us, the police questioned a few hunters but never made any arrests. No one was charged with attempting to murder us up on that mountain. If you ask me, the guy was just a hunter, not someone looking to shoot people intentionally. He might have been a psycho who thought, no witnesses, why not? I guess there are people out there who want to know what it feels like to kill, but I'm not implying that every hunter thinks that way. I just know for certain that at least one of them does. When I was a kid of about 12 years old, I used to live in a small town just outside Johnson City, Tennessee, deep in the Appalachian Mountains. This was back in the 70s, a time when people were different about their kids. We would go off all day and not come home until dark, and folks didn't worry about the same kinds of things we do now, but perhaps we should have. We would explore the woods, find abandoned mines and caves, and camp outside on warm summer nights. We weren't stuck in front of the TV like kids today. Back then, you could only get two or three channels in the mountains, so it was pretty boring to just stay home. In retrospect, we did some pretty dumb things and took some insane risks that could have cost us our lives, but somehow we survived it all. The story starts early one morning when I and my brothers and sisters were waiting for the school bus. It was around 7 a.m. on a cold November morning, probably in 1973 or 1974. We noticed the gravel on the road moving, heard the sound of rocks falling, and could see dirt and dust rising from a nearby ridge. This continued for about 10 seconds and was enough to make us run back into the house. The radio in my dad's old car said there was a 7.3 magnitude earthquake in Claiborne County to the north. I remember my dad saying it was felt all the way in Charlotte, North Carolina, some 100 miles south. We ended up missing school that day, which was pretty cool for us. So we took off like we usually did into the woods by that ridge, 
because we wanted to see which rocks had fallen. On our way to the ridge, we saw a place where the ground had opened up, revealing a cave entrance. Real cave entrances, which aren't cleared for tourists, look a lot different than the ones in movies or pictures. This one was covered with roots, leaves, and dirt, but you could see inside it pretty well. We went back to the house, got some rope, and my dad's old lantern. Before long, we were back at the new cave with our supplies, gathering up our courage to go in. We talked about finding gold or diamonds, maybe turning it into a secret hideout. There were four of us, including two twin boys, my best friend Dan and me. Dan and I were inseparable for the most part, while the twin boys were always getting into trouble and used profanity a lot. But they were always trying to outdo each other, so they were fun to hang around with. We climbed down the embankment to the mouth of the cave and turned on the lantern. We pulled away roots and leaves to make the cave mouth big enough to climb through. I stuck my head inside and was immediately met with the smell of death. The air was so thick with the smell of it that I gagged. Not to be discouraged, I pulled my t-shirt up over my nose and pushed past the roots until I was inside. Dan handed me the light, and inside, I saw a low, flat room about four feet high and easily twenty feet across. The cave went further back, but my light couldn't make out any details past that. Dan crawled through next, and then the twins, holding the lantern as high as I could. We proceeded into the cave, and once we were inside, we could see bones of animals all over the floor. Some of them had been picked clean, while others still had meat on them. Then, one of the twins found a dog collar on one of the bones, revealing that these were the remains of cats, dogs, sheep, deer, and small rodents. The bones were scattered around the floor as if they'd been tossed away from the carcasses. I remember thinking, what could have done this? That's when I noticed two lights reflecting the lamp in the back of the cave. It didn't make a noise, but I remember saying, guys, we need to get out of here now. I never took my eyes off those two pinpoints of light. It must have been something in my voice because Dan perked up and followed my gaze without another word. We all got out of the cave as fast as we could. There was only one thing it could be, a bear's den. Once outside, we all ran back to the house and told our dad what we saw. He was getting ready to go to work the second shift at the Blue Jean factory in town. He told us to stay away from that place until he could go check it out. Mom overheard us and told us that if we went back out there, she would tear our butts up. Getting mauled by a bear was not something we wanted, so we agreed. Just to be sure, Dad gave us a few chores to keep us occupied until he got back home, splitting firewood and breaking up coal. That was enough to end our adventures that day. The rest of the week was uneventful, except for the news of the earthquake. That was the topic at school and at home for the rest of the week. By the weekend, Dan and I had decided we were going to go back and explore that cave to see if there really was a bear in it. Pretty dumb, but we decided to go armed with pocket knives and sharp sticks to take care of the bear if there really was one, or at least we thought we would. We climbed the hill back to where the cave mouth was. A couple of nighttime rains had washed away the mud and made the mouth of the cave bigger and easier to get in and out of. We made our way inside the cave and past the smell, which was still very much permeating from the entrance. Once inside, we crouched and walked back to the back side of the cave. The cave entrance narrowed to an opening in the back wall that sloped down at a pretty steep angle, like a set of steps. We continued deeper and noticed there were no bones or animal remains back in this part of the cave. It went back another 100 feet and stopped at a rather large hole that seemed to go straight down. The strangest part was that we could feel warm air coming up from out of the hole. We couldn't see the bottom when shining the light down into it. We didn't have enough rope to go farther, so we made our way back out of the cave. Undaunted, we wanted to know how deep that hole was. We used the lantern to build a fire and made some makeshift torches. Dan was one of the best fire starters I'd ever seen. Within minutes, we were equipped with torches and were back in the cave. We dropped a torch down the hole, and it hit the bottom about 20 feet down. It opened up into a room with a dirt-covered floor. Then, there was a growl. 
unlike anything I'd ever heard in my life. It was coming from somewhere down in that hole, from something. It sounded like a tiger or a lion, some sort of big cat, more than that of a bear. Then it screamed so loud we dropped our gear and covered our ears. We could see from the torchlights that it was circling the torch but staying away from most of it. It was looking up at us, big and lean, definitely not a bear, more like a mountain lion, but its fur was black as pitch, and its ears were like a Doberman's, straight and tall like horns. It didn't look like any cat, dog, or bear. Its eyes glowed red in that firelight, like two hot coals. It would look at me, then at Dan, as if it were trying to decide who it would kill first. When it screamed again, it was like having a ton of sand dumped on you from above. I went down to my knees and tried to curl into a ball. The scream made me feel weak, unable to think or move. My head felt like it was a gong, or someone had placed a giant bell on my head and started to beat at it. I felt sick, confused, in pain, all at the same time. Dan collapsed into a ball with his hands on his ears. He had dropped the lantern, and it had rolled off the edge down into the hole. It went pitch black up top, but the bottom of the hole burst with light as the lantern shattered right beside the thing. Another scream came from it, this time a scream like it was in pain. We didn't feel weakened from it this time, we were just terrified. It was like the spell had been broken, and we were free. Our survival instincts kicked in, and we took off. Dan and I made our way up the slope as fast as we could. We could tell that whatever that was in the hole was going to come after us. We just knew that it would not let us live for dropping that lantern. It was like there was a connection to the thing in our minds, and it was talking to us. Once up the slope, we could see the dim light at the entrance, and we quickly made our way back. Just before we reached the mouth of the cave, we heard the scream again. This time, it was like being hit by water coming out of a fire hose. It knocked both of us down as we desperately covered our ears, then tumbled forward toward the entrance. We got out of the hole and ran all the way home with tears pouring down our faces. Neither one of us could hear for a week. I remember having a headache that was so bad my parents took me to the emergency room. The doctor couldn't find anything wrong with us other than the many scratches and bruises we had from the cave. We were told that we were very lucky to be alive, as there are a lot of poisonous gases in caves, and that was probably what was causing the headaches, but it should pass. About a week later, it was just a ringing sound in my ear, but I will never forget it. I remember having the strangest dreams for months afterward, dreams where I was back in that cave with that screaming thing. I would wake up curled into a ball again, just like before. I think Dan experienced the same thing. We never went back to the cave. It was very unlike us, but we weren't courageous enough to go back there. My family moved soon afterwards, and Dan and I lost contact. Many years later, I went back after hearing that they'd had another earthquake. I wanted to visit and see if that cave was still there. It is, although it looks like part of the roof collapsed in on it. I tried to look up Dan too, but he had moved away. The twins were there working at a local garage. They said Dan lived there for about 10 more years. He never quite got over the experience. Actually, he ended up being sent away to a special school for the deaf for several years. When he did come back home, he was a very quiet person, didn't make many friends, and he lived with his parents and worked at the mill for a while. Everyone said he kept to himself and that he liked to drink. I don't know what it is that the earthquake opened up back then. I guess I'll never know. I do know this though, it was more than just a bear, more than just a mountain lion. This thing had the ability to use its cry to disable its enemies or prey. I'm not sure which we were to it. I also know it was smart enough to get into our heads. I've never known another animal that can do that. Losing someone close to you is a process that unravels you bit by bit. It's like losing a piece of yourself, a part of your very essence. One moment, you're living in a world where you can spend all the time in the world with them, sharing your thoughts, your laughter, your tears. And then, in the blink of an eye, they're gone, and you're left with a million words to say, but no one to say them to. 
It's as if they take all your joy and warmth with them, leaving you to wander through life like an empty shell. The earth becomes a cold, barren husk, devoid of color and life. In the midst of this aimless drift, your mind occasionally toys with the idea of joining them in death, just to be reunited with the person you held so dear. My older brother and I were two peas in a pod, a pair of despondent souls who found meaning in each other's company. In our childhood, we were inseparable. We did everything together, so much so that we couldn't even bear to be in separate classes during elementary school. The thought of being apart for too long would lead to protests that my parents still reminisced about. Our parents owned a vast expanse of land in Washington State, including a dense forest behind our house. Every single day, without fail, my brother and I embarked on a long and arduous journey into those woods. We would spend hours playing together, our young imaginations running wild. We'd pretend to be knights, building castles out of sticks strewn about the forest floor and laying siege to each other's fortresses. Looking back now, those are my fondest memories of my sibling and me. But as we reached our teenage years, something changed. My brother and I started to drift apart. He began to allocate the majority of his free time to his frequent girlfriends, while I dedicated myself to academics and a part-time job. We started talking to each other less and less, and as our conversations dwindled, the divide between us grew wider. It was a silent acknowledgement of what was happening, a decision we both made to ignore the growing chasm, a choice I would later regret deeply. It was during the final weeks of my junior year in high school that everything changed. The weight of tests and exams inundated me, sweeping aside all other aspects of my life, including my social relationships. I had friends, but like me, they were heavily engrossed in their studies. Being the terrible time manager I was, I couldn't spare even a minute from my relentless preparation for finals to socialize. That was when my brother extended an unexpected invitation. He offered me the chance to attend a graduation party being held by an acquaintance of his. Normally it was for seniors only, but he was willing to make an exception for me. I hesitated, as parties weren't my scene, but after weighing my options, I reluctantly agreed. Perhaps it was my desire to impress my brother, to rekindle the bond that had faded away over the years, that convinced me to go. The rest of the week passed in a blur as I diligently chipped away at my remaining homework. When Saturday morning arrived, I was greeted by my brother's mischievous smile. I had overslept, and he took full advantage of the opportunity to wake me up with a jolt. Wakey, wakey, sleepyhead. It's eleven. I want to make sure my favorite little bro is ready for the night out, he said, patting my head. I groaned, still half asleep. I hate you so much, man. I muttered. He chuckled and left my room, utterly proud of his successful wake-up call. The aroma of bacon and eggs greeted me as I got dressed and headed down to the kitchen. My mother was at the stove and she greeted me with a warm smile. I returned the courtesy and took my seat at the kitchen table. When my mother finished cooking, she set the plates on the table. What's the occasion? I asked. She smiled. It's been a while since you two have spent some time together. I thought I'd commemorate the occasion. I looked down at my plate, guilt washing over me. Well, Mom, things get... busy, you know? I can't balance it all, school, work, and everything. The important thing, she said, is that you're making an effort now. As the morning turned into afternoon and afternoon into evening, I started having second thoughts about attending the party. I was convinced that once we arrived, my brother would simply forget about me leaving me alone in a sea of inebriated teenagers. But I pushed those thoughts aside, determined to impress him and rekindle our long-lost bond. I dressed in a manner that reflected the greaser aesthetic, wearing denim jeans, a leather jacket, and a muscle tee underneath. I grabbed my car keys and ventured to collect my brother. When he saw me, he looked genuinely proud. My little dweeb of a brother all grown up now, he remarked. I'm telling you, dude. If you just give it a shot, the ladies will be chasing you. I smirked and ushered him out of the door. No time for complimenting me. Even if I am the superior sibling, we've got to get going. It's an unusually chilly main night, he commented as we exited the house. 
The frigid air hit us like a freight train. I opened the garage, and we shuffled into my old 79 Camaro. My side hustle during high school had allowed me to save up for this car, and I was proud of it. We're in for a bit of a drive, I said, but it'll be worth it. The trip to the residence was surprisingly lengthy, taking us down multiple back roads. About two-thirds of the way there, the pavement turned to dirt. Finally, we pulled into our destination at around 7 o'clock p.m. We were the first to arrive, and Howard, my brother's friend and the host of the party, welcomed us inside, offering food and drinks. It was 1985, and the laws against teenage alcohol consumption were not as strictly enforced as they are now, at least not in our part of Washington. Within the hour, a sizable crowd had gathered in Howard's yard. My brother and I helped set up the grill, and someone had brought a boombox, blasting metal health by quiet riot at maximum volume. As the party picked up pace, I found myself pleasantly surprised by how much I was enjoying myself. I had expected the experience to be a chore, but it was quite the opposite. I played a few games of blackjack with some of the other guests, and even served as a referee for a drinking contest involving my brother, which he admittedly lost by a wide margin. As the night wore on, the party began to die down, and many guests started to take their leave. I had abstained from alcohol for the duration of the party, unlike my brother, who had overindulged and was having trouble speaking coherently. As the last of the attendees disappeared down the dark road leading away from Howard's house, I helped him clean up the mess left in the party's wake. In the meantime, my brother lay sprawled out on a sofa, clutching his head. Once we deemed the place immaculate, I helped my brother to his feet, and we prepared to head out. But Howard stopped me. You know, he said, just because the party itself is over doesn't mean the fun has to be. There's this deserted family estate just down the road from here. A lot of people say it's haunted. Want to go check it out? I hesitated, given my brother's level of intoxication. It likely wouldn't be a great idea to venture out into the woods to some decrepit old mansion. Just as I was about to reply, my brother quickly took Howard up on his offer. Sure, man, even if it's haunted, he slurred, it wouldn't stop me from going. I glared at him, incredulity written across my face. It's late as it is, and we have a curfew. Mom's gonna kill us if we go. My brother turned to me, raising an eyebrow. I've already had a couple of drinks, not like I can do much worse. I sighed, defeated. I knew I couldn't change his mind, but I also couldn't allow my brother and Howard to go alone. I gave in, and so the three of us charged forth into the icy night, piling into my car. I had the unfortunate disposition of being the designated driver, a role assigned to me by Howard after he explained that his vehicle's transmission had failed recently. Howard directed me to the supposedly haunted property. As we sped down winding, sparsely populated wooded back roads, the streetlights and sparse forestry began to morph into dense, undisturbed woods. Eventually, we halted in front of an enormous pair of rusted iron gates, decorated with overgrown vegetation. From what I could tell, there had at one point been a pair of initials welded into the gates, but they had since been removed. We carefully exited the vehicle, perhaps intimidated by the looming barriers. Howard glanced at me and my brother, a hint of mischief in his expression. You ready to see some ghosts, guys? He asked. I shrugged, unconvinced. Throughout my life, I had never been very religious or spiritual. I simply reasoned that when you die, you cease to exist. I didn't have any intention of changing my mind now that we stood in the presence of this mansion. My brother seemed to have sobered up a bit, his stance shifting from relaxed to uneasy. Yeah, I think so, he replied shakily. Howard shoved open the gates, emitting an audible creaking sound that made my skin crawl. He proceeded to gesture for us to take the lead. How chivalrous of you to make us monster bait, I snarkily stated, trudging my way through the overgrown grass, my brother following suit. The task of plowing through the excessive undergrowth guarding the estate was rather difficult. Many thorn bushes had inconveniently decided to plant themselves on our path. In due time, the dark silhouette of the house began to materialize in front of us. For all intents and purposes, the place looked very similar to its description. 
Much of the siding and roofing had partially or entirely rotted away, exposing some of the framework. Where windows had once been, there were now only gaping holes. There appeared to be a wooden deck connected to the entrance of the house, which lay astoundingly intact. We worked our way to it, and with each step I took, my sense of trepidation slowly crept up, urging me to turn back. But I couldn't. I was here because of my brother, and I couldn't let fear hold me back. As we neared the deck, Howard pushed past us and strode over to the door. He tried the knob, but it refused to budge. Dang it! Hang on! I'm going to kick this thing in, he exclaimed dramatically. He began to vigorously slam his foot on the door, and after three or four tries, it gave way, crashing into the shadowy interior of the house. I rolled my eyes, angered by his lack of discretion, but I dared not oppose him at the moment. Now certainly wasn't the time to argue. Howard was the first who sauntered inside, accompanied by my brother, who was unusually quiet. I treaded carefully trying to muffle the sounds of my footsteps while I pursued them. As the pitch black enveloped me, I reached for my pocket and produced my handheld flashlight. When I switched it on, my jaw dropped. The entire interior of the house was spotless. There were no signs of decay, not a single speck of dust. It was like the family had never left. What the... I stuttered before looking to my accomplices, seeing that they had similar reactions. My brother at last, spoke up. Okay, so this place is missing windows, but somehow the furniture and floors are untouched. Am I dreaming? Howard and I must have been too stunned to reply. Both of us remained speechless as an eerie hush fell over the three of us. We began to become aware of a distinct noise emanating from the second story, the sound of intense sobbing. My eyes were the size of baseballs, and I glanced at Howard and my brother panic visible in their faces. Howard spoke in a whisper. We've got to check it out. Someone could be hurt in here. My eyes grew even wider. Are you kidding? Who would be crying like that in the dead of night in the middle of nowhere? Howard didn't respond. Instead, he began edging toward the staircases leading up to the second floor. Left with no other option, being the self-proclaimed alpha males that we were, my brother and I stumbled after him. As we trampled up the stairs, my sense of trepidation grew stronger, drowning out all logical thought. We reached the top of the staircase and were presented with an extensive hallway. On both sides we promptly changed our course, while the distressing noise emanated from an unseen room to the right. Howard led the way, my increasing terror climbing to a crescendo, until I realized the noise was coming from the very end of the hallway. If it became necessary to run, our escape would be significantly prolonged. I shone my light down the hall to get a visual on the source, finding that the door to the room was shut. Seeing this as an opportunity, I shook Howard's shoulder in a final effort to convince him this wasn't a good idea. He once again soundly ignored me. Without wasting a word, Howard advanced toward the door as the crying became deafening. In one swift motion, he twisted the knob with a click that made my heart stop. The door swung open, and all at once, the sobbing ceased. The only thing I heard was a faint ringing in my ears. My hands violently trembled as I raised my light to the now gaping doorway. What I saw will forever be burned into my memory, etched into my very being. Inside the room, in a fetal position, there was a figure. It was slender its colorless flesh lightly stretched across heavy bones. The proportions of this being were not human-like. No, this creature possessed arms extending well over half the length of its body, ending in sharp talons resembling overgrown fingernails. Long, greasy black hair was draped across its shoulders and back, forming a tangled, shadowy curtain that obscured its features. It lay in a grotesque mound on the floor, unmoving and eerily still. Despite this apparent lifelessness, its spine protruded from its backside, a horrifying series of malignant lumps and deformities. As I stood frozen in place, my mind struggled to process the grotesque sight before me. It was as if my eyes were feeding my brain a nightmare, conjured from some malevolent corner of my subconscious. My body refused to obey my desperate commands to flee or even to blink. Beside me, Howard 
who had backed away from the door with a mixture of fear and caution, made one fatal mistake. The pressure of his backpedaling foot released a nearly imperceptible sound, a creak. It was just loud enough to capture the creature's attention. In an instant, it perked up, its chest rising and falling rapidly as it began to gasp and convulse, each breath sounding like a tortured, wheezing scream. The creature's writhing seemed to stretch on for an eternity. My brother, Howard, and I were held captive by the horrifying spectacle, unable to tear our eyes away from the nightmare unfolding before us. Finally, it ceased its convulsions, and an eerie noise escaped its unseen mouth, a dreadful, demented laughter that echoed in the room like a sickly woman's giggle. Then, with a series of bone-snapping cracks, the creature began to move. It rotated its neck slowly, revealing its hideous face. Even now, nearly four decades later, that image remains etched in my mind, a grotesque reflection of my flashlight in its beady, soulless eyes. It had no nose, only slits that served as nostrils, and its mouth, far from human, was a gaping maw lined with rows of needle-like teeth, dripping with what could only be blood. As the creature rose to a towering height, I began to grasp the gravity of our situation. I may have been 6'2", and athletically built, but this monstrosity exceeded my stature. Panic surged within me as my brother shook me out of my trance, shoving me down the hallway with a desperate urgency. He yelled something, but the adrenaline coursing through my veins drowned out most of his words. I sprinted down the hallway, reached the stairs, and hurled myself downward, crashing onto the wooden tiles below. I scrambled to my feet and bolted for the exit. Glancing behind me, I saw Howard reach the doorway just seconds after me, and my brother was descending the stairs as I yanked open the car door and dove inside. I fumbled with the ignition, and the car roared to life just as my brother slipped through the gates. The creature sat perched atop the iron gates, its mouth still glistening with crimson liquid, but it made no move to pursue us further. We sped away, breaking numerous traffic laws as we raced down the empty country roads in terrified silence. The soft hum of the engine was our only comfort. When we returned to Howard's home, he hurriedly vanished into his house. I harbored resentment toward him. After all, he had been the one insisting on investigating the mansion in the first place. My brother and I were left alone in the car, and he eventually broke the silence. I think it's best we just pretend this never happened, he suggested, his voice trembling. I agreed even though I knew deep down that we could never forget what we had witnessed that night. Life went on, but my brother's health took a severe turn. He suffered from unexplained aches, muscle spasms, and nausea. We admitted him to the hospital in July, and he began describing a tall woman tormenting him in his nightmares. The doctors could find no physical cause for his condition, and despite our hopes, he didn't pull through. I held his hand as he passed away my tears flowing freely. My brother's death left an indelible mark on our family. I couldn't focus on academics as I grappled with the loss, but one thing he had said haunted me, the woman in his dreams. It had to be the same creature we had encountered. It had taken my brother from me. On a chilling October morning, after I turned 18, I persuaded my father to lend me his hunting rifle under the pretense of going hunting with friends. Filled with determination, I set off for the old abandoned family estate deep in the woods. After a long drive, I reached the familiar iron gates and paused in my car, reflecting on the profound impact this place had on my life. Loading the rifle, I pushed open the gates and began my approach. As I drew closer to the house, I raised the rifle's muzzle to the sky and fired three rounds into the air. There was no response. I called out in anger. But still, there was only silence. Fueled by rage, I stormed into the house, determined to confront the creature that had taken my brother. The interior was a scene of devastation, the once sturdy furniture and tiling now reduced to ruins. My bewilderment briefly overwhelmed me, but I couldn't afford to dwell on it. I meticulously searched every room, closet, and crevice, but found no trace of the creature. My spirit crushed, I exited the crumbling home, defeated. As I stepped outside, rain began to fall, 
its cold drops battering me. I could no longer contain my grief, and tears welled up in my eyes. I wanted to apologize to my brother for failing him, but there I knelt in the field of silence, alone with my anguish. I'll never forget that sound, the crashing of feet on dry leaves passing my tent. It was fast, like I had been visited by an Olympic sprinter three minutes to midnight. The first time it happened, I grabbed my gun and searched the surrounding area. Nothing, not a trace. Settling in my sleeping bag, it wasn't five minutes before something ran past the tent once more. Ten minutes later I heard it again, then nothing further as I waited for the sun to rise. The wilderness has always been my home away from home, my escape when life was awry. I've been on more camping trips than I count, mostly alone. You see, I don't like people, so after many years abroad, another visit to the outdoors was way overdue. I had been scoping out a new camping site for a while. It was a few hours outside of town, but the reviews online were nothing short of glowing. This place prided itself on being for the solo traveler, with enough space for campers to pitch their tents without bothering each other. I was sold, with the essentials packed, including my Beretta 92 pistol for safety. I made my way down the highway and eventually arrived at the location's reception office. While some people are more adventurous, I prefer to explore areas curated for campers. Sure, it comes with an entrance fee, but at least I'm unlikely to stumble on the land of a lunatic with a shotgun. As I stepped into the reception, I was immediately struck by a feeling of emptiness. It wasn't because I was alone, this was a primal reaction that I felt in my gut, like the space around me was stealing my energy. As ridiculous as that sounds, it's the best description I've been able to come up with. Reaching the front desk, I called out for someone to assist me. It was almost two in the afternoon, and I knew that the camping site would be preceded by a short hike, as displayed on a nearby map. I didn't have to wait long before an old man in a blue cardigan arrived through the back office door. This guy was old, very old, at least 90, if I were to hazard a guess. He didn't act like it though. He spoke like a younger man and was far friendlier than his grim appearance would lead you to believe. Taking me through the rules and regulations of the land, he swiftly began saying something about the history of the area. Now I'm not a rude person, but my adventure was calling, and I had barely been paying attention to what was being said. Perhaps too bluntly, I told the old man that I needed to be on my way. He was disappointed, sad in fact, but he didn't hesitate to guide me towards the start of the trail. Before I left, I was handed a pair of keys that would unlock a gate at the mouth of the forest. Finally, my holiday could begin. Despite the reception's map stating that the forest was two miles away, it took me many hours to reach the towering trees displayed on the website. At first, I wondered if my pace was too slow, but I knew I was as fit as I had ever been. I was surprised that the map was so wrong, but I didn't think much of it. By the time I reached the gate, the sun had begun to set. Standing before the metal barrier, I noticed that the fences on each side stretched into an endless blur. I looked up at the massive tree line and peeked beyond the gate to see the wild world that I was eager to enter. I tried valiantly, but the key didn't work. Its shape didn't even match the lock. The many odd elements of this trip started to add up but I shook it off as I was in dire need of a meal, and my thoughts would only slow me down. I suppose what I did next was illegal, but like I said, I had little energy for an alternative solution. Thankfully the gate was quite short so I tossed my bag and joined my belongings by climbing up and over. At this point, I wasn't picky about a camping location, so I searched for the first bit of flat open land. Passing the hulking trees, the day's last sunlight shone through the branches. I stopped and appreciated nature's beauty for a brief moment. To my despair, this pause brought on the same feeling I had at the reception office. My stamina was waning, so instead of finding an appropriate piece of ground, I immediately put up my tent and prepared an outdoor area for cooking. With a week's supply of beans ready to prepare, I decided to lie down and rest before starting the fire. I hadn't planned on sleeping just yet, 
but after closing my eyes for a second, I was out like a light. I'll never forget the sound that woke me up. Something ran past my tent. Initially, I wondered if it was an animal, but four feet colliding with the ground is more distinct than you might think. Whatever this was, it was on two legs. I searched the area quite thoroughly but found no sign of the unwelcome visitor. Back in my tent, I heard the noise two more times. On both occasions, I rushed out to catch my guest in the act. Again, nothing. I didn't get any more sleep that night. My mind was buzzing with theories. Maybe it was a bear on its hind legs. No, it ran too quickly. If it was human, why was it running in the woods? I have no idea. Thinking back now, what was more chilling than the crumbling leaves was the eerie silence when I was waiting for the sound to come back. The new day brought more questions as I quickly learned that my surroundings weren't what I expected. Exiting the tent, I noticed the ashes of a burnt-out fire. Had I started it before collapsing the night before? It didn't make sense as I surely would have noticed the scorched wood when I searched the area at midnight. Although, I suppose the unwanted intruder had my attention at the time. I knew it was best for me to leave. I had planned to camp for five days, but one bizarre night was more than enough for me. The thought of the long hike back to the reception was daunting, but for the first time in my life, civilization was more appealing than the outdoors. As I packed my bags, I once again started to become drowsy. Was this due to my lack of sleep, or was it something else? I still don't know. Luckily, I have done training to operate on little rest, so packing my bags wasn't difficult. I was tired, but with my pistol strapped to my leg, I was ready to go. Tracking my movements from the day before, I followed the opening of the trees. I had sworn that I didn't travel that far into the woods, but after walking for an hour I realized that I must have been wrong. I knew I had gone the right way. After all, I pride myself on my sense of direction. Once I reached one hour and thirty-two minutes, I shifted my focus from the ground to the trees. While much of the bark surrounding me was in a reddish-brown shade, there were a few unique prints in the color gray. That's when I realized I was walking in a loop. I timed it on my watch. Every 12 minutes and 16 seconds I passed a giant redwood with a gray marking in the shape of an eagle's head. Every 16 minutes and 11 seconds I passed a tree that looked like it was decaying. This happened over and over, for what felt like hours. I tried everything going in the opposite direction, moving horizontally, yet I remained stuck in the same cycle. My spirit was willing but my body was weak, and after walking an endless path, I passed out amongst the dry leaves. Perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised at what woke me up, but I was startled nonetheless. The sound of the runner returned, but I didn't have the tent to protect me. The thin fabric wouldn't have done anything but its absence, still left me feeling bare. My instincts kicked in and I reached for my gun. Rising to my feet, I pulled out my flashlight and applied the Harris technique, crossing my arms to prepare for combat in the dead of night. The noises continued as I searched for its origin. I noticed a quick shadow in the corner of my right eye and turned. Firing two bullets, there was nothing there. The sound came back, this time behind me. It took me only a second to spin my body and pull the trigger three times. Again. Nothing. I repeated this pattern until all fifteen rounds were spent. I remember wondering if I was going mad, but the thought was fleeting as my eyes and ears had never deceived me before. I don't mean to brag, but I'm good with a firearm. I can hit a target from a distance, even a moving one. In most situations I am certain about my abilities, but not here. Every time I missed the target and splattered wood on the floor, I felt my confidence depleting. For the first time in my life, I felt that death could be near. I was scared. With my options depleted, I chose a direction and ran. My boots made a considerable impact on the ground, but I swear I heard a second set of feet not too far behind me, keeping up with my pace. Maybe it was an act of God, maybe it was luck, whatever it was. I soon arrived at the locked gate that swallowed me into the forest. At the time, I barely questioned why it was opened. I simply pushed through and continued towards the reception office and entered its walls after 46 minutes. My memory here gets a bit hazy, but I do remember that the building had its lights off. However, 
This was no concern for me, as after slamming through the front door, I jumped in my car and drove home. I wish I could end this story with a shocking plot twist or powerful life lesson, but this camping trip is as mysterious today as it was the day I exited the forest. If I didn't know any better, I would say that I briefly entered another dimension, but if I tell anyone that I fear that they will have me locked up at the funny farm. If I'm being completely honest, this trip left me feeling alive, more than I have been in a long time. I'm writing this with my bag packed in front of me. Even though the website for the camping site has been taken down, I vividly remember the directions to its reception. I don't know what's going to happen, but I am sure of one thing in particular. This time, I will pay close attention to what the old man has to say. I still remember that summer camp trip vividly. It happened when I was in 8th grade, in the beautiful lakeside city of Burlington, Ontario, not too far from Toronto. Our school had organized this trip, kind of like a summer camp experience, and we were all eager to embark on this adventure. It was a Catholic school, and as part of our final year, all the 8th graders got to go on two trips. The first one usually took place in the fall, a religious camping trip aimed at promoting Christian values and teamwork. To be honest, none of us were particularly excited about it, as it felt like a never-ending religion class stretched over three days. The second trip, scheduled for spring, was supposed to be a weekend in Ottawa, exploring the city and visiting museums. However, our year took an unexpected turn when it was decided that we would go camping instead, four hours away at Algonquin Provincial Park. The camp was located near one of the park's lakes, set up like a typical summer camp with cabins scattered near the lake and partially in the forest. There were separate buildings for bathrooms and a mess hall. For those not familiar with provincial parks, they're similar to state or national parks in the United States. As expected, the boys and girls stayed in separate cabins. The girls' cabins were perched on supports above the ground and closer to the lake, while our cabins were nestled deeper in the forest, along a gravel road. I shared a relatively large cabin with about four other guys. Our cabin, despite being the largest, was far from comforting. Unlike the other cabins with proper windows and doors that could fully close and lock, ours looked like it was hastily constructed from plywood. It had thin bug screens for windows and a door that wouldn't close properly. Now, I should mention that I had zero experience with actual camping. My family disliked it, so this was a less than ideal first impression of the great outdoors. The creepiness began on the first evening. We were all gathered outside the mess hall for a supposed fun night activity. The camp counselors spun a tale about a hermit who lived nearby in the woods, and we were going on a nighttime expedition to see where he resided. It was a random, intriguing idea, and it caught us by surprise. With our flashlights as our only source of light, we ventured deeper into the dark woods, searching for this hermit's house. Excited screams echoed through the night as we hunted for the mysterious abode. Eventually, we stumbled upon the hermit's dwelling, which was nothing more than a massive log with a makeshift bed. After the eerie encounter, we were escorted back to camp. My group didn't see anything unusual, but other kids started whispering about glimpses of someone lurking in the dark woods. A person from my cabin even claimed to have seen blue glowing eyes in the darkness. I dismissed it as a campfire ghost story meant to spook us, convinced that the person in the woods was just another counselor. But that night, everything changed. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the sound of someone sprinting down the gravel road that ran to our cabin. At first I thought it might be an animal, but then I heard the faint crunch of gravel around our cabin. It was too soft for an animal. It was the sound of a person moving. Panic set in as I realized that our cabin door didn't lock and the thin bug screens offered no protection. If someone wanted to, they could easily push the door open and see inside. My bed was right beside the door and I kept my eyes locked on it, preparing to scream if someone entered, but the door never opened. The sound outside slowly faded away into the woods leaving me terrified and baffled. My immediate thought was that it must have been the hermit, 
I ruled out the possibility of it being a counselor or teacher, as it was well past three o'clock in the morning, an odd time for a check-in. Surprisingly, I managed to fall asleep again after that ordeal. Unfortunately, that was the only interesting part of the camp trip. The remaining days were marred by relentless rain, and some students from our class caught the flu from another school sharing the camp with us. The bus ride back home was partially quarantined. As time passed, I almost forgot about the creepy encounter, attributing it to the possibility of a counselor checking on us. However, the story didn't end there. The following year, it was my younger sister's turn to go on the same 8th grade camping trip. Just like for my class, they went on the strange hermit expedition during the first night. While she initially thought nothing of it, during one of the other days, she and a few friends ventured into the woods by the lake. She described seeing a small, hermit-like person sitting on a log in the distance. It might not be the creepiest summer camp story ever, but it sends shivers down my spine, knowing that the hermit was indeed real. That seemingly fun camp led a bunch of children to a random guy's house in the middle of the woods, making the entire experience much less enjoyable in retrospect. I've been working in the film industry for a decade now, and while my role isn't exactly glamorous, it's incredible to be a part of this world. In a nutshell, I scout locations for films and ensure they're suitable for specific scenes. Many of my colleagues fell in love with movies at an early age, and the same holds true for me. My grandfather, a producer in the 1960s, worked alongside legendary talents like Audrey Hepburn, Alfred Hitchcock, John Wayne, and even Elvis Presley. As a young child, my grandfather regaled my brother, cousins, and me with captivating stories about the mythical world of Hollywood during that era. Yet, as I grew older, I couldn't help but notice my grandmother's discomfort whenever he spoke about his time in the industry. Her uneasy demeanor didn't escape my brother's and my notice, and we began to speculate about the cause. Unfortunately, we eventually arrived at the unsettling possibility that my grandfather might have had an affair during those wild Hollywood years. It seemed like the logical explanation for my grandmother's strange behavior, although we acknowledged it wasn't fair to jump to conclusions. Hollywood during that period was notorious for its extravagant parties and beautiful actresses, and my grandfather, being a prominent producer, fit the profile all too well. So why am I sharing this story now? Last month, my brother and I decided to finally confront my grandmother about what really happened during her time in Hollywood. We no longer wanted to hear the romanticized tales my grandfather had spun for us. Given my own career in the industry, we needed to know the truth, especially if it had been an affair. We approached the subject with utmost delicacy, not wanting to upset her or dredge up painful memories. Until the day he passed away, my grandmother had always expressed profound love and admiration for my grandfather, which made it seem even more peculiar that he might have strayed. My brother, the smooth talker of the two of us, finally asked, Grandma, why did Grandpa leave Hollywood, and why do you always go quiet and leave the room whenever he told us those stories? My grandmother took a deep breath, seemingly preparing herself to share a long-held secret. She began to narrate her story, weaving a tale only an elder could recount in such detail. We couldn't have been more wrong in our assumptions. My grandmother couldn't recall the exact year, but during her husband's tenure as a producer, he decided to move her to Hollywood. At the time, in her early 20s, she harbored dreams of becoming an actress, and she was undeniably beautiful. My grandfather used his connections to secure auditions for her and introduce her to some influential figures in the industry. However, my grandmother was determined not to have her success handed to her merely because she was married to a producer. She used a different last name during auditions and never mentioned her connection to my grandfather, wanting to be judged solely on her talent. After several failed auditions, my grandmother nearly gave up on her dream of acting and considered trying her hand at modeling as she had received some offers. But she had one last audition for what seemed like a significant film opportunity. She recounted how my grandfather was skeptical about this audition, 
having never heard of the director or the film. However, my grandmother was stubborn and urged him to trust her instincts. On her way to the audition, she got lost and stumbled upon a dilapidated building on the outskirts of town. Being new to the area, she didn't question the location and assumed it was a creative choice made by the director, perhaps even his office. She walked through the door, only to find four individuals inside, three women and one man, all masked. In an instant, my grandmother realized her peril and tried to flee, but two of the women caught her and subjected her to a brutal beating. After a few agonizing minutes, they tied her to a chair, leaving her helpless. One of the women then delivered a chilling ultimatum. My grandmother had to assist them in a robbery if she wished to survive. The consequences of refusing were too grim to imagine. My grandmother reluctantly agreed, hoping that she could find a way to escape this terrifying situation. The woman outlined their plan. She would rob an apartment for them. The four assailants assured her that there would be cash on a table inside, and my grandmother had no choice but to comply. She assumed that once inside the apartment, she could locate a phone, or better yet, find the occupant and explain her predicament. They reached the apartment building, and my grandmother's plan began to unravel. The man from the group accompanied her inside, holding a menacing pipe in his hand, which filled her with dread. She suspected that the pipe was intended for her. The apartment's door was unlocked, and they entered. My grandmother was handed a cloth sack and instructed to fill it with cash, assuring her that money would be found on a nearby table. As she cautiously collected the cash, her mind raced, searching for an escape plan. Suddenly, she spotted a glass vase on the table, filled with fresh flowers. With quick thinking and desperation surging through her veins, she seized the vase and shattered it against the man's face. He fell to the ground in pain, allowing her the opportunity to bolt from the apartment. My grandmother stumbled upon a back exit and sprinted several blocks, her heart pounding with fear. She finally encountered a police car parked nearby and approached it frantically. Breathlessly, she explained everything to the officers, desperately pleading for help. Back in those days, the police didn't always respond with urgency when it came to women's distress, and it took them a moment to believe her and take her statement seriously. Eventually, they contacted my grandfather, who decided to raise hell to ensure justice prevailed. Thankfully, my grandmother provided a detailed description of her captors, leading to the arrest of one of the women. However, the other three perpetrators remained at large. My grandmother never discovered the identity of the apartment's owner, but suspected involvement in the sinister underbelly of Hollywood during that era. The woman they arrested admitted to framing my grandmother, intending to incapacitate her inside the apartment after she'd filled the bag with cash. They believed she was merely a young actress, and her capture at the scene would have been another tragic story lost in the dark world of show business. This harrowing nightmare had left my grandmother deeply scarred, compelling her to leave Hollywood and return to her parents' house. My grandfather followed several months later, and that's when they started their family. He told us uplifting and joyful stories to entertain us children, but whenever he mentioned his time in Hollywood, my grandmother couldn't help but recall the traumatic ordeal she endured. I can only imagine the horrors my grandmother experienced during that terrifying ordeal. I am grateful she managed to escape and find some semblance of justice. As for the three other monsters from that night, I can only hope that karma eventually caught up with them, and justice was served in one form or another. My name is Brian and it's two in the morning as I write this. I hope that sharing my experience will help take my mind off the chilling events that unfolded. At the time, I was living in Alaska, approximately 16 miles southwest of Fairbanks. My home was nestled deep within a forest, and my love for the wilderness had led me to this secluded paradise. I was an avid camper, often venturing out into the woods with my two-year-old German shepherd, Cosmo. That particular night, I was feeling the weight of a tough week, so I decided to go camping to ease my mind. My favorite spot lay next to a serene lake, roughly seven miles from my house. Instead of taking the car, I opted for a jog. I grabbed my camping gear, Cosmo's harness and leash, and set off. 
Given my background as a wildland firefighter, carrying the necessary equipment was second nature to me. It took around two hours to reach our destination. Upon arrival, I wasted no time setting up camp. Then, Cosmo and I ventured upstream to try our luck with fishing. I managed to hook a beautiful rainbow trout. When I returned to camp, however, something unsettling occurred. My tent had inexplicably collapsed. Anyone who has set up a tent knows that they don't just fall on their own. You have to intentionally disassemble them. Perplexed, I erected the tent once more and lit a campfire. I cooked the rainbow trout, and it was nothing short of delicious. Following that, I roasted marshmallows over the fire, not bothering with s'mores, as I preferred them plain. With the fire extinguished, I crawled into the tent with Cosmo, finding solace in the symphony of nature, which had always lulled me to sleep. Sometime in the dead of night, I awoke to the low growl emanating from Cosmo. Irritated at first, I was soon gripped by the eerie realization that the forest had fallen silent, save for Cosmo's warning growls. In the darkness, I reached for my backpack and retrieved my 9mm handgun. It was a well-ingrained instinct. If the forest went silent, something was out there. I sat there clutching my gun for what felt like an eternity, but was likely only minutes. Then it came, a sound that sent shivers down my spine. It was reminiscent of a caribou's call, but distorted, almost gargling. My heart raced as I heard a twig snap nearby, so close it felt as if it was just outside the tent. Without hesitation, I fired a warning shot into the air. The sudden blast seemed to startle whatever lurked in the darkness, and it retreated. But the forest remained eerily silent, and my unease grew. At six foot three, and with a desire to appear fearless, I bellowed a menacing warning into the night, threatening to shoot if whatever it was returned. To my disbelief, it did come back. This time, it brushed against the side of the tent, taunting me with its malevolent presence. In a surge of terror, I fired at it, and it darted away into the depths of the forest. Suddenly, all the ambient sounds of the wilderness rushed back, filling the void that had existed during the creature's sinister visit. I stayed vigilant, my gun at the ready, but with the break of dawn, I made my decision. I swiftly packed up my camp, secured Cosmo's harness, and fled the scene, sprinting two miles and jogging the rest of the way. I cannot say for certain what I had encountered that night, but I was grateful that it had played out the way it did sparing me from whatever malevolent force lurked in the darkness. Last month, I embarked on a journey to visit my grandparents after a couple of years of absence. I know it might sound terrible, but the truth is, my grandparents live on the other side of the country, making it challenging to visit frequently. This visit was more than just a casual family gathering. It was a grand family reunion, an opportunity to reconnect with cousins, aunts, and uncles I hadn't seen in what felt like an eternity. My grandparents' residence was a sprawling farm, a place I remembered fondly from my childhood. When we lived just 30 minutes away, we used to visit occasionally and stay overnight. Every one of those nights had been filled with incredible memories and I always felt safe within the walls of that farmhouse. Little did I know that beneath the facade of tranquility lay a horrifying tale. As the family sat around, swapping stories and laughter, my grandfather decided to share something that would send shivers down my spine. It was a night when my cousin James and I had stayed overnight at the farm, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. The recollection of that evening came rushing back as my grandpa began his unsettling narrative. I remember precisely which night it was, because it was the only time in my life when my grandpa had raised his voice at me. The night started innocently, as most sleepovers do. James and I played outside, devoured pot pies with extra gravy, and sipped on root beers, pretending they were real beers. The farmhouse had a creepy little loft with a pull-out bed and a small TV, where we had our PlayStation hooked up. We'd typically stay up all night engrossed in games like Spyro the Dragon and Crash Bandicoot. However, that night, as the clock neared midnight, our world was shaken by an ear-splitting bang from downstairs. We instinctively paused the game, 
locking eyes with a sickening feeling in our stomachs. My initial thought was that one of my grandparents had taken a tumble, and I didn't know if I had the mental strength at that time to help them up. We sat in silence for what felt like an eternity, straining our ears for any sound from below. The silence was deafening, leaving us in an agonizing state of uncertainty. Tentatively, we resumed our game, trying to dismiss the eerie atmosphere that had settled upon us. But something felt off. An inexplicable unease had taken hold of us. James halted the game again, suggesting that one of us should check on our grandparents, just in case they needed our help. I reluctantly agreed and opened the loft door, which was attached to the ceiling. As it creaked open, a small, ladder-like staircase descended. I descended the stairs as quietly as I could, straining to hear any clues from the lower floor. Faint murmurs reached my ears, but the words remained indistinct. With cautious steps, I moved down the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest. Then, another loud bang, this time akin to a door slamming, sent me nearly jumping out of my skin. Fear surged through me as I continued to advance. And then, I saw my grandpa turning the corner, his eyes filled with an intensity I had never witnessed before. Without uttering a word, he pointed towards the loft and shouted at the top of his lungs. It was a bone-chilling scream, unlike anything I'd heard from him before. I was terrified, and it was made even worse by the look of sheer urgency on his face. In sheer panic, I spun around, sprinting back up to the loft and hastily shutting off the TV. James bombarded me with questions, but I could only manage to hiss at him to keep quiet, and that Grandpa was angry with us. Throughout the night we heard more loud banging and shuffling, but exhaustion eventually overtook us, and we fell asleep. The following morning, we found our grandparents looking exhausted in the living room. My grandpa had his hunting rifle out, an unusual sight that we didn't question at the time. Despite their strange demeanor that morning, we let it go and continued with our visit. It wasn't until the family reunion that my grandpa finally disclosed the truth about that fateful night. The initial bang that had sent shivers down our spines was the sound of an intruder attempting to break down the front door. My grandpa, in a fit of bravery, had managed to scare the intruder away temporarily. But when I had descended the loft stairs and heard the second loud noise, it was the sound of the intruder successfully breaking into the house. My grandma had managed to hide in a coat closet, while my grandpa, on turning the corner and spotting me in the hallway, had only yelled the word now in a desperate attempt to communicate that I needed to return to the loft. He didn't want the intruder to realize there was another person in the house. My grandpa had grabbed his hunting rifle to ensure our safety, and although he had called the sheriff, he convinced him that no immediate action was required. He provided an unofficial report over the phone, explaining the situation. All of this unfolded while James and I were blissfully unaware upstairs and we never realized how close we had come to a potentially life-threatening situation. As my grandpa recounted the tale, I felt a mix of anger and understanding. They had kept us ignorant to protect us, and it had worked. My grandpa emerged as a legendary defender of his home, wife, and grandchildren, but it was clear that the trauma of that night had left a lasting mark on him. It makes you wonder what other dangers lurk when you believe you're safe. I live in Montana on a small 20-acre ranch with my parents and my three sisters. My twin's name is Skye, and my second oldest sister, who is also a part of this story, is named Jess. We all loved going on night trail rides, especially just at dusk. We had done this many times, so we knew these trails very well. On the evening in question, we gathered our horses and prepared for the ride. We made sure to bring a flashlight with us and wore those reflecting bright yellow coat things for safety. Once we were all set, we mounted up and set off. By this time, the sun was setting, and the moon was just over half full, providing enough light for us to see clearly. We decided to take a roundabout trail from the barn, which led us through a dense forest, and eventually back to the barn. Sky rode in front, I was in the middle, and Jess brought up the rear. As we ventured deeper into the woods, we heard the unmistakable sound of a stick breaking, Initially, we didn't think too much of it, assuming it might be a deer or some other harmless creature. 
However, as we continued, we heard another breaking stick, this time much closer. We grew cautious and began to notice something odd, the absolute silence that surrounded us. No chirping crickets, rustling leaves, or distant calls of animals. It was eerily quiet. Our horses began to grow uneasy and skittish. They refused to stand still, constantly stepping to the side and nervously scanning the surroundings with their ears perked up. Then, out of nowhere, a shrill, demonic-sounding scream pierced the air, originating just to our left. Our horses went berserk, bolting away in sheer panic. We clung to our saddles, too terrified to even think straight. As we raced through the forest, the sound of heavy pounding steps echoed behind us, steadily closing in. Despite our horses reaching speeds of about 25 miles per hour, the ominous footsteps grew nearer. I couldn't resist the urge to glance over my shoulder. In the moonlight, I caught a glimpse of a long, skinny, bony creature with ghastly white eyes. It was indescribably horrifying to look at, and its mere presence filled me with an overwhelming sense of dread. We continued our frantic ride until we were just a few feet from the safety of the barn. Miraculously, our horses suddenly came to a screeching halt. However, the pursuing footsteps ceased just as abruptly. We dismounted and hurriedly entered the barn, locking the door behind us. Our hearts pounded in our chests, and fear gripped us like a vice. Inside the barn, we huddled together, trembling with terror. Our parents were out of town, and our older sister was in her room, oblivious to the horrors unfolding outside. None of us had our phones with us, leaving us isolated and utterly defenseless. Throughout the long, harrowing night, we remained vigilant, convinced that the creature would return to haunt us. The thought of venturing outside seemed impossible. We were paralyzed by the fear of what awaited us in the darkness. We anxiously awaited the first light of morning, clinging to the hope that daylight would bring safety. As the sun's rays finally broke over the horizon, we wasted no time. With adrenaline-fueled determination, we left the barn, running toward the house. Once inside, we quickly gathered our older sister and recounted the terrifying events of the night. We also called our parents, desperate for their reassurance and guidance. Unfortunately, our parents didn't believe our chilling tale. We were left feeling helpless and vulnerable, fearing that the unknown creature might return to harm our horses and other livestock. If anyone out there has any knowledge of what this nightmarish entity might be, please share your insights in the comments below. We are desperate to learn more and gain an understanding of the horrifying encounter that still haunts our dreams. I had never realized just how many fascinating stories my grandpa had. Our relationship had always been distant, not due to any animosity, but simply because our lives rarely crossed paths. However, a few years ago, my grandmother passed away and I witnessed the profound loneliness and sadness that gripped my grandfather's heart. It was then that I decided to make an effort to spend more time with him, whether out of guilt for not being there for my grandmother, or out of genuine concern for his well-being. I began visiting his house once a week for a simple coffee and a chat. I knew my grandpa had served in the military, but he had never shared any wartime stories with me while I was growing up. I believed he had served in the Korean War, but the specifics were a mystery to me. All I knew for certain was that he had been stationed in Germany and a few other European countries during his service. One afternoon as we sipped our coffee, the topic of his military service came up organically in our conversation. He revealed to me that he hadn't met my grandma until he returned home from the war. In Europe, he had been a single man, and he recounted how he spent a significant amount of time with women during that period. During his time in Germany, he and some fellow soldiers had ventured into a local establishment, though he was unsure whether it was a bar or a pub by the cultural terminology. There, he had a fateful encounter with a woman named Irma. As he began describing Irma, it became evident that he was deeply smitten by her. He painted a vivid picture of her beauty, with her curly blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and a smile that could seemingly illuminate an entire room. His words, not mine. 
Despite the language barrier, he knew a little German, and she knew a little English. They instantly connected. As he recounted their meeting, I was surprised by the daring nature of their encounter, given the norms of the 1950s. He continued by describing their walk to Irma's place. Initially, they traversed dimly lit and somewhat secluded alleyways, surrounded by the rustling of twigs and leaves. At the time, my grandpa attributed the sounds to possibly being just forest animals. Eventually, they arrived at a small cottage, nestled about a hundred yards into the woods. Irma had invited him inside. The cottage, as he described it, sounded like something out of an old fairy tale. It was constructed entirely of wood, with a comforting fireplace, two small chairs facing it, a loft accessible via a ladder that held a small bed, a table, and a petite kitchen area. Irma lit a fire and poured my grandpa some beer. Emboldened by romance, he asked her to come back to America with him once his military service concluded, a proposition that I found hard to fathom. Irma seemed flattered but evaded his question multiple times. As he continued narrating, a shift in his tone and demeanor signaled that the story was about to take a sinister turn. Irma began unbuttoning his military uniform, and he momentarily turned his head, losing himself in the passion of the moment. What he saw outside the window, however, jolted him out of his reverie. He leaped from his chair, urgently trying to explain to Irma what he had glimpsed. According to him, a man had appeared in the window, spying on them. As soon as the intruder realized he had been spotted, he ducked out of sight. While my grandpa was concerned, Irma appeared dismissive and attempted to distract him. However, my grandpa, torn between his desire for Irma and his instinct to protect her, grew increasingly uneasy. He began recalling the unsettling noises he had heard during their journey to the cottage and feared they might have been followed from the pub. Eventually, he mustered the courage to break away from Irma and insisted on inspecting the situation outside. Irma, though visibly upset, remained silent. Rushing to the table near the door, where he had placed his weapon, my grandpa discovered that it had vanished. He turned back to Irma, seeking answers, but she stood motionless in front of the fireplace. At that very moment, a burly man speaking German barged through the door he struck my grandpa in the face with such force that the pain was likened to an iron fist colliding with his skull. My grandpa, disoriented and in agony, was unable to move as the man proceeded to assault him mercilessly. He described it as the most excruciating pain he had ever endured, to the point where he felt almost numb. The attacker hurled my grandpa onto the table inside the cottage, produced a hunting knife, and brutally stabbed him in the side. Irma, now panicking, joined in the chaos. The room echoed with their frantic exchange in German, a language my grandpa had only limited knowledge of, further adding to his confusion, compounded by the throbbing pain from the sucker punch. Helplessly pinned to the table, my grandpa lay there, applying pressure to the wound in a desperate bid to stave off the bleeding, yearning to see the sun again. In the end, he succumbed to unconsciousness, and it was only through the serendipitous discovery of one of his military buddies that he survived that night. This comrade had been leaving the pub that evening, catching a glimpse of Irma and the unfamiliar assailant running down the road. A nagging suspicion gnawed at him, compelling him to follow Irma's path. Along the way, he encountered muddy footprints originating from the forest. These footprints led him to the open cottage door, revealing my grandfather unconscious on the table. With extraordinary strength, he carried my grandfather all the way back to their military base. Thankfully, the medical personnel managed to save him, and my grandpa thanked his lucky stars every day for his friend's timely intervention. They remained in touch until my grandpa's passing five years ago, with the friend constantly reminding him that he was a hero and that he owed him his life. I too wished I could thank that unsung hero for his selflessness. As my grandpa showed me the scar from that dreadful night, he confessed that even after all those years, he could still feel the phantom pain. Every time he beheld that scar, he was haunted by the memory of the horrific ordeal. Strangely, his deepest sorrow lay not in the brutal attack he endured, but in the fact that he never saw Irma again. 
neither she nor the enigmatic man who had accompanied her were ever apprehended by the authorities. Listening to my grandpa recount this harrowing tale, I was both fascinated and terrified. It was a story of love, betrayal, and survival, a tale that emphasized the importance of caution in matters of the heart. As my grandpa concluded his narrative, he offered me this chilling warning. Be careful who you give your heart to, because they may just try to cut it out when you least expect it. As the lush greenery of northeast Louisiana faded into the rearview mirror, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and apprehension. I'm Robert, just an ordinary 18-year-old guy, but this trip to Washington State felt like stepping into a whole new world. My friends Drew, Gregory, and Jolene were with me, all of us eager to escape the mundane routines of our small-town life. The car hummed along the interstate, the miles slipping away under us like water under a bridge. Drew, always the joker, kept us entertained with his endless stories and off-tune singing. Gregory, the oldest at 19, played the role of the responsible one, though his eyes shone with the same excitement that filled the car. Jolene, with her quiet smile and thoughtful gaze, seemed to absorb every detail of our journey. As we crossed state lines, the landscape began to change. The flat expanses of the south gave way to towering mountains and dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. It was like entering a C.J. Box novel, where the scenery is as much a character as the people. I imagined a world of hidden mysteries and untold stories lurking in those woods, and a shiver ran down my spine. We arrived at my uncle's house in Washington after what felt like an eternity. His small, cozy home was nestled in the heart of the woods, a stark contrast to the wide-open spaces of Louisiana. My uncle, a rugged man with a warm smile, welcomed us like we were his own kids. His small family, including a couple of hyperactive kids and a dog that wouldn't stop barking, added to the lively atmosphere. For the next few days, we immersed ourselves in the local culture and landscapes. We hiked through trails that snaked through the forest, the air fresh with the scent of pine and earth. In the evenings, we would gather around the fireplace, sharing stories and laughing until our sides hurt. Then Gregory, always the adventurer, suggested we spend our last night camping in the nearby woods. The idea struck me like a bolt of lightning. Camping in the vast unknown wilderness of Washington was not something I was prepared for. A million thoughts raced through my head, the isolation, the unpredictability of nature, the sheer thrill of it. Drew and Jolene are in, Gregory said, his eyes alight with the prospect of an adventure. I hesitated, the words caught in my throat, but something in me wanted to break free from the safety of the known, to step into the wild unknown. All right, I finally agreed, my voice barely a whisper. We borrowed two tents from my uncle and set out for the woods. It was hardly remote. The faint glow of the porch light was still visible from our campsite. But as we set up the tents and gathered around the fire we built, the woods around us felt like a different world. The trees stood like silent sentinels, and the night air was filled with the sounds of the wilderness. It was exciting and terrifying all at once. As the fire died down and my friends retreated to their tents, a sense of unease settled over me. The woods seemed to close in, and every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves sent my heart racing. I stayed up with Jolene, trying to shake the feeling off. But then, we saw it. Something massive and silent, moving in the shadows. My heart stopped. This was no ordinary camping trip. We were in CJ Box territory now, and the story was just beginning. The night had draped itself over the forest like a dark, heavy cloak, and the campfire's glow seemed to be the only thing holding back the darkness. As I sat there, the flames casting dancing shadows on Jolene's face, I could feel the forest's eyes on us, watching, waiting. Jolene, with her auburn hair reflecting the firelight, seemed lost in thought. I wondered what mysteries were locked behind those deep green eyes. We talked in hushed tones, 
our conversation meandering like a lazy river. But as the fire crackled and popped, a prickling sense of unease grew at the back of my neck. Suddenly, Jolene's hand gripped my arm, her fingers cold and tight. She nodded towards the edge of the firelight. There, amidst the darkness, was something massive. It was like a shadow, yet more solid, more real. It moved with a grace that belied its size, silent as the night itself. Panic gripped me, but I couldn't move. My mind raced with every horror story I'd ever heard, every monster from childhood nightmares. We stumbled back to our tent, our breaths coming in short, sharp gasps. We had to wake Gregory. He was the oldest, the de facto leader of our little group. He'd know what to do. Gregory, half asleep and annoyed, barely registered our panicked words. Go back to sleep, y'all, he mumbled, dismissing our fears as he curled back into his sleeping bag. But sleep was the last thing on my mind. The forest seemed to close in around us, suffocating, oppressive. Time stretched on, each minute an eternity. Then the creature returned. Its footsteps were soft, but to my heightened senses, they sounded like thunder. Gregory, oblivious to the world, snored softly. I couldn't blame him. Until you see it, the monster is just a story. My hand closed around the hatchet Gregory had carelessly tossed aside. Its weight was reassuring, a tangible anchor in a sea of fear. Jolene's eyes, wide with terror, met mine. We were in this together, whatever this was. The decision to check on Drew was born of necessity. He was out there, alone and vulnerable. Jolene, braver than I would ever be, took the hatchet and stepped out into the night. Her courage astounded me, but she was back in an instant, her face a mask of terror. She gasped. I couldn't leave it at that. Drew was out there. I had to know, had to see it for myself. Stepping out of the tent, I was met with the oppressive silence of the forest. There it was, the creature, its immense form looming over us. Fear and adrenaline surged through me, and I did the only thing I could. I swung the hatchet. The creature let out a sound that was half scream, half roar, a sound that chilled me to the bone. It vanished into the woods, leaving behind only the echo of its cry. The sound woke Drew and Gregory, their faces etched with confusion and fear. What was that? Gregory asked, his voice trembling. But before any of us could answer, Drew pointed to the ground. There, imprinted in the soft earth, were footprints. Huge, unmistakable footprints. His whisper cut through the night. Bigfoot. The words hung in the air, a chilling testament to the reality we had just faced. We were no longer just kids on a camping trip. We were survivors, witnesses to something beyond understanding. And as I lay there, listening to the sounds of the night, I knew one thing for certain. The woods were no longer just trees and shadows. They were alive, and they were watching. The forest was silent in the aftermath, the kind of silence that screams louder than any noise. The creature had vanished into the darkness, leaving behind a void filled with our racing hearts and heavy breaths. As I stood there, hatchet in hand, I could feel the weight of the unknown pressing down on us. Gregory and Drew were now wide awake, their faces pale in the dim light of the dying fire. What was that? Drew's voice was barely a whisper, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and fascination. I shook my head, unable to find the words. The echo of the creature's scream still rang in my ears. It was a sound that didn't belong in this world, a cry that spoke of ancient, hidden things. Jolene clung to my arm, her body trembling. It was huge, she stammered, like nothing I've ever seen. Her eyes, usually so full of life, were clouded with fear. Gregory, ever the skeptic, tried to rationalize. Maybe it was just a bear, he suggested, but his voice lacked conviction. We all knew it was no bear. The footprints we had seen were too large, too strange. The night passed in fitful silence. None of us could sleep our minds haunted by what we had seen. The forest that had once seemed so inviting now felt like a prison, holding us in its dark embrace. As dawn broke, 
the light seemed to chase away some of the fear that had enveloped us. My uncle, alerted by the commotion, arrived with a pistol and a lantern, his expression a mix of concern and confusion. What the hell was that? he demanded, scanning the woods as if expecting the creature to reappear. Gregory pointed to the footprints, now even more pronounced in the morning light. We don't know, he admitted, his voice tight. But whatever it was, I'm not staying to find out. The decision to leave was unanimous. We packed up our camp in silence, each lost in our own thoughts. The ride back to my uncle's house was a quiet one, the events of the night hanging over us like a dark cloud. The journey back to Louisiana was a blur. We spoke little, each of us processing the experience in our own way. The once lively conversations were replaced by a heavy quiet, broken only by the hum of the car on the highway. As I lay in my bed that night, back in the familiar surroundings of my home, the events in the woods felt like a distant dream. But the fear, the awe, and the wonder of that night were all too real. It was a reminder of the mysteries that lie hidden in the dark corners of the world, a whisper of the unknown that lurks just beyond our understanding. I knew one thing for certain, that night in the woods would stay with me forever, a haunting memory of the time when we came face to face with something truly inexplicable. There's something about the road at night that's always spoken to me. Maybe it's the way the moonlight plays tricks on your eyes, or how the world seems to stand still while you keep moving. My name's Devin, and I've been a trucker for over a decade now. I come from a line of truckers down in Mexico, and if there's one thing my cousins and uncles love more than the road, it's the stories they've picked up along it. Stories of the paranormal, the kind that make you look over your shoulder, I never bought into it much, until that night. The route from southeastern Wisconsin to southern Michigan had become like a second home to me. Every curve of the road, every gas station, every billboard was a familiar face. It was a clear night, the kind where the stars try to outshine each other. I was making good time, humming along to some old tune on the radio, the hum of my truck's engine a comforting constant beneath. The drop yard was quiet when I arrived just the sound of my boots crunching gravel. I did a quick switch, finding the trailer I was supposed to haul back over the legal weight limit. It wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. Company policy was clear. When in doubt, swap it out. So I found myself hooking up to an empty trailer instead. That's when the night started to stray from the usual script. I was back on the road, cutting through the rural country roads to avoid the tolls. The company always said, the less we spend on tolls, the more we can pay you. I didn't mind. It gave me more time to think, more time with the night. It was around two in the morning when I saw him, a figure walking on the shoulder of the road. He was wearing a hard hat and neon green pants, a reflective vest that caught my headlights from a distance. It was odd, no construction signs or work lights, just him in the dark road. As I drove closer, he turned and waved, a casual, friendly gesture. But something was off. The way he stood, the way the moonlight didn't quite reach him. I passed him, glancing in my rearview mirror. I was about to chalk it up to a night worker or a hitchhiker when I saw it, or didn't see it. He was gone. In that split second, he had vanished. I told myself it was just a trick of the light, the fatigue playing with my mind. I pushed the thought aside, focusing on the road, but the unease settled in the pit of my stomach, a silent companion for the rest of the journey. The road stretched out before me, bordered by dense woods, and the night felt heavier than before. I remembered my family's stories, the tales that I had always dismissed. Was I about to have one of my own? Little did I know, the night had just begun. The road has a way of getting into your head, especially in the dead of night. After that brief, unsettling encounter with the man who wasn't there, I could feel the silence pressing in around me. The dashboard clock glowed 2.15 in the morning, a stark reminder of the solitude of the night shift. I tried to shake off the feeling, 
but it clung to me like the chill of early morning fog. The landscape outside was a monochrome world, painted in shades of darkness and faint moonlight. Each passing mile felt like a step deeper into an unknown territory, even though I'd driven this route more times than I could count. Then came the knocks, three sharp, deliberate sounds from the back of the trailer. My heart skipped a beat. I've heard a lot of noises on the road, but this was different. It wasn't the usual creaks and groans of cargo shifting or the road's uneven surface. This was something intentional. I slowed down, my eyes flicking to the mirrors, half expecting to see something, but there was only the dark road and the dense woods on either side. The knocking had stopped as suddenly as it had started. Just your imagination, Devon, I muttered to myself, trying to brush off the unease. But as the miles wore on, the silence was shattered again. Five loud knocks, harder and more urgent than before. My grip on the steering wheel tightened. This wasn't right. Every instinct I had screamed that something was off. I knew my truck, and I knew that sound wasn't normal. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I had to check. The next safe spot I found, I pulled over, the gravel crunching under my tires. The night seemed to hold its breath as I stepped out, flashlight in hand. My heart was pounding as I made my way to the back of the trailer. I was a rational man, but in that moment, every ghost story I'd ever scoffed at came rushing back to me. The back of the trailer was as I'd left it, locked and secure. I hesitated before unlocking it, half expecting to find something or someone inside. But when I swung the doors open, the beam of my flashlight revealed nothing but empty space. I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. I was alone. At least, that's what logic told me. But the knocks. I couldn't explain them away. I closed the trailer, locking it back up, and climbed back into the cab. My hands were shaking slightly as I started the engine. I tried to focus on the road but my thoughts kept drifting back to the empty trailer and the unexplained knocks. Then, without warning, the calm of the night was shattered. A massive tree crashed onto the road just ahead of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, heart in my throat. There was no wind, no sound of splintering wood beforehand. It was as if the tree had decided to fall at that very moment. Fear gripped me, a primal, instinctive fear. I didn't stick around to ponder the why or how. I maneuvered around the fallen giant and didn't stop until I reached the next truck stop. I had to know what was in my trailer, once and for all. The road never felt lonelier than it did that night. After narrowly missing that falling tree, my nerves were shot, hands still trembling slightly on the wheel. I kept replaying the night's events in my head, each detail more unsettling than the last the ghostly figure on the road, the inexplicable knocks, and now this. As I drove on, the stillness of the night felt oppressive, like a heavy blanket smothering my thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone, that whatever had knocked on my trailer was still with me, following silently in the darkness. The knocks returned as I neared my destination, this time more frantic, as if in a hurry. Five quick, hard thuds that made me jump in my seat. I turned down the radio, straining to hear anything else, but there was only the sound of the road and my own ragged breathing. It was then I made the connection. The knocks. They were a warning. Something, maybe someone, was trying to tell me something. Had it been trying to warn me about the tree? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. Maybe my family's stories weren't just stories after all. Maybe I'd been too quick to dismiss the idea of the paranormal. I pulled into the yard, my eyes weary from strain and my mind heavy with questions. I parked the truck and sat there for a moment, gathering my courage. I needed to see, to know for sure what was in that trailer. The yard was silent as I made my way to the back of the trailer. The air felt charged every sound amplified in the stillness. I unlocked the door, half expecting to find something waiting for me. But when I opened it, the trailer was as empty as it had been before. No sign of anything out of the ordinary. I stood there, flashlight in hand, staring into the empty space. What had I heard? What had been knocking? 
I couldn't find an answer, and that bothered me more than anything. I closed up the trailer, making sure it was secure, and did a final walk around. Everything was as it should be, but the feeling of unease lingered. As I drove the last leg of my route, the sun began to rise, casting a soft light over the landscape. The world felt different in the daylight, less threatening. I tried to convince myself that it had all been a trick of my tired mind, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. I finished my run and unhooked the trailer, going through the motions mechanically. My mind was elsewhere, lost in thought. I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd been given a warning, that something out there had looked out for me. As I drove home, the first light of dawn breaking over the horizon, I found myself speaking into the empty cab. Thank you, I said softly, not sure who or what I was thanking. Maybe it was just the road, or maybe it was something more. But whatever it was, I was grateful. The story scared me, sure, but it also left me with a sense of wonder. Maybe there was more to this world than I'd thought. More mysteries hidden in the dark corners of the night. Maybe, I thought, as I headed home, i just had my first real encounter with the unknown. It was about a year ago when I first heard this chilling story from my grandma, and it still sends shivers down my spine. Sadly, she passed away just a few weeks ago. May her soul rest in peace. I thought I should share this bizarre tale that she confided in me, hoping it would captivate you as it did me and my husband. The revelation that my grandma had been married before my papa left me dumbfounded. I'm 30 years old and I had never known this dark secret. What shocked me even more was that my papa was equally unaware of this hidden chapter in her life. She had kept it hidden all these years, not wanting to hurt him, and as time went on, it seemed less and less significant, especially since she had never had any children with her first husband. She described him as a dangerous man, and the fact that she had married him when she was just 19 years old was mind-boggling. She was drawn to the bad boy persona, attracted to the danger he exuded. His name was Dawn. Dawn had a way of making her feel important, and in the world he inhabited, he was both feared and respected. The fact that he took an interest in her made her fall head over heels. They embarked on a tumultuous journey together, and my grandma became entangled in Dawn's world. Dawn had a distinctive appearance, he would roll his cigarettes in a short-sleeved shirt, his hair always slicked back. He was the type who always got what he wanted, even if it meant resorting to force at times. However, he shielded her from the worst of it, making her wait outside or in another room when things got rough. She admitted to being scared most of the time, but there was something addictive about the fear, something that held her captive. First love always has a vice-like grip on one's heart, for better or for worse. Their lives were transient, living in a small boarding house, paying weekly for a room. Their constant movement necessitated such arrangements, as they needed to be able to leave at a moment's notice. One fateful night, Dawn burst into their room, wild and angry, insisting that they needed to leave immediately. My grandma could see what looked like bloodstains on his shirt and jeans. She was upset and tried to get him to calm down and explain, but he was relentless in his anger and yelling. She quickly learned that when Dawn was in this state, it was best to comply with his demands without question. They hit the road, and for hours, he remained silent. It wasn't until my grandma couldn't take the silence any longer that she asked what had happened. Dawn's response was chilling. He told her they would never speak of that night again, and instructed her to forget about it. Even though my grandma knew about the terrible things Dawn did, this felt different, somehow worse. It was a line crossed, a boundary shattered, and the memory of that feeling haunted her. Eventually, they moved on and decided to have a small wedding ceremony. My grandma longed for children, but Dawn always told her that someday they would have them. That day never came, and my grandma's patience began to wear thin. Dawn's bad boy persona was finally starting to affect her, as she constantly worried that he would come home covered in blood, or worse, 
not come home at all. One night her worst fears nearly became a horrifying reality. They were spending an evening together when there was a knock at the door. An older gentleman stood outside, someone my grandma didn't recognize. Dawn's reaction was fierce. He yelled at her to stay in the bedroom. She pressed her ear to the door, trying to catch snippets of the heated conversation. She couldn't make out all the words, but the exchange sounded hostile. Minutes later, Dawn entered the room and informed her that he needed to leave and would return later. She tried to pry information out of him, to understand where he was going and what had happened, but he remained tight-lipped. There was something different about him this time. He didn't seem angry, but rather, he appeared scared. That night, Dawn never returned. My grandma didn't call the police as Dawn had always warned her never to involve law enforcement, no matter what happened. Instead, she decided to take matters into her own hands and become her own detective. She scoured their small apartment for any clues, and she stumbled upon some notes with a street address. Determined and anxious, she walked to that address the next morning, hoping to find Dawn. However, she didn't find him there. Instead, she uncovered a scene that would haunt her for decades, a warehouse filled with unspeakable horrors. I won't go into the gruesome details, but it involved a considerable amount of blood and a lifeless body. She rushed to a nearby store and asked the clerks to call the police, claiming that she had stumbled upon the site by accident. She never considered implicating Dawn, as he had always made it clear that she should never betray him. The body was never identified, and as far as she knew, it remained a John Doe. What made matters even more complicated was that one of the officers who had comforted her that fateful afternoon later became my papa. That's why she never wanted to admit to him that she might have known the potential culprits, as it weighed heavily on her conscience. She erased all traces of Dawn from her life, though there wasn't much to erase because he forced them to live a minimalist lifestyle. It wasn't immediate, but eventually, she started developing feelings for my papa, and they began seeing each other. A few weeks after the warehouse incident, she came to terms with the fact that Dawn was never coming back. For a long time, she wondered about his fate. Was he dead? Had he fled the country? Or did he simply want to separate from her? When I asked for Dawn's last name so I could try to find him for her, she just smiled sadly and said that she had given up on wanting to know what happened years ago. She believed she had made the right choice by ending up with my papa. The fear of Dawn finding her one day, of him lurking in the shadows, haunted her for years. With my aunt's birth that fear intensified, and she lived in constant dread, believing that Dawn was watching her, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Now that she's passed away, I'll never know Dawn's real name or where he ended up, and perhaps that's for the best. It's astounding to me that my grandma had been married to a criminal, even if it was an unofficial marriage. She retrieved an old box from storage and showed me her wedding ring and a picture of Dawn from back then. As I watched her stare at that picture, I could see the mix of fear and love in her eyes. My poor grandma, the fear she must have endured daily for such a long time, it truly must have been a living nightmare. I've been a police officer for my county for almost a decade. Over the years, I've encountered my fair share of crazy and disturbing incidents that have made me question why I ever chose this career path. However, there's one night that still haunts me more than any other. It was nearing the end of winter, and in the area where I'm stationed, the cold weather persists until mid-spring. On this particular night, I was scheduled to patrol the major highway for most of my shift. Typically, my nights on patrol were uneventful. I'd pull over a few speeding cars and maybe respond to a backup call, but nothing too out of the ordinary. I was cruising along the highway, doing my usual rounds, when it was approaching two in the morning. I passed by a car parked on the side of the road, a sight I hadn't seen earlier in my shift. Its headlights were off, and it was positioned far on the shoulder of the highway, so I didn't notice it until I had already driven past. Curiosity peaked, I decided to exit at the next ramp and make a full circle back to where I had seen the car. 
I assumed it was just an abandoned vehicle that I hadn't noticed earlier, so I wasn't in any hurry. Parking about 15 feet behind the car, I left my headlights on and radioed in to report that I was investigating a presumably empty vehicle on the southbound highway. I stepped out of my patrol car, flashlight in hand, and approached the mysterious vehicle. My initial impression was of how old and decrepit it looked. It appeared to be something straight out of the 90s, covered in rust, dents, and scratches. As I moved closer and peered inside, my unease deepened. In the back seat, there was a pile of clothes that seemed to belong to a young woman, but the way they were scattered about didn't sit right with me. I decided to check the other side of the car, but then a faint sound from behind me made me freeze in my tracks. I quickly swung around, pointing my flashlight into the dense woods that flanked the highway. The noise stopped instantly, but I had heard enough to know that it was the sound of footsteps. Someone was out there, possibly watching me. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I yelled out, ordering whoever was in the woods to step into the light with their hands raised. A moment passed, and then I shouted again, but there was only silence. My heart pounded in my chest as I updated my situation over the radio and requested backup. I continued to stand there, my flashlight fixed on the tree line, fear gnawing at my insides. If something sinister had occurred here, there was every reason to believe that whoever was lurking in the darkness would do anything to prevent me from uncovering the truth. I raised my firearm cautiously and moved further behind the car, maintaining a vigilant watch over the ominous woods. The next five minutes felt excruciatingly long, each second a tormenting reminder of the danger that lurked in the shadows. Finally, the sound of another patrol car pulling onto the scene provided a glimmer of hope. As soon as the backup officer arrived, we began searching the vehicle for clues. It became clear that something ominous had transpired, and my unease intensified. We found signs of violence inside the car and an empty ammunition package, suggesting the presence of a firearm. The knowledge that someone had been watching me, perhaps even targeting me with a weapon, was chilling beyond words. The following day, we conducted a more thorough investigation, but the car was untraceable, and any shoe prints found in the woods quickly faded without leading us in any specific direction. The truth of what transpired that night remains an enigma, an open case with no leads on suspects or victims. It's an unresolved mystery that continues to haunt my thoughts, leaving me unable to shake the feeling that something truly sinister occurred on that fateful night. When I was around eight or nine years old, my family suddenly stopped visiting my maternal grandmother. It took me a while to realize that we weren't seeing her anymore. However, when the realization finally hit me, I didn't question it much. I understood, even at that young age, that it was a sensitive and painful subject. It was inconceivable for me to think that my mom had just stopped talking to her own mother. The idea frightened me deeply, so I pushed it aside, as kids often do. As I grew older, I learned the reason behind their estrangement. They had a vicious argument one day and decided to cut ties. Their relationship had never been great during my mom's childhood, but I didn't want to delve into the painful past. As I matured, I felt a growing contempt for my grandmother. Whatever she had done had left my mom heartbroken, and there was no other word for it. I was more than willing to forget about a person who had hurt my mom so much regardless of whether she was a blood relative or not. Then, one day around Thanksgiving of 2016, my mom called me with shocking news. Grandma was dying, and if I wanted to see her before she passed, I needed to visit her that week. Knowing she was on her deathbed changed everything for me. I seriously contemplated going to visit her, but when I asked where she was, the answer I received stunned me. I had been somewhat surprised that Grandma was still alive, but what shocked me even more was when my mom revealed that Grandma was in Burlington at a place called Chittenden. The name meant nothing to me at the time, and it still doesn't now that I reflect on it. I asked my mom if Chittenden was a residential home or something similar. Her reply sent a chill down my spine. Chittenden RCF, honey. Your grandma is in prison. 
Sometimes people ask if you're sitting down before delivering bad news. I understand why now. While I didn't come close to passing out, I felt as though I had retreated into myself. I couldn't find the words to speak for what felt like a full minute. It was as if my mind had become a psychic bottleneck, a thousand questions trying to escape all at once, but not a single one making it out of my mouth. I briefly considered driving to my mom's place for an in-person conversation, but my curiosity got the better of me. With each passing second, it burned brighter and brighter until I couldn't wait any longer. I sat on my couch, cradled my head in my hands, and asked my mom to tell me everything over the loudspeaker. My mom had endured a rough childhood, and my grandmother was at the root of it all. I wouldn't go so far as to label her as a psycho, as it would be an insult to psychos everywhere. According to my mom, grandma's cruelty wasn't chaotic. It was calculated. I won't delve into every instance of abuse, as that would take all day, but take my word for it, she was possibly the worst mother one could imagine. Mom endured it for years, but she eventually realized that just because it was her mom didn't make it okay. This realization coincided with my birth, and Grandma surprisingly attempted to change her ways. She knew that if she didn't, there would be no chance of developing a relationship with her grandkids. This change led to regular visits until I approached double digits in age. Then, one day out of the blue, Mom received a call from a man claiming to be Grandma's attorney. Grandma was in jail, and the charges were serious. Mom thought it might be DUI-related, that maybe Grandma had been driving drunk and possibly caused an accident. But when she inquired about bail, the attorney dropped a staggering bombshell. Bail would cost in the region of half a million dollars. Mom's stomach tied itself in knots upon hearing that number, indicating the severity of the crime. Grandma hadn't been caught for a simple DUI. She was facing a lengthy prison sentence. What could she have done to warrant such a punishment? When the answer came, it left Mom in disbelief. Grandma was charged with four counts of solicitation to commit murder, four counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and one count of being an accessory to murder. In short, she had attempted to hire a hitman to kill her neighbors. Grandma had been in an ongoing dispute with a neighboring family of young professionals, with two young children. We never found out the exact cause of the feud, but instead of finding a peaceful solution, Grandma resorted to a shocking plan. She went online and attempted to hire a contract killer to eliminate her neighbors. She didn't just want the two parents dead, she wanted the entire family to suffer a brutal and gruesome death. As it turned out, the person Grandma was talking to wasn't a hitman, but an undercover cop. It almost felt like a scene from a dark comedy movie. A sweet old lady trying to hire hitmen over a dispute about dog poop. But the reality was far from funny. It revealed the true nature of my grandmother, who was anything but sweet. She might have had an undiagnosed mental illness, but that didn't excuse the hell she put my mom through for the first 20 years of her life. She was willing to spend a significant portion of her life savings to ensure the gruesome demise of the neighboring family, all over some perceived slight that they were barely aware of. I chose not to visit her, and about a month later we heard that she had passed away. Her final words involved bequeathing her possessions to an old cellmate, with no mention of her family. Sometimes I wonder if she would have even recognized me if I had visited. But that's okay because I wouldn't have recognized her either especially not after learning the true depths of darkness within her. I own a janitorial business that specializes in cleaning office buildings for mid to large size companies. Due to the nature of the job, we start our shifts at 6 p.m. on weekdays because most offices didn't want us inside during business hours while their employees were working. On this particular day, I arrived at the scheduled office building at 6.30 p.m., punched in the keypad passcode, and donned my janitorial gear. After locking the doors securely behind me, I was ready to begin my night's work. The building was only two stories tall, which was smaller than most, but both floors were unusually long, and there was a smaller basement level. I decided to start on the second floor and work my way down, as was my usual routine. 
My first task was to collect all the trash and pick up anything that might obstruct my cleaning. After tying up the bags, I hauled them out to the dumpsters at the back of the building to dispose of them properly. As I was outside in the dimly lit back area, I noticed two parked cars. Neither of them was running, which struck me as odd. This building was the only one nearby, and nobody was supposed to be here at this hour. I couldn't fathom why these cars were parked in the shadows, or where their occupants could be if not inside their vehicles. Returning inside, I double-checked to ensure that all the doors were locked before continuing with my work. However, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that something was amiss. Periodically I glanced out the windows to see if there were any developments with the parked cars, but they remained stationary. Finishing up the top floor, I made my way down to the first floor, repeating the same cleaning process. This time, when I went outside to toss the trash, I noticed that a single light had come on in one of the cars. Almost as soon as I stepped out, however, it abruptly switched off. This sent a shiver down my spine, and I quickly disposed of the trash, anxious about the situation. Returning inside, I couldn't ignore the unease that had settled in my gut. The realization that someone was inside one of those cars made the situation even stranger. Determined to finish my work as swiftly as possible, I completed the first floor by 11 p.m., which was significantly quicker than usual. All that remained was the small basement level, which was mostly used for storage. While I was working down there, I heard a sudden thud echoing through the building. The sound came from one of the floors above, but its exact source or location was unclear. I set down my cleaning equipment and began climbing the stairs to investigate, but halfway up, I froze. Voices, two men talking in normal conversational tones, echoed down the upper hallway. Their casual chatter suggested they had no fear of encountering me. Fearfully, I retreated down the stairs and concealed myself behind some stacks of boxes. My trembling hands dialed 911 as I listened to the approaching footsteps. Before I could even say a word to the dispatcher, the footsteps began descending towards the basement. I could only see the shadow of one of the men on the wall, but it was enough to make my heart race. He walked around appearing to search for something, then called out to his companion upstairs. No, I don't see anyone. I think we're good. He ascended the steps, and I dared to peek out one last time, catching a glimpse of him holding something small in his hand. That sight sent a fresh wave of terror coursing through me. I reconnected with the 911 operator and provided as much information as I could, then huddled behind the boxes, waiting in agonizing silence. Several minutes passed, and I believed the men were mostly on the upper floors. But then, they returned to the first floor. Panic surged within me when one of them exclaimed, Their van is still here. Both of their footsteps began rushing around, but they did not leave. They were searching for me. Struggling to control my breathing, I listened as they ran through the building, moving objects above me. Eventually, their heavy footsteps hurried down the basement stairs. One of the men started tossing boxes around, searching every corner, but the distant sound of sirens approaching caught the other man's attention, and he alerted his companion. In a frantic scramble, they fled the scene. I remained hidden until a police officer arrived to rescue me from my hiding place. It took only two hours for the two suspects to be apprehended. They declined to disclose their motives for breaking in, but some stolen items were found in their cars. It's safe to say that they weren't the brightest criminals, as they seemed to rely on guessing whether I had left instead of checking for my van. Nevertheless, the chilling experience of them not leaving after discovering I was inside is something I will never forget. Thankfully, I never had to find out what would have happened if they had found me. In July of this year, I finally decided to move out of my parents' apartment, as I had secured a steady job and yearned for some semblance of independence. I embarked on the search for an affordable apartment within my city, and luck was on my side when I found one just a two to three minute walk away from my parents' place. It seemed perfect. I'd get to live alone while still having the comfort of knowing my parents were nearby for visits and the occasional breakfast together. 
The apartment itself, though nothing extravagant, suited me just fine. It had a long corridor that connected each room, with my front door at the very beginning of the hallway. My bedroom was the second room on the left. Unfortunately, the walls in the building were quite thin, making it easy to hear the voices and activities of other tenants. Last week, after a casual night out at the pub with a few friends, I returned home around 10, 15, or 10.30 in the evening. Given that I had the day off the next day, I decided to take a shower and then settled into my bed to watch some Netflix. It was around midnight when I first heard a faint, gentle knocking sound coming from my front door. I paused the show I was watching and listened intently for a minute or so, thinking that my mind might be playing tricks on me. Convinced it was nothing, I resumed watching Netflix. But once again, the sound of a two-motion knock reached my ears. This time, it was a bit louder and more deliberate. I sat up in bed, puzzled and slightly on edge. I got out of bed and approached the front door, peering through the peephole. To my surprise, all I could see was pitch blackness outside. I shrugged it off, assuming it was just my imagination, and returned to my room. However, before I could even sit down properly, I heard a slightly louder knock. 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 At this point I thought it might be one of my friends playing a prank on me. I dialed my friend's number and asked him if he was the one knocking on my door. He paused for a moment and replied, Dude, I'm at home. I've got an early morning tomorrow at 7.30. I believed him and hung up the phone. I had been speaking rather loudly on the phone, so if it were my friends pranking me, they would have likely heard me. As soon as I ended the call, I heard another knock. This time, I was irritated. I walked back to the door, glanced through the peephole, and saw nothing once more. Determined to catch the prankster, I unlocked the door and quickly swung it open. But there was no one there. I stepped outside, scanning the empty hallway, but there was no sign of anyone. Feeling angry and a bit intoxicated, I decided to stake out and wait for the person responsible. I remained silent and peered through the peephole for a solid ten minutes. Suddenly, I was startled as I watched a hand cover the peephole from the outside, followed by yet another knock. My heart raced, and I immediately began unlocking the door again. Without thinking, I ran out into the apartment hall. I could hear someone hastily descending the stairs, and the sound of their jacket brushing against the wall echoed in the dimly lit corridor. I chased after the mysterious intruder, taking a few steps down the staircase, before realizing that he had stopped behind a corner, waiting to ambush me. Panic surged through me, and I quickly retreated back into my apartment, locking the door behind me. My heart pounding, I dialed the police and explained the situation. They arrived within a few minutes, conducting a thorough search of the building and the surrounding area, but they couldn't find anyone. The officers reassured me, suggesting that it might have been some mischievous kids pulling a prank. They advised me never to chase after someone in such a situation. To put my mind at ease, they stationed a patrol car near the building for the rest of the night, and the knocking ceased. It could have been a simple case of juveniles acting foolishly, but what gave me the creeps was the fact that the person had stopped behind the corner, not fleeing entirely. It seemed more like an intentional act of intimidation. Now, a week has passed since that unsettling night, and the knocking has not returned. Still, I can't help but remain on edge, always expecting the unexpected when I walk into my apartment. The lingering feeling of unease keeps me cautious and vigilant, wondering if there might be more to this eerie experience than meets the eye. I'm a 23-year-old guy, and a few years ago, I found a job at a local grocery store while juggling community college. My main goal was to earn some extra cash to cover my expenses and enjoy the occasional outing with friends. As the months passed, I became accustomed to the regular customers who frequented the store. Most of them were friendly or just average, but there was this one customer who always struck me as peculiar. This mysterious man would visit the store nearly every night around 9, which was just an hour before closing time. His routine was strange. 
he'd wander aimlessly through the store for what felt like an eternity before selecting only a few items and heading to the checkout. I couldn't fathom why he spent so much time perusing the aisles only to purchase so little. His behavior, coupled with his unkempt appearance and perpetually dirty clothes, left me with the impression that he might be homeless or living out of his car. Weeks turned into months, and this strange pattern continued. I had grown somewhat accustomed to his odd presence, chalking it up to the idiosyncrasies of working in retail. Then, one fateful night, everything changed. As usual, he strolled into the store, but instead of his usual meandering, he made a beeline for my register. I greeted him with a friendly smile and asked if he needed assistance. For a moment, he simply stared at me, his expression unreadable, before finally breaking the silence by inquiring if I drove the old Toyota parked in the lot. I felt a shiver crawl up my spine at his question. How did he know that? Despite my unease, I confirmed that it was indeed my car, hoping to discern the reason behind his inquiry. Without uttering another word, he maintained his poker face and walked away from the register, leaving me bewildered. Something felt off, so I asked my co-worker to keep an eye on the register while I ventured to the front of the store to observe the parking lot. My car appeared normal, without any visible issues. Puzzled but not alarmed, I returned to my post, planning to question the man when he reached my register. However, the minutes turned into hours, and the man never came to check out. The store closed, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding as I left work that night. I meticulously inspected my car from every angle, but nothing seemed amiss. I was left with a gnawing sense of confusion. The next day I anticipated the man's return, eager to confront him about his odd behavior and the question about my car. However, he remained absent from the store for an entire month, leaving me with lingering questions and an eerie feeling in the back of my mind. Then, one fateful Saturday night, I clocked out of work as usual. This night, in particular, was unique as I was the sole cashier on duty, and I would be leaving the store alone at closing time. As I walked through the parking lot towards my car, an inexplicable sensation washed over me, a gut feeling that something was terribly wrong. Maybe it was hindsight, or perhaps it was genuine intuition, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something was amiss. I quickened my pace, my heart pounding in my chest, and reached my car. The parking lot appeared empty, with nothing out of the ordinary to justify my unease. I started the engine and was about to put the car in drive when I heard the faintest noise from directly behind me. In the dimly lit interior, I caught a fleeting glimpse of movement in the rearview mirror. Panic surged through my veins, and I acted on instinct, abandoning the car and sprinting several spaces away. My gaze remained fixated on the back seat, where I saw a shadowy figure shifting. I didn't hesitate. I bolted back into the store, frantically dialing the police. When they arrived, my car was empty, and there were no signs of forced entry. It was as if the intruder had vanished into thin air. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was the strange man from weeks ago. Had he been lurking, waiting for the right moment? Did he possess an illicit key to my car, or had I carelessly left the doors unlocked one fateful night? While I believed I had locked them that night, the possibility of a momentary lapse in judgment nagged at me. It was chilling to think that I had come so close to driving away that night, oblivious to the presence in my back seat. Who knows what horrors awaited me had I left the parking lot. The unanswered questions and the unsettling encounter haunted me for a long time, a chilling reminder of the dangers that can lurk in the most unexpected places. I've always said that plumbing is more than just a job. It's a calling. Most folks think of it as a low-level trade, something not worth a second glance. But I know better. Without plumbers like me, the world would be a much messier place. No clean water, homes flooded with sewage. We do the dirty work that most would rather forget. My name is Bob, and I've been a plumber for as long as I can remember. I work for a big land development company now overseeing the plumbing for large projects. It's tough work, but someone's got to do it. And honestly, I love it. 
There's something about solving complex problems and seeing a building come to life that gets my blood pumping. I wouldn't trade it for anything, or so I thought until that one fateful night. We were working on a huge project at the base of a dam in California. It was an ambitious undertaking, to say the least. The area used to be a floodplain, but after years of drought, it was redrafted as potential housing land. With the change in status came a lot of interest, and the bidding for the contract was intense. My firm landed the job, but it came at a cost. We had to hire a bunch of outside contractors, and keeping track of everything was a nightmare. The land itself was a beast. We faced landslides, sinkholes, and severe soil erosion. It felt like nature itself was against us. The construction schedule turned into a minefield of delays and unforeseen problems. It was, to put it bluntly, a mess. As the plumbing supervisor, I was in charge of overseeing the water, gas lines, and drainage systems for the entire operation. The last few months had been particularly taxing. I took the job mainly because of my disability. Years of hands-on plumbing had taken a toll on my body, especially my back. Two herniated discs later, I had to step back from the labor-intensive part of the job. Thanks to my company's insurance, I could manage my condition, but I transitioned more into a supervisory role. That was all well and good until you get a call in the middle of the night about a plumbing emergency that only a supervisor can handle. One night, that's exactly what happened. I woke up to my phone ringing off the hook. I had missed four calls. Grumbling, I rolled out of bed, the pain in my back a sharp reminder of my physical limitations. Tony, one of the new guys on my team, was on the other end of the line. He was shouting so loudly I had to pull the phone away from my ear. What's the situation? I asked, trying to rub the sleep from my eyes as I got dressed. He finally calmed down enough to explain. A storm drain had collapsed because of the recent heavy rains, creating a huge chasm in the ground. It broke through a wall, flooding two of the three subfloors. And of course, it had to be the wall where most of the gas lines and water lines were anchored. The pumps were struggling to keep up with the influx of water. I let out a deep sigh as I resigned myself to what was ahead. It was going to be a long, hard night. I grabbed my gear and headed out into the dark, rainy night, unaware of the nightmare that awaited me at the construction site. The clock read 1.23 in the morning when I pulled up to the construction site. The rain was coming down in sheets, turning the ground into a slippery mess. My headlights cut through the darkness, revealing a chaotic scene. Puddles everywhere, equipment scattered around. And in the middle of it all stood Anthony, the new guy on my team. Anthony was pacing back and forth, his face a mix of anger and panic. I could hear him muttering to himself even over the sound of the rain. It was his first big emergency on the job, and it looked like he was losing it. Next to him stood Rick, a giant of a man with a reputation for being calm under pressure. He was just standing there, staring at the flooded basement entrance, looking like he'd seen a ghost. I got out of my truck, pulling my raincoat tighter around me. The cold wind bit at my face, but I was more concerned about the disaster in front of me. Tony, what happened? I shouted over the rain. He spun around, his eyes wild. The whole damn system collapsed, Bob. The storm drain gave way, and now the basement's flooded. It's a disaster. I nodded, trying to keep my own frustration in check. This was bad. Really bad. The collapsed storm drain meant that the water had nowhere to go but into our construction site, and with the gas lines and water lines damaged, we were looking at a potentially dangerous situation. Okay, Tony, calm down. We need to assess the situation and figure out what to do next, I said, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Tony just shook his head, throwing his hands up in the air. I'm done, Bob. This is above my pay grade. I'm out. And with that, he stormed off, leaving me and Rick in the pouring rain. I sighed, watching Tony's taillights disappear into the night. I turned to Rick, who was still standing by the basement entrance. Rick, you all right? I asked, concerned. He was usually the rock of the team, but tonight he looked shaken. 
Yeah, I'm fine, he said, but his voice was off, like he was holding something back. It's just a mess down there, Bob. I've never seen anything like it. I nodded, trying to push down the uneasy feeling growing in my gut. All right, let's take a look and see what we're dealing with. We made our way to the basement entrance. The water was already up to our knees, and the sound of it rushing into the basement was like a roar in my ears. The emergency pumps were working overtime, but they couldn't keep up with the sheer amount of water. I shone my flashlight into the basement, the beam of light cutting through the darkness. What I saw made my heart sink. The flood had reached critical levels, and with the damage to the gas and water lines, we were looking at a major repair job. Okay, Rick, we need to shut off the main valves and try to contain the damage. Can you handle that? I asked, hoping to give him something to focus on. Rick nodded, a determined look on his face. Yeah, I've got it, Bob. I watched as he waded into the water, moving with purpose. I knew I had to stay and deal with the mess, but part of me wished I could just turn around and leave it all behind. This was going to be a long, long night. The basement was like a scene from a disaster movie. Water everywhere, the sound of it rushing in a constant, overwhelming drone. I waded through the icy water, my flashlight beam bouncing off floating debris. My mind was racing with what needed to be done, but my body was screaming from the cold and my aching back. I started with what I could control, the main valves. The water was waist high, and I had to fight against the current to reach them. Turning them off was a struggle, but it felt good to do something tangible, something that stopped the chaos from getting worse. At least the gas was now off, reducing the risk of a bigger disaster. The emergency pumps were working hard, but they weren't enough. I needed to clear the debris clogging the drains to give the water somewhere to go. It was a grueling task, made worse by the cold water numbing my legs and the constant fear of what else might be lurking beneath the surface. As I worked, a strange sound caught my attention. It was a splash, distinct from the noise of the flooding water. It came from the direction of the collapsed wall. My heart raced. Was it just the building settling? Or was there something more to it? Curiosity got the better of me. I had to know what caused that sound. I made my way toward the collapsed wall, the sense of foreboding growing with each step. The flashlight beam revealed a gaping hole in the wall, opening into what looked like a cavern. I hesitated for a moment. This was beyond anything I'd seen in my years of plumbing. The opening seemed to beckon me, a dark, gaping maw leading into the unknown. Was I really going to do this? Was I going to step into this unknown darkness? I took a deep breath and decided to push on. Maybe this cavern was the key to understanding the flooding. Maybe it was just a natural formation. Either way, I had to know. The water grew colder as I approached the hole. I could feel the air change, a chill that seemed to come from within the cavern itself. I shone my flashlight into the darkness, and for a moment, I was struck by the eerie beauty of it. The light revealed a large space, with water-carved tunnels leading off into the darkness. It was then that the full weight of the situation hit me. We were dealing with something much bigger than a simple plumbing issue. This was a force of nature, a reminder of how small and insignificant our human endeavors can be against the might of the earth. I backed away from the opening, a mix of awe and fear churning in my stomach. I had work to do, a job to finish, but the sight of that cavern stayed with me, a haunting image that I couldn't shake off. I turned back to the basement, ready to tackle the next problem, but part of me was still lost in that dark, mysterious cavern, wondering what secrets it held and what dangers it might bring. The basement was a maze of darkness and rushing water. I was neck deep in the job, literally and figuratively, cutting away damaged lines and trying to reroute the water flow. My body ached, my mind was foggy from lack of sleep, but I had to keep going. The job needed to be done, and I was the only one there to do it. Then, everything changed in an instant. The generators sputtered and died, plunging the basement into complete darkness. Panic gripped me as I fumbled for my headlamp. The only sound was the water, which now seemed menacing in the pitch black. 
I tried to stay calm, telling myself that I just needed to get the generators back up. But deep down, I knew something was very wrong. The generators had enough fuel. They shouldn't have died like that. A cold chill ran down my spine, and for the first time that night I felt truly scared. I moved towards the generators, my feet unsteady in the rushing water. That's when I heard it. A splash, different from the sound of the water around me. Something had moved in the darkness. I froze, every nerve on edge. Was someone else down here with me, or something worse? I shook off the fear and focused on the task at hand. I had to get the lights back on, but as I reached the generators, I stumbled. My foot caught on something and I fell forward, my headlamp flickering as I hit the water. Pain shot through my arm as I felt something sharp pierce my skin. I struggled to push myself up, but my arm was caught on something. Panic set in as I realized I was trapped, impaled by a piece of rebar from the collapsed wall. The water rose around me, cold and suffocating. I fought against the rebar, but it was no use. I was stuck, and the water was getting higher. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of hard work, after surviving everything the job had thrown at me, was this how it was going to end? I was struggling to keep my head above water, each breath a battle. The pain in my arm was unbearable, but it was the fear of drowning that truly terrified me. I thought of my family, my friends, the life I still wanted to live. I wasn't ready to give up, not yet. Just when I thought it was over, when I was about to succumb to the darkness, I felt strong hands grabbing me. I was pulled from the rebar and dragged through the water. I couldn't see who it was, but I knew it had to be Rick. He had come back for me. As we reached the stairs, I felt the cool air of the outside world. I was alive. Rick had saved me, but as I lay there, gasping for breath, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. Why had the generators failed? What was that splash in the darkness? And how had Rick found me just in time? Those questions haunted me as I slipped into unconsciousness, the pain and exhaustion finally taking their toll. But one thing was certain, I was alive, and I owed it all to Rick. I woke up in a stark white hospital room, the sterile smell of antiseptic filling my nostrils. My arm throbbed with a deep, unrelenting pain, and my whole body felt like it had been run over by a truck. Tubes and wires were attached to me, monitoring my every breath, my every heartbeat. The events of the night came back to me in flashes, the flooding, the darkness, the feeling of being impaled, and Rick's strong hands pulling me to safety. But as I tried to piece together the memories, a nurse walked in, her face somber. How are you feeling, Bob? She asked gently. Like I've been through a ringer, I replied, trying to force a smile. Where's Rick? I need to thank him. He saved my life. The nurse's expression changed, a look of deep sadness replacing her professional demeanor. Bob, there's something you need to know. Rick. He didn't make it. They found his body in the basement, on the other side of the breach in the wall. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. That's impossible, I said, shaking my head in disbelief. He was the one who pulled me out. He saved me. The nurse sighed, her eyes full of sympathy. Sometimes, when we go through traumatic experiences, our minds play tricks on us. It's a way of coping with the shock and the pain. But the truth is, Rick was already gone when the rescue team arrived. I couldn't accept it. It didn't make sense. Rick had been there. I had felt his hands, heard his voice. But as the nurse continued to explain about hallucinations, about the effects of blood loss and trauma, I began to doubt my own memories. The next few days were a blur of doctors, police officers, and endless questions. Everyone wanted to know what had happened, but I couldn't give them the answers they were looking for. My story about Rick saving me was met with skeptical looks and gentle explanations about the tricks the mind can play. I felt lost, adrift in a sea of confusion and grief. But then, something happened that brought everything into sharp focus. As I was getting dressed to leave the hospital, I noticed something on my arm. A set of bruises, distinct and unmistakable. They looked like the imprint of a large hand, gripping my arm tightly. In that moment, I knew. Rick had been there. 
He had saved me, whether in body or spirit I couldn't say, but those bruises were proof that I hadn't imagined it. Rick had been my guardian angel in those dark, terrifying moments. I left the hospital with more questions than answers, but one thing was clear to me. Rick had been a hero, and I owed him my life. I didn't know how I would ever repay that debt, but I was determined to try. As I walked out into the sunlight, the events in the basement still haunted me, but I carried with me the memory of Rick's bravery and the knowledge that sometimes the line between the living and the dead is thinner than we think. It's funny how life can turn upside down in just a blink of an eye. Fourteen years ago, I was living a life that, though not perfect, was mine. I had a loving husband, a stable job, and dreams. But in what felt like a heartbeat, everything changed. It started with my husband, the man I thought I'd spend my entire life with. He blindsided me one evening, his words cutting through me like a knife. I'm leaving you for someone else, he said, cold and distant. I remember standing there, unable to comprehend the earth-shattering revelation. He left, and with him, he took a piece of my heart. Worse, he demanded that I leave our home, the one we had built together with love and dreams. Reeling from the shock, I sought solace in my work, but misfortune had become my shadow. The company I had dedicated over a decade of my life to faced financial ruin. I was one of the first to be let go. The pink slip felt like a betrayal. My career, which I had nurtured with hard work and dedication, was gone in an instant. I wish I could say that was the end of it, but life had more in store for me. One night, exhausted and lost in my thoughts, I fell asleep behind the wheel. The screeching of tires and the jolt as my car veered off the road are sounds and sensations I'll never forget. My car, a symbol of my independence, was wrecked beyond repair. I spent my last dime fixing it, not knowing it was just the beginning of a deeper financial abyss. The world felt like it was closing in on me. I moved into a small, drab apartment, a far cry from the warmth of what used to be my home. Nights were the hardest. I'd curl up in a corner, tears streaming down my face, mourning the life I'd lost. Friends, or those I thought were friends, turned their backs on me. Loneliness became my constant companion, along with a crippling depression that gripped me tight. But there was a moment a defining one, when I realized I couldn't let this be the end of my story. I was on the brink of homelessness, and the thought terrified me. It was then I decided enough was enough. I had to pick myself up. I didn't need anyone. I had to be my own savior. I lived in a small dying mining town where job opportunities were as scarce as rain in the desert. My options were limited. So, when a job offer came from a nearby dairy farm, I grabbed it without a second thought. Preparing and taking cows for milking wasn't a childhood dream, but desperate times call for desperate measures. The farm was a new world, a stark contrast to the corporate life I was used to. The smells, the sounds, the entire atmosphere was alien to me, but it was a job, and more importantly, it was a lifeline. As I adjusted to my new reality, I often found myself reflecting on the twists and turns of life. Little did I know, my journey was about to take an even more unexpected turn, one that would challenge everything I believed about the world and myself. Life on the dairy farm was a world apart from anything I'd known. The days were long and grueling, but there was a rhythm to them, a simplicity that brought a strange kind of peace to my heart. Maybe it was the way the cows looked at me with their gentle eyes or the endless green fields that stretched out under the open sky. It was hard, but it was honest work. Then came the day my boss, Mr. Thompson, a stern man with a heart of gold, called us all for a meeting. He needed someone to cover the night shift temporarily. Before I knew it, my hand shot up. The idea of extra pay was too tempting to pass up. Plus, working at night meant less physical labor. All I had to do was ensure everything was in order, that the cows were safe and sound. Simple, right? The first few nights were unsettling. The vast farm, 
so lively and bustling during the day, transformed into a different world after sunset. The darkness seemed to swallow everything, and the usual farm noises took on a sinister edge in the stillness of the night. But I needed the money, and fear wasn't a luxury I could afford. To make my night shifts more bearable, I created a little haven for myself. With a stack of hay bales, I built a cozy fortress. It wasn't much, but it was mine. Here, I'd sit with my back against the soft hay, a small headlamp lighting up the pages of my book. It was during these quiet hours, lost in stories, that I found a sense of peace I hadn't felt in years. But it wasn't all reading and relaxation. Every once in a while I'd take a walk around the farm, a flashlight in hand, making sure everything was okay. The cows usually slept soundly, and seeing them so peaceful somehow made the darkness less intimidating. One night, while I was nestled in my hay bale fortress, an idea struck me. Why stay cooped up in the small office when I could enjoy my book in the fresh night air? So that became my new routine. Wrapped in a warm jacket, I'd lose myself in novels, the soft sounds of the farm a comforting background melody. It was on one of these nights, while I was deep into a new thriller, that I first heard it. Footsteps. They were distinct, heavy, splashing through the mud near the barn. My heart skipped a beat. Thieves, maybe? I had read about small-town thefts in the local paper. I peered out from my fortress, trying to spot the intruder. The fog that night was thick, blanketing the farm in a ghostly haze. I crept closer to the source of the sound, my flashlight cutting through the mist. But when I reached the spot, there was nobody there. The mud bore the marks of recent activity, but it was as if the person had vanished into thin air. Confused and a little spooked, I called my brother. He was always up late, lost in his world of video games. His voice was a welcome anchor to reality. He laughed off my fears, assuring me it was probably nothing, just my imagination running wild. I wanted to believe him. I needed to. So I returned to my fortress, convincing myself it was just a trick of the mind. But deep down, a seed of unease had been planted, a nagging feeling that something wasn't quite right. Little did I know, that feeling was just the beginning. Back in my hay bale fortress, I tried to shake off the eerie feeling from the mysterious footsteps. I told myself it was just a stray animal, or perhaps my tired mind playing tricks on me. My brother's words echoed in my head, trying to offer some comfort. You're just tired, he had said. I wanted to believe him, but the unease clung to me like a second skin. I opened my book again, trying to lose myself in its pages. The words blurred before my eyes as I constantly glanced up, half expecting to see someone lurking in the darkness. The farm was silent, too silent, and it did nothing to calm my jitters. Every rustle, every creak seemed amplified in the stillness of the night. Then, it happened. A sound unlike anything I had heard before sliced through the silence. It was a guttural, slurping sound, mixed with what seemed like a gurgle. My heart raced, and a cold sweat broke out across my forehead. The sound was getting closer, moving towards my little fortress. I turned off my headlamp, plunging myself into darkness, hoping whatever it was wouldn't notice me. The sound stopped right outside my hay bale wall. I held my breath, too scared to move, too scared to even think. It was right there, on the other side of the hay bales. The silence was suffocating, and then I heard something that chilled me to the bone. It was my voice. The same words I had spoken to my brother on the phone earlier, repeated in a mocking, distorted echo. Maybe we can hang out tomorrow. I love you. The words were unmistakable, but they were twisted, as if coming from a broken speaker. My mind raced, trying to make sense of it. Was someone playing a cruel joke, or was it something else? Panic seized me. I couldn't stay there, not with that thing, whatever it was, mimicking my voice. Adrenaline surged through me, and I bolted from my hiding place, running blindly into the night. The fog was thick, a white blanket that made it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. I stumbled towards where I remembered parking my car, 
praying I was going in the right direction. The farm was a maze in the fog, and every moment I expected to feel a hand grab me from the darkness. Finally, I saw the outline of my car. Never had I been so relieved. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking uncontrollably. As I unlocked the car and slid inside, I heard it again, that same slurping sound, now accompanied by a soft scratching on the car roof. I started the engine, the sound of it roaring to life the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. I wanted to speed away, but the fog forced me to crawl at a snail's pace. All the while, I felt light taps, and heard soft whispers trailing behind me, as if the thing was following, taunting me. I don't remember how long I drove, only that I was sobbing, my tears mingling with utter terror. When I finally felt safe enough, I called my boss, stammering through my fear, trying to explain the unexplainable. That night changed everything. The farm, once a place of refuge, now felt tainted, haunted by an unseen terror that spoke with my voice. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, stalked by something that was not just a figment of my imagination. The terror of that night lingered, a constant shadow over my heart. The morning after that terrifying night, I was a wreck. My hands still trembled, and every shadow seemed to hide a lurking horror. I couldn't shake off the image of the thing that had mimicked my voice, that had followed me in the fog. Sleep was a distant memory. Every time I closed my eyes, I heard that eerie, distorted echo of my voice. I expected a call from Mr. Thompson, my boss, thinking he would be furious. I had left the farm unattended, fled like a scared child. But when my phone finally rang, and I heard his voice, there was no anger. Instead, there was confusion, concern. He told me he had gone to the farm after my panicked call. The fog had been so thick he could barely see, but he did a quick check of the barns. What he found in one of them sent a chill down my spine. One of the pregnant cows was dead. Not just dead, but something had torn open its belly. The details were gruesome. No calf, no organs, no blood. It was as if everything inside had been scooped out, leaving an empty shell. And the strangest part? No signs of a struggle, no footprints, nothing. It was as if whatever did it had vanished into thin air. Mr. Thompson didn't fire me. He didn't even scold me. He just asked if I was okay, if I needed any time off. But I couldn't go back to that farm, not after what happened. The thought of being watched by something unseen, something that could mimic my voice, filled me with an unshakable dread. I went back to my day job at the farm, but things were never the same. The once comforting routine of milking and tending to the cows now felt like a walk through a minefield. Every noise made me jump. Every shadow seemed to hide a threat. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, expecting to see something, but there was never anything there. The incident at the farm changed me. I had never been one to believe in the paranormal, in things that go bump in the night. But now, I couldn't deny that something unexplainable had happened. Something that defied logic, that defied reason. I tried to talk to people about it, but who would believe such a story? It sounded like something out of a horror movie, not real life. So I kept it to myself, this heavy secret that weighed on my soul. Months passed, but the fear never left me. It lingered like a bad dream, always at the edge of my thoughts. The farm, once a sanctuary, now felt like a prison. I knew I couldn't stay there, not with the memories of that night haunting me. So, I left. I packed up my few belongings and moved away, hoping to leave behind the terror that had gripped me. But even as I settled into a new life, the questions remained, unanswered and unanswerable. What had I heard that night? What had happened to that cow? And the most chilling question of all, had it been watching me all along? I don't know if I'll ever find the answers. But one thing is certain. That night on the farm changed everything. It opened my eyes to a world beyond understanding. A world where shadows whisper and unseen things walk. And though I've tried to forget, to move on, some nights when the darkness is heavy, 
I can still hear that distorted echo of my voice, calling me back to a mystery that remains unsolved. I've contemplated sharing this story for what feels like an eternity, because, to be honest, it sounds like something straight out of a horror movie. But since I cherish this community so much, I've finally mustered the courage to recount this chilling experience. Back in high school, I had a job as a closing server at the local Pizza Hut. My shift typically ended quite late, and my nightly ritual was to text my dad when I was nearly finished, not only to let him know I was on my way home, but also to gauge whether my parents were still awake. If they weren't, I'd often opt for the longer route home along the old country roads. You see, I lived on a dog breeding farm that was a good 20 minute drive outside of town. These country roads were my escape from the daily grind, a place where I could unwind and enjoy a joint or two while listening to my favorite tunes. It was on one fateful night during one of these solitary drives that things took a terrifying turn. I was cruising down a back road I knew like the back of my hand, a route my school bus had taken throughout my entire childhood. This part of East Texas was known for its dense woods, so most property owners built their homes about a quarter to half a mile deep into their land, leaving the woods as a natural buffer and barrier. This meant that while you'd come across plenty of driveways and mailboxes, actual houses were rarely visible, just the ominous woods with sporadic clearings. As I continued driving, my headlights illuminated an unexpected obstacle in the middle of the narrow dirt road. It was a toolbox, the kind you'd find in the back of a work truck. I pulled up to it and stopped, opening my car door just enough to step out while keeping a cautious distance. It was at this moment that I realized my headlights were not the only source of light on that road. Further down the road, there were other headlights, much smaller, approaching from a driveway that ran parallel to the toolbox. A creeping sense of dread began to wash over me, and I quickly retreated back into my car, closing the door with just a slight crack, ready to act at a moment's notice. My heart pounded as I watched a small riding lawnmower emerge from the trees. The person riding it was dressed in a full clown suit, complete with a mask that concealed their face. What was even more horrifying was the shotgun resting casually across their lap. As the clown turned his gaze towards me, our eyes locked and a shiver ran down my spine. With eerie calmness, he brought the shotgun up to his lap. I'm a true country boy, and I can sense when I'm not welcome somewhere. Before he could even raise the gun any further, my car was already in gear, speeding into the side ditch of the road. I jumped out of my vehicle, discarded my joint, and sprinted for home, not looking back. That night, I crawled into bed, shaken to my core, vowing never to speak of this horrifying encounter again. I couldn't fathom what the clown was up to, especially considering the whole killer clown craze had largely subsided by 2018 or 2019. Whether it was some misguided kid or a deranged backwoods dweller, I hoped to never cross paths with Mr. Clown ever again. Back when I was in my late twenties, I found myself in the most unexpected twist of fate. I had started dating my all-time biggest crush from secondary school, Jamila. She had always been the prettiest girl in our whole secondary school, but by the time we all got off to you and I, she had transformed into something truly stunning. We had stayed connected on Facebook, but our interactions were sporadic at best. I mostly just watched and admired her from afar never daring to think a girl like that could be in my league. Then, during the summer when I turned 27, fate threw me a curveball. I was out drinking at a swanky bar, celebrating a friend's birthday, when, to my utter disbelief, I spotted Jamila. Over the years, I had undergone a significant transformation myself, losing weight and getting into shape during junior officer training in uni. I had become more confident and athletic, making it easier to talk to girls and secure dates. However, when faced with my old crush, my newfound confidence seemed to vanish into thin air. Despite the initial awkwardness, we began to catch up, engaging in casual small talk that soon turned into flirtatious banter. We agreed to meet up for a drink sometime, and I couldn't believe my luck. 
It was like I was living out that cheesy Walking on Sunshine song, and this feeling of euphoria lasted for almost six weeks as we dated. But then, as if from nowhere, the affair took a dark turn. On our final date, a minor disagreement spiraled into a heated confrontation. I won't bore you with the details, but the girl of my dreams turned out to be a complete psycho. I found myself storming out of her apartment, angry, upset, and wearing nothing but a thin shirt in the freezing winter weather. I didn't stop to think about the consequences. I just needed to be out of there for everyone's safety. As I walked away, the reality of my situation started to sink in. The cold weather was biting, and my outdated iPhone's battery was nearly dead. I was facing a three-mile walk home in near-freezing temperatures. I began sticking my thumb out at passing cars, desperately hoping for someone to stop. At first, only cabs passed by, none of them empty or with their lights on. I even resorted to holding out a $20 bill, trying to entice someone into stopping, but to no avail. My desperation grew as I contemplated jogging home in dress shoes just to avoid freezing. And then, in a stroke of luck, a lone car approached. I stuck my thumb out one last time, hardly daring to hope. To my astonishment, the driver put on the indicators, pulled over, and honked the horn as if to say, get in. I couldn't believe my luck. It felt like a Christmas miracle. I looked into the open window and recognized the driver. It was one of my old uni mates, a guy named Matt, who had returned to town to visit his family for Christmas. He said, I thought that was you, hop in. Gratefully, I got into the car, and we started driving towards my place, chatting along the way. Matt had been driving all day, and I just rolled into town when he spotted me on the side of the road. It was a pleasant surprise, and we talked about our lives, my roller coaster relationship, and plans to meet for a pint or two around the new year. But then, out of nowhere, tragedy struck. Another car crashed into the driver's side door, sending us spinning out of control. It might sound cliche, but everything happened so fast that I could hardly process it. We were driving through a green-lighted intersection when we were suddenly blinded by headlights and hit. The impact was beyond description, like a powerful force had struck not just the car, but my very being. I closed my eyes, holding on for dear life, feeling the world spin around me. When we finally came to a stop, I opened my eyes and gasped. The car was wrecked. The front windshield looked ready to shatter, and the driver's side dash was crumpled. Panic surged through me as I noticed smoke rising from under the bonnet. Fear gripped me. The car could catch fire. I turned to Matt, telling him to get out before it exploded. But when I looked at him, my heart sank. There was blood everywhere, his face unrecognizable, blood oozing from his mouth. His one good eye was wide open, but he wasn't breathing. I knew he was dead. I managed to crawl out of the car, limping to the curb as far away as possible. I just waited there in shock until the emergency services arrived. Paramedics checked me over, and although I had a bit of whiplash and some cuts and bruises, I was mostly okay. They took me to the hospital, where they kept me overnight because of the shock. The next morning I officially learned that Matt had died, but truthfully, I already knew it, having seen his condition in the car. I nodded as the hospital staff went through the motions, despite knowing I had been in the bloody car with him. The following days were filled with police interviews and a lengthy legal process. The driver of the other car, who had been drinking after an office party and was driving recklessly, ended up going to prison for manslaughter. He pleaded guilty to everything, issued a prepared statement expressing his remorse, and even wished it had been him who died. But to me and Matt's family, he was a murderer not just an arrogant idiot who killed someone by mistake. I hoped he would carry the burden of his actions for the rest of his life, just as we would. Our lives had been forever altered by that fateful collision, and it was a pain that would never truly heal. I work as a childcare professional, and one of the kids I was taking care of had recently developed a keen interest in hiking. Eager to encourage his newfound passion, I decided to take him to Salt Fork State Park for a memorable hiking trip. The chosen trail for our adventure 
was Hosack's Cave Trail, a route I was quite familiar with. It was relatively short, spanning about half a mile in total, making it ideal for our daily hike. What drew me to this trail, aside from its manageable length, was its popularity. Whenever I had been on it before, it had always been bustling with people, and it felt like a safe and well-trodden path. However, this particular summer had seen a series of severe storms that wreaked havoc on the trail. To my surprise, it had become more complex and oddly devoid of hikers. Nevertheless, I wasn't too concerned about the solitude since a small construction crew was working on a bridge, albeit barely visible from the trailhead. The child was excited about the hike, even though the entire width of the trail had been washed out, leaving only a precarious foot-wide path with a substantial 6 to 12 foot drop into a creek bed below, strewn with rocks and fallen trees. His athleticism gave me confidence in his abilities, and his enthusiasm for the adventure was infectious. I couldn't bring myself to deny him this experience. We eventually reached a platform that provided a breathtaking view of Hosack's cave. Surrounding the platform were numerous downed trees, and unfortunately, the cave itself was closed off at this point. Nevertheless, we had come this far, and our determination led us to maneuver around the barriers and venture a few hundred feet into the cave's opening. Most of our time was spent in this area, as it proved to be quite challenging to get there. I vividly remember the surroundings, tree roots directly under the platform, offering a climb down on either side. Hosack's cave wasn't like the typical creepy, confined cave. It had an open, beautiful layout, with an overhanging rock formation and a gentle waterfall trickling down the middle. As we explored deeper into the cave, I noticed a candle resting on a large rock. It hadn't been lit recently, but there was a heart carved into the stone beside it. I shrugged it off, assuming it was just a spot for a romantic date. However, my unease began to grow when we reached the top of the cave and spotted two more candles neatly arranged in stacks of small rocks. A sense of discomfort settled in, but it was at that moment that the child's eyes lit up as he discovered a small puddle teeming with baby salamanders. His joy was palpable, and I couldn't bear to cut short his happiness. We spent around an hour catching these tiny creatures, and I watched him revel in the moment. Finally, we decided it was time to leave, but as we returned to the platform, I couldn't ignore the sight that now filled me with dread. Hanging in the center of the tree roots was a wet washcloth, a new addition that hadn't been there before. The child noticed it too, but he didn't seem to grasp the gravity of our situation. At that moment, I knew two things for sure. First, someone had been watching us all along, unseen, and second, they were now possibly lurking in the woods, intentionally staying hidden but leaving objects behind for us to find. With no option to run back along the narrow, treacherous trail, I decided to keep my fears to myself. I urged the child to walk ahead of me, continuously offering words of encouragement to keep him moving briskly. My eyes scanned the surroundings, but I saw no one. However, the feeling of being watched persisted throughout our hike back. We eventually reached the car, and I locked the doors immediately. As we drove out of the park, a disheveled man in his thirties emerged from the woods, making a deliberate point to lock eyes with me. His expression was vacant, like nothing I had ever seen on a human face before. He followed my car with his gaze and head as we passed by him, his stare unbroken until he faded from view. At that moment, the third fact became chillingly clear. This man had intentionally made himself known to me. The first two facts were confirmed. Someone had been watching us, and they wanted us to know it. The memory of that stare haunted me for days, and I seriously considered seeking counseling, as the anxiety it triggered lingered for weeks. I tried to rationalize the encounter, telling myself that maybe we had unwittingly disrupted the man's solitude or interrupted his bathing ritual, but the timing, the stare, and the fact that he had all the opportunity in the world to approach us during our salamander hunt made it difficult to dismiss as mere coincidence. Deep down, I couldn't escape the chilling possibility that his actions had been a deliberate attempt to terrify me. The child, 
blissfully unaware of the danger we might have been in, still recalls that day as one of his most exciting adventures. For me, however, it remains one of my most disturbing and unsettling experiences, a memory that continues to make me feel sick and disturbed to this day. When I was much younger, I found myself working for a local mining company that had recently arrived from out of state. I was at the very bottom of the totem pole, so to speak, relegated to the ranks of the dirt crew. Our job was as basic as it gets. We shuffled and moved dirt in this massive open pit mine. This place was a behemoth of a site, a colossal pit filled with boulders of all sizes. You see, mining operations involved some seriously hefty machinery. These colossal vehicles were not your run-of-the-mill trucks. Their tires could reach a staggering 14 feet in height. The one at the center of this eerie tale was no exception, and it boasted a set of air brakes to help counter its immense momentum. On that fateful day, I was just wrapping up my brake when my boss approached me with a peculiar request. He wanted me to inch this colossal dump truck a few feet forward, closer to the gaping maw of the enormous pit. My boss was the one who had hired me, and he knew my capabilities on the job better than anyone. So despite my initial surprise, I figured he must have had faith in my abilities. After all, he wouldn't ask me to do something I couldn't handle, right? Little did I know how wrong I would be. As I climbed the ladder to the driver's seat, I began to sense that perhaps I had bitten off more than I could chew. Standing atop the ladder, peering into the cab, I hesitated. Doubts gnawed at me, but I still couldn't believe my boss would assign me a task I couldn't handle. I lowered myself into the driver's seat, immediately taking note of the brand new, pristine leather interior. The scent of newness hung in the air. This vehicle had a mere 19 miles on its odometer. I started the engine, and it roared to life, but I struggled to shift it into gear initially. Eventually, I got it rolling and as the massive dump truck gained momentum towards the precipice of the pit, I attempted to use the regular brakes, the ones we're all familiar with, via the pedal on the floor. Panic gripped me when it became evident that this wasn't working. My heart raced, and my mind spiraled into a frantic search for a solution. It dawned on me that this colossal beast must have two braking systems, and I had no clue how to operate the auxiliary air brakes. With time running out, I found myself praying for guidance. In a split-second decision fueled by sheer desperation, I yanked open the door and flung myself from the towering cab, plummeting nearly twenty feet onto the jagged rocks below. I landed with a bone-jarring thud, my knees absorbing the brunt of the impact. My eyes were locked on the monstrous truck as it teetered on the edge of the precipice. Time seemed to stretch into eternity as I helplessly witnessed the giant machine somersaulting end over end, descending deeper into the gaping pit. A colossal cloud of dust billowed up in its wake. The massive dump truck must have flipped a dozen times or more during its harrowing descent. In a surreal moment, I watched one of its gigantic 14-ton tires detach and go hurtling off, bouncing erratically across the rocky terrain. Even more astonishing, the truck's bed broke free, soaring high into the sky like some bizarre UFO. It felt like hours passed as I remained rooted in shock, staring at the spectacle unfolding before me. Finally, with a deafening crash, the colossal vehicle came to rest at the pit's bottom, a mangled and twisted wreck. It seemed to have melded with the unforgiving rocks below. I sat there for a while, unable to tear my eyes away from the grotesque scene grappling with the shock of what I had just witnessed. Eventually, I mustered the strength to rise, dusting myself off and making my way to face my furious boss. Unsurprisingly, he was livid. He barked orders for me to march straight to the company office, which lay on the far side of the property. Apparently, hospital checkups were deemed unnecessary in his eyes. As I entered the office, a whirlwind of anger and frustration consumed me, but it was to no avail. My pleas fell on deaf ears, and I was summarily fired on the spot. I tried to argue that my boss had assigned me a task I wasn't qualified for in the first place, but my protests were met with indifference. 
So, on that traumatic day, I walked away without a job, my final paycheck clutched in my trembling hand, forever haunted by the terrifying spectacle of a monstrous dump truck tumbling into the abyss. In the thick of a Texan summer, the heat can warp the air and make a man think of cooler places. That's where my mind wandered as I sat on the porch, watching the kids play in the dwindling light of the day. Courtney came out, her steps slow but steady, a testament to her recovery from the accident that had turned our lives upside down. Alaska, she said, the word hanging in the air like a promise or a threat. We had talked about it for weeks, the idea of starting anew in a place as foreign to us as the moon. The company I worked for had offered me a position there, and with our mounting debts, it wasn't an opportunity I could easily dismiss. The kids, Kevin and Jamie, were oblivious to the monumental change looming over them. Kevin, at ten, had the boundless energy of a pup, chasing after everything with a sense of wonder. Jamie, seven, quieter and more thoughtful, watched her brother with a mix of amusement and envy. As I watched them, the decision weighed on me like a lead blanket. But it was a weight I had to carry, for all our sakes. We needed a fresh start, away from the memories of the accident, the endless hospital visits, and the pitying looks of our neighbors. We can do this, Courtney whispered, her hand finding mine, a gentle but firm grip. It was all the assurance I needed. Within months, we were uprooting our lives from the familiarity of Texas to the unknown wilderness of Alaska. The journey was a blur, a whirlwind of packing, long flights, and a seemingly endless drive. Alaska greeted us with its vast, untamed beauty, a stark contrast to the neat suburbs we had left behind. The kids pressed their faces against the car windows, eyes wide at the sight of mountains that pierced the clouds and stretches of forest that seemed to go on forever. Our new home was a wooden structure, nestled in a clearing surrounded by towering pines. It was larger than our place in Texas, but it felt smaller, dwarfed by the enormity of the wilderness around it. The first night, as the kids slept in their new rooms, Courtney and I sat in the living room, the silence around us so thick it was almost a physical presence. I remember thinking how different the stars looked here, brighter and more numerous, a glittering tapestry above us. The next morning, as I stepped outside, the crisp air bit at my skin. I had spent most of my life outdoors, but the Alaskan wilderness was a different beast. It was wild, untamed, and utterly indifferent to the struggles of a family trying to find their footing. Our neighbor, Terry, came by later that day, a casserole dish in hand. She was a sturdy woman, with a warm smile and eyes that had seen much of life. Her husband had passed away the previous spring, leaving her alone in a house that had seen better days. As we shared the meal, she told us about the community, the quirks of living in such a remote place, and the beauty of the Alaskan seasons. She didn't mention the legends then, those would come later, but in her stories, I sensed a depth, a connection to the land that was both inspiring and intimidating. That night, as I lay in bed, listening to the unfamiliar sounds of the wilderness, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of excitement and apprehension. We had stepped into a new chapter of our lives, one filled with unknowns and challenges. But I was determined to make it work, for Courtney, for the kids, for all of us. Alaska was a new beginning, a chance to rebuild, and to find something we didn't even know we were looking for. The first light of dawn in Alaska is different. It's not just the time it shows up, but the way it spreads across the land, like a slow, reluctant awakening. That's what I thought as I stood on our new porch, coffee in hand, watching the sun tease the horizon. It had been a few weeks since we moved, and the novelty of our new home was starting to wear off, revealing the hard edges of reality. Courtney had set up a small office in the corner of the living room. Her job allowed her to work remotely, a blessing given her ongoing battle with PTSD since the accident. I watched her sometimes, her face illuminated by the screen, a mix of concentration and discomfort etched on her features. 
She was strong, my Courtney, but even the strongest have their breaking points. Kevin and Jamie had started school. They seemed to be adjusting well, making friends, embracing the Alaskan lifestyle better than I'd hoped. Kids are resilient like that, bouncing back in ways adults can't. But I could see the longing in their eyes on the rare occasions they talked about Texas, about the life and friends they left behind. In those early days, I learned quickly that living in Alaska wasn't just about dealing with the cold. It was about understanding how the cold changes things, the way you dress, the way you plan your day, even the way you think. It wasn't just a matter of throwing on a heavier coat. It was a whole new way of living. The cost of living hit us hard. Everything was more expensive. Fuel, food, the basic necessities. We had to be careful with every penny, plan every trip to the store like a strategic mission. I remember thinking how ironic it was, moving to Alaska to save money and finding ourselves pinching pennies more than ever. But there were moments, brief and fleeting, when the beauty of this place would catch me off guard. Like when I took the kids hiking, and we saw a moose and her calf at a distance. Or when the northern lights danced across the night sky, painting it with colors I didn't even know existed. Our neighbor, Terry, became a regular presence in our lives. She would come over with baked goods, share stories of her life with her late husband, and give us tips on surviving the Alaskan winters. There was a strength to her a resilience that came from years of living in this unforgiving land. I respected her for it, even as her stories of the Alaskan wilderness sent a shiver down my spine. One evening, as the kids played in the living room and Terry shared a cup of tea with us, I felt a sense of community, albeit a small one. She spoke about the winters, how they could be brutal and beautiful all at once. Her words were a mixture of caution and admiration for the land. It was during these talks that I began to understand the complexity of life here. This wasn't just a place, it was a living, breathing entity that demanded respect and offered awe in return. Terry talked about the wildlife, the hidden dangers, and the unspoken rules of living in such close proximity to nature. Her stories were interspersed with laughter and moments of silence that spoke volumes. She didn't just live in Alaska, she was a part of it as much as the mountains and the forests. As for Courtney and me, we found solace in each other. Our conversations often drifted back to Texas, to our families and the life we left behind. But there was also a sense of purpose in what we were doing. We were here for a reason, to build a better future for our kids, to pay off our debts, to heal from the past. The days turned into weeks, and slowly the initial shock of the move began to fade replaced by a routine that felt almost normal. I would head out to work, the kids to school, and Courtney to her corner of the living room. In the evenings, we would gather for dinner, share our day's experiences, and slowly, the unfamiliar became familiar. But beneath the surface of our daily life, there was an undercurrent of something else, a sense of unease that I couldn't shake off. It was in the way the trees seemed to watch over our house, in the unfamiliar sounds that filled the night, and in Terry's stories that hinted at a world beyond our understanding. As winter approached, that feeling grew stronger. The days got shorter, the nights longer, and the cold seeped into everything, chilling not just our bodies but our spirits. Alaska was testing us, challenging us to adapt, to survive. And as I looked at my family, at the life we were building, I knew that this was just the beginning of our journey in this wild, beautiful, and unforgiving land. The Alaskan winter settled in like a long, uninvited guest, bringing with it a silence that seemed to muffle the world. It was during one of those silent evenings, as the kids played checkers by the fireplace, that Terry began to share the legends of the land. There's more to Alaska than just the beauty and the wilderness she said, her voice low, almost reverent. There are stories here, tales that have been passed down for generations. Courtney and I listened, the warmth of the fire a stark contrast to the chill that Terry's words brought. She talked about the Alaskan Bermuda Triangle, a stretch of land where people went missing more often than anywhere else in the world. 
My rational mind scoffed at the idea, but there was a part of me, a part that had begun to respect the raw power of this place, that couldn't help but listen. The Wendigo, Terry continued, her eyes fixed on the dancing flames. They're the ones you need to be careful of. Wendigo? Jamie asked, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and curiosity. Dear men, Terry explained, creatures of legend, they say they can take the shape of a man, lure you into the woods, and then you're never seen again. The kids were hooked, hanging on every word. I could tell Courtney was less enthused, likely worried about nightmares. But there was something captivating about the way Terry spoke, a sincerity that made the stories come alive. As she delved deeper into the legend, describing encounters and near misses, I found myself looking out the window into the dark forest that surrounded our home. It was easy to imagine something lurking out there, something ancient and unknowable. It's not just stories, Terry said, a serious tone in her voice. People go missing. You need to be careful, especially with the kids. The evening ended with a sense of unease hanging in the air. The kids were quiet as they went to bed and even Courtney seemed lost in thought. I lay awake that night, listening to the wind howl outside, wondering about the truths that lay hidden in Terry's tales. The next day, life went on as usual, but the stories lingered in the back of my mind. At work, I mentioned them to a few colleagues. Some laughed, others nodded solemnly, sharing their own stories or experiences they'd heard of. It seemed that in Alaska, the line between legend and reality was often blurred. One evening, as I sat on the porch, watching the northern lights dance across the sky, I felt a deep connection to this land. It was beautiful and terrifying in equal measure, filled with mysteries that I was only just beginning to understand. I realized then that these legends, whether true or not, were a part of the Alaskan spirit. They were a way of understanding and respecting the wilderness, a reminder that we were just small pieces in a much larger, ancient puzzle. And as I looked out into the dark, snow-covered forest, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets it held. The Alaskan winter was a relentless beast, its cold gnawing at every inch of exposed skin. That particular day, the job was the same as always, out in the wild, where the land was as harsh as it was beautiful. As the evening approached, the light began to fade, painting the sky in shades of pink and purple. It was then that I realized I'd left my phone back at the work site. Damn it, I muttered to myself. In any other place, I might have left it until the next day. But out here, a phone was more than a luxury. It was a lifeline. I told the crew I'd catch up with them and headed back alone. The path was familiar, a trail I had walked countless times. But as the light waned, it took on a different character. The trees seemed to lean in closer and the shadows grew longer, darker. The cold was biting, seeping through my jacket and numbing my fingers. I cursed myself for not being better prepared, but there was no going back now. The thought of the phone lying there, possibly getting snowed over or taken by wildlife, spurred me on. As I walked, the silence of the forest was absolute, broken only by the crunch of my boots on the snow. It was eerie, this quiet, and it made me feel like an intruder in a world that was not my own. Finally, I reached the site. My phone was there, just where I'd left it, propped against a tree. Relief washed over me as I picked it up, but it was short-lived. A howl, distant yet chilling, cut through the silence, and I froze. It was probably just a fox, I told myself, or some other small creature. But Terry's stories echoed in my mind, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. I hurried back, my pace quickening with every step. The forest seemed to close in around me, and the howl sounded again, closer this time. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could feel the adrenaline coursing through my veins. The path, so familiar in the daylight, was now a labyrinth in the fading light. Every tree looked the same, every shadow a hiding place for whatever was out there. I was lost, disoriented, and the realization hit me like a physical blow. Panic set in, and I started to run, the phone clutched tightly in my hand. 
Branches reached out, snagging my clothes, scratching my face. I stumbled, fell, and got back up, driven by a primal fear. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the forest opened up, and I saw the lights of the truck. I had never been so grateful for the sight of anything in my life. I didn't stop running until I reached the vehicle, slamming the door shut behind me. As I sat there, panting, my heart still racing, I knew that Terry's stories had burrowed deeper into my mind than I'd realized. The wilderness around me wasn't just a backdrop for our new life. It was a living, breathing entity with its own rules and dangers. I had underestimated it, and that mistake had nearly cost me dearly. Driving back, the warmth of the truck's heater slowly thawed my chilled bones, but the cold inside me lingered. It was a cold born of fear, a realization of how vulnerable I was in this vast, untamed land. When I got home, Courtney noticed the scratches on my face and the wild look in my eyes. I brushed off her concerns, not wanting to worry her or the kids. But that night, as I lay in bed, the sounds of the forest seemed louder, more ominous. I thought about the legends, about the Wendigo and the other tales Terry had shared. In the light of day, they were just stories, but out there, in the dark heart of the Alaskan wilderness, they felt uncomfortably real. The experience changed something in me. It was a reminder that, no matter how much we try to control our environment, there are forces out there beyond our understanding, beyond our control. And in Alaska, those forces were right outside our door, hidden in the shadows of the trees and the howling of the wind. I resolved to be more careful, to respect the land and its mysteries. But as I drifted off to sleep, a part of me knew that the wilderness had already left its mark on me. It was a mark that I would carry with me, a constant reminder of the fine line between the known and the unknown in this rugged, beautiful, and terrifying place called Alaska. The Alaskan wilderness in winter is a kingdom of ice and shadow, where every step could be your last. That reality never hit me harder than it did on that late February day. The job was straightforward. Get to the site, do the work, and get home. But nature has a way of laughing at our plans. I remember leaving the site as the sky dimmed, the twilight hours in Alaska being more suggestion than certainty. The cold was a living thing, clawing at my skin, seeping into my bones. My crew and I packed up, the camaraderie of shared labor keeping our spirits high despite the biting cold. They headed back, but I stayed behind for a moment, lost in thought, watching the darkness swallow the landscape. That's when I heard it. A voice, faint but unmistakable, calling my name. It was distorted, carried by the wind. Brian? I called back, thinking it was my boss, maybe coming back for some forgotten tool. But there was no reply, just the echo of my voice in the still air. I followed the sound, my rational mind screaming that this was a bad idea, but curiosity and concern for my friend pushing me forward. The darkness deepened, the trees becoming menacing silhouettes against the night sky. The voice called again, closer this time, and I quickened my pace. Then, abruptly, it stopped. The silence was deafening, the sudden absence of sound more terrifying than any noise. My heart pounded in my chest, my breath forming clouds of vapor in the cold air. I realized then that I was lost. The familiar trail was gone, replaced by a sea of white that stretched endlessly in every direction. Panic set in, a primal fear that gripped me and wouldn't let go. I thought about the Wendigo, about Terry's stories, and a cold sweat broke out despite the freezing air. Had I been lured into a trap? Was this how I would meet my end, not in a blaze of glory, but lost and alone in the Alaskan wilderness? I turned to head back, but the landscape had changed, or my sense of direction had betrayed me. Every tree looked the same, every shadow a potential threat. I stumbled through the snow, my thoughts a jumble of fear and regret. Then I saw it, a figure, tall and dark, moving between the trees. It was no human, that much was clear. Its movements were too fluid, too silent. It was the Wendigo, I was sure of it the creature from the legends, 
come to claim another victim. I ran, my breath ragged, my legs burning with the effort. The creature followed, always just out of sight. But I could feel its presence, a malevolent force that filled the night with terror. I don't know how long I ran, time losing all meaning in my flight. But eventually, against all odds, I saw lights, the lights of our camp, a beacon of hope in the darkness. I burst into the clearing, my crew looking up in surprise. There's something out there, I gasped, collapsing into their arms. They didn't question me, their faces telling me they believed every word. That night, I learned the true meaning of fear and the respect that the Alaskan wilderness demands. It was a lesson I would never forget, a reminder that some legends are rooted in truth and some truths are better left unexplored. The aftermath of that night in the Alaskan wilderness lingered in my mind like a haunting melody. Lying in a hospital bed, staring at the sterile white ceiling, I had time to reflect on the harrowing events that had brought me here. The doctors said I was lucky to have only minor frostbite, but the chill that had settled in my bones wasn't from the cold. It was from the fear. Courtney sat beside me, her hand a constant comforting presence. The worry in her eyes was clear, but so was the relief. She didn't ask many questions about that night, and I wasn't sure if I could have answered them if she did. How do you explain an encounter with a legend, a myth, a creature from a story meant to scare children. I knew what I had seen, what I had felt. The terror of being chased, the sense of an otherworldly presence. It was all too real. But admitting it, even to myself, felt like opening a door to a world I wasn't sure I wanted to be a part of. The kids visited, bringing drawings and stories to cheer me up. I tried to be present for them, to laugh and smile, but my mind was elsewhere, lost in the endless white of the Alaskan wilderness. When I was finally discharged, the journey home was a quiet one. The landscape, once a source of awe and wonder, now seemed foreboding, filled with hidden dangers and secrets. As we passed the dense forests and snow-covered fields, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Back home, Courtney and I talked long into the night. The move to Alaska, which had seemed like such a promising start, now felt like a mistake. The cost of living, the isolation, the harsh weather, it was all bearable when weighed against the chance for a better life. But this, the fear that now hung over us, was something else entirely. We discussed our options, the possibility of moving back to the lower 48 states. It wouldn't be easy, but perhaps it was necessary. The kids, still blissfully unaware of the depth of our concerns, deserved a chance at a normal life, one not overshadowed by the legends and dangers of the Alaskan wilderness. The decision wasn't made that night, but the seed was planted. In the days that followed, as I returned to work and the kids to school, the thought of leaving grew stronger. Alaska, with all its beauty and mystery, had shown us a side we weren't prepared for. I continued to work, but the joy I once found in the wilderness was gone, replaced by a constant vigilance. Every rustle in the trees, every unexpected sound, made me tense. The legends of the land, once just stories, now felt like warnings. As winter gave way to spring, the snow melting and the days growing longer, Courtney and I made our decision. We would leave Alaska, return to a life more familiar, more predictable, it was a difficult choice, but one that felt right for our family. Alaska had changed us in ways we never expected. It had shown us the beauty of the wild, the strength that comes from facing challenges, and the importance of respecting the mysteries of nature. But it had also shown us our limits, the boundaries we weren't willing to cross. As we packed our belongings, preparing for the journey back to Texas, I took one last look at the wilderness that had been our home. I felt a twinge of sadness, a sense of loss for what might have been, but there was also relief, a lifting of the weight that had been pressing down on us since that fateful night. Alaska would remain a part of us, a chapter in our lives that we would never forget, but it was time to move on, to seek a new beginning, a new adventure. And as we drove away, leaving the land of legends behind, I knew that, 
No matter where life took us, we would be ready for whatever came next. I need to start by saying yes, this really did happen. I also have to say that this kind of ghostly incident was one of a kind. I worked in healthcare at the time, in a local emergency department, dealing with life and death daily, including my days off and vacations. There's a lot that changes how you perceive your world. I feel as if I grew up being sensitive to these kinds of events. One year, a co-worker and I went to Keystone, Colorado for an emergency medicine conference. We drove up together and split a room. The lodge we were at was very cozy and comfortable, but I had a feeling of being watched from the very moment we parked. We went to the room and dropped off all our stuff. There were two queen beds there, and I took the one closest to the window. I put all the throw pillows on the right side of the bed so that I could be by the window and hear the babbling brook. When we went to bed, my coworker was fine with that decision. After all, she said she was a light sleeper, and the sound of the water would probably keep her up all night. We then went to the pre-conference walkthrough to look for the best swag from the vendors. While at the swag convention, we ran into a few friends who worked at the local fire department. We finished our day off by going to dinner, having a few drinks, and dancing. By then, we were both so tired that we called it a night around midnight. When we made it back to our hotel room, everything appeared to be in the same place as we left it. The temperature was so perfect that we slept with the window open. We were on the second floor, so it felt safe to us, and I slept like a rock. I woke up when I felt someone crawling into the bed with me. It began at the right side foot of my bed. At the time, I was lying on my stomach, with a bit of a pillow fort on my right side. I thought, what is my friend doing climbing into bed with me? I guess if she needs to cuddle, that's fine. I chuckled softly to myself. The bed was still moving as it felt like someone was crawling right up to me. Then suddenly, I felt as if someone just laid right on top of me. I instantly became so cold, and I found it very hard to breathe. I opened my eyes and saw the hairs on my arms standing up, huge goosebumps present on my skin. With my eyes now open, I noticed there was no other person in the room. So, who was on top of me? The window was open, and the sun was coming up. Once this eerie feeling went away, I shot straight up in bed and looked over at my friend. She was sound asleep in her bed. I just stayed there, sitting and hugging my pillow, until she woke up about half an hour later. I must have looked like a sight because she looked at me and said, Uh, what happened? I told her what had happened. Dang it, she said. Why can't the cool stuff happen to me? I'm not going to lie. I kind of became excited about the experience, but would have been okay if it had happened to her instead. Living on our 18-acre property in the Pacific Northwest, my wife and I resided in a camping trailer about 100 yards away from the main house owned by my mother-in-law. The land, once a site for logging a century ago, hid numerous untold stories and mysteries of generations past. One such story I've uncovered involves the early inhabitants, Mr. John Graham Sr. and Mrs. Mona Smith. Their son, John Graham Jr., an architect, left his mark on Seattle, designing iconic structures like the Space Needle. The lake nearby was named Lake Moneysmith in honor of John Sr.'s wife. In this wooded haven, home to our ducks, chickens, sheep, and goats, the wilderness teemed with life. Bald eagles soared overhead, black bears roamed freely, deer and their young found refuge, while possums, raccoons, and bobcats called this place home. There was even a sighting of a cougar about five miles away. But one night, an encounter shook me to my core. It was a moonless night, and I found myself outside the trailer wearing a headlamp, tending to the mundane task of emptying the black water tank. The beam of my headlamp barely penetrated the surrounding darkness, illuminating only what was directly in front of me. As I stood there, waiting for the tank to empty, I saw two reflective orbs staring back at me from the impenetrable void of the woods. 
On this land, I'd encountered and startled bears, been surprised by them, named the deer, been dive-bombed by bats, and even sprinted after a bobcat eyeing our ducks. But these eyes were different. They were tall enough to be a bear, yet not spaced apart like a deer's. My attempts to scare it off with shouts, mock charges, and furious yells proved to be futile. It stood unwavering, unblinking, and motionless. The unnerving silence hung heavy as those eyes pierced through the darkness, fixated on me. For an eternity, I waged a one-sided battle against this unseen entity, its unwavering gaze chilling me to the bone. I mustered all my courage, bellowing and stamping my feet, but those eyes, unmoving, remained fixated on me. A sense of foreboding crept in. I realized this wasn't like anything I had encountered before. The eyes, glowing and intense, never wavered. They were there, stubborn and unyielding, until suddenly they turned away. They vanished into the darkness without a sound, rustle, or twig break, leaving me with a chilling void of confusion. It's been a decade since that haunting encounter, and still, the mystery lingers. Despite the passing years, the night's events remain etched vividly in my memory. I've often contemplated the inexplicable nature of that presence the enigmatic pair of eyes that seemed to defy the natural world, leaving me with an eerie sense of wonder and curiosity that endures to this day. Yet every time I venture out to tend to the black water tank, a lingering thought nags at me. What else might be looking in those creepy woods? It was another early spring morning when I decided to head out to my favorite trailhead in Washington. I always loved how secluded it was, how it felt like my own private escape into nature. Hardly anyone ever parked there, just my trusty Mini Cooper most times. But today was different. As I pulled into the parking lot, I noticed a big white Ford pickup already there. It was so much bigger than my car, and it immediately made me feel uneasy. There's something about seeing another vehicle in a usually deserted spot that sets your nerves on edge, like walking into your house and realizing someone's moved your furniture just an inch to the left. Shaking off the feeling, I grabbed my backpack filled with water, snacks, and hiking essentials. I double-checked my hiking boots, making sure they were tied tight. The air was crisp and fresh, filled with the promise of spring. I took a deep breath, trying to let the beauty of the day wash away my lingering unease about the pickup. The trail starts right in the thick of the woods. For the first few minutes, you can still hear the hum of cars on Highway 2, a comforting reminder of the civilized world just a stone's throw away. But as you walk further, that sound fades, replaced by the symphony of the forest. It's like stepping into another world. Tall trees tower above their leaves whispering secrets to each other. The sunlight pierces through the branches, casting dancing shadows on the ground. It's mesmerizing, almost magical. I've always loved this part of the hike, where the forest feels like it's embracing you. The path is a straight shot through this dense green wonderland. Today, the beauty of it all was heightened by the clear, bright day. The sunbeams broke through the canopy in spots creating a collage of light and shadow on the forest floor. It was like walking through a living piece of art, a masterpiece of light, shadow, and greenery. But as I ventured further, the comforting signs of civilization faded away. The only sounds were my own footsteps, the occasional chirp of birds, and the distant rustle of animals in the underbrush. It's funny how the absence of human noise can make you feel so isolated, so vulnerable. I've hiked this trail so many times before, but today, it felt different. The silence was heavier, filled with an unspoken warning. As the trail began to climb, I found myself drinking more water than usual. Maybe it was the unease about the pickup, or maybe the beauty of the day was making me more adventurous. I've always carried a purifier pump with me. There are a bunch of streams along the way, and there's nothing like fresh mountain water to quench your thirst. I was about an hour into the hike, when the trees started to thin out. More sky than canopy, the air grew colder with the elevation, 
but the sun felt warmer on my skin. I stopped for a moment, catching my breath and taking in the view. It was then, in that moment of peaceful solitude, that I heard it. A muffled bang. It sounded distant, muffled by the ridge ahead of me, but I could hear its echo bouncing back a few seconds later from a cliff across the valley. My first thought was a gunshot, but that didn't make sense. There weren't supposed to be hunters here. I stood there for a moment, considering turning back, but curiosity got the better of me. I kept walking, unaware of the nightmare that was about to unfold. As I pushed further along the trail, the dense forest gave way to a more open landscape. The path, still clearly marked, wound its way up the mountain, the trees standing tall and majestic on either side. The further I hiked, the more I felt enveloped by the wilderness, a tiny speck in the vastness of nature. The first bang I'd heard earlier was still nagging at the back of my mind. It was probably nothing, I told myself. Just some distant noise, maybe a car backfiring on the highway, or some construction work. But deep down, I couldn't shake off a sense of unease. The forest, usually so comforting and familiar, now seemed to whisper secrets I wasn't privy to. I focused on the physical effort of the hike to distract myself. The trail began to ascend more steeply, and I could feel the burn in my legs and lungs as I pushed myself. I've always carried a purifier pump on these hikes. The mountain streams, crisp and cold, were a natural source of refreshment. I stopped at one of these streams, the water babbling over rocks, and filled my bottle. The water was so clear, so pure, it felt like drinking in the essence of the mountain itself. About an hour into the hike, the trees started to thin, offering glimpses of the sky above. The air was cooler here, but the sun's rays felt more intense warming my skin as I moved through patches of light and shade. I was drinking in the beauty of it all when it happened again. Another bang, louder this time, unmistakably close. It wasn't muffled like the first one. It was sharp, clear, and it echoed off the surrounding mountains, setting my heart racing. My first thought was a gunshot. Could there be hunters in the area? But that didn't make sense. This was protected land, Hunting wasn't allowed. The sound made me jump, and for a moment, I lost my footing, stumbling slightly before regaining my balance. My heart was pounding, not just from the hike, but from a growing sense of fear. And then I saw it. Smoke rising between two red cedars ahead. It wasn't just a wisp of smoke, it was substantial, billowing up into the clear sky. Birds took flight in a flurry, their peaceful chirping replaced by alarmed calls. I instinctively ducked, even though the source of the smoke was still some distance away. My mind raced with possibilities. Could it be a campfire? But no. Campfires were banned in this area. My overactive imagination conjured images of miners using dynamite. Ridiculous, I know. This wasn't the 19th century. Curiosity and a sense of responsibility propelled me forward. I veered off the main trail making my way through the underbrush towards the source of the smoke. My heart pounded with every step, a mix of fear and adrenaline driving me. I had to know what was going on. As I approached, the smell hit me first. It was a stench, an acrid mix of burning and something else, something foul, and then I saw it, the deer. It was a gruesome sight. Its was mangled and torn, still steaming in the cool mountain air. Its ribcage was exposed, a grotesque display of violence. Crimson was scattered around, painting the high grass in shades of red. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. The deer's remaining eye was lifeless, staring into nothingness. The wounds were chaotic, as if inflicted in a frenzy. A landmine? Here? The thought was absurd, but my mind struggled to make sense of the scene before me. And then I heard it, a buzzing, faint at first, like a distant power tool. But it grew louder, more insistent, until I could no longer ignore it. It was a drone. Within seconds it was hovering above the clearing, its mechanical hum filling the air. I waved at it, a futile gesture. I was angry, confused, horrified. 
What was this? Some kind of sick game? I yelled at the drone, not even sure if it could hear me. I screamed into the wilderness, my voice echoing off the mountains. The drone just hovered there, an impersonal observer to the carnage below. I felt a surge of helplessness, a sense of violation. This wasn't just a peaceful hike anymore. It was a scene from a horror movie, and I was the unwilling protagonist. Standing there, in the middle of the clearing, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The sight of the mutilated deer was horrifying enough, but the sudden appearance of the drone added a whole new level of terror to the situation. For a few seconds I was frozen, my eyes locked on the mechanical intruder that buzzed menacingly above me. I couldn't understand what was happening. Was someone watching me? Playing some sick joke? The drone seemed like a sinister eye in the sky, cold and unfeeling. It hovered there, its presence invasive and ominous. I felt exposed, vulnerable in a way I'd never experienced before. This was supposed to be my sanctuary, my escape from the world, but now it felt like a trap. Anger bubbled up inside me, mixing with fear and confusion. I shouted at the drone, my voice echoing through the trees. What do you want? I demanded, knowing full well I wouldn't get an answer. The drone just hovered, its camera lens fixed on me, making me feel like a specimen under a microscope. I took out my phone thinking to document this bizarre encounter. I snapped pictures of the drone, zooming in as best I could. That's when I noticed something even more alarming. Hanging from the drone's underside was a small round object. My heart skipped a beat as it dawned on me what it could be. It was no bigger than a baseball, but its implications were terrifying. Was that a grenade? Panic surged through me. This wasn't just some voyeuristic prank. It was something far more dangerous. I didn't have time to process the thought fully before I heard a faint click, followed by a clinking sound. Instinctively, I dived to the ground just as a loud bang erupted behind me. The force of the explosion sent dirt and debris flying. For a moment, I was deafened by the blast, my ears ringing. I lay there on the ground, disoriented, my heart racing. I could taste metal in the air and feel the sting of smoke in my eyes. Slowly, I sat up, checking myself for injuries. Miraculously, I was unharmed. The drone had missed, but the message was clear. I was being targeted. I scrambled to my feet, my mind racing with fear and adrenaline. I needed to get out of there to put as much distance between myself and the drone as possible. I glanced up, searching the sky, but the drone was gone. I didn't stop to think. I just ran, stumbling back toward the trail. My thoughts were a jumbled mess of fear and confusion. Who was controlling the drone? Why were they targeting me? My peaceful hike had turned into a nightmare, and I was the prey in a deadly game. As I ran, the reality of the situation hit me. This wasn't an accident. Someone had intentionally sent that drone after me. The thought sent chills down my spine. I was in real danger, and I had to get back to my car. To safety. I pushed myself harder, running as fast as my legs would carry me. The forest, once a place of tranquility, now felt like a maze of shadows and threats. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, made me jump. I was no longer just a hiker. I was a survivor, running for my life. Panting heavily, I hurtled down the trail, the once familiar path now a blur as I raced for my life. My mind was a whirlwind of terror and disbelief. How could a simple hike turn into this nightmare? The buzzing of the drone like a relentless predator haunted me, echoing through the trees. I couldn't shake the image of the grenade dangling menacingly from the drone. It was surreal, like something out of a twisted movie. But this was no movie. This was real, and I was the unwilling star. Every step I took was fueled by a mix of adrenaline and fear. The peacefulness of the forest was gone, replaced by the chilling realization that I was being hunted. I tried to rationalize the situation, to make some sense of it. Why me? Was it random, or was I specifically targeted? My thoughts were cut short by the faint yet unmistakable buzz of the drone. My heart sank. It was back. I looked up to see it gliding effortlessly above the treetops. 
its dark silhouette a stark contrast against the sky. In that moment, I felt a surge of anger. I was tired of running, tired of being scared. I stopped and screamed at the drone, my voice filled with rage and desperation. Leave me alone, but it was pointless. The drone was unyielding, its mechanical hum a constant reminder of my peril. I started running again, my lungs burning with each breath. I had to keep moving to outpace this mechanical menace. I stumbled over roots and rocks, my legs aching with the effort. The terrain was rough, uneven, but I couldn't afford to slow down. The drone was always there, just behind me, a relentless pursuer. I remembered the way the drone had dropped the grenade, how it had hovered with calculated precision. It was playing a game, and I was the unwilling participant. The thought filled me with a cold dread. What if I couldn't escape? What if the next grenade didn't miss? I pushed those thoughts aside and focused on the trail ahead. I had to survive. I had to get back to my car, to civilization. The canopy of trees offered some cover, but it was only a matter of time before the drone adapted, before it found a way to reach me even here. I ran and ran, my body screaming in protest. I didn't know how much longer I could keep this up. My mind kept going back to the white Ford pickup in the parking lot. Was the driver of that truck controlling the drone? Was this some sick form of entertainment for them? The buzzing grew louder, and I glanced over my shoulder. The drone was closing in, its presence a constant threat. I knew I couldn't outrun it forever. My only hope was to reach the trailhead before it was too late. As I neared the end of the trail, my legs felt like lead, my breath ragged. But I couldn't stop, not now. I was so close to safety, so close to escaping this nightmare. The trailhead was just ahead, my car a beacon of hope in this madness. With one last burst of energy, I sprinted towards the parking lot, the drone hot on my heels. I reached my car, fumbling with the keys, my hands shaking uncontrollably. I threw myself inside, locking the doors behind me. I was safe, at least for now. But as I sat there, catching my breath, I knew that this ordeal was far from over. Whoever was behind this drone, they were still out there, and I had to find out why they had targeted me. I sat there in my car, my chest heaving with each breath, trying to process what had just happened. The once comforting rhythm of my heartbeat now sounded like thunder in my ears, a constant reminder of the terror I had just endured. The forest around me, once a sanctuary of peace and solitude, now felt like a cage. I was safe inside my car, but the feeling of being hunted still lingered, like a shadow I couldn't shake off. The drone, that relentless machine of terror, was gone, but its presence had left a deep scar. I stared out of the windshield, my eyes scanning the trees for any sign of movement. Every rustle of leaves, every creak of a branch set my nerves on edge. I wanted to drive away, to leave this nightmare behind, but my hands were shaking too much to even start the car. The trailhead was deserted. The white Ford pickup that had been there earlier was gone. A wave of relief washed over me, but it was quickly replaced by a sinking feeling in my stomach. Who was driving that truck? Were they watching me the whole time? The question spun in my head, but I had no answers. I forced myself to take deep breaths, to calm the racing thoughts. I needed to think clearly, to figure out my next move. I couldn't just drive away and pretend nothing had happened. I had to report this. Someone had tried to kill me, and they could be out there, planning to do the same to someone else. Slowly, I started the car and drove away from the trailhead. The drive back to civilization felt surreal. The road was familiar, but everything felt different now. I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the drone following me. But there was nothing, just the empty road stretching out behind me. When I finally reached a town, I went straight to the police station. My story sounded unbelievable, even to my own ears, but I had the photos of the drone on my phone, the evidence of what had happened. The officers took my statement, their expressions a mix of concern and disbelief. They promised to investigate, to send a team to the trailhead, but I could tell they were skeptical. I left the station feeling drained, 
The adrenaline that had fueled me through the escape now replaced by a deep exhaustion. But there was no relief, no sense of closure. The drone, the person controlling it, they were still out there. The next day I saw the news about a missing girl. Her car had been found at a different trailhead, not far from where I had been. My heart sank as I read the article. They were looking for a white Ford F-150 in connection with her disappearance, the same kind of truck I had seen at the trailhead. I knew then that I couldn't just let this go. I had to do something. I had to find out who was behind the drone, who had tried to kill me, and was now possibly involved in this girl's disappearance. I couldn't shake the feeling of helplessness, of being a pawn in someone else's game. But I was determined to fight back, to uncover the truth and bring them to justice. This was no longer just about survival. It was about standing up against a faceless threat that had shattered my world. I must confess that I had always dismissed the countless stories about the deep web and dark web as nothing more than sensationalized tales, mere urban legends meant to send shivers down one's spine. However, a close friend of mine, whom I trusted implicitly, adamantly swore that she had ventured into this shadowy realm and had witnessed unspeakable horrors, some of which she would divulge, while others remained locked in the recesses of her mind, forever haunting her. Despite her solemn assertions, I initially brushed her accounts aside, convincing myself that she was fabricating these sinister tales out of a twisted desire for attention. But curiosity gnawed at me, persistent and unrelenting. I couldn't simply let it go. I yearned to discover the truth behind her stories, to ascertain whether this place truly existed. And so, I found myself descending into the depths of the internet embarking on a journey that would forever alter my perception of reality. Following the well-trodden path of inquisitive individuals, I ventured into the labyrinthine corridors of the deep web. I had been forewarned about the treacherous nature of the links that lay in wait, luring unsuspecting souls into a sinister web of depravity. My initial clicks led me to sordid rendezvous requests, illegal drug deals, and other nefarious transactions further confirming my skepticism. The deep web appeared to be nothing more than a digital marketplace for shadowy dealings, devoid of the sinister mystique that had been ascribed to it. However, I persisted in my quest for something remotely intriguing, something that would vindicate my friend's unsettling claims. And then, like a beacon in the darkness, I stumbled upon a link. The Night Watch. Intrigued, I clicked on it, envisioning perhaps a platform where an enigmatic figure would recount eerie tales or traverse desolate towns in the dead of night. Little did I know what awaited me. The moment I entered the night watch, I was greeted by a stark, black page. Three video screens dominated the space, arranged side by side. Each screen showcased a different family or individual. In the first video, a family of four was depicted, with parents and two young girls. The second featured a pregnant couple, their joy and anticipation palpable. The third video depicted a solitary woman and her faithful black lab, distinguished by a white streak over its left eye. Before I could scrutinize these vignettes further, a male voice emanated from the shadows. It was slightly distorted, rendering the speaker's true timbre enigmatic. Nevertheless, I strained to hear his words as he welcomed me with a chilling greeting. Good evening. Tonight, the night watchmen have brought you three unique households. They live disparate lives, harbor distinct beliefs, and envision disparate futures. He paused, clearing his throat with an eerie undertone. Watch each video, and then choose one. I was perplexed by the task at hand, struggling to comprehend its purpose. Yet, an inexplicable fascination overcame me, compelling me to continue. I hesitantly selected the first video, revealing fragments of the family's life, moments of familial togetherness, domestic activities, and ultimately, the parents retiring to their bedroom. The video abruptly cut off, leaving me feeling like an intruder into their intimate moments. 
a disconcerting voyeuristic sensation began to gnaw at my conscience. Reluctantly, I clicked on the second video, immersing myself in the lives of the expectant couple. I observed their shared excitement and love, their hopeful preparations for the impending addition to their family. This glimpse into their happiness managed to elicit a smile, albeit one tainted by the knowledge of my intrusion into their personal lives. Resigned to follow through, I moved on to the final video. It unveiled a single woman's solitary existence, marred by disarray and loneliness. Dishes piled up, laundry scattered, and trash overflowed. Her isolation weighed heavily upon me as I watched her desperate attempts to fill the void with television, ice cream, and an incessant obsession with her phone. I squirmed uncomfortably as the video took an explicit turn, capturing moments I had no business witnessing. Thankfully, the video ended, and I found myself waiting for the next stage of this surreal experience. The videos reverted to their initial stills, and the voice resurfaced. Now that you have seen, which will you choose? It queried, leaving me in silence, praying that someone else might be sharing in this macabre ordeal. But time passed without a response. The videos vanished, replaced by three new screens. This time the content was harrowing. Three towering figures, unmistakably men by their imposing presence, appeared clad in identical attire. Black shirts, pants, boots, and long trench coats. Wide-brimmed black hats obscured their features, lending an air of malevolence to their silhouettes. Have you decided? The voice inquired, its tone unsettlingly calm. Death comes on swift wings for our ill-fated friends. You must choose one. That's how the game goes. The implications of this grotesque game were thrust upon me, and I was horrified. Was I truly tasked with choosing who lived and who perished? The absurdity of it all made me consider closing the page. But before I could act, the voice interjected. Before you close us down, you should know that if you do not choose, your family will be next. The words reverberated through me, jolting me from my stupor. I dismissed it as a mere scare tactic, but then, to my horror, the voice addressed me directly. Anna, dear sweet Anna, I know it's a difficult choice, but it must be made. Please, if you will, direct the night watchmen to their chore. My heart pounded in my chest as I gazed at the screens, my eyes darting between the unfortunate families. The weight of responsibility bore down on me. The family with children was out of the question. The expectant couple's dreams hung in the balance. And then, my gaze fell upon the lonely woman with her faithful dog, the least to lose. With a heavy heart, I made my choice, clicking on her video. Very well, so shall it be, the voice responded, its serenity restored. The night watchman, a choice has been made. You may attend to your work. The videos returned to the previous scenes, and a sense of foreboding washed over me. Maybe this was all an elaborate prank by a group of hackers, I reasoned aloud, attempting to quell my rising fear. But then, the voice spoke again, uttering my name, and my heart seized with terror. Anna, dear sweet Anna, it intoned, sending shivers down my spine. I know it's a difficult choice, but it must be made. Please, if you will, direct the night watchman to their chore. The videos shifted, revealing the night watchman once more. Two of them approached their designated households, while the third retreated into the darkness, disappearing from view. Confusion washed over me. I had chosen the lonely woman, yet her watchman was walking away, vanishing into the night, leaving me bewildered and anxious. As the videos played out, two watchmen entered their respective homes. One stood menacingly at the foot of a sleeping couple's bed, brandishing a gleaming machete. He swung it wildly, and the room erupted in screams of terror. I felt a lump rise in my throat, bile threatening to surge forth. I averted my gaze to the other video, where the remaining watchmen loomed in the children's room, positioned amidst the pink bunk beds. My scream merged with the cacophony as he raised his machete, and in that moment I yanked the computer plug from the wall, severing the gruesome spectacle. My mind reeled in horror, unable to comprehend the unfathomable act I had just borne witness to. What had I done? My mouth was dry, my head spun with dizziness, and my heart threatened to burst from my chest. 
Hours passed, and I was left to grapple with the torment of my actions. Eventually, I dared to approach my computer, praying that the nightmarish ordeal had been erased from existence. I found nothing amiss, as if the twisted reality I had stumbled into had never existed. Days later, while checking my email, a sense of dread washed over me as I discovered a message from an entity I never wished to hear from, the Night Watchman. With trepidation, I opened the email, inexplicably compelled to confront the sinister enigma that had infiltrated my life. The email contained only a few haunting words against a stark white background. Jenna thanks you for excluding her from a Night Watchman's fate. We thank you for your choices too, and we truly enjoyed our encounter with you. Come play again any time. Attached was an image of the lonely woman, still engrossed in her phone, walking her dog in the park. My soul shuddered with revulsion. I vowed never to venture into the dark abyss of the deep web again, forever haunted by the choices I had been forced to make and the chilling encounter that had unraveled before me. I've always loved Halloween, ever since I was a kid. I would eagerly anticipate it each year, counting down the days until I could dress up, carve pumpkins, and go trick-or-treating with my friends. Halloween was that one magical night when anything could happen, and I reveled in the thrill it brought. So when I stumbled upon an advertisement for seasonal workers at a local theme park hosting a Halloween event, I jumped at the opportunity. It seemed like the perfect way to earn some extra money while having fun. The ad mentioned they were looking for actors, makeup artists, costume designers, and various staff to create a spine-tingling atmosphere for the park's guests. Naturally, I applied for the actor position, hoping to scare the daylights out of people with my acting skills. A few days later, I received a call from the theme park inviting me to audition. The audition was held at the theme park itself, in a dimly lit backstage area. There were about a dozen other people, all dressed in various costumes and makeup, waiting nervously. I watched as they performed their scenes, some of them impressively good, which made me doubt my own chances, while others left much to be desired. When my turn finally came, I walked up to the stage where a man with a clipboard introduced himself as the director of the Halloween event. He asked for my name, and I replied, I'm Alex. He smiled and inquired, Nice to meet you, Alex. What scene will you be performing today? I confidently replied, A scene from The Shining. He nodded and said, Ah, a classic. Let's see what you've got. With a deep breath, I began to act out the scene. I must admit it felt a bit awkward, but to my surprise, the director seemed pleased with my performance. I couldn't believe it. I got hired as an actor for the Halloween event. After thanking him profusely and signing some paperwork, he handed me my schedule. I was going to play one of the killers in the haunted house called the Slaughterhouse, one of the park's most popular attractions. The Slaughterhouse was located at the far end of the theme park, near the woods. It was designed to resemble an old, abandoned factory where people were tortured and killed by sadistic killers wearing animal masks. Guests would navigate through dark corridors and rooms filled with gruesome props and effects, including severed limbs, hanging bodies, chainsaws, and plenty of terrifying screams. My role was to hide in one of the rooms, waiting to jump out at unsuspecting guests with my meat cleaver, aiming to send them fleeing in terror. The first night of work was exhilarating. I arrived an hour early, changed into my costume, and applied my makeup. I looked quite menacing in a blood-stained apron, a butcher's hat, and a fake meat cleaver. The thrill of scaring people was unlike anything else, and I relished every moment of it. Seeing the guests' terrified reactions as I emerged from the shadows was a pure delight. Week after week, I continued working at the slaughterhouse, every Friday and Saturday night from 7 p.m. to midnight. Each night was a unique experience, with different reactions from the guests. It was a job where boredom simply did not exist, and I began to think that I might have found my true calling. The climax of my time at the park was Halloween night, the grand finale of the Halloween event. The park was packed with enthusiastic guests, eager to celebrate the holiday in style. Decorations were more elaborate, 
the music was louder, and the staff was more energetic than ever. As I arrived at my locker an hour early as usual, I found a note from the director, along with a new costume and makeup kit. The note congratulated me for my hard work and dedication, and informed me that I'd been given a special role for the night. I was to play the leader of the killers, wearing a pig mask. Excitement surged through me as I donned the new costume and applied the makeup, transforming into a terrifying figure. In the slaughterhouse, my fellow actors and I gathered, all of us having received similar notes from the director about our special roles for the night. The anticipation was palpable as we waited for the event to begin. Little did we know that this Halloween night would turn into something far more chilling than we could have ever imagined. The night started off according to plan, with us terrifying guests as usual. But as the hours passed, something unexpected happened. An announcement came over the loudspeakers, but it was not the director's voice. It sounded strange, ominous. The announcement called for a real slaughter, a grand finale for the night. The lights inside the slaughterhouse suddenly went out, plunging us into complete darkness. Panic began to creep in as we fumbled in the dark, trying to make sense of the situation. After a long minute of silence, screams pierced the air, but they were different from the usual terrified screams. These were filled with genuine agony and terror. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized something was terribly wrong. A few of us rushed to investigate the source of the screams and stumbled upon a horrifying sight. Two individuals dressed like us were chasing guests with knives, inflicting real harm. In the dim light, I saw a body lying on the floor, surrounded by a pool of blood. Chaos erupted as guests fled in all directions, some stumbling and falling in the stampede. My co-workers and I tried to help, but we were overwhelmed and bewildered. I attempted to contact the director and the lighting crew, but there was no response. Amid the pandemonium, the announcement over the loudspeakers took an even darker turn. It was no longer just a twisted prank. It had become a real nightmare. The lights never came back on, and the screams and chaos continued. It was as though we were trapped in a real-life horror movie. Finally, when it was nearly midnight, the park's security and police arrived, swiftly containing the scene. The assailants were apprehended, but the damage had been done. The director was found unresponsive in his office, and the park immediately shut down the event, offering apologies and refunds to the traumatized guests. My co-workers and I provided statements to the authorities, trying to piece together the terrifying ordeal. It turned out that a former employee and his friends, for reasons unknown, had infiltrated the event, exploiting the chaos to carry out their twisted plan. What was meant to be a joyous Halloween celebration had turned into a nightmarish tragedy. In the aftermath, I was left shaken to my core, my love for Halloween forever tainted by the horrifying events of that night. The park never fully recovered, and I doubt I will ever be the same after experiencing the thin line between the thrill of fear and the true terror of reality. When I was 13 years old, I had an experience that, even now at the age of 26, still sends shivers down my spine. It was a Saturday night during the summertime, around 9 or 10 p.m. My family and I lived in a modest apartment on the first floor of a 10-floor building. Our apartment was situated right at the entrance, making it impossible to escape the sounds of anyone passing by. Little did I know that this fact would play a crucial role in the terrifying events that unfolded that night. At that time, I was deeply engrossed in a video game called Perfect World International on my PC. My beloved dog, Benny, was my only companion at home that evening. My parents, on the other hand, decided to go for a walk around the block, taking Benny with them. They asked if I wanted to join, but I declined, wanting to continue playing the game. They assured me it wouldn't take more than 30 minutes, so I agreed to stay home alone. As my parents got ready to leave, I logged into the game and checked my guild and global chat to see if anyone was online. Strangely, no one was online that night, which was quite unusual. Feeling a bit lonely and restless, 
I decided to change my mind and join my parents on their walk. I quickly got dressed, put Benny on his leash, and left our apartment. The apartment building had a foreboding aura, especially at night. Being on the ground floor meant we could hear every sound from outside, which often sent chills down my spine. But I pushed those thoughts aside as I joined my parents. We set off on our walk, enjoying the warm summer evening. However, after about 15 minutes, the atmosphere shifted dramatically. The gentle summer breeze suddenly turned into an ominous, foreboding wind, signaling an incoming storm. My mother made the call to return home, and Benny had already completed his business. We approached our building, a place that had always given me an eerie feeling. It was particularly dark on the side facing the block's garden, because there was no streetlight nearby. My father took the lead in unlocking the door, but as he attempted to unlock the final metal bar that secured it from the inside, his expression turned deadly serious. He paused and turned to my mother and me, his face etched with concern. In a hushed voice, he instructed us to call the police and alert the neighbors. Panic welled up within me as my mother rushed to the second apartment, where our neighbor, Ted, emerged, asking what was wrong. My dad whispered to Ted, obscuring the peephole of the door. Someone's in our house. They're holding the door. Please stay here with my family. I'll try to open it, but I'll be back. With that, my father sprinted alone into the darkness, shouting angrily, Hey, you, come back. Who the hell do you think you are? I'm calling the police. I followed my dad, not too closely, but enough to hear if he encountered trouble. After all, he was my father, and I couldn't help but worry. As I stepped outside, the darkness enveloped me intensified by the absence of any street lights near our apartment. My heart raced as I heard my father's distant shouts, Come back! And, I'm calling the police! My anxiety continued to grow, and I couldn't help but imagine the worst scenarios unfolding. In the midst of my fear, Ted managed to open the door, and we hurriedly entered our apartment. But what awaited us inside was beyond horrifying. In just fifteen minutes, our once serene home had been transformed into a chaotic nightmare. Shelves had been pulled out, and our clothes were strewn all over the house. Benny's dry food covered the floor, a clear sign that the intruders had stumbled upon his bowls, likely unaware we had a dog. What disturbed me the most was the calculated precision of the break-in. They had organized our belongings in the living room, meticulously selecting what they wanted to take with them. Laptops one of our TVs, my father's prized coin collection, phones, chargers, wallets, and even my father's camera, which he needed for a wedding assignment that week, all packed and ready to be stolen. But they hadn't had enough time to grab everything, so they settled for some of my mother's jewelry and pocket money. My heart sank as I rushed to my room, fearing the worst for my piggy bank. I had diligently saved money from my meager chores, and while it wasn't much, it represented my hard work and savings at the time. As I entered my room, a chilling sight met my eyes. The metal bars covering my window had been cut open, and my window was shattered. It was the point of entry for the intruders. My room was the only one facing the side of the building, secluded from prying eyes. It was at that moment that I realized I would never feel safe in my own room again. The police arrived, scattering white dust throughout our home in search of fingerprints. They took photographs, collected statements, and examined my broken window. Sadly, they couldn't apprehend the intruders, but they did share a grim revelation with us. Our home invasion was not an isolated incident. During that month, four other houses in our neighborhood had been broken into, one of them belonging to a police officer, unrelated to our case. The intruders had studied their victims, learned their schedules, and even knew the layout of their homes, often entering through children's windows. All the affected families had children, like us. The realization that our privacy had been invaded by organized criminals left a lasting scar on our family. If we hadn't returned home earlier than expected, I might have come face to face with these intruders. I shudder at the thought and pray I never have to meet them again.
I work hard during the evenings as a flight attendant, particularly on our overnight flights. I'm responsible for Delta flights from Buffalo, New York to various destinations across America. As you can imagine, the nights are usually hectic, with terminals flooded by passengers. My role involves ticket acceptance or denial, which often results in long lines of people rushing to catch their flights, and they're usually feeling quite agitated. It's a tough job, but it could always be worse. That fateful day started with an unusual delay. I overslept. I'm usually punctual, but something about the stress from late night flights had taken its toll on my sleep schedule. I woke up a full hour later than I was supposed to, causing panic to set in. In my haste, I grabbed everything I needed and sprinted to my Acura, which was parked in the driveway. But as luck would have it, I had to turn around because I'd forgotten my purse, car keys, and lunch for work. Those ten minutes felt like an eternity, and by the time I got back to the car, I was already two hours late. I called my boss to apologize profusely, thanking her for covering for me. It was the first time in eight years that I'd been late, so thankfully, she understood the situation. I rushed out of the driveway and onto the main road, still trying to make it to work as quickly as possible. In retrospect, my reckless driving probably would have gotten me into trouble if a police officer had caught me. As I sped along, I passed a dark blue Ford that had been swerving in front of me for the past three miles. I blared my horn as I went past, and the driver gave me a polite flip of the bird. However, instead of letting me go, he began tailing me for the next five minutes. Admittedly, I knew I was in the wrong, but his erratic driving was endangering others on the road. I watched in growing concern as he nearly collided with a black car driven by an older woman. She looked petrified as his vehicle came dangerously close to hers, swerving just in time to avoid a collision. I tried to maintain my speed and distance from him, but he continued his erratic behavior. Eventually he lost control and veered off the road into a ditch after clipping a motorcycle. I pulled over to the side of the road to help and discovered that the motorcyclist was unconscious and bleeding profusely. My hands were trembling as I called an ambulance and gave my statement when the officers arrived. The ambulance rushed both drivers to the hospital, but the motorcyclist was declared dead upon arrival. The officers assured me they would be in touch if they needed any further details. Feeling numb, I eventually made my way to my desk at the airport, where I explained the morning's events to my boss. My hands were cold, and my fingers wouldn't cooperate properly, but I managed to put on a smile as I greeted the passengers boarding the flight. Everything seemed normal until one woman disembarked and answered a phone call. At first she appeared excited, but her demeanor quickly changed as she began to break down at the desk, screaming in a way I had never heard before. She was screaming about her son being dead, and her husband, who looked equally shocked, muttered to himself about how he knew the motorcycle would be the end of him. It was then that I realized that this was the same motorcyclist, the one who had been following me and got clipped and killed earlier. I stood there, virtually paralyzed, as the family rushed out of the terminal. On my way home, I couldn't shake the feeling that I saw the lone headlight of a motorcycle following closely behind me. The events of that day would haunt me for a long time, a reminder that life can take a terrifying turn in an instant. Several years ago, when I was just 14 years old, I experienced a chilling and unforgettable encounter during an evening winter walk on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Our family had a summer house on Cape Cod and we spent every other weekend there whenever we could escape the hustle and bustle of New York City. Cape Cod, a peninsula off the east coast of Massachusetts, was a lively and crowded place during the summertime, but during the winter season, it transformed into an empty and desolate landscape. Most of the houses in our area were summer residences, and during the winter, these houses stood eerily silent, devoid of their usual occupants. In stark contrast to New York, where city lights never allowed the night to truly darken, Cape Cod had only street lamps along its single main road in the town. The main road stretched from the town center to the beach, and aside from this road, all the other streets were cloaked in darkness at night. 
The Cape extended out into the Atlantic Ocean, forming Cape Cod Bay, allowing us to witness both breathtaking sunrises over the Atlantic and mesmerizing sunsets over the bay. This proximity to the ocean also meant that there were minimal artificial lights at night, making the stars shine brilliantly. On clear nights, the Milky Way spanned across the sky, creating a captivating celestial display. The events of this story unfolded during the period between Christmas and New Year's Day. After the Christmas celebrations were over, our family found ourselves with an abundance of leftover turkey and pumpkin pie. Cabin fever began to set in as we spent days indulging in Christmas feasts and surrounded by family. One evening, my older sister, who was seven years my senior and 20 years old at the time, proposed an idea to break the monotony. A walk to the harbor, approximately a 20-minute journey from our cozy Cape Cod cottage. The harbor had a unique charm during the winter, as we could explore the quiet docks and wander among the boats. Although the thought of strolling through a deserted beach town on a cold winter night gave me a sense of unease, I also found the prospect of an adventure thrilling. As we ventured out into the darkness, crossing the street from our classic Cape Cod cottage, we were met with a vast field that gradually transitioned into a dense forest at the other end. The tall grass in the field added to the eerie ambience of the night, and a sense of foreboding crept over me. I couldn't help but entertain thoughts of potential psychopaths lurking in the tall grass, armed with axes, even though I knew it was just my imagination running wild. The setting was ripe for a horror movie, a moonless sky filled with sparkling stars, the Milky Way arching overhead, and a sense of isolation enveloping us. We continued our walk, reaching the main road and then turned onto a side street that led downhill toward the harbor. This side street ran along the backside of a long, yellow-painted motel with a pool, a lively hub during the summer months. However, on this December evening, the motel was closed for the season, shrouded in darkness, with several windows covered in plywood for protection. My sister couldn't help but remark how the motel, spanning an entire block yet partially boarded up, reminded her of the kind of horror movie where characters make all the wrong decisions and stumble into their worst nightmares. As we proceeded down the road, we realized that we hadn't encountered a single car, person, or sign of life since leaving our house. The absence of any signs of life began to weigh on our nerves. I was only 13 at the time, but I was determined to maintain a facade of toughness in front of my older sister. The woods alongside the road intensified our unease. The trees seemed to close in on us, offering countless hiding spots for someone or something. The houses beyond the woods were all dark, as winter vacationers rarely ventured to this area. It was then that I felt it, an inexplicable sensation tingling up the back of my neck, causing the hairs to stand on end. This peculiar feeling was something I experienced when I believed I was being watched, an eerie sixth sense, or perhaps just a heightened intuition. We found ourselves halfway into the wooded area, still descending toward the harbor. My composure was slipping, and I was on the verge of abandoning my tough act when my sister suddenly suggested, let's go back, it's getting late, and it's pretty creepy here. I seized the opportunity and replied, yeah, it's kind of eerie. I could feel my body trembling with a mix of fear and excitement as we turned around. My sister gripped my hand tightly, a rare display of affection from her. The moonless night and the dark, deserted streets only fueled our anxiety. As we retraced our steps, my sister suddenly let out a scream that sent shivers down my spine. I've got a knife, and I'm not afraid to use it. She maintained her brisk pace without missing a beat. We crossed a street and when my sister cast a panicked glance behind us, I could hear a worried sound escape her lips. She ordered me, don't look back. My heart raced and a chilling sense of dread enveloped me. Apart from the eerie atmosphere and my sister's inexplicable behavior, I hadn't seen anything unusual. We continued our hasty retreat, making our way to the street behind the closed motel. My sister kept looking back, her apprehension intensifying. That's when she commanded, When I say run, you run, okay? Okay, I replied nervously. We were now approaching the end of the wooded area, and
and I was losing my composure entirely. My sister suddenly shouted, Run! We both broke into a sprint, our footsteps echoing loudly on the asphalt. I could hear more footsteps in the distance behind us. Cutting through a grassy area, we took a shortcut toward our street, running through our neighbor's front yards to reach the safety of our home. We finally made it inside, breathless and panicked, and locked the storm door behind us. The transition from the terror outside to the warmth and light of our house was surreal. Inside, I struggled to comprehend what had just occurred, my sister's bizarre behavior, and the lingering sense of unease. My sister seemed equally uncertain, questioning whether there had been a real threat, or if we had both allowed our imaginations to run wild. I asked my sister what she had seen, and she explained that there was a man standing at the edge of one of the driveways we had passed. She claimed that as we were heading back he had crossed the street and appeared to be following us. She emphasized that he had been staring directly at us and had seemingly been closing the distance despite our fast pace. It made no sense for a man to be standing alone in that dark, wooded area at that time of night. To this day, I remain uncertain about the events of that night. I'm not sure how much of my sister's account was true, or if we had both allowed fear to play tricks on our minds. Regardless, one thing became clear. I had developed a strong preference for daytime walks to the harbor on Cape Cod. The frosty air bit at my cheeks as I trudged through the dense Wyoming forest. It was a typical January afternoon, the kind where the sun plays hide-and-seek behind the clouds, casting long, wavering shadows across the snow-blanketed ground. I've always preferred hiking during these off-seasons. The trails are less trodden, the world quieter, more introspective. It's just you, the crisp air, and the occasional deer footprint. That day, though, the silence felt heavier, the isolation more pronounced. As I walked, my breath formed small puffs of vapor, disappearing as quickly as they appeared, like fleeting thoughts. I was wrapped up in my own, pondering over the little things, an unpaid bill, a forgotten errand, when I saw it. A camera, a sleek SLR perched precariously on a large boulder, as if it were deliberately placed to catch my attention. For a moment, I just stood there, squinting at it against the backdrop of the snow. Cameras are not what you expect to find in the middle of a Wyoming forest. I glanced around, half expecting someone to emerge from the trees, laughing at their prank. But there was nothing, just the sound of the wind whispering through the pines. Curiosity nudged me forward. The camera was an enigma, a sleek contrast to the rough, natural setting. As I neared it, I noticed a yellow sticky note attached to the bottom, the handwriting almost playful. Finders keepers, it read, followed by a crudely drawn smiley face. My eyebrows furrowed. This had to be a joke, right? But who leaves an expensive camera out here as a prank? I picked it up, the metal cold but not as icy as I expected, given the temperature. It was like it had been recently handled, the warmth of human touch still lingering. I scanned the area again, nothing but trees and the occasional bird call. The camera felt right in my hands, familiar despite its strangeness. I've never been much of a photography buff, but I knew enough to recognize that this was a high-end model. I weighed it, considering my options. The right thing would be to leave it, or maybe take it to the local ranger station. But then, there was that note, and the camera's apparent value. It seemed wasteful to just leave it there. I decided to carry on with my hike, the camera slung around my neck. Maybe I'd bump into its owner further down the trail. But deep down, a small voice whispered that the camera was now mine. A gift from the forest, or perhaps a trap. I couldn't resist testing it. I aimed at the sky, where the clouds hung low and heavy, and snapped a photo. Then another of the trail winding ahead. Each click of the shutter was satisfying, yet each picture that appeared on the digital screen seemed off. The colors were muted, the images tinged with a grayish-yellow hue, like old photographs forgotten in a sunlit room. Shrugging off the unease, I continued my hike, the camera a constant curious presence at my side. Little did I know, 
this simple walk through the woods would soon spiral into a nightmare, the camera at its center. A nightmare that would make me question not just the forest around me, but the very fabric of reality itself. The following morning, the dull gray light of dawn seeped through the curtains of my small cabin, painting the room in a monochrome hue. I lay there for a while, the events of the previous day replaying in my mind. The camera sat on my desk, a silent, enigmatic sentinel. It was just an object, yet it felt like it had a presence, a weight beyond its physical form. After a strong cup of coffee, I decided to seek out Dave. He had a knack for electronics and a curiosity that matched mine. The drive to his place was quiet, the roads empty, and the sky a blanket of overcast gloom. I found him in his usual state, surrounded by a chaos of gadgets and tools in his garage. Hey, what brings you here this early? Dave asked, wiping his hands on a rag. I handed him the camera. Found this in the woods yesterday. Something's off about it. He turned it over in his hands, his brow furrowing. SLR, huh? But no brand. That's odd. He examined the pictures I had taken. These look... weird. Like there's a filter or something. I nodded, watching him closely. Try taking a picture. See if it's just the landscape shots that come out strange. He shrugged and pointed the camera at me. I posed, half-heartedly smiling, and he clicked the shutter. We both looked at the screen, expecting another oddly colored image. But this one was different. It wasn't just the colors. My face was twisted, my features grotesquely distorted. What the... Dave's voice trailed off as he looked from the screen to me and back again. This has to be some sort of trick camera, right? I took the camera back, a shiver running down my spine. I'm not so sure. We spent the next hour trying to figure it out, checking for filters, hidden settings, anything that could explain the images. But the camera was like a puzzle without a solution. I know someone who might help, I said finally, thinking of Jim. He used to work in a camera shop in town, knew everything there was to know about photography, but Jim had had a rough couple of years. Last I heard, he was at St. Daniel's Mental Health Facility. Dave raised an eyebrow. You think he can help? Can't hurt to ask. St. Daniel's was a stark, imposing building on the outskirts of town. I signed in at the front desk, claiming to be Jim's cousin. They led me to a common area where Jim sat alone, staring out a window. Jim? I approached cautiously. He turned slowly, his eyes vacant at first, then sharpening as they focused on me. Do I know you? I hesitated, then decided to be direct. I found a camera, Jim. An SLR. The pictures. They're not right. His expression changed then. A flicker of recognition, then fear. The camera. You shouldn't have taken it. You need to get rid of it. Why? What's wrong with it? I pressed. He looked around nervously, then leaned in close. It's not just a camera. It sees things. Things it shouldn't. Things from elsewhere. It's dangerous. Before I could ask more, a nurse approached, her expression stern. Time's up, she said, guiding me away. Jim's words echoed in my mind as I left the facility, the sense of unease growing. What had I stumbled upon? There's something about being told you're holding a dangerous object that makes you want to understand it more, not less. Jim's words had lodged themselves in my mind like a splinter. I needed answers, and the only place I could think of to start was back at the beginning. The trail where I'd found the camera. The drive to the forest was tense, my thoughts a tangle of anxiety and curiosity. I parked at the trailhead, the camera resting on the passenger seat its presence now feeling more ominous than intriguing. As I walked the familiar path, the air felt heavier, the silence more oppressive. Reaching the spot where I'd found the camera, I stopped. The forest seemed different, altered in subtle, unsettling ways. The trees were gnarled, their branches twisted into grotesque shapes, mirroring the distorted images I'd captured with the camera. A cold shiver ran down my spine as I realized the changes weren't just in the trees. The very landscape around me seemed off, the colors muted, the air thick with an unnameable dread. 
It was as if the camera had not just captured the forest, but changed it, infecting it with its otherworldly malevolence. I lifted the camera, my hand trembling slightly, and took a photo of the warped scenery. The image on the screen was as twisted as the reality before me. That's when I heard a voice, chillingly familiar. Have you figured it out yet? I spun around. Standing there in the flesh was Dave, but not the Dave I knew. His features were distorted, his smile a grotesque caricature. Beside him was Jim, his eyes wild, his face a mask of madness. You shouldn't have brought it back here, Jim hissed. Who are you? I stammered, backing away. What do you want? We're not who you think, the distorted Dave said, his voice a guttural echo. We're from another place, your camera. It opened a door. My mind raced, trying to comprehend what they were saying. Another place, a door, the camera, Jim continued, his voice trembling. It's a gateway. We use it to reach your world, to transform it. I looked from one to the other, horror gripping me. They weren't human, not anymore. They were something else, something otherworldly, corrupted by the camera's influence. I thought of running, but something held me in place. Fear, maybe, or the desperate need to understand. How do I stop it? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. You can't, the entity that used to be Dave said. It's too late. The changes have begun. They moved closer, and I could see now the true extent of their transformation. Their skin was mottled, their eyes hollow. They were no longer of this world, but something far more sinister. As they approached, I did the only thing I could think of. I raised the camera and took their picture. The flash seemed to startle them, giving me just enough time to turn and run. I didn't stop until I reached my truck, my breath ragged, my heart pounding. I threw the camera onto the seat and drove away, leaving the forest and its twisted inhabitants behind. But I knew it wasn't over. The camera had unleashed something terrible, and I had unwittingly become part of it. I had to find a way to close the gateway, to undo what I had done. But how? How do you fight something that can twist reality itself? There are moments in life when reality shifts, and what you thought you knew crumbles away. Driving away from that forest, the camera beside me, I felt as though I was caught in a current, powerless against the pull of something vast and unknowable. I didn't head home. Instead, I drove aimlessly, my mind a whirlpool of fear and confusion. The words of the twisted versions of Dave and Jim echoed in my ears. A gateway, another place, transformations. I thought of the distorted landscape, the unnatural silence that hung over the forest. Whatever I had unleashed, it was beyond my understanding, beyond my control. It was dusk when they found me. I was parked on a lonely stretch of road, staring at the camera, when a fleet of black SUVs surrounded me. Men and women in tactical gear poured out, their movements precise, their expressions grim. One of them, a tall man with a scar running down his cheek, approached me. Are you the one who found the camera? He asked, his voice devoid of warmth. I nodded, unable to find my voice. We need to take it, he said, reaching for the camera. Who are you? I finally managed to croak. The organization, he replied simply, as if that explained everything. This camera is a threat. It's a doorway to something dangerous. I watched, numb, as they took the camera and began scanning the area with strange devices. The man with the scar, he never gave me his name, stayed with me. What's going to happen now? I asked. We contain the situation, he said. We've dealt with otherworldly threats before. This is just another day for us. But the people in the forest... He shook his head. They were already lost. Once the other side takes hold... There's no coming back. I thought of Dave and Jim, of the horror that had replaced their humanity. A sense of guilt washed over me. I should have left the camera where I found it. Your friend Dave, the man said suddenly, as if reading my thoughts. He's gone. Tried to contact you, to warn you. They didn't like that. I felt a sharp pain in my chest. Dave had tried to reach out, and I hadn't understood the danger. What now? I asked, feeling defeated. You sign a non-disclosure agreement. 
We compensate you for your silence. It was surreal, sitting there signing a document that stated I would never speak of this, receiving a check that felt like blood money. As I drove home, the check in my pocket, the weight of what had happened pressing down on me, I realized that my world had changed. I had glimpsed something beyond the veil of reality, something terrifying and incomprehensible. I tried to convince myself that it was over, that the organization would handle it. But as I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, I knew the truth. It wasn't over, it was just beginning. The days following the incident with the camera and the organization passed in a blur. I found myself going through the motions of everyday life, but nothing felt the same. The world around me seemed less real, like I was living in a shadow of what used to be. The check for $10,000 sat untouched on my kitchen table, a stark reminder of the silence I had agreed to. I couldn't shake the images of the twisted forest or the haunting transformations of Dave and Jim. They infiltrated my dreams, turning them into restless, feverish nightmares. During the day, I found myself staring into the distance, lost in thought. I couldn't escape the feeling that I had glimpsed something fundamental and terrifying about the nature of our world. The worst part was the isolation. I couldn't talk about what had happened, couldn't share the burden of what I knew. The non-disclosure agreement was a chain around my neck, a constant weight. I pondered over the idea of breaking it, of telling someone, anyone, about the otherworldly horror I had witnessed. But fear kept me silent. Fear of the organization. Fear of not being believed. Fear of the camera itself even though it was no longer in my possession. I tried to distract myself with work, with hikes in the mountains, but it was useless. The forests I once loved now felt oppressive, the trees watching me with unseen eyes. I couldn't shake the sensation that something was lurking just out of sight, waiting. It wasn't just the fear and the nightmares that haunted me. It was the questions, the endless, unanswerable questions. What was the camera, really? Where had it come from? What was the nature of the other place? The one that had claimed Dave and Jim? And the biggest question of all, were there more objects like the camera out there? One evening, I sat on my porch, watching the sun set over the mountains. The sky was ablaze with colors, a beautiful, serene end to the day. But even that couldn't lift the heaviness in my heart. I thought about Dave, about his curiosity and his untimely end. I wondered what he would have done if our roles were reversed. Would he have delved deeper into the mystery, or would he have backed away, scared of what he might uncover? I realized then that what I missed most was the simplicity of not knowing. There was a time when I would have looked at the sunset and seen only its beauty, not a reminder of other, darker realities. There was a time when the forest was just a place of peace and solitude, not a gateway to horror. As the sky darkened and the first stars appeared, I made a decision. I would try to move on, to find some semblance of normalcy. But I would also stay alert, watchful. If there were other gateways, other threats, I needed to be prepared. The camera had changed everything. It had shown me a glimpse of the unknown, and that knowledge could not be unlearned. I was a different person now, one who had stared into the abyss and seen it stare back. And so I watched the night fall, feeling a mix of resignation and resolve. The world was a bigger, stranger place than I had ever imagined, and I was now a part of that strangeness, for better or for worse. It's funny how some memories stick with you, clear as day, even when years have passed. For me, those memories are often about the times I spent with my best friend, Jay, back when we were teenagers. We would escape the boredom of our small town by heading out to Forest Glen National Park, a sprawling green haven only 15 miles from where we lived. It was our little adventure land, with its camping sites, fishing spots, and most importantly, countless winding trails. I remember those days like they were yesterday. Jay and I didn't have much going on in our lives, so Forest Glen became our go-to place. We'd pack a few snacks, grab our water bottles, and just hike. 
Sometimes we'd challenge ourselves to tackle two or even three trails in a single day, depending on how energetic we felt. Those trails, with their twists and turns, hidden nooks, and unexpected vistas, never got old. They were like our secret world, a place where we could talk about everything and nothing, away from the prying eyes of our small town life. As time passed, Jay and I grew up, and life, as it tends to do, got in the way. College, jobs, and all the other grown-up stuff filled our days, and our visits to Forest Glen became less and less frequent. But those trails and the memories we made there never really left me. Lately, I'd found myself thinking about those days more often. Maybe it was nostalgia, or maybe just a desire to reconnect with a simpler time. Whatever it was, it made me pick up the phone and call Jay out of the blue. Hey Jay, you remember Forest Glen? I asked, feeling a bit silly. But to my surprise, his response was immediate and enthusiastic. Of course. Man, we had some good times there. Why do you ask? I explained how I'd been reminiscing and floated the idea of going back for a hike, just like old times. I half expected him to laugh it off, but instead he was all in. He even sounded excited about it, saying he'd been thinking of doing the same, but never got around to it. So we made plans to meet up that Saturday morning at one of his favorite trails, the one that wound its way up to the old lookout point. Saturday morning arrived bright and clear. I got up while it was still dark, feeling a mix of excitement and nerves. It had been so long since I'd done anything like this. I grabbed my backpack, which now felt oddly unfamiliar, and drove out to Forest Glen. The sun was just starting to paint the sky with shades of orange and pink when I reached the park. Parking my car near the trailhead, I noticed the absence of Jay's car. There was more than one entrance to the park, so I figured he might have parked somewhere else. I checked my phone to call him, but I barely had any signal. Typical. Shaking my head, I locked the car and decided to start walking. Maybe he was already on the trail, or maybe he was just running late. Standing at the trail entrance, I began some stretches, my eyes occasionally darting to the path, hoping to catch a glimpse of Jay. I remembered how he always used to be the first one at our meeting spots, usually with some joke or prank ready to lighten the mood. But today, it seemed I was the early bird. After about 10 minutes, I started to get impatient. We had agreed to meet at 6.30 in the morning, and Jay was never one to break a plan. Maybe I should go back and check my phone again, I thought. But then, on a whim, I decided to walk a little way into the trail, just to see if I could spot him. The trail was just as I remembered it, a clear path at the beginning, giving way to a more rugged, natural trail, flanked by thick brush and towering trees. It felt good to be back, the air fresh and crisp, filled with the sounds of nature waking up. But something felt different. The trail seemed less traveled, more overgrown than I remembered. And it was quiet, too quiet. The usual chatter of birds and rustle of leaves was there, but it was like the volume had been turned down. I walked briskly, my eyes scanning the path ahead and the dense foliage around me. The familiar yet strange trail brought back a flood of memories. It was on these very paths that Jay and I had shared our teenage dreams and fears. It felt surreal to be here again, alone this time, with only the echoes of the past for company. As I reached a small stream that cut across the trail, I paused. The path continued on the other side, splitting off in two directions. I had never been good at remembering which way led where. That was always Jay's thing. He had an uncanny sense of direction, always knew exactly where we were and how to get back. I decided this was as far as I'd go on my own. I didn't want to risk getting lost, and I wanted to be at the trailhead when Jay arrived. I knelt down to tie my shoelace, which had come loose. As I stood up, I caught my breath. There, right in front of me, was Jay. He was grinning like he used to when we were kids, like he had just pulled off the best prank. Jay, I exclaimed, a mix of relief and annoyance in my voice. You scared me. He laughed, that familiar infectious laugh that always made it impossible to stay mad at him. Sorry, couldn't help myself, he said, still chuckling. I was a bit farther up the trail and turned back when I didn't see you. 
thought I'd surprise you. I shook my head, smiling despite myself. Well, you definitely did that. I didn't even hear you coming. He just grinned, that wide, toothy grin that was so quintessentially Jay. We stood there for a moment, just looking at each other. It felt like no time had passed at all, yet here we were, years older, standing on the trail that had seen so much of our youth. Shall we? I asked, gesturing towards the trail. Let's do it, Jay replied, his smile still in place. He led the way, and I followed, feeling a sense of rightness, of things falling back into place. We were back on the trails of Forest Glen, just like old times. But as we walked, a whisper of something not quite right. I pushed it aside, focusing instead on the trail ahead and the friend beside me. As I stepped onto the trail, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of disappointment at Jay's absence. We had agreed to meet here, at this very spot, but he was nowhere to be seen. I had this weird gut feeling, the kind you get when something's not quite right, but I pushed it aside, convincing myself that Jay was probably just running late. The trail was just as beautiful as I remembered, but somehow, it felt different. It was overgrown, wilder than before. Nature had reclaimed what we once knew so well. I tried to shrug off the eerie silence that seemed to envelop the woods. I told myself it was just the early hour, that the forest was still waking up. I ventured further in, my footsteps crunching on the forest floor. The narrow path, framed by tall trees and thick underbrush, brought back a flood of memories. Jay and I used to race down these trails, laughing and shouting, our voices echoing through the trees. Now the only sound was the soft rustling of leaves in the gentle morning breeze. After a few minutes of walking, I stopped near a small stream that crossed the path. I remembered how Jay and I would jump over these streams, competing to see who could do it without getting wet. I smiled at the memory, but it was a bittersweet smile. I missed those carefree days. As I stood there lost in thought, I realized just how quiet it was. It was more than just the absence of human noise. It was like the forest itself was holding its breath. The usual symphony of bird calls and insect chirps was strangely muted. It was peaceful, yet unsettling. I decided to head back to the trail entrance thinking maybe Jay had arrived by then. I didn't want to venture too far without him, especially since I wasn't as familiar with these trails as he was. As I turned around, I stooped to retie my shoelace, and that's when I got the shock of my life. Jay was suddenly there, standing right in front of me, grinning. I let out a gasp, my heart pounding in my chest. Jay, you scared me half to death, I exclaimed. He just laughed that familiar, hearty laugh that always made everything seem okay. Sorry, couldn't resist. I saw you from up the trail and decided to sneak up on you, he said, still chuckling. I couldn't help but smile, despite the adrenaline still coursing through my veins. Well, you definitely succeeded in scaring me, I admitted. As we started walking together, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. Everything was back to normal just two friends hiking their favorite trail. Jay led the way, his steps confident and sure. I followed, happy to be back in this familiar place with my old friend. But as we walked, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was still off. The silence of the forest was unnerving, and I couldn't remember the trail being this overgrown. I tried to push those thoughts away, focusing instead on the sound of our footsteps and Jay's occasional comments about the trail. Remember how we used to race to the big oak tree? He asked, pointing to a spot up ahead. Yeah, I do, I replied, smiling at the memory. You always won, though. Jay laughed. That's because I always cheated and started running before you were ready. We continued walking, the familiarity of our banter comforting. But deep down, I knew something was different. The forest didn't feel like the one I remembered. It felt like a stranger watching us with silent, unseen eyes. As Jay and I jogged down the familiar yet strangely foreign trail, a flood of memories from our teenage years rushed back to me. We laughed and shared stories, reminiscing about the good old days. It felt great to be back here with Jay, 
even though the trail seemed more mysterious and overgrown than I remembered. The deeper we went into the forest, the more I noticed how different things seemed. The path was narrower, the trees closer together, and the silence of the woods was almost overwhelming. It was as if the forest had changed, or maybe it was us who had changed. Jay kept up a steady pace, leading the way with confidence. I followed, trying to shake off the growing sense of unease. We talked about everything from our first camping trip here to the time we got lost and ended up hiking until sunset. Remember when you tripped over that route and scraped your knee? Jay suddenly asked, a teasing tone in his voice. I chuckled, rubbing my knee reflexively. How could I forget? You wouldn't stop making fun of me for weeks. Jay laughed, but something about his laughter sounded different this time. It didn't have the warmth that used to. I pushed the thought aside, attributing it to my overactive imagination. We continued jogging, the trail becoming more rugged with each step. The forest around us felt denser, almost suffocating in its silence. I could barely hear any wildlife, which was odd for Forest Glen. It was as if the animals themselves were avoiding this part of the woods. What's up with this trail, Jay? I asked, panting slightly from the effort. It seems so... different. Jay didn't respond immediately. He just kept jogging, that strange smile still on his face. It's just nature taking back what's hers, he finally said, his voice lacking its usual cheerfulness. We reached the fork in the trail, and Jay paused, looking at both paths before deciding on the right one. I followed, my unease growing with every step. The trees seemed to close in around us, their branches creating a canopy that blocked out most of the sunlight. This doesn't seem right, I muttered, more to myself than to Jay. I don't remember the trail being this overgrown. Jay didn't reply. He just kept moving forward, his pace never wavering. I tried to keep up, but my legs were starting to burn from the effort. Suddenly, a memory hit me like a bolt of lightning. It was a day when I had fallen and scraped my knees really bad. Jay wasn't there that day. He was homesick. My heart started to race as I realized something was terribly wrong. Jay, wait, I called out, stopping in my tracks. He turned around, his expression unreadable. What's wrong? He asked his voice barely more than a whisper. I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry. You weren't there the day I scraped my knees. You were sick. For a moment, Jay just stared at me, his eyes wide. Then slowly, his expression changed. The smile disappeared, replaced by something cold and unreadable. I need to go back, I stammered, taking a step backward. Something was very wrong and every instinct in my body was screaming at me to get out of these woods. Jay just stood there, watching me with that strange, cold look. I turned and started running back the way we came, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't look back, not even once. All I knew was that I had to get away from whatever was pretending to be my friend. My breath was ragged, my heart pounding in my chest as I ran through the overgrown trail. The realization that the person with me wasn't Jay sending waves of panic through my body. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig under my feet, heightened my fear. I couldn't believe it. How could I not have realized sooner? The memories we shared, the laughter, it all seemed so real. But the chilling truth was now clawing at my mind. That thing was not my friend. I could barely see through the tears that blurred my vision, but I kept running. The once familiar trail now felt like a labyrinth, with branches reaching out like hands trying to grab me. My mind raced with questions. Who or what was that impersonating Jay, and why? The forest, once a sanctuary of happy memories, now felt like a trap closing in on me. I stumbled over a root, catching myself before I fell. Pain shot up my leg, but I pushed it aside. I had to get out of these woods. I had to get away from whatever was masquerading as Jay. The thought of that thing, with Jay's face and voice, made my skin crawl. Finally, I saw the clearing where my car was parked. I had never been so relieved to see that old, beat-up vehicle. I fumbled with my keys, 
my hands shaking uncontrollably. Glancing over my shoulder, I half expected to see that thing following me, but there was nothing, just the quiet, ominous forest. I threw myself into the car, locking the doors the second I was inside. I didn't waste a moment, starting the engine and speeding away from Forest Glen as fast as I could. My mind was a whirlwind of fear and confusion. What had just happened? Was I losing my mind? The drive home felt endless. Every shadow, every movement outside the car made me jump. I kept checking the rearview mirror, expecting to see that thing chasing after me, but there was nothing. Just the empty road and the growing distance from the forest. When I finally got home, I was a mess. My hands were still shaking, and my heart was still racing. I grabbed my phone from the glove compartment. I had forgotten to take it with me in the rush to escape the forest. That's when I saw it. A text from Jay, the real Jay. His message sent a chill down my spine. He explained that he couldn't make it to Forest Glen because the park was closed. There had been several accidents. People found drowned. My heart sank. If Jay hadn't been in the forest, then who or what was with me? I barely had time to process this when I heard a knock at my door. A cold dread settled in my stomach. I peered through the peephole and felt my blood turn to ice. There, on my doorstep, was Jay, or at least something that looked like him, smiling that same unsettling smile. I didn't open the door. Instead, I called the real Jay, my hands trembling as I dialed his number. His voice, warm and familiar, was a stark contrast to the cold fear I felt. He was at the store, nowhere near my house. I hung up and immediately dialed 911, reporting an intruder at my door. By the time the police arrived, the imposter was gone. I didn't know how to explain it to the officers, so I just said someone was trying to break in. They promised to patrol the area, but I knew they didn't understand the true nature of the threat. That night, and every night since, I've been haunted by the presence of that thing. It knocks on my door, calling out in a voice that's a twisted version of Jay's, begging to be let in. I've called the police multiple times, but they find nothing. They've stopped taking me seriously. Now I sit here, alone and terrified, clutching a knife for protection. The knocks continue, each one sending a shiver down my spine. I don't know what that creature wants, but I know I can't let it in. The memory of the forest, of the thing wearing my friend's face, haunts my every waking moment. I'm trapped in my own home, a prisoner of my fear, and I don't know how much longer I can hold out. Night after night, I sit in my living room, the lights dimmed, a heavy sense of dread hanging over me. The creature, whatever it is, keeps coming back. Its knocks at the door are like a countdown to my sanity. I clutch the kitchen knife tightly, the cold metal offering a small sense of security, though I know it's not enough to protect me from whatever is out there. The police have stopped responding to my calls. They think I'm just another paranoid guy, spooked by his own shadow. But I know what I saw, what I heard. That thing, wearing Jay's face, isn't human. It's something else, something sinister. My mind races with questions. What is this creature? Why is it tormenting me? What does it want? But the answers are as elusive as the shadow that lurks outside my door. I've tried researching, looking for anything that might explain what's happening, but I've found nothing. It's like I'm facing a ghost, a phantom that exists only to haunt me. Every knock, every call of my name in that garbled, twisted version of Jay's voice sends shivers down my spine. I've stopped sleeping. I can't. Every time I close my eyes, I see that thing's face, hear its voice. It's driving me to the edge. Tonight, as I sit here, the bottle of brandy on the table almost empty, the knocks come again. My heart pounds in my chest, a frantic drumbeat echoing my fear. The voice follows, a wail that sounds less and less like Jay with each passing night. Let me in, it moans. I need more friends. The words send a chill through me. More friends? What does that mean? Is it lonely? Is it looking for companionship in its twisted, horrifying way? Or is it something more sinister? 
I've barricaded the door, but I know it's a futile effort. If this thing is what I think it is, no lock, no barrier can keep it out. But still, I try. I have to do something, anything, to feel like I have some control over the situation. The creature's visits are becoming more frequent, more desperate. I can hear it moving around the house, tapping on the windows, testing every possible entry. I'm trapped, a prisoner in my own home, and the walls feel like they're closing in on me. I don't know how much more of this I can take. The isolation, the fear, the constant vigilance. It's wearing me down, breaking me bit by bit. I've thought about leaving, about running away, but where would I go? And what if it follows me? What if it's not just tied to this house? but to me. As the night wears on, the knocks and calls continue, a relentless assault on my senses. I know I can't keep this up forever. Sooner or later, I'll have to face whatever is out there. But I'm not ready. Not yet. For now, all I can do is wait, watch, and hope that the dawn will bring some respite, some answer to this nightmare. But deep down, I know the truth. There is no escape from the unseen menace that has chosen me as its target. All I can do is wait and pray that when the time comes, I'll have the strength to face it. I've always had an open mind when it comes to the mysterious creatures that might wander our world. It's partly because I've always been inquisitive by nature and partly because of the lessons my mother instilled in me about respecting nature and being aware of my surroundings. She taught me to listen to the animals, believing they would alert us if something unusual lurked nearby. This story takes me back to when I was a teenager, visiting my dad's small hometown in Texas for a family reunion. The town was so tiny that you could stroll through its central part in less than an hour. Most of our relatives lived further out, each with an acre or more of land around their homes, providing privacy and tranquility. That evening, we joined my dad's extensive family for a hoedown near the town's edge. People were dancing, drinking, and reveling in the festivities, while my brother, one of our cousins, her friend and I, hung out on the sidelines. We engaged in typical teenage chatter, discussing school crushes and the like. Our attention drifted towards the outskirts of the party, where a fence bordered the area. The fence separated the yard from the scrubland on the edge of town. The night had fallen, and the only illumination came from the lights on the fence poles, casting eerie shadows around. As I gazed into the distance, I noticed something unusual, an object partially obscured by a small tree. It stood out because it remained still, unaffected by the breeze that rustled the other foliage. I pointed it out to my brother and cousin, who also saw it. We couldn't help but be curious. One of us suggested it might be a coyote, but we quickly realized that it was too massive to be one. Curiosity, and perhaps a bit of foolishness got the better of us, and we cautiously approached the fence. We were now only twenty yards away from it, and this mysterious figure was a further ten yards from the fence, shrouded in darkness just beyond the reach of the feeble light. We halted in our tracks, our eyes locked on this enigmatic creature. It was covered in fur, its hunched form supported by long slender legs and human-like arms ending in sharp claws. Its head, partially concealed by the tree, had a canine appearance, complete with a long snout and pointed ears, much like a coyote's. But it wasn't a coyote. It was something else entirely. The creature's gaze met ours and a chill ran down our spines. We hastily retreated to the party, realizing that we were now closer to this strange being than to our own families. If this creature possessed the speed attributed to werewolves in movies, the fence would have been no obstacle for it to reach us. We were stunned into silence, unable to comprehend the reality of what we had just witnessed. Back at the hoedown, we exchanged knowing glances but said nothing. Who would believe us? The next day, my family prepared to return to Oklahoma, and my brother and I secretly breathed sighs of relief, leaving behind the unsettling encounter. My cousin and her friend still lived in Texas, within the territory of that creature. I hoped they never had to see it again.
Over the years, that night's encounter lingered in the back of my mind. As I learned about various creatures people claimed to have encountered in the woods, I hoped I'd never cross paths with anything like that again. However, as fate would have it, in 2019, I found myself on my boss's farm for a three-day work excursion during the summer. The farm was located about an hour from Oklahoma City and spanned 80 acres, mostly covered in woods and isolated from neighboring properties. His nearest neighbor was at least a mile away. I had visited his farm numerous times in the past and had grown familiar with the surrounding woods. There was a trail leading into the woods from the compound, and every morning I'd walk it with his dog, Duke. But I never ventured onto that trail alone, and I always carried a weapon, not because I feared encounters with Dogman or Bigfoot, but because wild boars were known to inhabit the area. However, I had never heard of any reports of Dogman or Bigfoot sightings in the vicinity, only rumors about wild boars. On this particular day, I set out toward the trail in the late afternoon, Duke by my side. The trail wasn't well-traveled, covered more in grass than dirt. As we ventured further, I could see signs of wildlife all around. Deer tracks, raccoon prints, even an armadillo scrape on the ground. Duke wandered off the trail into the trees drawn by something that had captured his attention. I called out to him, asking him not to stray too far, and stepped toward the edge of the trail to join him. That's when I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. Right at the edge of the trail, where the exposed earth met the grass, was a colossal canine-like footprint. It dwarfed Duke's prints and was much larger than even my own size 10 boot. The track appeared to be relatively fresh, no more than 24 hours old. I couldn't help but wonder what had made it. I looked back down the trail but saw no more tracks, as if this creature had leaped over the trail to avoid leaving any more prints. It had jumped a staggering 15 feet across the trail, leaving no trace of its presence. I quickly scanned the surroundings and strained my ears, but all I heard was silence. No birds, no insects, and even Duke seemed on edge. I called Duke back to my side and hastened our pace, heading back toward the barn. I didn't want to stay any longer in case whatever had made those footprints was still lurking nearby. As we reached the tree line and entered the open, I couldn't help but think that they were here in Oklahoma too, even though I had foolishly believed they would remain confined to Texas. My thoughts were disrupted when I returned to the barn. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Duke's nervous demeanor seemed to convey a clear message. We needed to leave. I briefly glanced around but the woods appeared empty. Yet, I couldn't shake the eerie sensation that we were being watched. As we made our way back inside, I couldn't help but ponder the implications of what I had seen. I remembered my mother's words. You may not see them, but they can see you. I knew that whatever left that footprint and turned that branch had been near, and it was a chilling realization. As I recounted the events of that day, I couldn't shake the feeling that these creatures were not confined to Texas alone. My brother had mentioned that his co-worker had recently claimed to have seen a dogman on the edge of his property in El Reno, Oklahoma, a mere ten miles from my boss's farm. The boundaries between fact and folklore were becoming increasingly blurred, and I couldn't help but wonder if these enigmatic creatures were closer to home than I had ever imagined. Back in the 90s, I found myself working as a park ranger in the northern part of the United States. For the safety of all involved, I won't reveal the specific state, but I can tell you it was near the northern border of America. After an incredible honeymoon with my husband, I was headed back to work, even though he wasn't thrilled about my career choice. He worried about me being alone in the wilderness, especially since I'm a short, slender woman, weighing maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet. But my heart belonged to nature, and I couldn't give up my job to stay home and have a baby, as he wished. I longed to spend days, sometimes weeks, or even months, among the trees and wildlife. Unfortunately, I never got to enjoy my favorite job again, at least not the way I used to. It was quite a drive from my husband's home, which was on the other side of the state. However, it was worth it. 
especially during winter when the treetops were blanketed in snow as far as the eye could see. The long drives through nature were always a pleasure for me, though I can't imagine being able to stomach one anymore. On this particular occasion, it was the winter season, and I had signed on for fire watch duty. My job was to ensure that no fires were left unattended, despite the heavy snowfall. But in reality, I was there to keep hikers from getting lost, and to watch over the wildlife. The winter had been especially harsh, and I made the journey in my 92 Ford to the ranger station. After exchanging well wishes and some gossip with my colleagues, I set off for my favorite firewatch tower for the winter season. If my memory serves me well, it should have been a three-hour drive to reach the best parking spot to access the tower. As I ventured deeper into the wilderness, the road grew rougher, and eventually, I couldn't proceed much farther. I hadn't reached the parking area I had in mind, but I hoped that the conditions might improve, allowing me to drive to my preferred spot. I consulted my map, circled the spot where I had parked, and studied the path ahead. It was quite a distance to hike, but I was no stranger to it. I had trekked farther before, so I wasn't too concerned about the distance. As I began hiking through the snow, memories of what I loved about this job flooded back. The satisfying crunch of snow underfoot, the pristine white landscape adorned with occasional animal tracks, it felt like stepping into a storybook or a fairy tale. Nature had always been my one true love, despite my deep affection for my husband. The day passed quickly as I walked through the snow, taking breaks to sketch in my notebook and capture photographs with my camera. It felt like one of those days that blink by, and suddenly the sun was setting. Consulting my map, I realized I was nearing the tower, but I wasn't sure if I should camp for the night or proceed. The thought of entering the warm tower, meeting the ranger who had been stationed there before, and enjoying hot chocolate and a comfortable bed was tempting. Yet, the forest I cherished was quickly vanishing into the swirling abyss of white and black. It would have been easy to miss the tower completely. So, I made an educated decision and began setting up my camp, ensuring I wouldn't get lost in the snowy wilderness. I pitched my tent, packed down the snow, and stacked some firewood I had brought into a pile. A campfire crackled to life, and I followed all the proper steps for camping in the snow, something I genuinely enjoyed. I remember gazing at the distant tower, still a good distance away, as I ate my dinner, which I believe was some type of meat. It smelled like meat, but my memory was a bit hazy. After dinner, I extinguished the fire and crawled into my tent, which provided as much warmth as possible. I relished the feeling of camping again after months away. The sound of the wind against my tent lulled me to sleep, and I soon drifted into a dream whose details I couldn't recall. Suddenly, I was jolted awake by a horrifying, guttural howl. My heart pounded, and I scrambled out of my tent, clutching a flashlight tightly. I shone the beam into the snowy landscape, searching for the source of the spine-chilling noise. Hello? I called out into the frigid night. Is anyone there? I'm a park ranger. Do you need help? Where are you? I shouted again, my voice growing hoarse with every question. I scanned the surroundings, but there was nothing to be seen except for the slumbering trees. Hello, you there! I yelled once more, taking a moment to cover my mouth and warm my face with my breath. During this brief respite, I heard another shriek, this one sounding more desperate and feminine. It felt closer, and I called out again, Ma'am, are you okay? What's wrong? However, there was still no response from anyone or anything except for the wilderness itself. I tried to determine the direction from which the sounds had come, but it eluded me. As a park ranger, it was my duty to assist people in such situations, which was why I was stationed here throughout the winter. I returned to my tent, quickly gathered my gear, and rolled up my sleeping bag. There wasn't enough time to dismantle the tent. It took me about ten minutes to prepare myself fully and gather the courage to head in a direction. At that moment, my starting direction was arbitrary, but in my mind, I convinced myself that the scream had come from that specific direction. I set off into the snow, my flashlight's beam dancing across the trees. About five minutes later, Another scream pierced the night, or at least it felt like five minutes. 
Time seemed distorted in that eerie silence. This time, I was closer to the source, and it sounded like a woman's cry. My heart raced as I shouted, It's okay, I'm here to help. Where are you? The icy air irritated my throat with each question, but I continued to scan my surroundings for any signs of the distressed person. Once again, there was nothing but the sleeping forest. Stay where you are, I'll come to you, I yelled, my voice echoing through the wilderness. I hurried off into the night, driven by the urgency of the situation. My footsteps crunched through the snow as I ventured deeper into the darkness. Another shriek echoed through the forest, and this time, it sounded almost like a word, possibly help, although it was hard to discern. The sound came from a bit to the right of the previous location. I finished warming up my throat and yelled again, I'm coming, stay where you are. I sprinted toward the source of the screams, and as I drew closer, I noticed tracks in the snow. My heart sank as I also spotted patches of blood along with boot prints. I followed the boot prints for a while, but the trail suddenly ended at a larger pool of blood. The person or creature seemed to have vanished into thin air. I spun around, my heart pounding, and while I wanted to call out in a desperate attempt to find them, a deep-rooted survival instinct kept me silent. It was as though the person had been plucked from that spot, disappearing without a trace. I took a deep breath, attempting to calm my racing mind, and considered my options. Another scream pierced the night, closer than before, and panic gripped me. I started running this time not needing to convince myself of any direction. I simply fled into the night, the trees blurring past me as I weaved in and out, trying to put them between myself and whatever had produced those horrifying noises. I ran until my lungs burned and my body felt frozen from the cold. I came to a sudden stop and shone my flashlight around, searching for the source of the terrifying screams. I couldn't understand how it had followed me so easily, but then I realized that I had been shining a blindingly bright light in all directions, practically announcing my location. I pressed my thumb against the flashlight button, plunging myself into total darkness. The wind howled around me as I heard the crunching of footsteps in the snow. Slowly I moved, making every effort to remain as silent as possible. I approached the nearest tree, or at least where I had remembered it to be, and huddled down next to it, covering myself with snow. There. I waited, my heart pounding in my chest, my breath visible in the frigid air. I strained my ears for any sign of the person or thing that had been following me. The footsteps grew closer, and I heard them sniffing the air. My heart raced as the crunching sounds approached, and I covered my mouth with my hands to stifle my breathing. Then I heard another shriek, more furious than the previous ones. I shivered from the cold and trembled with anxiety as I held my breath waiting for this unknown entity to spot me in the absolute darkness. I waited for what felt like an eternity, every passing second stretching into hours. The crunching grew nearer, and the air turned putrid, as if a septic tank had ruptured nearby. I prayed silently as the presence drew closer and closer until it passed by me. I remained still, waiting for it to emerge from the other side of the tree and seize me, but it never did. I offered silent thanks to my lucky stars and cautiously began to rise from my hiding place. The crunching sounds moved away and I dared to crawl out from under the tree. Rolling onto my side, I realized that I had been crying. My eyes stung from the tears and I wiped them away with my clothes. At some point, exhaustion overwhelmed me and I lost consciousness. I awoke the next morning and slowly extricated myself from under the bed. The stench in the room was unbearable, and the sight was horrifying. I staggered and limped down the steps of the tower, my senses overwhelmed by the gruesome scene. I ran into the woods, desperately trying to put as much distance as possible between myself and whatever had happened in that tower. I ran, and I didn't stop until I reached my vehicle. I got inside and floored the accelerator racing back to the ranger station. I filed a report, deliberately avoiding any mention of what I suspected had been there. I only stated that I didn't see who or what it was. Eventually, I was interrogated about my story, particularly what made me think it wasn't human. 
I was instructed never to speak of it again. However, after hearing the accounts of other former park rangers and reading similar stories online, I couldn't help but share my experience. I still love how well America preserves its natural beauty, but I now fear that it may be to hide things like what I encountered that night. When I told my husband, he was shocked and could only hold me tightly. Yet I don't believe he truly believed my account, especially when I mentioned encountering a monster, given that I had never seen it directly. But based on all the stories I've come across, I genuinely believe I may have encountered a Wendigo, and I also believe it's still out there, lurking in the wilderness, responsible for the countless missing persons in our national parks. My name is Ben, and I had the weirdest encounter of my entire life during my recent trip to Ocean City, Maryland. I'd mentioned in a previous story that I and my friend often visited this popular beach destination, which is about three hours from where I live. This time, I decided to go alone, seeking some relaxation and respite from the wacky summer, plagued by the ongoing pandemic. I drove down in my trusty Chevy Nova on June 10th, excited to avoid any unnecessary stops along the way. Upon arriving at the condo, I swiftly unloaded my bags onto one of those hotel wheel carts, which proved to be a more efficient alternative to lugging my luggage up the stairs. Our condo was on the fifth floor, beachfront, and waking up to the soothing sound of crashing waves every morning was a true luxury. As I peered out from the balcony, I noticed the ocean looking rather choppy, and there were plenty of people dotting the beach, with not much space between them. I'm the type who enjoys the beach view from a distance, but doesn't particularly relish getting sandy or diving into the water. Unless, of course, I find myself in a more secluded spot with fewer people around. The day passed by, marked by a sudden rain shower around 2 p.m., which quickly cleared the beach. Seeing this as an opportunity, I seized the moment and decided to head down to the shore for some surf fishing. Rain poured down relentlessly as I cast my line, though I didn't manage to catch anything. But there's something about fishing that makes me feel truly alive, akin to the thrill of bow hunting. The first night came and went, and I ordered some delicious seafood for dinner before retreating to my freshly made bed. The following morning, I brewed some coffee and contemplated my day ahead. Although I had brought my Nintendo Switch, I felt a compelling urge to step outdoors and soak up the beauty of the beach. It was then that I decided to visit Assateague Island. For those unfamiliar, Ocean City is essentially a massive sandbar, surrounded by various islands and small pieces of land. Assateague is one such place, a national park, and it had been recommended to me by my next door neighbor, who was studying to become a park ranger. The island was a natural playground, featuring protected marshlands, beaches, swamps, forests, and even wild horses that had roamed there for generations. While there was a dune trail for off-road vehicles, my 1970 Chevy Nova was ill-suited for the sand, given the risk of rust. Arriving at Assateague, I parked in one of the visitor lots and began exploring. First, I ventured into the swamp trails, only to be mercilessly attacked by mosquitoes. Regretting not having brought bug spray, I soldiered on and then made my way through the beautiful marsh waters, observing crabs and small fish darting around my legs. Eventually I found a quiet stretch of beach and decided to lay out on the sand. Thankfully I had remembered to bring a towel this time. I closed my eyes, basking in the warmth of the sun, and lost track of time. It must have been around noon when I first arrived, but when I awoke, Darkness was already descending upon the horizon, and I realized I had fallen asleep under the scorching sun. As I tried to sit up, I let out a scream of agony. My skin was searing, and despite having applied sunscreen earlier, I had been badly sunburned. It felt as though my skin was bubbling and peeling away before my very eyes, and I couldn't help but shed tears. I've endured my fair share of injuries, but sunburns are a different kind of pain. Now, this is where the truly eerie part of my story begins. I was contemplating how to hobble back to my car when I heard a loud splash from the ocean. 
Typically, such a sound wouldn't have alarmed me, as large fish and even sharks were known to frequent these waters. In fact, I had once caught a massive sand tiger shark near Assateague two years prior. However, this splash was different. It was close, maybe only seven feet from the shore, which was peculiar. Large fish usually didn't venture so close to the beach, and the noise it was making was unsettlingly loud. In my rush to get up, I dropped my bag and car keys, my body protesting every step I took toward the water's edge. But then it made a sound I would never forget, a haunting combination of a mountain lion's cry and the deep calls of a colossal whale. It was eerie, sad, and entrancing all at once, defying explanation. My mind immediately conjured up tales of sirens and mermaids whose haunting songs lured unsuspecting sailors to their doom. I didn't truly believe in mermaids, but with the vastness of our unexplored oceans, who could say what mysteries might dwell beneath the waves? My thoughts raced as I backed away from the crashing waves, which had grown smaller now. Whatever had made that sound was moving closer to the shore, and I began to hurry back to grab my bag. Panic welled within me as I made my way to the spot I had been lounging in, all the while feeling my sunburned skin peel and burn. I shone the light of my phone on the sandy ground, searching for my keys, and there they were, partially buried beneath the sand. I dropped to my knees, scraping them in my haste to retrieve the keys. As I was about to get up, I met its gaze. The creature before me was like nothing I had ever seen. It was pale, almost translucent, resembling a jellyfish in some respects. Its skin appeared aged yet muscular, devoid of any hair. Its long, slender legs were strangely tall, akin to those of a basketball player. Its hands were amphibious, and it possessed something akin to a tail, but its face was the source of true horror. The face was eerily featureless, reminiscent of a clean mannequin's visage. The only discernible features were a nose and a tiny slit, presumably its mouth. As I stared in abject terror, I couldn't help but smile at it, a foolish, futile gesture. Perhaps I entertained the fleeting thought that this entity might possess emotions. To my astonishment, it returned the smile, but it was all wrong. The tiny slit of a mouth began to expand, tearing its face apart to form an unnaturally large grin. Blood trickled down its face as it smiled back at me, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth glistening in the beam of my phone's flashlight. It was a sight that would haunt me until my dying day. In sheer terror, I turned and ran, screaming like a child. Surprisingly, no park ranger or passerby heard my panicked cries as I sprinted back to my car. I could hear it screaming back at me, a mocking, otherworldly sound. I leaped into my car and sped away, my heart pounding in my chest. When I reached the safety of my condo, I raced upstairs, locked the door behind me, and struggled to regain control of my erratic breathing. As I finally composed myself and collapsed onto the couch, the sunburned agony still coursing through my body, I realized that I had narrowly escaped something truly inexplicable and horrifying. The next day, I visited a local clinic to have my sunburned skin examined. They prescribed a lotion to alleviate the burns, and I headed home immediately. I scoured the internet, desperately searching for any explanation for what I had witnessed. Skinwalker, alien, or some other shape-shifting cryptid, I couldn't find an answer. I want to thank Just Creepy for sharing my story and encounter, and I appreciate the support from his channel during these challenging times. If anyone reading this has any insight into what that creature could have been, please let me know. The memory of that encounter continues to haunt me, and I yearn for answers that may never come. My name is Ryan, and I'll never forget the terrifying experience that unfolded about two and a half years ago. It's a story I still relive in my nightmares, and it has left me scarred with a touch of PTSD. Let me assure you, this story is not a work of fiction. It's a chilling reality that my friend Jake and I endured. It all began in June, during a time when the pandemic was wreaking havoc worldwide. At that time, I was living with my sister and her two children having taken them in after she fled her abusive husband. 
Desperate for employment, I had been working as a social worker and counselor for abused kids at a group home. But after a few months, myself and a few colleagues, including my close friend Jake, were let go. The loss of my job hit me hard. I had bills to pay, a mortgage to meet, and I was responsible for my sister and her kids. I needed a job urgently. One evening, while scouring Craigslist for job opportunities, I stumbled upon an intriguing one. They were looking for people to work at a B&B that was about to open. They needed live-in housekeepers, a cook, and a front desk clerk. Offering a tempting $20 an hour plus free room and board, with weekends off. It was an offer too good to pass up, even if it meant stepping away from my career field. I called the number listed in the Craigslist ad, and a man with a southern accent answered. I expressed my interest and suggested I could come in for an interview the following day. However, he surprised me by insisting that I come that very evening. It was already late in the afternoon, and darkness was setting in, making it an odd time for an interview. Nevertheless, he claimed they were desperate, and that my immediate presence would greatly help. I agreed and asked if I could bring my friend Jake, who was also job hunting. The man agreed, gave me his name, and provided the address. I informed my sister and her children about my plans, and despite their concerns and warnings about responding to Craigslist ads, I headed out to explore this job opportunity. I picked up Jake, and together, we embarked on the journey to the mysterious job interview. As we drove, Jake expressed his skepticism about these seemingly too-good-to-be-true $20-an-hour jobs, but my desperation pushed me to believe that it could be legitimate. The drive took us deep into rural, wooded areas, far from the main city. It was a long journey, filled with endless trees lining both sides of the road. Upon arrival, we found the B&B sitting back from the road, resembling a southern plantation house. A skinny young man named Jordan greeted us on the porch. His appearance was more fitting for a skater park than a B&B. He wore a peculiar smile as he welcomed us and mentioned that we were the fourth and fifth applicants interviewed that day. He added that the previous applicant had been hired on the spot. This raised eyebrows since immediate hiring was a rarity. Without much thought, we followed Jordan into the B&B. He led us to the kitchen and mentioned that Michael would also like us. Just as Jake began to reply, a tall, imposing figure suddenly appeared behind us, towering over us like a professional wrestler. This was Michael, the owner of the BNB. After the introductions, he guided us through various rooms and shared that Charlie, his brother, was the mastermind behind the operation, while he, along with his son Jordan and daughter Marissa, would manage the day-to-day -day affairs. Michael explained that Charlie had some affiliation with the government, piquing my curiosity. However, when I inquired about the nature of Charlie's government work, Michael evaded the question and redirected us to his office for the interview. Entering Michael's office, we were met with a chilling sight. Shelves and tables adorned with taxidermy and embalmed animals. Deer, alligators, wolves, and even a boar's head were on display. Although bizarre, I brushed it off as a quirky hobby. Jake and I sat down at Michael's desk, ready for the interview, but it soon became evident that this interview was anything but ordinary. Michael asked a series of bizarre personal questions that were completely unrelated to the job. He inquired about our last physicals, prescription medications, and other intrusive details. It felt inappropriate and unnerving but Michael insisted that it was for workplace safety reasons. I considered leaving, suspecting this might be a scam, but desperation for a job and Michael's reassurances convinced me to stay. Michael concluded the interview by declaring that we were hired. Relief washed over me. I finally had a job. Michael then showed us around the BNB, revealing its dilapidated condition. Only four rooms were remotely presentable. The rest were in terrible disrepair, including one with significant water damage from a recent roof leak. We also met Marissa, Michael's daughter, who appeared disheveled and disconnected. I didn't want to be rude, so I ignored her condition. We met the other employees, Katrina and Rob, and encountered Charlie, who exuded an eerie, emotionless aura. He showed little interest in us. 
I assumed our visit was over, and we'd return on Monday to begin work. However, Michael had one last surprise in store, a walk through the wooded nature trail on the property, which he believed would attract guests. Although it was already dark, he handed us flashlights and armed himself with a shotgun. Jake and I hesitated, feeling uneasy about following a stranger into the woods at night, especially one wielding a firearm. But we didn't want to jeopardize our newfound employment. We trekked along the trail, Michael discussing plans for picnic tables and bonfires. It wasn't long before I heard faint murmurs and whispers in the distance. The eerie sounds grew louder as we ventured deeper into the woods. Jake and I exchanged alarmed glances. We weren't alone in hearing this unsettling chorus. Michael remained oblivious to the whispers, and we continued following him. Suddenly, I spotted a dim light through the trees, and we stumbled upon a clearing. A blazing fire illuminated the area, revealing about half a dozen figures dressed in black hooded robes. To the left, obscured from our view, lay something gruesome, a mangled animal with blood evident. Realization hit us like a freight train. We had walked into a gathering of a cult or ritualistic group. Michael turned to us with a twisted smile, proclaiming it to be the beginning of a hunting ritual. Panic set in as we realized we were in grave danger. Michael raised his shotgun and fired it into the air, yelling something about the hunt. Frozen with fear, I couldn't move. This couldn't be happening, but it was undeniably real. We had either stumbled into an elaborate scam or something far more sinister. Jake snapped out of it before I did. Ryan, run, he shouted, sprinting back toward the trail. We dashed through the woods, blindly following the path, our hearts pounding. Gunshots echoed behind us, accompanied by furious shouts in pursuit. We zigzagged, unable to tell where the shots were coming from. By some miracle, we made it back to my truck, unlocked the door, and sped away just as the group closed in on us, firing at my tires. Jake suggested going straight to the police, but I knew our story would sound too absurd to be believed. We opted to remain silent about the ordeal and told my sister and nephews that the job wasn't a good fit. Weeks later, I secured a job at a local fast food restaurant and Jake and I never spoke about that fateful night again. I avoided passing by the B&B, always on edge, fearing they might come after us. Six months later, I moved to another state for better job opportunities. To this day, I still have nightmares, haunted by the possibility that Charlie might recruit others for a similar sinister scheme. So, I implore you, be cautious when responding to Craigslist ads. If it could happen to me and Jake, it could happen to anyone. Stay safe and trust your instincts. I've always had a knack for finding the perfect spots for camping, a skill I attribute to my years growing up in the wilds of Georgia. This time, my choice was Eatonville, Washington. It was a picturesque town, the kind that you'd imagine on a postcard or in a dream, nestled between lush green hills and clear, starry skies. We arrived in the late afternoon, the sun casting a golden hue over the landscape. My wife, Anna, hummed a soft tune as she helped set up the camper while our kids, Sarah and Joey, ran around in the open space, their laughter echoing through the trees. The youngest, little Lily, was just a year old, snug in her portable crib, gazing at the new surroundings with wide, curious eyes. I lit the grill, the smell of cooking burgers mingling with the fresh pine air. Anna set the picnic table her hands moving deftly as she laid out the plates and utensils. We had a simple rule, no phones, no tablets, just us and nature. It was our way of reconnecting, a brief escape from the chaos of city life. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire. I cracked open a beer and watched the flames dance, their light reflecting in my family's eyes. It was moments like these that I lived for, the quiet simplicity of being surrounded by the ones I loved. We roasted marshmallows, and I shared stories from my childhood, tales of camping trips and close encounters with wildlife. The kids listened, 
their eyes wide with wonder. The first two nights passed peacefully. The days were spent exploring the trails and the nights, stargazing and telling stories. I slept soundly those nights, the kind of deep sleep that you only get when your mind is at ease. But the third night, everything changed. I woke up suddenly, my heart pounding in my chest. It was past midnight, and an eerie silence enveloped the camper. Then, I heard it, a whooping sound, distant yet distinct, breaking the stillness of the night. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard, a chilling guttural cry that sent shivers down my spine. Anna stirred beside me, her eyes wide with fear. Hunter, what was that? she whispered. I shook my head, unsure. We listened intently, the sound growing closer. It was accompanied by a stench so foul it made my stomach churn, a mix of hot garbage and rotting roadkill. I peered through the window, the dim yellow light from our outdoor setup barely piercing the darkness. Maybe it's a bear, Anna suggested, her voice trembling. But I knew better. I'd encountered bears before and this was different. This creature, whatever it was, seemed to move with an eerie intelligence, its presence unnerving. Anna clutched my hand, her fingers cold. Our kids slept soundly, blissfully unaware of the terror lurking just outside. I felt a protective instinct kick in, a primal urge to keep my family safe. The creature let out another whoop, louder this time, right outside our camper. The RV trembled slightly, and I held my breath, praying for it to pass. That night, as we lay in fear, I knew our peaceful camping trip had turned into something we'd never forget. Something was out there in the dark, and it was too close for comfort. Lying in our camper, my heart racing, I felt a sense of dread wash over me. The eerie whooping sound outside seemed to pierce through the walls, each cry more unsettling than the last. Anna clung to me, her body trembling with fear. I tried to reassure her, but my voice was a mere whisper, lost in the chaos of the moment. As the creature circled our camper, its immense size became apparent. Even in the dim glow of our outdoor lights, I could make out a towering, shadowy figure moving with an unsettling grace. The stench that accompanied it was suffocating, an assault on the senses that made my stomach churn. I've spent enough time in the wild to know the sounds and behaviors of most animals, but this was different. This was no bear. Its movements were too deliberate, too intelligent. It let out a low growl a sound so foreign and menacing that it chilled me to the bone. Anna's tears streamed down her cheeks in silent terror. We huddled together, trying to make ourselves as small and as quiet as possible. The kids, thank God, remained asleep, oblivious to the nightmare unfolding just outside. The creature's whooping intensified, a haunting chorus that seemed to shake the very air. It was right in front of our RV now. The camper trembled with each of its movements, a terrifying reminder of its immense power. I remembered the stories I had heard, tales of Bigfoot, creatures of legend that roamed the remote corners of the world. I'd always dismissed them as just that, stories. But now, in the heart of the Washington wilderness, I wasn't so sure. The minutes stretched into what felt like hours, each second a test of our courage. I held my breath, listening as the sounds gradually moved away the whooping growing fainter until it finally disappeared into the night. When the silence returned, it was a cold comfort. We were safe for the moment, but the fear lingered, a tangible presence in the cramped space of the camper. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. Instead, I watched the first light of dawn creep through the windows, the beauty of the morning a stark contrast to the horrors of the night. As the sun rose, Casting its warm glow over the campsite, I knew our lives had changed. We had come to Eatonville in search of peace, and found ourselves face to face with a mystery as old as the hills themselves. That morning, as we stepped out of the camper, we were greeted by the sight of other campers, their faces etched with the same mix of fear and curiosity that I felt. They too had heard the sounds, the whooping that had shattered the stillness of the night. Together we gathered around the unmistakable evidence left behind. A set of colossal footprints, unlike anything any of us had ever seen. It was a moment of shared disbelief. 
a realization that we had encountered something truly extraordinary. The sense of wonder was overshadowed by a primal fear, a reminder of our vulnerability in the face of the unknown. As we packed up our belongings, ready to leave this place behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled upon a secret, a hidden truth that lay just beyond the reach of understanding. Our encounter in Eatonville would stay with us, a haunting memory of the night when the legend of Bigfoot became all too real. The light of dawn did little to ease the tension that had settled over the campsite. I stepped out of the camper, Anna close behind me, her eyes still red from the night's tears. The kids, thankfully unaware of the night's ordeal, were curious about the sudden change in our plans. We're heading home early, adventure's over, I told them, trying to mask the tremor in my voice. Outside, the camp was abuzz with activity. Other campers, faces drawn with a mix of fear and intrigue, were gathered in small clusters. They spoke in hushed tones, pointing at something on the ground. I walked over, my curiosity overcoming my apprehension. There, right in front of our camper, were the footprints. They were unlike anything I'd ever seen, enormous, deep imprints that bore the unmistakable outline of a massive foot, much larger than any human or known animal. They carved a path through the campsite, a physical testament to the reality of the previous night's terror. Did you guys hear that thing last night? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Nods and murmurs of agreement met my question. One camper, a middle-aged man with a weather-beaten face, pointed at the footprints. Look what it did right in front of your camper he said, his tone a mix of awe and disbelief. The sight of the footprints sent a shiver down my spine. They were real, tangible proof that what we had experienced was no dream, no figment of our imagination. This was something else, something beyond the realm of normal understanding. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the lingering, unspoken fear of the unknown. People took photos, their cameras clicking in a desperate attempt to capture the inexplicable. I stood there, rooted to the spot, my mind racing with questions that had no answers. The decision to leave was unanimous. One by one, the campers packed up their belongings, eager to put distance between themselves and the unexplained mystery of the night. Even the campsite manager, a gruff no-nonsense type, seemed unsettled as he issued refunds. We packed up in silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts. The drive back was quiet the usual chatter and laughter absent. The encounter had left a mark on us, a shadow that lingered in the corners of our minds. Once home, I felt compelled to report the incident. I reached out to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, detailing our experience and the evidence we had found. Their response was measured, skeptical, yet intrigued. They promised to investigate, but I knew the chances of finding anything conclusive were slim. The days that followed were a blur of normalcy, a stark contrast to the surreal experience we had lived through, but normal felt different now, tinged with the knowledge of something unexplainable, something that defied logic and understanding. As I lay in bed each night, the memories of that encounter played over in my mind. The whooping sound, the enormous footprints, the fear and wonder they inspired. It was a reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden in the wild places of the world, a testament to the fact that, despite our advancements and knowledge, there are still things beyond our comprehension. Eatonville, once a place of peace and relaxation, had become something else to us, a symbol of the unknown, a reminder of the night when our world was turned upside down. We had come seeking a simple camping trip and left with a story that would haunt us for the rest of our lives. The days following our return from Eatonville passed in a haze of normalcy, but beneath the surface, the memory of that night lingered like a stubborn fog. When the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, contacted me, saying they were heading to the campsite, a part of me felt a rush of relief. Maybe they could make sense of what we had encountered. I met the BFRO team at the campsite a few days later. The drive back was surreal, each mile bringing me closer to the place I had sworn to leave behind. The team was a mix of seasoned researchers and enthusiastic volunteers, their equipment a testament to their dedication. 
We walked through the campsite, the memories flooding back as I showed them where we had found the footprints. The BFRO team moved with a professional detachment, measuring the prints, taking soil samples, and discussing theories in low, serious tones. I watched them, a bystander in my own story, feeling a mix of hope and skepticism. One of the researchers, a woman named Dr. Hayes, approached me. We've seen prints like these before, she said, but it's rare to find them so well preserved. Her eyes held a spark of excitement, the thrill of the chase evident in her voice. As the day wore on, the team combed through the area, their cameras and recording equipment at the ready. They interviewed other campers who had stayed nearby, collecting stories and sightings. Each piece of evidence added to the puzzle, but the picture remained incomplete. Night fell, and with it, an unsettling quiet. The BFRO team set up night vision cameras and audio recorders, hoping to capture any lingering presence. I stayed with them, my curiosity outweighing my apprehension. The woods seemed different in the darkness, every rustle of leaves and snap of a twig magnifying the tension. But the night passed without incident. No mysterious sounds, no unexplained movements, just the quiet, indifferent forest and the stars overhead, bearing silent witness to our search. In the morning, Dr. Hayes shared their findings, or lack thereof. It's not uncommon for these investigations to yield more questions than answers, she admitted. The disappointment in her voice mirrored my own. As the BFRO packed up their equipment, preparing to leave, Dr. Hayes offered a small smile. This doesn't mean it's over, she said. We'll keep looking, keep investigating. These mysteries have a way of revealing themselves in time. I watched them drive away, the dust from their vehicles settling back onto the empty road. The campsite was quiet again, the excitement of the investigation replaced by a palpable sense of mystery. On the drive home, I reflected on the experience. The encounter in Eatonville had opened a door to a world I had never truly believed in. The lack of conclusive evidence from the BFRO didn't deter my newfound curiosity. If anything, it fueled it. The mystery of Bigfoot, once a mere legend, had become a part of my story, a chapter in my life that remained unwritten. The unknown had a way of drawing you in, of keeping you searching for answers in the shadows of the unexplained. And as I drove back to the familiarity of my life, I knew one thing for certain. The search for answers would continue, both for the BFRO and for me. In the weeks following the Eatonville incident, Life returned to a semblance of normalcy, but the shadows of that night lingered in the corners of my mind. At home, surrounded by the familiar, the experience felt surreal, like a fragment of a half-remembered dream. Yet, the footprints etched in my memory, and the whooping sound that echoed in my dreams, were reminders of a reality that defied explanation. Anna and I didn't talk much about that night. It was as if by acknowledging it, we'd give it power, let it seep further into our lives. But the unspoken understanding hung between us, a shared experience that had subtly shifted the contours of our world. The kids, thankfully oblivious to the true nature of our early departure, had moved on, their resilience a stark contrast to our silent grappling. Little Lily, with her innocent gaze, remained a source of light in the shadow of our unease. I found myself drawn to the lore of Bigfoot, an interest I had never entertained before. It was a pursuit of understanding, of trying to make sense of what we had encountered. The internet was a rabbit hole of theories, sightings, and skepticisms. I read accounts that mirrored our own, stories of peaceful nights turned into encounters with the unknown. Yet, in each story, the mystery remained, a question mark hanging over the reality we thought we knew. The BFRO reached out occasionally, updating me on their ongoing investigations. They hadn't found anything conclusive, but their dedication to unraveling the mystery was a source of comfort. It was a reassurance that we weren't alone in our experience, that there were others who believed, who sought answers. As the seasons changed, the lure of the wild called to me, but the thought of returning to Eatonville, to that campsite, 
was a line I wasn't ready to cross. The wilderness, once a refuge, now held an undercurrent of unease, a reminder of the thin veil between the known and the unknown. I took to spending evenings on our porch, gazing at the woods that bordered our home. The sounds of the night, once a symphony of nature's tranquility, now carried a hint of mystery. Each rustle of leaves, each distant call, seemed to hold a deeper significance, a whispered hint of the secrets hidden in the depths of the wild. The encounter had changed me, not just in my perception of the world, but in my understanding of myself. I had always prided myself on my rationality, my grounded view of life. But faced with the unexplainable, I found my beliefs challenged, my skepticism giving way to a cautious openness to the mysteries of the world. In quiet moments, I would find Anna looking out at the woods, her expression a mix of wonder and apprehension. It was a look I understood all too well. Our journey had taken us beyond the boundaries of our ordinary lives, into a realm where legends tread the line of reality. The Eatonville encounter, a fleeting moment in the grand tapestry of life, had left an indelible mark. It was a reminder of the vast, unexplored mysteries that lay just beyond our understanding, an invitation to embrace the unknown with a sense of awe and reverence. As I sat there, the night unfolding around me, I realized that our encounter with the unknown was not an end, but a beginning. A beginning of a journey into the depths of the unexplored, a journey not just through the wilderness, but within ourselves. In the stillness of the night, I knew one thing for certain. The world was far more mysterious and wondrous than we could ever imagine, and our story was just one thread in its vast, unfolding mystery. The night air was cool and crisp as I sat by the campfire with my grandfather. We were in his backyard, deep in the heart of the Arizona desert, a place where the sky stretched endlessly, painted in shades of purple as night fell. Stars twinkled like distant fires, and the moon, full and imposing, hung low over the distant mountains, casting a soft glow over the rugged landscape. My grandfather, a man whose life story was etched in the lines of his weathered face, had a voice that crackled like the dry wood in our fire. It was a raspy, gravelly sound, the result of too many cigars and sips of whiskey over the years. His eyes, wide and dark, seemed to reflect the flames as he settled into his chair, an old but sturdy thing that creaked under his weight. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, he began, his voice taking on a distant, reflective tone. I leaned in closer, the fire's warmth comforting against the desert's nocturnal chill. My grandfather lived just outside an Apache reservation with my great-grandfather, a tough man who had come back from the war and started a ranch, raising horses and cattle. The land was tough, rough, with dirt good for growing nothing but thornbrush, he continued, his eyes glazing over as if he was seeing the past unfold before him. He spoke of a night, long ago, when his mother fell ill. He and his father had to drive to town for medicine, a journey of about 50 miles through the desert, over a creek that had long since dried up, passing old abandoned farmsteads that stood like ghosts in the moonlight. As he spoke, a log in the fire cracked sharply, making me jump. The sudden sound seemed to break the spell of his story, and I found myself eagerly asking, what happened next, Grandpa? He chuckled, a low, throaty sound. Settle down, boy. You'll hear soon enough. His tone was serious now, almost somber, as he delved back into the story. They were driving in an old Ford pickup truck, he told me, the kind that seemed as tough and rugged as the men who drove it. The darkness was thick, the only light coming from the truck's headlights, slicing through the night. He recalled the engine beginning to sputter, the truck slowing to a jerky stop. God damn it, his father had muttered, guiding the vehicle to the side of the road. The truck coasted to a halt, and his father stepped out into the inky darkness. I could almost feel the cool desert air as he described it, breezy and refreshing against his hot face and neck. His father was getting water from the back to cool the engine when my grandfather smelled it, a stench like rotten eggs. Sulfur. His nose also picked up the smell of carrion, 
reminding him of dead cattle bloating under the scorching sun until they burst. The stench was so foul he gagged, and a strange tingling sensation spread across his skin. Just then, the wind died down, leaving the air heavy and still. The cab of the truck filled with the stench, but there was no answer. My grandfather's heart pounded in his chest, a fear unlike any he had known gripping him. He locked the door, reached over to lock his father's door, and that's when he saw it. A shadow moving swiftly across the road, illuminated briefly by the dim light of the truck's headlights. It was something inexplicable, something that made his blood run cold. My grandfather paused his story, spitting a wad of tobacco into the fire, his gaze lost in the flames. I realized I had been holding my breath, the suspense of his tail gripping me. I was sweating despite the coolness of the night. Well, what happened? What about your father? What did you see? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He sighed, a deep, weary sound. A creature, he said, his voice barely audible. But it's more than just that. You see, there are legends, old legends, about creatures like the one I saw that night. I sat there, under the starry sky, listening intently as my grandfather wove his tale, a story that would stay with me for the rest of my life. I'll never forget that night, driving through the Arizona desert with my grandfather. The road stretched out before us like a dark ribbon, winding through a landscape that felt as ancient as time itself. The truck's headlights cut through the night, casting eerie shadows across the abandoned farmsteads that dotted our path. My grandfather's tale, steeped in mystery and the supernatural, had me completely captivated. He described how, as a young boy, he and his father set off on a seemingly mundane trip to town, a journey that would soon turn into a night of unforgettable terror. The truck, a sturdy old Ford, rattled along the rough desert roads, its engine humming a steady rhythm in the otherwise silent night. The only signs of life were the occasional cacti and brush that dotted the barren landscape. As they drove, the sky above was a blanket of darkness, pierced only by the sharp glints of stars. My grandfather recalled the sense of isolation, how the desert seemed to swallow them whole, leaving them utterly alone under the vast, unyielding sky. But then, without warning, their journey was halted. The truck's engine began to sputter and cough, its rhythm faltering until it came to a jerky stop. My grandfather remembered his father's curse, a sharp exclamation lost in the vastness of the desert. He watched as his father, a silhouette against the dark, moved to fix the truck, leaving him alone inside the vehicle. That's when the atmosphere shifted. The cool desert air, once a relief against the heat of the day, now felt charged with an unspoken threat. A sense of foreboding washed over him, prickling his skin and setting his nerves on edge. He described the smell that hit him then, a stench of sulfur and decay, so potent it made him gag. It was an unnatural, unsettling odor that seemed out of place in the dry desert air. His heart pounded in his chest, a drumbeat of fear escalating with each passing second. His calls for his father went unanswered, the silence of the desert swallowing his voice. He remembered the stillness that followed, a suffocating calm that hung heavily around him. And in that stillness, he sensed something else, a presence, something lurking just beyond the reach of the truck's dim headlights. It was then that he saw it, a shadow moving swiftly across the road. It was only a glimpse, but enough to send a jolt of terror through him. The creature, whatever it was, moved with a grace that belied its size, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. My grandfather paused his story, his eyes reflecting the flames of our campfire. I could see the impact that moment had on him, even after all these years. The fear he felt as a boy was almost tangible in the air between us. What was it, Grandpa? What did you see? I asked, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and excitement. He looked at me, his eyes grave. I didn't know then, he said slowly, but I would soon learn the truth. That night, I came face to face with something from the old legends, something that defied explanation, 
something that would haunt me for the rest of my life. Sitting across the campfire, my heart pounding in my chest, I listened as my grandfather continued his harrowing tale from that fateful night in the Arizona desert. His voice, roughened by time and memories, carried a weight that made the story all the more real and terrifying. He spoke of the moment right after seeing the shadow dart across the road. Alone in the truck, with his father nowhere in sight, he felt a deep, primal fear. The desert, once a familiar place, now seemed alien and menacing. The stench of sulfur and decay hung heavy in the air, a reminder of the presence he had just witnessed. Then my grandfather began to explain about the legends he had heard as a boy, stories passed down through generations of Native Americans. He spoke of the skinwalkers, beings of ancient myth, steeped in dark magic and mystery. According to the lore, skinwalkers were once warriors, who through a deal with the spirits gained the power to transform into animals, taking on not only their physical forms, but some of their essence as well. He described these creatures in vivid detail, beings that walked on the hind legs of deer with the sinewy muscular torso of a man and the head of a coyote, but all wrong, distorted and grotesque. Their mouths were filled with teeth sharp as bowie knives, and their eyes, he said, glowed with a malevolence that could chill one's soul. As he spoke, I could almost see the creature in my mind's eye, a nightmarish figure straight out of a horror story. He told me how these skinwalkers were feared among the tribes, known for their cunning and ruthlessness. They were tricksters, able to mimic human voices, luring unsuspecting victims into their grasp. But what scared me the most was the power they possessed, the ability to wear the skin of another person, to become them, if only for a short time. This was why they were named skinwalkers. It was a chilling thought to imagine a creature that could take on the appearance of someone you knew, someone you loved, and use it against you. My grandfather's voice trembled slightly as he recounted his thoughts from that night. Alone in the truck, he had grappled with a terrifying possibility. What if the creature had taken his father's form? The thought had paralyzed him with fear, the uncertainty of it more frightening than any ghost story. He paused looking into the fire as if it held answers to the mysteries of that night. I could see the burden of those long-ago events in his eyes, the way they seemed to look beyond the fire, beyond me, into a past filled with shadows and fear. What happened to your father? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper, caught up in the spell of his story. My grandfather sighed, a sound of weariness and age. He came back, he said. But for a moment, I didn't know if it was him or something else. That uncertainty, that fear of not knowing, it stayed with me for a long time. The fire crackled between us, a barrier against the darkness of the night. I sat there listening as the tale of the skinwalker unfolded, a story that blurred the lines between legend and reality, leaving me to wonder at the mysteries that lay hidden in the depths of the Arizona desert. The fire crackled and popped, casting eerie shadows across my grandfather's face as he reached the climax of his story. The night around us seemed to hold its breath, the stars twinkling like distant watchful eyes in the vast Arizona sky. I leaned forward, hanging on every word, completely engrossed in the tale of the skinwalker. My father eventually came back, my grandfather continued, his voice heavy with the weight of the memory. He climbed into the cab of the truck, his movements awkward and strained. For a moment, I was frozen, my mind racing with fear. Was this really my father, or had the skinwalker taken his form? The way he described that moment sent chills down my spine. I could almost feel the same paralyzing fear he must have felt as a young boy, alone in the dark with a creature of nightmares lurking nearby. The fear of not knowing if the person next to you was really who they appeared to be was a terrifying thought. My grandfather told me how he scrutinized his father, searching for any sign that might reveal the truth. The tension in the truck was palpable, a thick, suffocating blanket of uncertainty and fear. Finally his father spoke, mentioning getting the medicine for my great-grandmother. 
It was such a simple, mundane statement, but to my grandfather, it was enough to confirm that this was indeed his father. But how could you be sure? I asked, unable to contain my curiosity. My grandfather looked at me, a hint of sorrow in his eyes. I wasn't completely sure, not until I saw it, the skinwalker, running alongside our truck, keeping pace with us as we drove. It was a horrifying sight, its eyes glowing yellow in the darkness, its mouth twisted into a sinister grin. He described how the creature ran with an unnatural speed, its twisted form a blur in the night. My grandfather's father kept his eyes fixed on the road, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. Don't look at it, he had warned in a stern, urgent voice. That was the moment my grandfather knew for sure that the man beside him was his father. The story concluded with them arriving back home safely, but the experience left a lasting impact on my grandfather. He spoke of how the encounter with the skinwalker had changed him, how it had opened his eyes to the mysteries and terrors that lay hidden in the world. As he finished his tale, the fire between us had dwindled to embers, casting a soft, warm glow in the cool desert night. I sat there, processing the story, feeling a mix of fear, awe, and wonder. The line between legend and reality seemed thinner than ever, the mysteries of the desert more profound and unfathomable. My grandfather leaned back in his chair, looking up at the starry sky. That's the power of the old legends, he said softly. They teach us that there's more to this world than what we see, that there are things beyond our understanding. I nodded, a newfound respect for the old tales and the mysteries they held filling my heart. The story of the Skinwalker, a tale of fear, bravery, and the unknown, would stay with me forever, a haunting reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden in the vast, enigmatic desert.